Would the members of the executive committee please come to committee room one for quorum?
Ladies and gentlemen, we'll resume now. Uh, and where we left off, uh, Councillor Crawford had uh, asked that some uh, people from the Toronto Parking Authority be here to answer a couple of questions, and so I gather they're here. And so on that basis, Councillor Crawford, over to you for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, a couple of questions on these uh, 180, 181 spots. So I've done a rough calculation myself, $1.9 million, 180 spots. It looks like these, these um, 180 spots generate about $10,000 a year. Is that correct, approximately? A year? Yes, Councillor. So uh, on, on a, I wouldn't say scale of 1 to 10, but when you're looking at uh, as a, a, an important asset or investment, these particular spots compared to other spots in the city, are they fairly uh, lucrative, I guess, for you? They're, they're among the top highest revenue earners in the city, but they do have the highest hourly rate of the spaces in the city as well. So when, you, when you're looking at other spots, can you give me, I don't know if you, you can give, give me another indication of what, what an average parking spot in the city would generate? I don't know if you can do uh, Approximately three to four thousand dollars. Okay, and then again, when you're looking at spots in this, where would the, where would the area of the city where you generate the most money per spot? Um, it would be somewhere in the downtown core, probably around the university, or sorry, the uh, hospital area. So definitely, definitely more than ten thousand dollars. Would be close to ten thousand. It's not going to be substantially more. It might be slightly less, but it would be okay. in that range. So you do consider these a valuable asset, of course, and you'll be losing about one point nine million dollars. I mean, if, if the pilot goes through, but annual not one point nine million dollars. Yes. And do you have any plans on how to replace any of this money? And I, specific, I look at you know, when we're getting to the budget, 2018 budget process, $1.9 million is not pocket change. Uh, and there'll be, we need to deal with that. Do you have any sense of how you can replace this? What, what we're going to do is undertake a review of some of the flanking streets in the area um, to see if areas that currently have, for example, no parking restrictions can be converted to paid parking or there's some spaces that are currently free, and we would like to look at converting those to pay now, parking. Have you had any discussions with either planning, transportation staff of any of this? Or is this something that will be happening during the pilot? Yes, we have had discussions, and it will be happening during the pilot. Okay, so you get a sense that there, there, there may, be that, may be that potential of looking at other alternative revenue sources? Uh, yes, we will be looking at them. I'm not confident that they'll replace the revenue entirely, but they'll provide some additional revenue and parking service really which is important. so in that then then if you're not going to be able to find any parking closer by would you be looking at any other opportunities citywide to increase you know your stock to increase your revenue is that something you, you look at on a regular basis we do look at that on a regular basis and in fact last week at community council we put about 800 additional spaces through the community council process so okay. they'll be going online and we have another thousand or so right now in the pipeline that are being looked at. Okay. So it's something we're constantly reviewing. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, uh, Councillor Crawford. Thank you very much uh, to the uh, people from the Parking Authority. I'm sorry you had to come over, but that's good to, to get those things on the record. Uh, okay, I think that brought us to the end of our question uh, period, and now we would move to speakers uh, on this matter and uh, speakers who are not members of the Executive Committee. So I've got uh, Councillors Cressy, Deputy Mayor McConnell, I assume Councillor Karajanis, who's here. Okay, well, there's a start for us. Uh, so, uh, Councillor Cressy, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you as well to all the deputants this morning. Uh, this has been a, a quite impressive collaboration between transportation services, the TTC, and city planning. Uh, and I just want to recognize all their hard work as well as the indulgence of members of the Executive Committee for giving me a moment to speak. Uh, I represent one of the two wards where this pilot, the proposed pilot, is coming forward, along with Deputy Mayor McConnell. And I think it's fair to say, if you ask anybody who uses King in any way, they'll tell you that King Street is broken. King Street does not work today. If you're a driver, you avoid King at all costs because it is always congested. If you ride the streetcar, in this pilot area, it is often faster to walk than take the streetcar. And if you're walking, you often find that the sidewalks are full. And so you have the King Street portion here is the busiest surface level transit route in the entire city. In fact, it is the third busiest transit route of any kind in all of Toronto. And it's broken. And so to do nothing is to render us to more failure. 
which is why it is time for an approach which simply does this, moves more people quickly and reliably. That's what we're doing. Uh, we have no choice but to do this because the city is growing. We know that Toronto today, downtown, has 250,000 overnight residents. But we have a daily population in weekdays of nearly 900,000 people. Downtown Toronto quadruples in population every single day because people work downtown. They study downtown. Many of my colleagues here commute into downtown. And so with the city growing, we're adding a million new residents. 41% of all the non-residential development is still downtown. It's going to get harder and harder for people to move in and out of downtown. You cannot get in and out unless we redesign our streets. And so if we're going to enhance the quality of life for people who commute to work and to study, as well as to ensure economic vibrancy and prosperity without losing money and gridlock, it has to be a transit-first approach. And so I, I recognize completely that change is indeed hard that, as every one of my colleagues will know, you can't put a speed bump on a residential street without fierce debate, let alone redesigning a core arterial without intense debate. But on King, change is absolutely necessary. And as one of the two local councillors who represents the residents and the businesses and the tourists and the commuters who use our streets downtown, I am prepared to go block by block to make sure this works, along with Deputy Mayor McConnell. And so, our streets were designed to move cars. And in a growing city, we have no choice but to redesign our streets to move people. Uh, and I'll just close. Deputy Mayor Minim Wong asked a really good question in the TTC. And he moved a motion to say, we need to ensure that the barometers for success are clear. I think that's the right approach. And so I asked the question, what does success look like? And the answer, as the TTC, indicated is moving more people quickly and reliably. That's success. If we've done that, we've improved our city, and I hope uh, that members of the executive will support the report in front of us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Cressy. Uh, Councillor, what have I done with my list here? I think it was Deputy Member McConnell. Like, there we are. Yes, Deputy Member McConnell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I, I, um, I won't repeat my colleagues, um, but I agree with everything that he has said. Um, and I know that you have spent an awful lot of time trying to figure out how to get rid of the congestion. Um, this, co this community is made up of the financial district, a lot of important uh, businesses, including the entertainment, but also neighborhoods. And those are growing neighborhoods. Um, many of our neighborhoods really wanted to be part of this um, because the uh, distillery district, for example, is not neither is the new Canary District. <coughs> but it is the place that we have put an additional streetcar, uh, the first streetcar, new streetcar in all of these decades, uh, the 514. So we've tried a lot of things, no left turns, no, no, uh, um, no parking during um, particular um, rush hour. But this, I think, will measure what is it that we need to do in order to make this street work? 75% of the people who live in the neighborhoods that I represent don't actually even own cars. There are zip cars and, and share cars in every single one of those buildings and parking lots, and the parking authority have been terrific at that. But they don't need to, and why don't they need to? Because they can't drive anywhere. You can't get downtown, you can't can't drive down King Street. But most of these traffic movements are from people who are local. Most of them are from people who are local. And they, they know that this is not the place that you try to get to. Even if you want to go to Golf Town, you go another way. Um, so it seems to me that that's pretty important. The second thing that's very important to me is that it is a true pilot. So whatever it is, and I hear, and I've talked to the ta taxi industry, you know, I think we've made some errors, both of us, and that's just the way it is. But what I would say is we need to try our pilot first. And then if we want to make uh, some adjustments after we've got at least some data on what works, then I have no, no difficulty with that. Because we have spent, uh, Councillor Cressy and I, and our offices, a lot of time on block by block consultation and 
um, and understanding. And this has been an incredible team who has listened, who's had thousands of people who have, have participated. It's been much more of a charrette where you talk about what would happen if you were in that car, what would happen if you were in that streetcar. Um, but it has been dynamic. And so I think that when we hear that our community represents, um, supports it almost unanimously, I think that's pretty important. And I think it's important when we hear that car drivers, 67, almost 70% of them, think it's a pretty good deal. And that's because they know what King Street is like to drive down. You just simply don't, and it is broken. So this is an opportunity for us to measure and to evaluate and come up with a better solution. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Karajanis. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. With all due respect to my colleagues, nothing begins with a pilot that does not become permanent. You try it for a couple of weeks, people are sort of like, okay, I guess I'm gonna put up with it, and it starts becoming permanent. I think we will be doing a disservice to all our stakeholders if we do not consult with them more deeper. I hear from staff that um, we consulted with the taxi industry. Oh, we got in touch with one person and, uh, and that was it. The taxi industry is more than one person. I hear from staff and I was given to understand that one of the third of the vehicles down there was supposed to be taxi cabs and then when I speak to them offline, they said, no, no, it's 150 cabs per hour. The figures that uh, staff were giving us are a little bit ambiguous. We don't even have the complete picture. Um, statements as to having reached all the stakeholders, certainly questionable. Maybe it is time that we do a real service to the people of our city and reach out to the stakeholders. I think that my, my residents in Scarborough Agent Court will certainly be interested to hear about King Street besides hearing from their councillor. I invited staff to, to come up to speak to my constituents and I think that we might want to spend one or two more months. I would suggest to you that you might want to put this off, Mr. Mayor, until next time that we come back in, in the fall, first meeting in the fall, to, to allow the staff to have a complete consultation Consult with the areas, consult with Scarborough, consult with North York, because it's not only the two wards that are affected by this. All the people of Toronto are affected by this. I drive downtown, and I'm sure that a lot of my constituents drive downtown. Some of the people that are working in those ivory towers on Bay Street could be my constituents, and they would they'd like to hear, their families might like to hear. So I'll say to you that consultations have to be done, consultations have to be done, and we have to do diligence and speak not only of the two neighborhoods or the two wards that are affected, but to speak about the whole city of Toronto. King Street travels from one side of the city right across to the other side. So it affects everybody, it affects all our lives, and I think staff might want to do the due diligence and make sure that all the stakeholders are, uh, that are affected are on the table and everybody has a chance to speak up and everybody's having an opportunity to be given an opportunity to voice their concern to, to speak up to speak up and make their concerns heard as well as for them to understand what the ramifications would be. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Karajanis. Councillor Layton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, and thank you, Executive Committee, for hearing this item. We, we know that any time uh, we make a change of this significance, uh, of any significance, really, Councillor Cressy has a great line at most that if, uh, uh, apparently my colleague wants to cut off my microphone uh, right away. I realize that wasn't you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, uh, that my colleague, Councillor Cressy, has a, a great saying at, at, at most public meetings that even when we want to redo a sidewalk from, uh, from the heritage asf asphalt that was put in place, that that kind of change elicits some kind of reaction from a community. Um, we knew that undertaking a, a, a discussion like this about uh, such a serious artery would be uh, would be difficult at times. Um, it would evoke a lot of uh, a, an emotional response by people both living in the area and that used it on a on a regular basis. Um, we also knew that 
everyone uh, and their counselor would turn into a transit planning expert. Um, th th that is also what's happening here today, I think, with some of the motions that, uh, that, that are being discussed, that all of us like to think that we can do a better job than, uh, th than our planning experts that we pay, pay likely a little bit more than what we make, to be experts. We try to get them to come from other municipalities. We, we, uh, we get them as far as Seattle. Uh, to, to come to the City of Toronto to lend us their expertise. So when they do come forward with a recommendation, a proposal like this, what we do is we help shepherd it through the public process and now the political process um, because we all want to, we all have a, a similar common goal. If you've ever waited for the King Street car, and I know you have, Mr. Mayor, because we've been out there together on occasion and I know you understand the seriousness of this. You, you, if you've ever stood there and watched five streetcars go by that are packed, that are bunched, that, uh, that, that are struggling to get through every intersection, then I think you'd, you'd have a, a, a deeper consideration and give, give more thought into uh, the looking to absolutely anything we can do to, uh, to, to address congestion along the King Street Quarter. There are already more people taking public transit than sitting in, uh, in, in single, single occupancy vehicles on that corridor. And what we have is entire cities along that corridor that right now are either walking because they can't get there any faster any other way, or they're sitting on, on pa or, or standing on packed streetcars, not able to get on, uh, on streetcars as, and watching full ones go by. Um, it is not working. It's not working for the people of Liberty Village. It's not working for the neighborhood of Fort York. It's not working for any of those buildings along King Street, for the, for the significant city that uh, Councillor Cressy, along with the planning department, are building at, at King Spadina uh, that will go up in the next decade. Um, it's not working for those communities. We need to look for other options. And just, on, just, to, just to close off, it's very brave to look at an option like this. It's brave to try something like this. And I'm very thankful to the mayor and to other members of the executive who are, are, are working to try to get this through. Because change is difficult, but the, potential, the, the status quo just won't work. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Uh, other uh, visitors from Council are wishing to speak? If not, we can move to a speaker's list, which I, which I do not have one as yet, for the members of the committee who would, uh, who would want to be on that list. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, yeah, I have um, three motions. Uh, Council direct the General Manager of Transportation Services to, uh, to report in 2017 on the increase in congestion in the downtown core over the past 10 and five years, uh, including the changes to roadways in the downtown core, such as the Garden Expressway and arterial roads that have contributed to the increase in congestion. City Council direct the General Manager of Transportation Services to report on any increase in congestions on roads in the downtown core as a result of the pilot project. City Council direct the General Manager of Transportation Services and Chief Planner and Executive Director of City Planning to report in 2017 on the suggested changes proposed as a result of the pilot project before any implementation. Um, I will s just make my comments brief. Firstly, with regard to the issue with regard to the taxi cabs. We need to introduce the chief planner to the executive director of municipal licensing and standards. If they had talked beforehand, um, the executive director would have told the chief planner all the people that she needed to talk to so we could have avoided this controversy. Um, that would have been easy and it's, it's uh, regrettable that, that our senior staff aren't talking to each other and th sometimes, and this is the result of that, that could have been avoided. Um, secondly, uh, I will say this, that um, my residents, you talk to them, many of them, and, they, and you ask them, so what do you think about this? And they say, you know what, I don't go d downtown anymore because it's so bad, right? We don't come downtown anymore. And that's regrettable too. People aren't coming downtown because the congestion is so horrible. And, uh, and that's regrettable. They talk about it a lot. Um, so I think, uh, I, think and I, I think that we need to find out what the impacts are, not just on transit. And, you know, they say any improvements. Well, I think there will be an improvement. The question is, is how much is, how much is that improvement going to be and weigh that against the impact it's going to have on all the other modes of tra uh, uh, traffic, transit and all the other impacts on traffic. So for example, like I was talking to business, businessmen down there. They say it's, it's horrible on Wellington Street right now. There's all sorts of construction going on. What's going to happen with, you know, how much worse is it going to be? How much worse is Queen Street going to be? You know, these are all things that we have to take into account. Yes. 
We have to improve uh, transit. There's no question about that. But we can't, you know, put our head in the sands or just, I don't believe, some people do, that we should completely ignore motorists. We don't, in this city, get anything accomplished by ignoring significant groups of people. And as I said before, the number of people who are buying cars, families that are buying cars, is just increasing. And the sooner that we get our heads around that idea, the sooner we'll be making better decisions. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Ainsley. Thank you, Mayor Tory. Um, I want to thank the, first and foremost, I want to thank all the deputants uh, that were here this morning. I want to thank the, the staff that uh, did their work on this. And I want to thank my colleagues in the wards uh, that represent this area. Um, I think that, you know, a few months ago, I had to go out to the West End and um, my staff were trying to figure out the best way for me to go because usually I take the GO train. I don't drive downtown. Um, it's easier for me to get the GO train from Eastern Scarborough. And my staff said, figure out a plan. They said, go down to King Street and take the subway out to the library branch where you have to go and it'll be great. And I was on the subway in the middle of the day and it was very congested. It was, in fact, it was so congested on a weekday, I was watching people on the sidewalk walk faster than I was taking the streetcar. And I think I'll support this pilot project. I think it's something that needs to be looked at. I think when we look at the amount of congestion in the downtown core and how it's affecting the city and gridlock, and you look at the volume of people that take this streetcar, 65,000 people a day, I think it was, compared to the 20,000 vehicles that are on this road. And I think we can do a much better job. Um, I understand the perspective of this morning of some of the couriers and the taxi cab companies were here, but I also, um, listening to staff and our colleagues, I think that they, they did an ex would, excellent um, consultation process. Not every consultation process, press, process is perfect. I've never seen one that's been described as perfect, but I think it was done very well, and I think a lot of people were involved, and they got the necessary um, information out there. Um, in terms of congestion, as I said, um, I'll, I'll look at Councillor Min and Wong's report, but I think that one of the reasons we're doing this is the roads are congested. I don't think that people are coming downtown. One of the excuses, excuses they're not coming downtown is because there's congestion. And I think we need to deal with that. And I'll be supporting this uh, pilot study. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ainsley. Councillor Barlow. Uh, very briefly, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I will be supporting the pilot project because I actually agree with the Deputy uh, Mayor. I think there is a congestion problem in our city. Uh, but because our city is also growing as well, the only way to deal with this congestion is actually to diversify and make it easier for everybody to get around the city. So we can't start uh, tearing down buildings to make roads uh, larger for cars to come in for the thousands of new residents. So we need to make sure that the cars that need to be on the road do it in a better way. We need to make sure that our public transportation is fast, efficient, gets thousands of people around. We need to make sure that people, if if people want to do, uh, uh, want to use other modes of transportation such as cycling, they have a safe and uh, and and easy way to get around as well. As well, so the most the the best way to actually deal with congestions is to ensure that if somebody gets on that streetcar, that if somebody needs to get downtown through the subway, that they know that they have the subway that they can get through, that they have that they get on the streetcar and they'll get there faster than than walking, so that more and more people actually opt to use that modes of transportation and at the same time motorists also have a better time and an easier time to get around if they choose so so I think that what what we're trying to uh, do here is to, to bring a balance I think it is extremely important that as we do this that we measure things and we are transparent on our measurements. And that is what I, I, I leave here, the request to our staff, because it is very important as we're putting these pilot projects through and as we we attempt to create a balance between all our road users that we bring forward this data. And that is why it's so important to have good data from the beginning, not only on King Street, but actually on all the other roads that are part of the pilot project. And that when the, once the pilot project is, is, is uh, through, that we come forward with that data because the data might even show that we need further action in other corridors as well. So I ask that staff be, be diligent on that and that uh, bring forward that, uh, that good data. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor Barlow. Uh, other speakers from the committee? 
Okay. You're going to speak, Council Pasternak? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks, staff, for their, their hard work uh, on the file. I do have a motion uh, regarding uh, taxis uh, that they receive uh, a, an exemption from the vehicle restrictions list. However, I understand the mayor may move a more omnibus motion a little later, which, which encompasses this, and therefore I'll, I'll withdraw it. Uh, but that being said, uh, with the amount of development uh, downtown, I am astounded that uh, the correction of this problem has not been funded through various negotiation of development applications. Um, I've seen uh, a number of them in Ward 10 where we have had private sector companies uh, put uh, proposals together and construct uh, right-hand turn lanes, public realm improvements, and other streetscape improvements. And I'm surprised that with all the dozens of applications approved with positive staff reports and with the local councillors that that is not fully funded through that. This is a very expensive venture uh, for a pilot project and this is why we're in the mess we're in. 1.5 million to start, a loss of $2 million in parking fees every year uh, as long as the program uh, project is going uh, with no uh, guarantee that this will solve uh, the problems. The report itself uh, admits that uh, streetcar service is unreliable, erratic, and unpredictable, and the removal of cars from this area will not, uh, will not solve that. This money taken from the uh, Public Transit Infrastructure Fund uh, is, um, this, these, those funds should be used for expansion of rapid transit. Many of the projects that we have approved at Council that are currently unfunded, we can tap into those funds for environmental assessments, for studies, for public consultations. It's not to be used for triage uh, projects like this. Uh, this is coming down to nothing more than corporate welfare, uh, where we are funding the, uh, the downtown developers through, through taxpayers' dollars. Uh, the people of Ward 10 have been waiting long for curb cuts, uh, for new sidewalks, for road repairs, and they too are worried about congestion and cut through traffic and speeding. Uh, in their various neighborhoods. Um, pilot projects always sound great on paper, but the reality is once you set them up, they are extremely difficult uh, to remove. And I think we'll be waking up a year from now, finding it extremely difficult to turn the clock back and fix what we have created. Therefore, I will not be supporting this. I will support motions to make sure the taxi industry is treated fairly should it go through. But I believe, I believe that this plan will not solve the problem of downtown congestion and that the dollars should be spent on expanding rapid transit, not on Band-Aid solutions. Thank you, uh, Councillor Pasternak. Councillor Shiner. Well, Mayor Tory, I do have a motion. And it's to ask the Parking Authority to report directly to Council on the impact of removing the parking spaces and some recommendations they may have. I think it's self-explanatory. I understand you have a motion uh, looking at regards to the taxis and abilities to put them through the pilot projects. I'll support that as well. Um, my problem with this is in my ward. My problem, really, I see this as a vision without a plan, not a plan with a vision. I see it because the downtown has developed out of our control because we don't have an official plan in place that controls it and we keep supporting development applications downtown, which are amendments to our official plan. And the first thing I was taught is, you have an official plan, which is the vision for the city, and then you have variances to the zoning to meet the official plan. But I keep seeing variances to the official plan so people don't really know what they should be building down there, and they compare it to everything else in the area. And because of it, we're having development going in places without community centers, without park places, without transit. And now we're trying to solve that by a test in a pilot project. But the pilot project, who when I asked, no one studied, no one's got any numbers on what the additional streets and how they're gonna handle it. Because Queen Street isn't much better, Dundas Street is a mess. The Adelaide and Richmond Street have been narrowed for bike lanes, traffic's horrendous down there. The, the numbers aren't here. It's like, well, we have a problem, let's try and fix it, the parking. 180 spaces, it's minimized. They turn 10 times a day. 10 times a day on an annual basis is 600,000 plus. 
visitors that use those 180 spaces. And as we heard from people representing the businesses in the area, almost 50% of the visitors to Mervish and the ancillary buildings come down by car. We haven't looked at other alternatives that may be there. And what's going to happen when we have a road closure like we had on the weekend? King's closed, Queen's closed, Dundas is a mess. So I don't believe proper thought has been given into this to deal with the congestion that's happening down there, which I understand what it is, and I do know the area. I grew up in the area very well, and I understand what's happening. But this is a 724 impact on a roadway that may not need a 724 impact that we're shutting it down, trying to create two little spots for taxis and a couple for, for drop off and pick up of, of supplies. And you think it's gonna work until the third person and the fourth wants to wait for that spot. And the streetcars are gonna be there blocked on the street. And if you look at the street, sometimes you ask, is it the car that's blocking up? Is it the car that's blocking up the traffic or is it the streetcar when it opens up its doors blocking off the cars? So I have a problem with this. And unfortunately, I can't support it because I don't think it's a full-fetched plan that we should go forward with. I think we could do better than what we have now, and I would support something better. But I can't support what's currently in front of us. Thank you, Councillor Shiner. Uh, who else do I have wanting to speak now? Uh, Councillor DiGiorgio. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, I, I do think there is some merit in, in undertaking um, a pilot project. Uh, I don't think that I don't like some of the information I hear, like uh, one of the uh, objectives of the pilot project is to remove more than 50% of the cars that are currently using King Street. And uh, as some people have indicated, those cars are going to end up somewhere else. And unless you know what the ultimate impact of those cars being uh, redistributed somewhere else, it's difficult to properly assess this particular um, pilot. So there are some unintended consequences that will develop. I think Councillor Shiner has indicated some things that are likely to happen. Um, I, I have concerns related to the uh, safety of cyclists. When we've got cars that are in, encouraged every block to be making right-hand turns, um, that it might impact the, the proper operation of the cyclists, um, uh, the cycle lanes on, on King Street. So I, I do think that uh, there is a need for a more comprehensive analysis and review to incorporate all the major stakeholders. Um, People have talked about, well, we need a balance. Well, the reality is this is not a balanced pilot. It is not a balanced, uh, a balanced pro, uh, pilot as it's anticipated. I think we need to monitor it rather than on an annual basis. We need to monitor it on a perhaps quarterly basis to try and make some cosmetic changes on a quarterly basis to, 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 to have things operate more, more fairly. I mean, just recently, I remember we brought in articulated streetcars on King Street. That was supposed to be the, the solution. You know, the articulated streetcars were going to be able to move a lot more people and whatnot. The reality is maybe they're, they're not moving a lot more people. Maybe we should uh, go back and take the articulated streetcars away since this is the panacea solution now. Um, and then the last comment I'll make is that, again, some people have indicated that, you know, Development has to be conditional on adequate infrastructure being in place. We don't keep allowing development to be approved without insisting that the infrastructure has to be in place to accommodate the development. So, and that's an under underlying problem that we need to, uh, to address. So I think this is kind of, um, it's got some under underlying problems that we need to deal with on a going forward basis. That said, I think we should uh, uh, proceed gingerly and I'd like to see the monitoring done on a more frequent basis than on an annual basis. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Giorgio. Other speakers? Committee. Okay, well, I would like to just uh, say a word, if I can just find my notes. Here we are. I have a motion uh, to put, uh, which will be uh, up on the screen, and it deals with uh, studying 
the taxi issue uh, in an open-minded kind of way and just looking at what we can do to be uh, try to be responsive to some of their concerns. Um, I want to begin, uh, like everybody else, by thanking the staff and thanking the public, including the deputants. Um, I think it's been a very extensive consultation with the two very large town halls and a lot of things in between. It's gone on for a long time. There are some improvements we can clearly make on our consultative process as evidenced by the discussion with the taxi industry uh, today, and I'm sure we can make those. I think I'll repeat something that has been said by a number of people in this room, it's been said by our own experts, and it's been said even by people you talk to who initially start off resistant uh, to the notion of a pilot project like this. I haven't found anybody yet who doesn't agree with the notion that King Street is not working in its present form. Everybody agrees with that. It's dysfunctional, and that means nothing is working. And to be candid, and it hasn't been much mentioned today, we've tried a lot of the traditional remedies with uh, changing signals and putting up those new LED uh, signs and stopping left turns and uh, broadening out the no stopping zones and so forth and so on. We've had the blitzes that uh, I've tried to help see initiated by our police service uh, on people parking at rush hour and so on. And I, I believe, as I've said before on other matters, that in a 21st century city, um, we simply have to be prepared to try things uh, to, to move us off the status quo and to take account of the fact that we have to move uh, people. And I think we have to place some priority on the mode of transportation that is moving the most people by far, by far. I mean, if it was a tie between cars and transit, it might be a different discussion, but it's not even close. And that doesn't mean you disregard uh, cars, it simply means you find something that as its first and foremost priority is going to move people better on public transportation. And the staff and, and the help with the help of the public have gone through a very thorough exercise of looking at the best way for a pilot that you could do that. And they've come up with this uh, one, uh, which now I think it's time for us to move forward and to try. And it does uh, the prioritization in a balanced way, but it prioritizes nonetheless. It does. There is no question place the first priority on public transportation. 65,000 people who get to and from where they're going every day on this mode of transportation compared to a much lesser number in other ways. Um, because it's a pilot, we can collect as much data as possible from transit, from business, from motorists, from cyclists, from taxis to assist us in making a final decision. And I am not one. Uh, who believes what Councillor Karajanis and others said, that once you put in the pilot project, that's it. Um, I very much believe that you do what you say you're going to do, which is you put it in, you see if it works, and if it doesn't work, you have the guts to take it out. It takes guts to put it in, it takes guts to take it out if it doesn't work, uh, also maybe it takes guts to leave it in if it does work, because you'll never get anything I've learned in a couple of years on this job that everybody agrees upon. But to do nothing, to me, um, would be the thing that would be irresponsible and we know the street doesn't work. We know the transit in which we've already invested a lot of money um, isn't working properly because people can walk faster than streetcars go along and that surely is not uh, a, a remedy for anything or nor is it an acceptable pattern. Uh, change is controversial, especially as I've discovered being here, change that has anything to do with moving people around. It's controversial, um, it can be difficult, um, but we will use a pilot so that we can see if we can get this right by this means, and if not, we'll go back to the drawing board and find something else. But I think we have to try this. I think it's the right thing to do, and I think that this motion I've moved addresses one area of consultation that wasn't as thorough as it might have been for reasons well catalogued already. So, um, on that note, are we ready then to call the questions on the? I'll, um Mr. Mayor, I'll withdraw my motion because yours seems to encapsulate it. Well, it leaves it wide open for the staff to come back with options that go all the way from yeah. one end to the other. So, so they'll decide. So do you have these in? Uh, oh, all those in favor of allowing Councillor Pasternak to withdraw his motion? Carried. Imposed? Carried. Okay. So uh, we will deal first with the aptly numbered motion number one. Um, and... Uh, Um, would this be taken as three different or as one? Uh, <clears throat> set? Want to have a vote on it separately? All right. No. Nope. So um, can we then have the vote on uh, clause number one uh, of uh, Councillor Men and Wong's motion? All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Uh, clause number two of Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Menon Wong's motion. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. And clause number three of Councillor Menon Wong's motion. All those in favor? Opposed? 
Oh, that's count, there's one just in favor again, please. Ever recorded. In favor, you want it recorded? Okay, record vote. On clause three by motion one by Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong. All those in favor, Councillor Crawford, Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Pasternak, Councillor Shiner. All those opposed, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bailao, Councillor Burnside, Mayor Tory. Clause three. Clause three of Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong's carries. Okay. Oh, sorry, Councillor DeGiorgi, I missed your vote. So, Councillor DeGiorgio, sorry, your vote was against? Uh, let's let's take the vote one more time to be clear. It's a recorded vote. On clause three of Deputy Mayor Minnan-Wong's motion, all those in favor, Councillor Crawford, Deputy Mayor Minnan-Wong, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Pasternak, Councillor Shiner, all those opposed, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bailao, Councillor Burnside, Councillor DiGiorgio, Mayor Tory. Clause three of Deputy Mayor's motion fails on a tie. Oof. All right, uh, then we have uh, motion number three. Uh, which is the motion from Councillor Shiner to do with the Parking Authority. Uh, all those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Uh, motion number four, which is my motion concerning the taxi industry and the study by our staff of some options there. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Uh, the clause, uh, the matter as amended, uh, all those in favour? Fine, recorded vote. On the item as amended, all those in favor, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bailo, Councillor Burnside, Councillor Crawford, Councillor DiGiorgio, Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong, Mayor Tory, Councillor uh, Palacio, all those opposed, Councillor Pasternak and, and Councillor Shiner. Item as amended carries. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to everybody for their time, including the deputants and the staff and, and uh, the councillors. So, uh, what I would like to do with your indulgence, ladies and gentlemen, we have one uh, deputant. Uh, on item 26.3, uh, Daryl uh, Villa and Daryl uh, needs uh, our. Uh, we all need help with uh, the, the signing uh, for him to make his deputation, and the signers uh, may not be available to us at the time when that matter would probably be expected to be considered. And so I thought uh, that 26.3, by the way, is the short-term rentals item, and I thought rather than have him excluded or sit here and find he gets to the time for his deputation and can't make it because there's no signer here for him, we would let him uh, make his deputation uh, now. Um, and so it's a bit out of order, but I think it's uh, called for in the circumstances. Is, is, is the committee willing to uh, accept that? All, all those in favor? Hearing the deputation now, thank you. So Mr. Villa, I guess what we'll do, uh, we'll have to have this sign, we'll, we'll have him Speak. You're probably accustomed to doing this, and then have the sign the signer interpret for us. That's correct. Is that fine? Yep. You'll have to turn your microphone on too. There. Check. Can you? Yep. Yes. Microphone's on. Mr. Villa is in the gray T-shirt yeah. here, and we're ready. I think we're ready to go. Yep. Mr. Mayor, can we just okay. make noisy here? Thank you very much. We're just trying to deal with this. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. My name is Daryl Villa, and I am a deaf individual and citizen of the city of Toronto, and just want to speak briefly on the Airbnb proposal. And one thing that's very relevant to me is the amount of barriers that I face as a deaf individual and the quality of life that this Airbnb, uh, Airbnb opportunity has changed. Uh, for us and for deaf individuals and the proposal that is before us today is something that is going to have a huge impact on me as a deaf individual and other disability disabled individuals who earn an income from this opportunity with Airbnb. Thank you. Well, maybe I could start uh, some questions because it would help us uh, to understand what impact it would have on you, negative or positive, it wasn't clear, it sounded negative, uh, of the changes that are being proposed by this uh, report. Well, what's one of the major concerns is, <clears throat> is if, um, if there is more restrictions to Airbnb, there's a lot of us that will not be, will not be uh, able to use the service or to be hosts anymore with some of the proposed changes. 
can you help us, uh, Mr. Villa, with which of the changes uh, would make it more difficult for somebody like yourself to be a host if you wish to do so? So there is uh, there is a proposed uh, limit of uh, reservations, and I'm not uh, I'm not an expert on any of, on any of the uh, dealings in public policy and so on. But I am seeing the impact on, uh, for example, the limit on reservations that we can take per month. And me being a disabled person, this is a primary source of income for me. Just because it will help us, uh, the restriction that said you could only do it in your own principal residence, is that a problem for you? Right now, that is not one of the problems. That is one of the uh, best things about uh, being, being with Airbnb is it is giving me a great opportunity to have to be able to create an income where I don't often have the opportunity to get a job as a disabled person. So some of the limitations are what create barriers with that. And what about the 28 day uh, short stay definition? Is that uh, causing a problem? Well, if it was only 28 days per year, that would be, create a, a huge problem, but currently it's okay. Okay. It's, so it's a bit difficult for me and maybe other members of the committee can bring this out better to determine what the concern is because we'd want to try to understand it. And there will be further public consultation if this recommendation passes. That's where it goes for further consultation. And it might be Mr. Villa could uh, take advantage of that opportunity to uh, to uh, put his concerns on the record at that time as well. Not a problem. Okay. Are there other members of the committee who wish to ask Mr. Villa some questions uh, while we have the signing available? Councillor de Bailo? Um, just uh, trying to understand as well the impact. So, do you usually rent uh, a room in your own house or how, how, how are you a host? Three rooms. Three, individually. Yes. So these regulations have no impact on you directly? Well, I'm not sure what the, what the exact changes of the, uh, of the proposal are, but what my, what my biggest concern is, if there's more limitations to being able to provide an Airbnb uh, room or residence as a host, is the impacts that it's going to have on disabled individuals in the city who use this as a source of income. Okay, thank you. Other members of the committee wishing to ask Mr. Villa questions? Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Villa, and uh, thank you for your signing as, thank you. as well. You're welcome, Mayor. Uh, we'll look forward to you participating in the further consultation that will come after today's uh, deliberations. Thank you. All right. Uh, we now go to item 26.2, which is the tenants first to phase one implementation. And again, we have a long list of people uh, to be heard. The rules will be the same uh, for the three minutes. And we will start with uh, Marcel Pereira. Pereira? Is that, sorry, I may have mispronounced that. If I have, I apologize. Is Marcel Pereira here or possibly committee in two. committee room two? If that's yeah, true, we'll... Eric, if you could give me one minute, we'll make sure that everyone tuned in. All right. Here. Thank you. Good Uh, Councillor Palacio has widely suggested I just indicate who the first five are. Marcel Pereira, who's here now, Alana Smith, Kisa Hamilton, Dr. Samir Sinha, and Ingrid Palmer. Those are the first five. If they happen to be in the other room, uh, they'll know their turn is coming up uh, relatively soon. So please go ahead. Three, you have three minutes based on our motion passed earlier this morning, and we thank you for being here. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Mayor Tory for um, taking provincial leaders on tours through TCHC buildings, drum up money for infrastructure repairs, in response to the lack of it in the last Ontario 
liberal budget. Only one leader, Andrea Horath in the NDP, pledged to give the full share of some $900 million, the requested three-way federal, provincial, and Toronto split. As anyone concerned about affordable housing, we must be advocates and fully support, campaign and elect those parties come election time when they support us and our best interests. What are our best interests? As members of SIT, Save Improve TCHC, we request no transfer to a seniors entity and nonprofit housing corporation in part or as a whole, which would mean almost 20% of TCHC units combining phase one and phase two. We would lose our economies of scale. It, from, according to the report, the economies of scale promised by such an am amalgamation have never been fully realized, mostly due to the age design and construction quality of some of the stock. That's a separate issue of funding for infrastructure repairs and nothing to do with the efficacy and principles of the economies of scale. In fact, this phase one report contradicts the June 24th, 2016 staff report, tenants first. The TCHC funding model is currently the least expensive RGI delivery model. And this is in spite of the inequity of city funding. Um, to reiterate, it doesn't make sense financially. The cost, there's, a la there's been a lack of transparency the cost of making this has not been revealed by the City of Toronto, but it will cost more than the centralized present TCHC entity. These extra costs should go towards infrastructure repairs and nothing less. Benefits of economies of scale. TCHC has a history of delivering non-landlord related services to tenants. Service delivery is neither a core function or a core competency of TCHC while it has responded to the expectations of boards, councils, and tenants. That's from the report of phase one. It is not specified, however, exactly what those non-landlord related services to tenants are, even though they met the expectation of the tenants. Uh, You're reaching the, the end of your time, sir, so if you could uh, wrap up. Uh, the size of TCHC appears to compromise the ability to specialize its services to any particular group, also from the report. I don't know what appears, but I know these facts. The 2016 report extolled the virtue of TCHC being the key central player in the city to revitalize neighborhoods. It created the Office of Commissioner of Housing and Equity. Accessibility issues have been addressed. We have participatory budgeting, apprenticeship programs, Actually, its size affords its, its flexibility, like reorganization of management models faster, better to help tenants. In fact, accountability in TCHC is not limited to one level of management, but that has oversights for tenants. Right. I, I'm, I'm going to have to stop you there. I've given you 45 extra seconds, and so we'll see if there are any questions uh, for you. Are you here as a separate deputy or just accompanying Mr. Pereira? I'm a second deputy. You're Alanis, uh, I'm sorry, Alanis Smith? Yeah. Uh, do you want to make your uh, submission now in addition to what Mr. Mr. Pereira said and then take questions together? Yeah. Is that what you'd like to do? Yes, thank you. All right, so you go ahead and do that then. Thank you very much. As a member of SIT, I am here to expand on our previous deputy, his special continuance. A non-profit entity for phase two. If the city continues to pursue implementing the 2016 report, consequences include losing the vigorous accountability, accountability like the city council approval of financial documents, tenants on the board of directors, oversight by the city ombudsman and auditor, and if any information survey or many nonprofits of the last ONPHA conference found that few had tenants there on the board of directors, one nonprofit manager even calling it a conflict of interest. 
as the 2016 report admits, once transfer, there would be little the city could be doing with repairs and unforeseen consequences that may arise due to transfer. A case at point, a group of residents at Scarborough Corp, a non-dissimilar model, uses the same accountability system from the Housing Service Act as non-profit use. Billing testified at a Human Rights Tribunal Ontario hearing on Monday, January 2015, saying they were targeted by anonymous, anonymous vulgar flyers. The residents allege the court boards of directors took too long to deal with their complaints about flyers which mock, among other things, their physical disabilities. Resident Deborah Gru and her partner Bill say it's been three years they fight to hear at their tribunal. They actually are listening now, she said, to their weakness. A similar incident had happened at my previous deputant here. It was immediately addressed by our property manager who proposed a notion outlining th that any violation of TCHC human rights code could not be tolerated and action would be swiftly taken. I go to number five. No. No. 30 seconds left, uh, Ms. Smith. It is. The non-profitable sub rent subsidy, no portable, no. portable housing benefits no, are unlikely. No portable. no portable housing benefits are unlikely to be no, unaffected. No. no portable rent subsidies. No portable rent subsidies. Portable housing benefits are unlikely to be effective to to locate TCH tenants to provide market housing or diversity incomes at TCH. There are apartments in the U.S. to prove market housing or diversity incomes. Shows a track record to uneven and fraud with pitfalls to justify replication. Here, number one recommendation coming out of a discussion with tenants including one member of the tenant for social housing Fred Victor and Dr. Emmanuel Paradise. All right, I have to ask you there, Miss. I'm sorry, Miss Smith, to to uh, to wrap up. Um, are there any questions of these deputies? Oh God, I forgot one thing. All right, seeing none, I will thank you both very much. Uh, I'm sorry the time is short, but we. Can have I just to... say one thing? Sure, briefly. Uh, I just want brief. to say one thing in conclusion, that we um, we demand a referendum vote by all tenants on this phase one and the entire tenant's first proposal with all the facts clearly laid out in the most transparent and countable process available. This is the truly democratic thing to do. As tenants, the largest stakeholder in TCHC, we want to determine our future, all right. decide how important that's, money is for repairing. That's duly, duly noted. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, next, we have uh, Kisa Hamilton, oh, Tenants Audrey. First Advisory Panel, along with Ingrid Palmer. I believe they want to appear together. and. Deka Noor, uh, Tenants First Advisory Panel. They have a video they'd like to show, and then we're just going to hold up the rest of it. Okay. And I understand there's a video you want to show. Is that set up to go? That I do not know, Chris. Good afternoon. Is the video coming first? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Executive Committees. Um, my name is Kisa Hamilton, and I'll be deputing today with members of the Tenant First Advisory Panel. Um, to my left is Ingrid Palmer, and to my, number five on the list, and to my right is um, Decker Deckener, number 23 on the list. We would like to combine our deputations today. Is that okay? I must say we are very pleased to be here today um, to present our report and to share with you our thoughts about the future of Toronto community housing. 
We have been working collaboratively um, for the, over the past six months, five months. Um, we've been meeting weekly. Um, we're very dedicated. And we've been meeting in workshop and meetings and with all the tenants to give our advice and feedback on the report that is before you today. Good afternoon. My name is Ingrid Palmer, and I am the community co-chair of the Inner City Advisory Committee and a member of the Enhancing Equity Task Force at the Toronto District School Board. In addition, I am a parent advocate leader with the um, Macaulay Center for Child Development and an advocate for persons with disabilities, special needs, and children in the child welfare system. I am very pleased to be able to address you this afternoon. My family and I live in a standalone house within the Toronto Community Housing Portfolio. And the beauty of being in a scattered home is that we are completely embedded in our community and our neighborhood. This universal housing model uh, nurtures inclusivity, removes stigma, and works against the creation of silos of poverty. For many Toronto community housing tenants, there is a very large social stigma of living in government housing, which has fed a culture, a long-standing culture of bias, discrimination, devaluation, and discrediting of tenants' concerns, uh, our voices, and also our lives. Now is a prime opportunity to prioritize social housing and to fund it accordingly. You find the money to fund the TTC, to fund the police, and to fund even the taking down of the gardener. The Holchansky report is coming to life with every passing day. When people who earn a livable wage are finding it difficult to afford the increases on their condos, when there is a mass grassroots protest taking place in Parkdale, this is evidence of the need for courageous leadership right now in the social housing sector and affordable housing. Mayor Tory and councillors, I want to appreciate and recognize the work that you have done so far in advancing the engagement of Toronto community housing residents. Uh, first, in the creation of the Mayor's Task Force, and secondly, in the creation of this panel. Uh, you have gone much further than any of your predecessors in recognizing the value of Toronto community housing to work collaboratively with us and to recognize us as key stakeholders. In all of our community consultations, we heard loud and clear from residents that engagement is working, it's valued, and there is a really high demand for more of it. You are on the cusp of being the first officials to make concrete and tangible change to the social housing sector, and we implore you and encourage you to bravely go forward to do more and to embrace the recommendations of this panel. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and committee member, members. My name is Dekka Noor, and I am a tenant leader and activist in the, East Mall, um, in the East Mall community in Etobicoke. I'm also a parent, and I'm currently in the International Development Studies program at York University. Mr. Mayor, my community is my home. It's a home to my children and my family and my neighbors. We hear often that TCHC does not have enough fundings. The city does not have enough fundings. The province does not have enough fundings. Mr. Mayor, we know that it will take a lot of fundings to fund both the operating and the capital needs of TCHC. We know that the province has not stepped up and the federal government has not assisted this is unfortunate, but as a city, you are our landlord. We ask you today to take a leadership and support the funding that TCHC needs to become a better landlord, to provide us with a quality housing that is safe and clean. Mr. Mayor, I join this panel because I want to be part of bringing those resources to Toronto community housing and making a sustainable housing system for the future. It's not just myself that wants to contribute. Tenants wanted to be involved. As a partners, we want opportunity to take leadership to make Toronto community housing a better place to live for all. Mr. Mayor and community members, we thank you for your time. There's a video we'd like to share with you with all the voices from our panel members.
Good morning, Mayor Tory and Executive Council. My name is John Corso, and I am a member of the Tenants First Advisory Panel, and I live here at 250 Davenport Road. Here are some of the voices of the panel members talking about what's important to them. For the first time, I think the city was actually looking at the housing of Toronto community housing as a whole, as a crisis, and realized that emphasis really needed to be put on Toronto community housing. Uh, what motivated me to become a member of the Tennis First panel was the opportunity to better my community. I think what tenants want to see, first thing, is maintenance. That the housing is better, that they have better housing, that they were able to reach their management easier and able to talk to the management, and that TCAT would listen to what they have to say, would actually listen and act upon what they say. We need more decentralization. We need to have those managers back in the communities where they know their tenants and the tenants know their One of the challenges that faces tenants living in scattered homes is a lack of representation on the operating units and the council. The dedicated seniors housing provider is a great thing. It takes it out of uh, a portfolio or a, a, a business model now and focus will be there for the seniors with knowledgeable and dedicated management at the top who are versed with dealing with seniors. I think that it definitely should be separate because the seniors needs are different from family needs. TCHC um, doesn't have enough funding to most of the time to make these problems fixed. And Toronto needs the province and the federal government to get back on board because we cannot do it alone. My hopes for the future of Toronto Community Housing is to see a better collaborative relationship between tenants and staff and city advisors. Things get done and not put on the burner. I want to see the changes now, not tomorrow, not next, now. Well, I'd like to live in a place with dignity, respect, and care. Going forward, my hope for the future is that TCHC would become a really great landlord. I'm going to say the word great landlord. Mr. Mayor and City Council, thank you for the opportunity to sit on this panel and share our voices. We hope you give your full support to Tenants First for Toronto Community Housing Tenants. Thank you very much. Uh, so you're open to questions now from uh, the members of uh, Council here? You were finished, we, yeah, we did um, nine minutes, I, so it's right on If I can times, have three. like one minute just to wrap up. Will you go I ahead and take that. just 30 seconds if you could. Okay, thank you. Um, so just in conclusion, I just want to really say that um, we're here to advocate for better quality homes and um, for our communities, for all tenants of Toronto Community Housing. Um, what we have learned is that we understand the importance of partnership and it's very important. Um, we, we've talked to many resident tenants and we continue to keep hearing, we wanna be engaged. We wanna be part of the conversation. We wanna be part of the decision-making processes. Um, you're gonna hear through many deputants, you know, um, the state of disrepair. It breaks my heart, and honestly, it breaks my heart today because I'm from a small community called Neptune, and there's a community called Foregrove who no, who no longer is a community because one day somebody, they wake up and realize that, hey, they no longer have a home, and they also no longer have a community because that was 134 units close. That is almost a similar size of my community, and I'm looking at you today, Mr. Mayor, and the council, I'm like, that could have been my community. And so this is what is happening today to our residents. We are being displaced, we are putting a strain on our housing, and we really need to step up. Not tomorrow, we need to do it today. So I'm asking all of you today is that you need to take the leadership. This is in your hands to take leadership, and we're holding you accountable for that. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you for uh, listening to us. Very much, Ms. Hamilton. All right, uh, questions uh, of, of starting with Councillor Cressy. Uh, well, thank you very much, Case Angrid and Decca. Just a couple very quick questions. So first of all, the Tenants First Advisory Panel, uh, how were you decided who were members of the panel? Because I, I recognize a number of faces in the screen. I mean, it's a, it's a big city. How were you decided? Who got to be on the panel? That's not a decision that we made. 
But was there a voting process and you put your names forward and a selection process? So there was a call out um, to residents, to, to tenants to be part of the panel. Um, I know they were interviewed by city staff and I think they used judgment of making sure that it's diverse. We are representing all over Toronto. Um, there's seniors, there's youths, they're in between like myself. And um, so just trying to make a diverse and cultural and especially geographic um, locations so that all tenants' voices as best as we can can represent on that panel. And housing types. Wonderful. Uh, in, there's a whole series of recommendations that staff have brought forward. The, the Tenants First Advisory Panel, are you supportive of, of the entire set of recommendations? Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. And can I ask in particular, just one of the recommendations, it's, it's number five in the report has to deal with scattered homes. Scattered homes, as we know, has been very contentious in the past. It's also critical in our neighborhoods, that housing stock. The recommendation here is to ensure that they're protected and improved through a partnership. Is that a recommendation? Can you explain why the Tenants First Advisory Panel recommended that approach? Because I know there were a lot of different moving parts on this recommendation. Um, so one of the things we've always heard about is that, and tenants have stand up and spoken very strongly about that, they're not for sale. Our lands, our public lands are not for sale. And so um, what, we do, what we do realize as well, um, they need to be protected. Yeah. And those are conversations we need, to, we need to look into and talk. But when we talk about partnership, we're not talking about selling our public lands. We're definitely not. So, so just so I'm clear um, that the Tenants First Advisory Panel is supportive of this recommendation on scattered homes because it will protect these homes. Exactly. Yes. Okay. For current and for future generations. Yeah. Perfect. Now, I understand. Thank you very much. Other questions of uh, these deputants? Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming today. I just note uh, the previous deputants were very worried about tenant engagement under Tenants First and under these recommendations. I've read them that the uh, kind of goal is to increase tenant participation in Toronto community housing. Have I read that right? Yes, you have. Yes. We have Why don't you each tell me a little bit about that part? Because that was concerned when I heard the tenants say, we're worried that we're uh, erasing tenants from the equation. So maybe Ingrid could start with. Uh, oh no, the Tenants First Advisory Panel uh, supports the increase of tenant engagement and the recognition of tenants as a key and very important stakeholder. Uh, it's very important. Residents made it clear in all of our community consultations that uh, engagement is working, that it is desired and that they want more of it. Uh, tenants want to be involved in making decisions about partnerships, about um, learning about how Toronto community housing works inside and out, and also sharing our lived experiences. It's not only important to um, understand from the city and uh, Toronto community housing staff viewpoint of what it takes to run um, such a, a, a massive organization as Toronto community housing, but it's also important for you to hear from us who have to live out the chosen solutions. It's important for us to have decision-making power and to be able to work collaboratively with you to ensure mutually beneficial outcomes. And would you hope that uh, your advisory panel could be maintained to continue to advise as this would be implemented? To make yes, sure it's being we hope right. for our panel to uh, be maintained. Uh, we also hope for it to be expanded and for there to be expanded ways in all levels for tenants to be engaged. And we also would hope and advise that, uh, that uh, tenants on the advisory panel are you know, are reviewed and that, um, that it changes so that tenants are, different tenants are able to come in and have uh, their voices heard. That's not something that is completely worked out, but we are definitely in support of the main tenants of the Tenants Advisory uh, Panel. Have, are you aware if there have been any large tenant forums over the last number of years where hundreds of tenants would be together in a, let's say, exhibition place to grapple with difficult issues? Has that been I, happening lately at Toronto Community Housing? I would defer to one of my colleagues to answer that question as this is my first involvement with Toronto okay. Community Housing. Um, actually, the reason I got involved uh, 
working with the tenants first advisory committees because of the problems that TCHC is having the lack of funding. Um, many of the, the residents uh, that live in TCHC, one, um, they run into issues. Um, they're always told that the city doesn't have enough funding. And I hear that all over again and again as a tenant rap, as a, as a, as a community activist, as a part of this, especially all across Otobico and in Toronto. Um, it was very amazing to see that people come out in townhouse meetings just to be involved and take part in where they live. Uh, what a better way to hear things, how, how they can be solved issues from a tenants that live in these communities, because these are communities, these are families, these are residents, um, seniors, and in neighbors, and for them to want to be um, volunteer and take part, that was one of the reasons. And um, last year, just having um, communities to come out just to voice out their concerns and make sure that these things are fixed and not carry into the future. So that was really um, one of the reasons why we're involved in this. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, other questions of uh, Councillor Davis? Um, thank you, I'm just over here. Sorry, um, could you wave or something? Over there. Yeah. Over, uh, oh, to there your you left. Yes, yes, she's here. Um, thank you very much for your deputation um, and for participating in this process. Uh, from reading it, it certainly looks as though you were very active for a period of time. Um, I wanted to ask, one of the um, findings um, that is in the report is that on-site management and having more direct <coughs> engagement with management was seen as a priority. And I wondered if you could comment on that and maybe even if there was advice on contracted services versus directly delivered management services. Did you want to take that one? Um, I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, well, at the moment, uh, if I give you an example of where in the East Mall area, we have, um, we have a contract that, that we have right now. So the issue with uh, many of the residents that, um, that we spoke to when we did all the meetings across the city is that um, the, the, the contractors have to go through stops comparing to when it's direct. And most of the time it was because of, again, it comes back to TCHC being underfunded. And, um, and, and it was, for many residents, it was very frustrating, the fact that things can be done, but it's not getting done because of the, the lack of, of the funding. And, um, and for example, uh, they had local offices getting closed because of that reason and it, it's happening and TCHC needs the support but again the city tells them we don't have enough funding the province is not stepping up the, f the federal government uh, for for many of the um, residents that's what fr fr the frustration comes is that we do live in uh, a modern um, uh, country and then to just to hear especially city like Toronto is one of the you know first class city so when our residents our neighbors hear that of, um, local offices are getting closed due to lack of funding a city of Toronto a big city like Toronto does not does not deserve to be neglected if I could just add to that, the importance of decentralization and of putting back um, offices back into the community is to bring back that relationship between uh, tenants and the staff. Uh, when we have operating units that are embedded right there in the community, the staff know the tenants, the tenants know the staff. There's a strong relationship there mm -hmm. um, and it, it builds trust, it builds a better uh, working relationship and uh, that model is, is very highly missed among our tenants where we feel closed off. Um, having the call center only option where a lot of our concerns are often neglected, 
are, um, you know, I've been told myself many times when I've called in that I didn't make the call, that there's no evidence of that. Uh, so having somebody uh, local to go to face-to-face uh, -face where you have that relationship and you build that type of working relationship uh, brings back the uh, personal uh, relationship back into the mix and where it brings back respect right. and it, it brings back um, just that, that ability to feel like um, like it's not a, a distant conglomerate way out, way out there that you have uh, no relationship with. I'm not sure if that was a really clear answer. I'm no, sorry. but you're, you're saying the decentralization. No, uh, Councillor Davis, I'm sorry, your time's up. Oh, yeah. okay. Thank you. Three minutes today. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, other questions of these deputants? All right, well, I will thank all three of you very much for being with us today and for answering questions, and uh, appreciate it and all of your involvement uh, in the whole process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very and much. for the video. Tell everybody we appreciated that. It got lots more people involved as well. Thank you very much. And I just give a big shout out to Councillor Vilo, who has really been a champion for us. We just want to <laughs> say we really appreciate it. Thank you. Here, here. All right. Dr. S Dr. Samir Sinha, Provincial Lead, Co-Chair, City of Toronto Senior Strategy Accountability Table. Good day. You're welcome here. We have three minutes for the presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Uh, I'm very happy to be here representing uh, both my role as the architect for the Government of Ontario Senior Strategy, um, working with the federal government on a national senior strategy, but also, as you heard, um, a co-chair of the City of Toronto's accountability table for the our City of Toronto Senior Strategy, unanimously passed by Council in 2013. Specifically, I want to speak to tenants first on the fact that we currently have a TCH entity that is struggling to meet the needs of its aging population. Um, and specifically, we have a system in place that's not working for low-income Torontonians living in the specific seniors' buildings, about 80 in number or so. These are not just places of housing, but they're often also becoming places of care and support. I have a number of patients in these um, buildings who not only receive you know, the housing supports, but they also do receive access to other services services like city homemaking services, but also access to new city services like community paramedicine supports, but also the falls and exercise classes that have been funded through the province as well. Uh, the challenge that we have is that we need a more focused and coordinated services, specifically to improve the quality of life for those low-income seniors who are not being well served under the current system. My second point is that a focused seniors housing provider, and you heard this in the video as well from a number of the tenants, which the city has oversight o over, um, could be going forward a cornerstone or part of a more streamlined service system and approach to the needs of older, uh, older Torontonians who are living within these buildings, including those who are not living in TCH seniors buildings um, and, uh, and really everybody who's older and requires services. We have a number of services that are serving seniors across the City of Toronto and across the city's divisions and agencies, such as the community paramedicine, funding for elderly person centres that comes from the province, property tax deferral services, snow shoveling, et cetera, et cetera. And to manage all of these needs in a one-stop integrated way could actually be better served if that was part and integrated with some of these services, um, such as represented by the 80 specific buildings um, that are encompassed in the uh, TCH entities for seniors. Finally, I believe that a new seniors entity within the city administration could not only serve older Torontonians in a more streamlined and coordinated way, it could also be a receptacle entity for other partnerships and other government programs and potentially receive new provincial or funding dollars for seniors housing and services like new senior centres that the province recently announced in their budget. Finally, as we know, provincial and federal governments are becoming more attuned to the needs of older adults, hence a lot of pandering and a lot of money that's coming forward that I'm helping to negotiate for. It becomes very hard for us to receive that funding when we don't have a clear entity to receive it. That's it for me. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sinha. Are there questions of the Deputy <laughs> Councillor Davis? Yeah. Um, thank you very much uh, for coming, Dr. Sinha. And it's, um, it was a pleasure to work with you at the beginning of the senior strategy. I wondered, um, as I read the recommendations in the report, it talked about a new and bold role um, to help integrate and coordinate senior services. Um, but I wondered if 
or how the City of Toronto could take on that broader jurisdiction of coordinating those services um, under new governance model if we did not have significant new funding to be able to do that? No, I think it's a very good question, uh, Councillor, and I think the, the, the way I would approach it is right now the City of Toronto is currently managing a whole host of services for seniors through various different agencies and that sometimes they don't communicate well to each other, there's overlapping and there's duplication of administrative services. I agree with you that I think if the City of Toronto did want to say, look, our long-term care homes, for example, which the City manages a number, um, these 80 buildings are so that they're already responsibility, they have the responsibility for managing, and the other host of services, if together we actually coordinated that, such as the City already does in the City of, Ch of Toronto's Children's Services, again, I think that not only could you create efficiencies, I'm not a big person about raising taxes, finding new services, but also I think the Mayor and the Councillors could go to the province and say, look, we have a coordinated service that's providing a whole raft of services, and if there is a need for new funding, and there is actually new funding coming down the pipeline, the problem is I don't know who to point it towards in the city when I'm not sure who's in charge. This, so children's service is very interesting. Children's services is the service system manager identified under statute as the and all of those functions were downloaded to municipalities some years ago. We've also had um, immigration and settlement tables that we've uh, coordinated. We've uh, tried to coordinate in the past uh, employment and uh, tables. Um, you're suggesting that we would actually be delegated or given authority for coordinating services for seniors. Um, no, I'm not actually asking us to take on new responsibilities from the province or the federal government. I'm saying that I think this could be a cornerstone of what the city is already doing to say, let's bring all of those services that we're currently actually responsible for, we're currently managing, maybe not in the most efficient way, and actually use this as an opportunity to better serve those older tenants in Toronto community housing and also combine a number of the other services together. I'm certainly not asking for more responsibility, I'm just saying by having actually better coordinated you know a, a better coordinated response at the level of what we're already doing what we're already taking the responsibility for I think we could better support everybody and the city could frankly use its dollars better to better support all of its constituents who are older mm -hmm. thank you Councillor Davis okay. uh, other questions for Dr. Sinha uh, Councillor Nunziata just on that point because I agree with you um, we the city now funds and we have a number of senior agencies where we fund deliver meals and snow links and all these other programs. So if the city can work with these agencies that we're funding to partner with, with uh, Toronto Housing in our senior buildings, that we could actually do more for our seniors in our buildings. Rather than create new services, we have existing services, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll give you a very quick example. Or yeah. So, you know, to respond, that's exactly it. For example, under our provincial senior strategy, we created funding for 2,000 new free exercise and falls, pre falls prevention classes. That's, uh, uh, so that was $10 million, 2,000 classes, a number of them being delivered in the city. The challenge we had is we have five local health integration networks that cut across our city, and we left it to them to then work with each of these different community agencies, 68 just in the Toronto Central region alone, to try and divvy these up, as opposed to saying, here's the money for these classes, city agency, you tell us how we equitably spread these services, and I could give countless other examples. Yeah, and actually the mayor took a tour in one of my buildings at Weston, 19, I have one building in, in, in my ward at Weston, is where we have a senior's agency that actually is a tenant on the main floor of our, our uh, building and they provide programming and services to seniors outside but unfortunately the seniors that live in the building do not have access to those programs so we can work with them uh, being a tenant we can work with them as far as the rent and try to work with them in delivering the services to the tenants that live actually in the building 
Ab absolutely, and I think I think the. I mean, there you find efficiencies. Yeah, and I think right? the I think the opportunity is right now. Every there's season. such disjointment of the services that are a funded directly through other forms of government that the city is actually responsible for. That I think again having one clear entity that again can can better support these individuals through tenants first, specifically who are asking to be seen, to be recognized, to be supported, but then also recognize that wait a minute, we're running all these other services and not necessarily in the best coordinated way for these individuals and others, I think it represents a great opportunity. Yeah. Do you not agree as well as that some of our senior buildings that were built years ago, seniors, and now they're they're mixed, you know, you have a portion of seniors and mixed, that we should really focus on bringing all these buildings back to seniors? Well, there are 83 specific buildings, I might be one number off there, but that are specifically only for um, older Torontonians. Of course, we have thousands of other tenants who are older, who are living in buildings, and some of those buildings, I can tell you, I was just in one of them the other week, it's just up on Young Street near College, it's a scary place. Mm -hmm. I really feel sorry for the tenants who live on the top of those floor, my patients, who live in fear of some of the younger tenants, who um, who partake in activities that make them live in fear and put them at harm, um, and it really is it, it really is put some of those individuals at disadvantage. I'm not against the idea of integration, but we also have to think about how do we protect vulnerable seniors in particular, and how do we have a range of options that make sense. But right now we have 83 buildings that are exclusively seniors only, but we have a number of other tenants in mixed buildings. Some of them work well, some of them don't. Yeah, I've been working on that for years. We thank you, I you agree. There, uh, thank you. Councillor, thank you, thank you. Uh, other questions of Dr. Sinha? All right, doctor, thank you very much for being with us today. We appreciate that. I'll just give you the next five now again. Clive Williams, Heather Wilberforce, Stephen Tingley, Mohammed Ahmed, and Leona Lowe. So those are the next five, and that would uh, bring us next to Clive Williams. Mr. Williams here. I guess we'll give him a minute to see if he comes. Yes, no, oh, there we are. Okay, Mr. Williams, you're up, sir. Can I ask Afternoon, uh, sir. Councillor Cressy's question about the. You can. You have three minutes. You can say whatever you wish, sir. Uh, I mean, aside from that, I've got. A, I got. I had 40 points. I've reduced them to about 14. Well, you have three minutes, so you deliver whatever points you uh, wish. And thank you. I'll answer your question. Maybe somebody will have a question for you as well. The mayor's task force was, uh, you asked for out-of-the-box thinking, you didn't get it. They refused to listen to out-of-the-box thinking, refused, for the whole year that they were in situ. I found that really offensive. Um, I wrote EX 11, EX 16111 last year this time which took me 12,000 hours of input to, 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 to put me in a position to write it, and it's comprehensive. It paints a picture of a whole new way of looking at Toronto community housing. The, fo the focus is wrong in this corporation. It's just that the focus of the executive is wrong. It's a cruel organization. It comes across to the tenants as cruel. It also is divisive amongst tenants because it, it sets up an elitist structure all over the place. It wants leaders, and most tenants don't want leaders. They want a voice of their own all the time, not just once a year or whenever. The, uh, we live in, we have a sort of a, 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 a 19th century modus under Purvis. It's a disaster. There is no free speech. There's no, there's no free communications amongst tenants without the corporation sticking its nose in through the uh, Strategic Communications Division. I'd like to know how many millions have been spent on bugger off and shut your mouth payments to senior executives over the last five years since Purvis has been in situ. How many millions? I would also like to, I would like to see some, the non-union workers given some assurance that they will in fact have benefits continued and, and, during this upset time. So the, there's all these people who are managing the union employees and they are insecure. The union employees are not insecure. I would like to see that uh, the, the social services be, it be impressed upon social services to increase the claw back to $300 from $100 to give people a bit of a window to climb out of so that they can maybe get their feet underneath them. That wouldn't cost you a dime. 
In fact, you'll probably put money into your coffers because they get productive instead of holding them down and, and holding them as less than. The tenant, the, the residents, the tenant resident, the tenant rep system is a one party system run by the landlord. Now, if that isn't pure communism, I don't know what is. It is not democratic, so therefore the corporation is in violation of the shareholder direction 9-1, which calls for a democratic system or similar. This is neither. Some of us find it quite offensive to have this system imposed on us by the corporation. There you go. Questions? No? All right. Uh, Mr. Um, Williams, we thank you very much for being here and for uh, sharing those thoughts with us. Heather Wilberforce, President, Winchester Parks Residents Association. We've come together. We are all on the list, but we've come as a delegation because we're all here to speak about the rooming houses. All right, we'll put those. Can you just help me with the, all the three names so I can... Um, Morgan Williams Morgan and Rick Harris. Keegan. I'm sorry. Morgan Harris, Rick Keegan. Well, there's Morgan Harris, okay, and Rick Keegan. At the bottom, very there we are. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, as you said, I'm the president of the Winchester Park Residents Association, and I've lived in my neighborhood in Ward 28 for 20 years. I'm here to speak for our 1,320 members. Our members are tenants of TCHC rooming houses and TCHC family housing, co-ops, persons who rent, business owners and homeowners, as well as parents of children attending our school. We are not a ratepayers association. I want to speak specifically to item number five <coughs> relative to the rooming houses. Over time, TCHC has demonstrated itself to be a callous and negligent landlord. It has ignored the needs of its vulnerable rooming house tenants in many respects, but particularly concerning its neglect for tenant safety and security. The conditions inside the buildings are beyond appalling. We have written many times about the conditions in these houses, and they have not improved. Windows are missing, there are holes in the walls, mold, water from bathrooms running on the hall floors, garbage in the halls unsecured handrails, used syringes and needles, and so, so, so much more. The places are filthy, and most of these conditions are caused by people who are not tenanted. TCHC has policies which at a practical level do not protect the vulnerable tenants living in the rooming houses, and instead they protect the predators living in the rooming houses, extending to them rights that the decent tenants who are our neighbors are not given and it forces them to accept living in appalling conditions. Most do not complain for fear of recrimination and because they do not have any other options. TCHC security appears to be virtually impotent to do anything meaningful about keeping those engaged in destructive and illegal behavior from preying on and intimidating vulnerable tenants. In some cases, tenants are afraid to stay in their units, which they pay for overnight and actually go to shelters. On many occasions, the bathrooms are occupied by customer addicts or prostitutes doing business, and tenants have to go to the service station or to Tim Hortons to use a toilet. There have been five fires that we are aware of that have damaged TCHC rooming house buildings and neighboring properties, and that have forced tenants who have lived long-term in our community to be relocated. There is continuing predatory behavior which neighbors have also witnessed, and neighbors who have reached out to vulnerable tenants in these situations have faced intimidation from the perpetrators of the violence, and I am one of those neighbors. The landlord's response to all of this is to take the offenders to the landlord-tenant tribunal, cumbersome and ineffective at best, since the predators manage to rehouse themselves by taking over the units of vulnerable tenants or becoming retenanted. Arrests result in a return of predators after only a few days. The problems in these TCHC rooming houses are systemic. 
The rooming houses need to be managed by agencies or, or organizations other than TCHC, which have the experience of working with vulnerable people and which are able to provide effective security policies and services. The effect on tenants and the neighborhood has been profound. At the center of our area is the Winchester Park Elementary and Junior School. Children have witnessed police takedowns while playing in the schoolyard, witnessed the police shooting death of a dangerous pit bull owned by a resident drug dealer, and the playground has been previously closed because it became unsafe. Unsafe because of the needles and used drug paraphernalia and human excrement left by the customers of the dealers. We have witnessed individuals leaving rooming house addresses where drugs have been sold, collapse on the sidewalk from overdoses. Walk up Parliament Street any time of the day and you can witness two or three drug deals being done within a time frame of just a few minutes by people who come out of the Parliament Street rooming houses. 41 Rows has become an active drug distribution centre and all of this and all of the other rooming houses are affected too. Neighbours of this particular address are afraid to allow their children out to play. Some of us have been witness to brutal beatings on multiple occasions in the front of rooming house properties. And this past week, a vulnerable tenant had his unit broken into. He was robbed of his wallet, his only cash, until the end of the month, and he was stabbed. Many of the tenants in these rooming houses are long-term residents of our neighbourhood. They are people whom we are pleased to call our neighbours. We support the City's plan under Item 5 to seek other interested parties such as not-for-profits, co-ops or land trusts which could take these beautiful heritage buildings we're at the, which are at the centre of our community and restore safety and security for the sake of tenants and neighbours as the longer-term solution. However, this is at a minimum 18 to 24 months away from realisation. And in the short term, as in this moment, we need immediate focused solutions which address the needs of the tenants and the community for real safety and security. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Okay, well, I'll go next. Uh, Morgan Harris. I'm submitting this deputation as a current tenant of Toronto Community Housing who has lived in a rooming house operated by TCHC. As a director of a nonprofit in the mental health sector, a member of the board advisory at Housing Connections and a volunteer with a local food bank in my neighborhood, I'm familiar with the daily challenges facing poor and vulnerable people in finding and keeping safe and affordable housing. I know many who are living in rooming houses operated by TCHC in Cabbage Town. I have witnessed ongoing criminal activity in the house where I lived, which was reported to TCHC and the police, a house which you visited, Mr. Mayor. As a volunteer, I meet with tenants of rooming houses operated by TCHC every week. Current tenants of TCHC have reported to me personally events of ongoing violence, drug dealing, prostitution, trespassing, criminal damage to properties where they live. These tenants must contend with threats to their safety posed by violent criminals and their associates, street addicts, sex workers, transients using the rooming houses as casual accommodation. The conditions in the houses are often unsanitary and unsafe. Access to the properties is weakly controlled or not controlled at all. Many of these tenants are vulnerable people in need immediate relief of their living conditions. With regard to tenants first phase one report, I recommend the council adopt the report and the recommendations for immediate implementation specifically with reference to Section 3A, a revised tenant-focused delivery model, 3B, improve integration and accountability, Section 5, request for expressions of interest to non-profit co-op and land trusts for the operation of 684 scattered housing properties, Section 6A, local service model pilot program with local action plans, and Section 6B, rooming house revitalization projects. Uh, as I mentioned, the rooming houses in the portfolio require urgent attention for the safety and security of the tenants, and the surrounding community, the physical conditions in some houses could be described as slums. Many incidents of ongoing problems with crime, violence, intimidation of tenants, and criminal damage to properties have been reported. Short-term action plans are needed for the immediate relief of tenants living in the rooming houses in Cabbage Town, South St. Jamestown. Therefore, immediate adoption of the recommendations to Council is advised. Long-term strategy should be the transfer of rooming houses to non-profits, co-ops, or land trusts. 
I will actively and locally manage the properties with the intention of improving the lives of current tenants and providing affordable, decent, safe housing options for those in need. Thank you. Uh, what do I do? Push this? It's on, it's on, it's on. There you go. Uh, my name is uh, Rick Keegan, <clears throat> and I'm a resident of a Toronto community housing rooming house. And I'd like to say a few things about my experiences there. I've abridged my thing as much as I can. I'll do the best I can to come in under the wire. I believe in the law. The law isn't just about punishment. It's, it's wisdom and guidance. It's meant to be the best we can do in order that we may escape the worst. The law has been absent from TCHC properties. There is no one guiding anything. The lowest of the low set the standards. The law has something in its eye. It would be a base ingratitude for me to pretend it was inevitable, this degraded jungle-like situation, when I can see with my own eyes it is the absence of the law making our troubles inevitable. So I want to describe living in a TCHC building. In order to do that, I have to say some shocking things. I don't do this out of a desire to shock. I know from my own experience before TCHC that I would have been unprepared to accept the simple statement that conditions in TCHC buildings are deplorable. Just words. You can't smell them. They don't make you want to cringe or vomit. Those words don't make you lose sleep. It's the guy busting into the room next door with a hammer that makes you lose sleep. It's the guy above you who drinks Listerine then spends, spends hours smashing his room to pieces every day. It's the front door being booted in every few minutes because a proper working lock and a proper locking door cannot be envisaged. Conditions aren't deplorable. It's the fact that the drug dealer whom the door busters are visiting can't be evicted. Conditions aren't deplorable. Blood smeared all over a, vac a bathroom by a junkie is deplorable. Used syringes, used condoms, drug kits, blood, vomit, spit, name a body fluid, these are deplorable. When you have to skid on them on your way out of, in or out of your room. Someone finding the bathroom occupied and squatting on the kitchen floor is deplorable. Having to check your peephole before you dare open your door. Having to develop peripheral vision so you can check both ends of a hallway before you enter it having to hard stare the ominous looking strangers constantly lurking about, having to constantly be probed and prodded by advantage takers, these are deplorable. Conditions is an abstraction. You can't be robbed by it or slip on it or bump up against it and wonder if you've become infected. What we have is this. The worst offenders in society, the ones society can't handle, have become the direct responsibility of those least able to deal with them. That's us, the tenants. And we also have this, a tendency on the part of authority toward a deceitful retreat in the face of this wrongdoing. It's a hard thing to have to put it so blatantly, but if you strip away all the abstractions, which I also refer to as public relations, this is the situation at ground zero. No amount of effort touches the problem. All of the most furious and expensive activity is going on at a level that simply does not touch the problem on the ground. A lot gets done, but nothing gets accomplished. We are, just, we are just as under siege and unprotected as we were at the beginning. It's very much as though no one can bring themselves to look directly at the problem. If a troublemaker won't respond to requests to tone it down, we're stuck with it. That's the end of intervention. Other than reportedly accumulating a case file, that is the end of intervention. And despite avidly reassuring the suffering tenant that a process is underway, one never really is. The process of a pair of shrugged shoulders. After that, the bully is emboldened, freed of what restraint he might have had. Tenants are effectively goaded into conflict and put into jeopardy by the refusal of an authority to engage further. You're on your own, sorry as loutish and brutish behavior becomes more extreme and more coddled, it is the unstated policy to ignore the 95% of tenants who are decent neighbors suffering under the dictatorship of the 5%. The main fix is timely interventions, timely evictions, a trustworthy process that can actually deal with troublemakers, or to put it more succinctly, consequences. And ultimately, for our authorities here to rebirth the expectation among all tenants that we can trust the law to be in effect here. No one believes that now. They'd be fools. We have now signs all over the property declaring that there is no tolerance for certain illegal activities. That declaration is false. All of those activities are, in fact, tolerated. How can we reverse just, this trend? I'll ask you if you could take maybe one. I've, I've given you four extra minutes. If you could just take one more minute and. Okay, yeah, I'm up. just about finished. Thank okay. you. So, okay, I'll just skip right to the end. Uh, basically, I think, I think this is hopeless. 
I think our chances are hopeless. We can't possibly fix this. Nobody cares about this underdog. We've had years of trying, being patronized, but ultimately ignored, overlooked, PR'd, blind-eyed, but maybe we have an underdog's chance. Sometimes you just gotta like the underdog. Can we now have something returned to us? The simple, almost childlike expectation that the law protects all, and the assurance, genuine this time, because we get plenty that aren't, that we aren't, that we, the forgotten majority, aren't sentenced to live in someone else's nightmare. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I wish I, but we have so many people waiting to be heard, and I did give you four extra minutes because I thought it was very important we hear you, in particular, uh, about all of you. Thank you. Um, we have some questions, uh, including myself, but uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Deputy Mayor McConnell. Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, this is my community, and I'm really proud of the work that they've done. So my question to you is, earlier this morning, um, we we're moving forward with the Margaret's Initiative, which will look at one set of houses. Um, you've been very supportive of that. Um, do you see that as a model for us moving quickly into some of the other houses to get a similar sort of arrangement? Yes, I do. And I do. And you have been working, we've all been working together in a working group and under Chris Brillinger's brilliance, we're now more formalized, Mr. Mayor. Um, do you think that this might be a model uh, for other communities uh, besides, besides South St. James Town? I, I absolutely, I can't see any reason why I would not. Right, and would you say that there is almost unanimous support uh, from a community that, say, two years ago was in total um, uh, disbelief about how we could manage this? Well, two years ago, um, all we wanted was uh, closure. Yes. Uh, because, you know, circumstances were so terrible, and they're not really better, but we do feel some hopefulness at yes. this point. Yes, yes. Uh, so, yes. And would you say that rooming houses are perhaps the most difficult um, living arrangements for people with the most severe um, of the um, of the challenges and of the um, um, of the vulnerabilities. I think they are very difficult um, because um, I mean, having lived in the neighborhood and knowing so many of of my neighbors in the rooming houses, many of these individuals live very privately within yes. the rooming house. Uh, they don't even know each other from building to building to building yes. to building next door, and they don't socialize. Many are uh, quite reclusive, and so, uh, yes, their needs are special. Yeah. And, and I agree with you. And I thank all of you for bringing the voices forward, and Mr. Mayor, for you visiting uh, this particular thing. I, I hope that we're finding a framework that will work for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there other... Uh, Persons with willing, if not, I, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, it can be any, to any one of the three of you. First of all, I wanted to follow along on the questions of uh, Deputy Mayor McConnell because I was concerned after all the time, frankly, that we've put into, and I say we, including myself and Deputy Mayor McConnell, that there wasn't any mention made of the efforts that have been made on Winchester, um, where I think, again, maybe you're jaded because of all the time that it's gone on, but I think we've made more progress. And, and just to, to make sure that you did think that was a model that was worth pursuing there and other places. Uh, secondly, related to that, um, that uh, you'll, I hope you'll understand uh, that um, when it comes to making those kinds of changes, there are all kinds of rules we have to comply with in terms of procurement of the agency to be the partner and this kind of thing. We can't just go out and make the change, unfortunately, because I would have done it the day after I was first there. But I want to make sure that you, you did, in fact, see it as a model that was worth replicating, which I think is the intent of Recommendation 5 in this report. And, and a lot of it, I think, frankly, came out of the experience we've heard, especially from Mr. Keegan, um, about what's going on there. And I saw it with my own eyes, and Deputy Mayor McConnell's seen it more than once. I've been more than once, too. But you think that model's I, potentially I, workable, I and that you understand works. it does take a little bit of time in terms of actually then picking the agency and going through the process of getting that approved in the public domain. Yes, we have to choose the right agencies for the neighbourhood. Um, as far as the Winchester properties are concerned, there are still problems there. 
Those properties um, are partially vacant now, but they're not completely, and there's still lots of problems in those properties. So Margaret's is not there. Um, you know, that, uh, as you have pointed out, there are problems with the funding and, and all of the procurements. It does take time. So there's no shovel in the ground, and we're told there won't be one until the earliest March of next year. So. Um, there won't be occupancy with Margaret's and, and uh, the women that they expect to, to house there until I would say at the earliest late, late 2019. But we think, we think on the whole, the neighborhood is supportive of this model and we think it's, it's doable and workable. That probably leads to my second and final question which was uh, to do with the law. And I trust, I hope, that you are aware of the efforts we're making as a city, and in fact it's written about in the Toronto Sun today, um, to get the laws changed so as to, for example, to address one of the examples I think you both mentioned, which was people, I forget the word you used, but going back into the same housing mm -hmm. they were put out of after they've been uh, engaged in or convict, even convicted of behavior that would be such mm -hmm. as to get them evicted, but they end up having the right to go back in. Um, and we're trying to get the law changed and quite frankly um, we get dismissed so far by the Minister of Housing and my question is have you have you taken any steps to be in touch with your provincial MPP to ask them to respond to our request to change the law? We uh, have. We wrote directly to our MPP, Mr. Mur Minister Murray. Well if you could make sure you had, you said you had 1,200, there's nothing like 1,200 letters to get right. the attention of any elected official and if there's 1,198 more uh, letters that could come, I can assure you that will help us because right now uh, what we get are these kind of uh, baffle gab uh, explanations of how it really isn't the way we think it is and you know how it is because you said it and that's how we think it is and that's why we thought and the whole city council passed the resolution asking for the law to be changed so we would really appreciate any support you could give. We did send out a letter to our membership and ask them to uh, either sign it and mail it or sign it and email it. Uh, directly. So I don't know how many responses there were sent, but it was something that people were uh, very uh, concerned about. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Keegan, did you want to say a word on that? Yes, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't ascribe to this notion that the law is uh, insufficient. I mean, in some cases it is, but such laws as we have now are not being enforced. We're not having uh, security confront people that come on the property. They see known perpetrators, they just turn a blind eye, let them walk right past. It's either too much trouble, it's too much paperwork, or they're afraid that they're going to, you know, they're going to push too hard. They're, they're, most of the security I've talked to, and I've talked to a lot of them, they're all petrified that they're going to push too hard and get in trouble. There's no will, there's no, there's no savvy on the part of uh, of our security forces. There's a, uh, there, there's a cat and mouse game going on, and the mice are like miles and miles ahead of the cats. The the the, th the thing is. If, if there's no will to enforce the laws that we have now, where's the will coming from to enforce the new laws? You know? uh, it's not an occasion for, I'm supposed to be asking you questions, but I'll just respond by saying to you that the laws sometimes are inadequate in the sense that those security guards can be told, well, I'm a guest of so-and-so inside the rooming house, and we then, the, the, the landlord, Toronto Community Housing, has no legal right to... I know, but that's rubbish, that that's rubbish. I've seen, and I've that's seen not a guy cleaning out a, a, a person's room known to security and security standing there watching him saying well the guy told us he was a guest the guy told them he was a guest okay not anyway. the guest i <laughs> understand wasn't even around fully understand that's okay. why we've asked for a change in the law i thank all three of you very much for your time today it was very enlightening for us thank you very thank much you. thank you mr mayor next is stephen tingley Hello, Mr. Tingley. Hello, Mayor. Thank you for uh, coming. Three minutes. Yes, thank you for having me. My name is Stephen Tingley. Uh, I've been selected as a tenant co-chair of the communications work group at the age of 29 for Toronto Community Housing. I also was a community animator, uh, tenant, uh, youth tenant rep. I also sit on the Charter of Rights Committee for Toronto Housing. Uh, I just want to say back, back then I thought I was going to make a real difference, and I did. But I'm here to tell you that TCAC does not put tenants first. In recent months I saw a number of resi residents screaming out and crying for help. 
for construction workers going into their units while they're showering, being harassed in the, the privacy of their own home, and also having my next door neighbors ha uh, have their place breaking into to have their gold rings and more stolen, but no force entry. I've seen residents uh, in my building come out of the ma mail room with a master key. Uh, I've also seen a superintendent with another resident holding my friend's arm at 3.30 in the morning, leading him out, out of his, his building. I have been misjudged. I, I used to work and sit on a number of committees for Toronto Community ha Housing, but, but move a drug dealer in beside me, while it makes it extremely hard to maintain uh, sobriety and, uh, as a recovering addict. From fights to screaming in the hallway at nights, drugs, weapons uh, that I've seen and heard about at 250 Davenport Road since this construction has started. The disrespect to tenants is out of control. Three years ago in my, our building was, a, was great and people got along besides the deteriorating infrastructure of the building. There was a but, buddy, but, budding uh, sense of community. A virus has come in and affected our operation of daily life and enjoyment. Social programming uh, has been reduced to everything for seniors in our community. A small group of residents thinking that they're the only, it, uh, thinking only of their, their issues paddling commu community. When, the, when they became seniors, or for when they become seniors, have played a key role in stonewalling other pr programs for youth, new immigrants, and so social services uh, programming for mental health and addiction. In closing, I feel this is a great uh, disservice to community and TCHC facilitating these select few and their hidden agenda with the Tenant First uh, Advisory Committee. Uh, guaranteeing their, their uh, coming comfort, or comfort as seniors in the next few years. Social justice is based on needs for all, uh, not just uh, those who presume others are unworthy. Looking at census reports for, for, of seniors to workers in the workforce, these trends are social injust uh, of social injustice is why five and a half seniors to every ca Canadian labor la laborer or laborer in in the workplace. Thank you, sir. There, I'll have to stop you there. Yeah. Uh, it's three thirty now, three forty-five. Uh, questions of the deputy? All right. Uh, yes, so, Councillor Bailo. Uh, I was just wondering if you had an opportunity to read the attachment on the report on the decentralization pilot projects, which actually talks about the program with youth and the neighborhood planning and so on, and if you could give us some feedback on that. Uh, from what, what I understand, um, the way I see it, it should be broken up into three parts, youth, transition, and seniors. Uh, kind of like more of a transitional intervention program where all residents of Toronto Housing is kind of uh, assessed and placed in their, their category. So part of the report that we're approving today, the decentralization talks about that. There's a, a plan to have uh, three pilot projects and one is actually to do a plan with youth mm -hmm. and another one to do a plan with the neighbourhood. Yeah, okay. okay. Thanks. Other questions uh, of Mr. Tingley? All right, Mr. Tingley, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Mohammed Ahmed. Mohammed Ahmed. All right, we'll just see if Mr. Ahmed appears, but otherwise we can go to Leona Lowe. Hello, Ms. Lowe. Thank you for joining us. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Leona, I'm from Ward 28. I'm happy to be here this afternoon. This afternoon I got some good news, so um, I'm gonna just blur this out. Um, some, some, 
some samples of the things that need fixing in our building. Um, the water pipes are clogged up very badly, and the floors from unit water coming up from um, different areas are now being looked into. So I don't need to go through the whole process because it's been taken care of. So the super told me this afternoon, so I'm going to skip that. Also, there's also another another one I want I want to bring up. I support I suppose recommendations to have a strategy to ensure there is a common standard between housing and transfers. The RGI units, the TCH needs more money to keep buildings in good repairs. The city could ensure that uh, housing receives the same amount of money as a nonprofit. Do who are. Uh, managed by RGI units. Otherwise, you know, and, uh, other ways to do that would be to raise the amount of money I receive on my shelter allowance through ODSP or Canada Pension or whatever. Then TCC would receive much money to keep up with the high demands of maintenance. I can't. The city can't raise my shelter. The city can raise my shelter allowance directly, but it could cost, call on the provincial to do that. The other issue is the other one is one other issue is a transfer. How can a trans, how can the tenants have their voice heard on transfers? I've been waiting 12 years for a transfer. That's just too long. I've been offered and I haven't been offered anything, and I'm still 44 on the waiting list. The waiting list needs to be done in a way so people get better service. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lowe. Uh, are there questions of Ms. Lowe? Again, you know we are embarked on sort of looking at the entire waiting list and trying to figure out how to make it work better. And I think there actually are some, uh, some uh, discoveries being made to something that hasn't been looked at for a long time and so we're trying to make it both in respect of filling vacancies and also transfers. So I hope there'll be some light at the end of that tunnel. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Ms. Lowe. Uh, Mr. Chris, I, I believe it'd be Mr. Chris Sprosky or Ms. Mr. Chris Sprosky. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. I represent the downtown core, one of the main units of TCHC that seems to be the predominant problem holder for TCHC at Sherburn and Dundas at the Dan Harrison Community Complex. And even though I'm a tenant rep, I don't want to talk as a tenant rep today. I would like to talk as a Canadian. In my experience, due to trauma as a child and moving down to Texas, I wound up in a Texas prison for 16 years. And I have to say that as a Canadian living here in Toronto, that Dan Harrison is less safe than a Texas prison. There's less accountability. There's less professionalism. And while all of you sit here and negotiate amongst yourselves and do these various things, day to day people are dying. They're overdosing. They're being raped. They're being assaulted. And assaulted amongst those people that are being raped and assaulted, you have children and families of the most marginal, marginalized <laughs> groups that don't even feel like they have a voice. And endemically, Dan Harrison has done nothing but produce misery over and over again. And TCHC has stepped in the way of the efforts of tenants and various NGOs that have come in to help that neighborhood by putting up consistent roadblocks. And whether it's security actually becomes effective because tenants advocated for four security guards at night, two to provide as concierge and two to go around as patrol, TCHC cut the funding for that. And as soon as that happened, fire alarms went up, violence went up. We even had a, t a non tenant who was thrown off the fifth floor just three weeks ago, right there by the playground. The playground that's strewn with crack pipes, syringes, use condom, where it's also been the place where people have been raped and physically assaulted. Three years ago, children were out on that very same playground and were witness to a drug dealer being shot by another drug dealer. And TCHC's own employee, Steve Marshall, when the city offered help to come in there and deal with the people that were traumatized, Steve Marshall said, no, they don't need any help there. And unfortunately, TCHC, which is a landlord, has been handed a portfolio which in effect is a mental health institution with no regulation, no supervision, 
and endemic violence. And I think the city needs to step up and push the province to come in and respond. I think we need an inquiry as to how come for 40 years this corner has been allowed to sit there and perpetuate violence and misery upon the most poorest in our society, regardless of their color, regardless of their orientation, because this is the end result of what the endeavor of City of Toronto has done for the poorest people. So I don't know what you can do with that as far as solutions. I know Fred Victor is stepping in the wings, and there's an employee there who is engaged in uh, transition from homeless into housing, engaging in the best practice. It, but my belief is, and everything I've seen from TCHC, that it's pretty much a dog and pony show. Make it look like something's being done, bleed off cash and revenue, give some people some tokens and some sandwiches, and at the end of the day, the decision's already been manufactured before the voices are even heard. Well, thank you for that very candid uh, assessment. Are there questions for members of the committee? Councillor McMahon, did you have a question? No. Uh, you, you did have a question? No. I, I, I would just, sorry. Oh, Councillor Fletcher, I'm sorry. Uh, have you been able to come out to any of the, any of the uh, meetings or anything that have happened around the tenants first and been able to speak about this? After three different engagements, one was a uh, poverty reduction strategy. Um, I went to, there was two consultations, one at John Ennis and then the one at 519, and then I went out to another one uh, that was supervised by Senator Eagleton. Then I became engaged in the reprogramming of tenant engagement, and the facilitators of that program were at best inept and it was basically a day daycare program for adults. There was no ability to sit there to get any concrete solutions to anything. It was, it was remedial at best. So are you telling us that uh, there are a large number of vulnerable people living at this particular address that you know, have many types of problems and you don't feel that there's a mechanism a good mechanism or a good way they're being dealt with as people that are have special issues? I would say this, every individual that steps up in that community and does what we would think would be good and compassionate winds up suffering the cost, whether it's police, whether it's security, whether it's TCHC officials, that there is a force in effect that is against any solution taking place. And I would argue that there are people that literally feast on the misery of others because it's profitable because it always guarantees you need more police presence, you need more EMS, you need more harm reduction kits left on people's front porches. And because people are milking that cow and milking that misery, the poor have become a resource for this city. Thank you. Are there other questions? I have a couple, but I just wanna make sure there's no one else. Uh, back uh, on the report itself, and it talks about um, taking some steps to decentralize, uh, starting with the seniors' buildings, but I think the objective of that is actually to, to you know, to have a management that, of these individual buildings or groups of buildings that get closer to the problems that you identified. Do you think that's going to be, I mean, this is the, what we heard uh, from the people we asked in the exercise that led, to, led us to today. Do you think that is going to be helpful in terms of this uh, attitude or this approach that you... I would say after reviewing some of the city homes materials before the amalgamation, that when the amalgamation took place as far as social housing in the city, the elements of corruption and incompetence were then just masked in a greater organization. And I don't see how breaking down incompetence and corruption into a smaller fiefdom is gonna solve the problem because there is still no accountability and transparency in the city. In, in my own personal experience, there is a provisional budget component within TCHC in which tenants advocate for changes in their neighborhood. And because we had problems with addicts coming on the front porch or sex workers implying their trade where families lived, we advocated for a fence. We did a pilot program with one house. It has a locked gate at the front. And as soon as we did that, there weren't piles of trash sitting on the front wall sitting on the front porch with rats scavenging through it because after everybody leaves, that was what's left behind. So we went through the process with management locally. It was very effective. We, we did the whole estimation. And then when the budget was approved, 
the contractor would come back the previous, did the previous work the summer for an extra $10,000 was going to do the exact same thing, which was sand, paint, and grind the fences. And I will say this, and I will say it frankly, I threatened him and told him that if he began work on the fences doing that, I was gonna flatten his tires. If it weren't for the fact that I advocated and pushed and said that this, this was taking place, my name had been signed off on it, and it was corruption, the tide would have never turned. We now have fences on Sherburn Street that protect the front porches of the houses where the families live. But unfortunately, even after six months of completion, we still don't even have locks on two of the doors. And, and that, that's just one example. It's been consistent. When something is done on the local level and tenants engage, as soon as it gets up to 931, some, somebody in the middle always screws it up. And, it, and it's too consistent to be just an accident. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Browski, very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Robert Fredrickson. Hello, Mr. Fredrickson. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Three minutes, sir. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for this opportunity to speak, and I'm going to be brief. I was involved in the mayor's task force. I've been involved in all these consultations, and I want to say that I fully support all the recommendations in this report and the timelines attached to them. But I would like to make a few other suggestions. Take the net, this new housing entity, all steps have to be taken to make sure this new housing provider succeeds. And I give an example, you know, building audits, make sure they're not strapped with backlog of repairs like Toronto Community Housing was. Second, to consider the expansion of the Office of Commissioner Housing Equities role to cover the seniors that are now covered by TCHC that will be with the new housing provider. And the tenants be included in all consultations in implementation of all the ongoing process. That's it. Thank you very much. Are there questions of uh, Mr. Fredrickson? Uh, Councillor Fletcher? Uh, yes. Hello. Uh, that the Office of uh, the uh, Commissioner of Housing Equity, uh, you're worried that that role wouldn't travel over with the new position. And well, there's still going to be tenants seniors in Toronto Community Housing, so I think that role has to expand to cover all of them. And that that role in particular has to do with ensuring people aren't evicted for non-payment of rent, and that came out of the Al Gosling investigation, and just poor administration leading to uh, evictions and to protect the tenants, particularly the elderly. So exactly. if there's a transfer of the seniors' units, you want to make sure that the seniors are well protected. Yes. You feel that that role is working very well now? Yes. You, yes. Why? Uh, because they are keeping people housed. And they've, made all, they've recovered money for TCH and they're into all kinds of repayment agreements for people that are <coughs> suffering from arrears, and I think it's been successful. So it's a successful office, mm -hmm. and the, do you, do they, does that person have the ability to reach in, or do they have to have staff refer? Well, right uh, now, the files have to be referred by the staff, and I'd like to see that changed a bit, too. Like the, so that somebody that is, is in danger of going, being evicted or even threatened to be evicted or losing their subsidy, they should be able to call the, how, the office directly. And they're not allowed to right now. So if you know, know somebody that needs help, you're not allowed to 
uh, call on their behalf or engage that person. It has to come through staff as a last resort. Yes. And you'd like to see that changed. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Fletcher. Like Thank you very that. much, uh, Mr. Fredrickson. Appreciate your time. Anita Dressler. Hello, Ms. Dressler. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. You have three minutes. Thank you. Mayor Tory, members of this committee. My name is Sunita Dressler. I'm a tenant at one of your better senior buildings. I'm also a tenant rep and the co-chair of Seniors Voice, an advocacy group for tenants. I respectfully submit my deputation. Oh my, what are we going to do with these people called seniors? Are we going to stay with the archaic thinking of TCHC or are we going to be progressive? Seniors of today are very, very different than seniors of yesteryear. We do not sit on the front porch waiting for our children and our grandchildren to visit. We are independent, outgoing. We bring a wealth of experience from work volunteer, street smarts, cultural, education, and everyday living. We have been there, done that, and sit in amazement why the younger generations do not see the big picture. Staff want to direct us and lead us like doddery old fools. We certainly are not. We challenge and we want transparency and accountability. In my opinion, TCHC has not been able to manage the chore. They put up barriers to engagement. Staff get upset when challenged and, or that the seniors show their independence. But please note, there are staff at TCHC, such as the Chief Operating Officer or some of the VPs and some of the managers that really excel at what they do. I recommend that the senior portfolio be a department or a division of the City of Toronto, much like the TTC or Metro Licensing, where you have an advisory board speaking up for tenants, much like ACAT, or a tribunal to deal with issues affecting seniors, much like Metro Licensing dealing with licensees. This is the time to identify and create a new system, one that introduces healthy living, transportation, safety and security, quality of life and engagement programs that are actually geared to seniors. We might not have a lot of money, most of us live on small pensions, and the social detriments of health as per numerous studies including St. Michael's Hospital, but we do have the knowledge and the get up and go to make a real difference. I'm closing, I would like to thank staff senior strategy and Councillor Josh Matlow, the Senior Advocate, for their hard work and visions for the future. Also, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to present my deputation. Thank you. Second short of three minutes, Ms. Dressler. That's very no, good. Hey. Thank you very much. <laughs> I try to make it short. Uh, are there questions of Ms. Dressler? Yes, uh, Councillor Fletcher. I, I just w was interested when you said, you know, the TTC uh, has a board that seems to be more aligned with the city. Uh, they do meet here at City Hall. Do you yes, think do. maybe the Toronto Community Housing Board of Directors should meet here at City Hall and that would seem more as if it was uh, tied closer to the city in many ways? I would like to see TCHC have something similar to an advisory committee where you pick possibly 15 tenants that are really advocates and people that have been proven to go out of their way, not just nitpick about the little stuff, but actually go out of their way to make a change, to make a difference, to cooperate with staff, and to um, be able to make positive, constructive suggestions, along with certain management staff. I think if they had that type of executive board or advisory board, it would uh, benefit TCHC, because at the present time, tenants talk, tenants complain, and all of you have heard these stories today, but staff sit there on certain staff. Some staff are excellent. But certain staff, especially with residential engagement, they have a feeling that if they don't lead the tenant, then the tenant will not know what to do. Right. They don't give the tenant the opportunity. So that's why I'm suggesting an advisory type of board. So you think tenants are 
Uh, there's a lot of good tenants, a lot of smart tenants, and they certainly, given their own space, can be of great assistance in, in showing the way. Well, I've been very fortunate. Um, being co-chair of Seniors Voice, I've had the opportunity to work uh, in cooperation with a lot of senior management. And I can honestly say that I get a lot of cooperation back. But I also have a positive view and I also give constructive suggestions. I don't expect them to accept everything, but at least we talk. In most cases, senior um, tenants talk and the staff say, I don't want to hear you. Or my old saying is, you hear us, but you don't listen. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, oh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Pasternak. Thanks very much uh, for coming in, Anita. Do you have any further insights into what's before us today in changing the governance model and operational model for TCHC and quite, taking taking the seniors' portfolio and and putting them in? Quite frankly, I think that TCHC is too big to handle right now. How it is? Um, if you wanted to. Well, I suggested go to the city or some division that has its own board, its own managers, that strictly deals with senior issues. Senior issues are very different than dealing with kids or adults. Um, seniors need more support, uh, support services. Um, they need uh, more counseling. They need people that will listen. Um, that's the biggest thing with senior portfolio. Nobody listens. And let's face it, a lot of seniors outlive their families, outlive their friends, and they need that human contact that they could give their history, they could give such valuable information to have a good, positive structure for housing. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor DiGiorgio. Just a very quick question. I was interested in your comment about we listen, sorry, we hear, but we don't listen. Th That's does right. that mean, if I may, does that mean that we hear what you're saying, but we're not able to implement some of the suggestions that you're putting forward? I find that depending on the manager, just like depending on the counselor or anyone else, you hear what we say and you walk away with it. And 20 minutes later, if I walked up to you and said, um, what was discussed, you would turn around and say, a whole bunch of things, you know, there's some complaints about this, some complaints about that, but you wouldn't be able to tell me. The excellent staff that I referred to before actually come back. They answer your phone calls, they answer your emails, they give um, suggestions and timelines, and they tell you when things can't be done or if it has to be moved to the next year. So those are the people that I consider are really listening to the real story. I've watched this committee on television, et cetera, and there are numerous people that you're really listening. You uh, really relate to what's happening. You relate to what's happening in the city. But unfortunately, like I said, many of the staff have been taught the old doctrine where um, we know better, we have the education, we don't want to hear what your education, your work experience or anything is. I know better, I can lead you. Okay, just uh, as a supplementary, Mr. Mayor. So the essence of what I hear you're saying is that there, you, you appreciate when someone has some empathy and, and mm -hmm. regard for some of the concerns that you put forward. Mm -hmm. And I can remember the people that came here when we were, try, we were looking to shut down some units in the Fir Grove community. The fact was that they said people didn't, we did not understand the kind of turmoil that would be involved in their having to relocate and they really wanted us to appreciate or be more empathetic with their needs. They weren't opposed to perhaps being relocated. Right. They just felt, and I think that's what you're, you're conveying yes. to me, not opposed to, uh, but you just want some more empathy from people. And to I try. think that, especially with seniors, because they have so much experience, they want to know that when you say you're going to do something, you do it, not 10 years from now. Yeah. because they won't be around <laughs> you know like i've seen so many cases what if it's not doable has, within the next that's year right. what if somebody it's not has doable pleaded for a medical transfer for an example and they say okay you'll be moved within five years tell a 93 year old that you'll be moved within five years okay. it doesn't work you know thank you that type of thing any other questions of mr essler 
Thank you very much for Thank you for your time. Uh, Jean Stevenson, Executive Director, Madison Community Services. Jean Stevenson? Not here. Has left? Not, not here? Okay. Uh, Joy Connolly. Just again, the next five, Joy Connolly, Sean Mahar, Kira Hynek, Brian Oliver, Al White. Those are the next five. And, and you are? I'm Kira Hynek, actually, and Joy Connolly and Sean Mahar have graciously allowed me to go first as I have to leave to make another appointment. Are, you are? Kira Hynek. Oh, fine. Perfect. Thank you. Is that okay with Yep, committee? sure. If that's okay with them, it's okay it with me. Yes, thank you. Okay, it's only going to be okay with them? All right. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Our deputation has also been tabled with the clerk, so I'm sure you'll all get a copy. My name is Kira Hynek. I'm the executive lead at the Toronto Alliance to End Homelessness. Our alliance includes over 100 members working to end chronic and episodic homelessness in our city, and we're also your city's community advisory board on housing and homelessness issues. We've worked productively and effectively with members of council and city staff, developing over the last two years an increasingly respectful and trusted relationship. You may have seen the Toronto for All Public Education campaign focusing on anti-NIMBYism that we produced in partnership with you just recently. We know that council wants to continue to make progress towards ending homelessness. We also know that you know that homelessness in Toronto remains a critical problem. In this trying context, we recognize the important role that the Toronto Community Housing Corporation plays. TCHC houses many of the city's most vulnerable and marginalized people, including those that would otherwise be homeless. Therefore, we are pleased to see in this report before you today, which we urge you to support, that the emphasis is on a systems-wide approach to social housing in Toronto. As you know, our municipality is the service system manager for housing. This means that the city's plan for meeting the diverse housing needs of its residents, including the, for those that face homelessness, must include not only the TCHC, but also the approximately other 30,000 public and co-op uh, nonprofit units in the sector. The TAH strongly supports the vision in both today's report and in the Eggleton Task Force report that the city take full advantage of its power as service system manager and set strategic directions and secure enough sustainable resources to fund its entire local system. We support the role of, and recognize the role, the needed role of other orders of government, and we will work with the city to do our part to keep this a priority in front of them. We will also harness our large and citywide network to support city action as the frontline funder to invest more significantly in social housing itself or to raise property taxes in order to meet this need. In particular, we have support of two recommendations uh, in the report before you today. Number five speaks to the scattered housing portfolio. We applaud the report's acknowledgement that these houses are and must continue to be a vital component of an affordable housing stock kept in the public realm. And we strongly support staff's recommendations to transfer operations of this stock to the nonprofit, co-op and land trust sectors. Almost 700 public properties with over 1,000 units in them are at stake. And this stock supports Toronto's commitment to inclusive communities and they're also, no doubt, part of the strategies to fight poverty and exclusion in this city. The houses are also ideal for families, and as we know, with family shelters being at 100%, this is an area that we are in particular need of meeting. Ms. Heineck, you said you had one more point, and I'm sorry your time is up, but I'd like you to maybe just make your other point you said you had to make, and then I have to call it to a close. There may be questions for you. Thank you, sir. Yes, the next recommendation that we support is recommendation number six. And we believe that a decentralized approach to community development and local action plans is part of a strategic systems focused approach and speaks to the importance of continuing to create strong local partnerships to meet the needs of our most vulnerable in the city, including those that would otherwise be homeless. I will leave it at that. I have many examples as well that I'm happy to share if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Are there questions for Ms. Heineck? Well, maybe on the second one, could you just help us, because I'm interested in that, the sort of decentralized delivery of consolidated mm -hmm. alcohol services, those are my words, but could you just give us an example of something there where you think we could uh, do better and does the report seem to speak to speak to you in terms of what you think we should be doing? Thank you. 
Um, yes, we know that about 30% of the stock is often um, vacant, largely bachelor units, either because of um, issues with the waiting list and, and centralization of waiting list uh, processes or because of state of repair. Um, we have examples within our own um, membership, uh, one being Covenant House, which I'm sure you're familiar with. They have currently are in agreement with the TCHC to access bachelor units for youth and they wrap services around these kids to support their transition. This has been considered to be very successful. Gordon Ridge is the name of the uh, project and it's working very well. So we'd strongly support looking at what works well in those arrangements and scaling them up. Um, another example is actually um, a sort of innovative idea that has come across our tables, which is, and we've approached TCHC about this uh, very informally to date, but really just in the process of doing that, and we're hoping that this report is an opportunity to take us to the next step, which is that we have agencies uh, in our membership that serve folks with uh, high support needs, people who are currently in the shelters, and they have capital reserve dollars that they're willing to bring to the table with TCHTC to repair some of these units so they can, uh, in exchange, house folks that they're working with in the shelter system. Excuse me. <clears throat> so those would be two examples, and, and um, if time had allowed, I would have stressed our strong uh, recommendation that we use this opportunity to look at those kinds of innovative ideas, um, those that are focused on systems change again, where we have opportunities to do things differently uh, with the same resources we have now. Thank you. I hope you bring most of the attention of some of the maybe individual members of the board even, because it just would help if sometimes they get lost in the they do. ideas. Yeah. They right. do, and we're a pretty new alliance and, and just um, sort of forming our own leadership team and, uh, and our own recommendations. But as I said, we have uh, plans in place to take this idea to the TC. Thank you, because both those ideas sound very good to me. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much again, Ms. Henrik. Sorry we're short of time today, but we just have a lot of people wanting to be heard. Now, that would bring us back on the list to Joy Connolly or Sean Mahar. I'm sorry? Sean here? Okay. Uh, is Joy, Joy is not here? Okay, well, Joy, Joy is next. On the, I mean, it just that doesn't matter, but the list, that's what it provides for. No problem. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Thank you. In three minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of recommendation number five, to issue an REOI to operate TCHC's scattered unit houses. It's really an idea that's been brewing since 2001, when the Ontario Housing Corporation and the federally funded City Home transferred the houses to TCHC. It was a free gift to TCHC, but one TCHC never really knew quite what to do with, simply because the houses didn't quite fit with the rest of TCHC's portfolio. Starting around 2006, TCHC hired consultants, moved the houses around administratively, hired more consultants, transferred 20 to Wigwaman, an Aboriginal housing provider who managed 200 houses of their own. And then 2010, new TCHC board. In 2011, TCHC declares these houses non-strategic, a $40.5 million liability losing TCHC $6.4 million per year, sell the lot. Massive protest, tenants, civil society, three former mayors rise up, enter Councillor Balao and the putting people first strategy. A total 158 houses will be sold and TCHC is asked to investigate transferring the rest to nonprofits, co-ops and land trusts. The selling part happens, 140 sold, 18 to go, but as for the rest, nothing happens until now. Today, you have an opportunity to take the lead, to preserve and protect these homes, to ensure that never again will tenants have to worry every time there's an election that their houses will be sold out from under them, and to create the stability needed to invest in these houses. So why am I so confident that the recommendation before you is the right solution? because the past six years tells us what happens 
when TCHC's houses are transferred and when they are sold. So let's start with the houses that were sold. TCHC folded the proceeds into the operating budgets to do repairs. Now the houses are gone, the money is gone, TCHC's repairs backlog has grown, not shrunk, and now that TCHC no longer has this one-time money to plug their operating gap, they're back where they started. And what happened to TCHC's houses after they were sold? Among those sold between 2011 and 2013, before Toronto's real estate market exploded, 68% were flipped for an average $286,000 more than what TCHC got. The typical flip rate for houses sold in Toronto, it's 7%. And what about the 20 houses transferred to Iguaman back in 2010? Those houses were not in good shape. Many were vacant. Today, fully renovated, fully occupied, fully affordable, not only breaking even, but generating their own capital reserves to keep them in good shape in perpetuity. This is the solution that Toronto needs. This recommendation from city staff is the way to get there. I urge you to adopt this recommendation and once and for all to create stability and opportunity for the tenants who live there now and for the next generation in mixed income neighborhoods where everyone belongs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Connolly. Are there uh, questions for the deputy? Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Yes, uh, thank you, Joy. Um, you had mentioned of the ones that were sold. It's my understanding that many of these homes have three, four, and even five bedrooms. They're um, a housing configuration that we're not building too much of. Is that what you understand? Absolutely. Um, the stats before the sales were 82% were three bedroom. The rest were four and five. And that is, no one's building that stuff this day, today, uh, in apartments even. Um, they're absolutely vital for families, for immigrants, for just larger families, absolutely essential to the city. And those units that were lost, 140 and that's times three, let's say 420 bedrooms, have they been replaced? I thought that was one of the things that was supposed to happen, that those would be replaced. So 420 new bedrooms been built to replace the ones that were sold? Um, I don't know of that happening. Uh, certainly some tenants, some were vacant, others were relocated. Um, but in terms of new housing being built of the similar size, I don't know of anyone that's been well, built. Well, you've lost 420 bedrooms by selling. It could well be. So one would think that they would have to be replaced. So I'll, I'll ask that, whether or not uh, those were replaced. And the 20 that went to Wigwaman, uh, Wigwaman, tell me what that is again. It's an Aboriginal housing, housing provider. provider. That's right. So they own over 600 units. Um, across um, Toronto, um, of those 214 are standalone houses. It's sort of a specialty with them. They also have seniors housing as well. And they have made that work. <coughs> Absolutely. They've taken those, so it can work, and it can work for tenants, is what you're saying. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Fletcher. Any other questions for Ms. Connolly? Oh, Councillor Bailon. Thank you, Joy, for your presentation. Um, we know that uh, we also have co-ops that operate these homes. I mean, this is not a new model that we're actually uh, putting forward. We know that they're out there, they've proven to be successful. We just want to make sure that these 684 are actually available through agencies or co-ops. And, uh, and if you could talk a little bit about this land trust issue. So I know it's a lot of questions in one question. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, it's true. There is a, there's a, a group forming, and I, I should say that I am involved with that group. Um, and their idea is to create a community land trust, a non-profit corporation, for the purpose of, um, taking, uh, of protecting and preserving these houses, to invest in them, to bring them up in condition, to good condition, and keep them in good condition, and then partner with existing nonprofit organizations that specialize in scattered unit housing management, because it is kind of a specialty, um, and, um, and then and engage tenants, both in opportunities, such as the opportunity 
to, um, I mean, bringing these homes to good condition is a real investment. It will involve refinancing, but it frees up money that can actually be used for employment opportunities for tenants, um, and then also to just engage tenants in the overall uh, management of the housing. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Bailo. Uh, any other questions for, for Ms. Connolly? Thank you very much for being here today. Much appreciated. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sean Mahar. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the committee. Appreciate the opportunity to come forward uh, to talk to you today. My name is Sean Maher. I'm the Executive Director of Social Planning Toronto, which is a uh, evidence-based charitable organization that does public policy reform and research. And I want to start by thanking council and city staff for a strong report on a very tough file that does credit to uh, the public service. Uh, this is not an easy uh, topic to examine and to examine well even more difficult and I think we have a, a really terrific piece of work in front of us. I also want to compliment Council on the process that led to it, uh, an equally valuable process with a discussion that was thoughtful and deliberate, that explored all kinds of ideas, good, bad and in between, and then engaged staff in a careful analysis of the evidence to examine them. That's how we get to good public policy and I really appreciate um, the way that has played out here. Um, over the last several months, we at Social Planning Toronto have been convening stakeholders in the housing sector to understand uh, their impressions of the challenge that's in front of us and to explore the scope of the issues and the range of opinions on those issues. And their views are pretty clear. They see a lot of very positive ideas um, in this report and a good reason to move ahead with this report. They also note that the devil is in the details and I want to share that view. This is a terrific report with exciting ideas and we're eager to see the next steps in clarifying the implementation and the next round of work addressing the issues that this report points to. I want to speak to a few um, key points in the report. The first is about seniors housing. There certainly is an enormous pool of evidence that suggests that integrating care and housing together for seniors makes a lot of sense. That continuum of care tends to be beneficial and working on the assumption that we need to move from one form of housing to another to shift types of care tends not to work out. So the engagement of all segments of the seniors housing and care um, service delivery is advantageous. Notwithstanding that, there are challenges in that field. Um, isolation of seniors is a challenge. Intergenerational engagement of seniors is a challenge and we'll need thoughtful ways to address that. Um, these transitions require real investment and we will need ways to address that. And governance matters in seniors care. Um, Dr. Joel Lection participated in some of our forums and brought the international evidence that shows very clearly that moving from public sector operation to private sector operation in seniors care is strongly associated with declining investment in service and declining health outcomes and so we need to be very careful about the governance. On a similar topic, the scattered houses, as Joy mentioned before, have been a perennial topic of debate here. It is nice to see this report not wade back into yet another round of exploring whether or not it turns out to be a good public policy to take a quick buck to lose very valuable components of our housing infrastructure and to recognize that transferring those um, to co-ops or land trusts or nonprofits could potentially end that debate and move us into a more productive conversation. I do want to flag again, the devil being in the details, that an REOI that considers the development of a business plan for operation of that housing is not the whole package. Clear, long-term commitments to ownership uh, and to the, the uh, continued function of those houses in um, the affordable housing stock is a necessary component both of resolving that issue and in attracting any nonprofit or co-op or land trust I will um, in engaging in that process. I will stop you there because we're 30 seconds over your time okay. and uh, we'll see if there's any questions. Maybe somebody will ask me about portable housing benefits since I didn't get to them. Uh, <laughs> oh. I wasn't going to ask you about that. I was going to ask you what you just said. Uh, should we transfer those to an entity that would be operating housing in a, as Ms. Connolly said, it's a particular type of operation. It's not a big apartment, it's a specialty. Uh, would you want to see that whatever entity it is can't just get rid of all of those and yeah. build something else? Is 
There are a lot of tools that can serve council in, in this area. Um, there are covenants, there are 99-year um, leases, there are all kinds of tools that we can use to make sure that those houses stay in the service of affordable housing in Toronto. Um, retained ownership with long leases, transfers with covenants, all kinds of things can do that. But, but it is really clear that if, if council is to achieve the goal laid out in the report, that's a missing component. We really do need that long-term commitment. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Thank uh, other you, questions of uh, uh, Councillor Perks? So I have two questions for you. The yeah. first is, what do you want me to ask you? <laughs> um, I, I would like to make a quick comment about portable housing benefits if you choose you to please? ask me about it, Councillor Perks. Go. Oh, oh, sorry. I, um, it's not a part of the report, but it is a part of the appendices, and I think it's it's been a part of the research in this area, and we're publishing a paper on it shortly. Um, the the whole idea of portable housing benefits as a way to sort of diffuse public housing and move people from existing social housing units into other kinds of, of affordable housing um, has a surface appeal. Its track record is not great. Um, its track record strongly indicates that though portable housing benefits are genuinely beneficial to address things like people on the waiting list, uh, women in VAW shelters, and if they're long-term stable adequate benefits, um, they can have a really positive role to play there. Um, moving people out of social housing using portable housing benefits has pr proven very unsuccessful in the United States, especially in the HOPE 6 applications. It doesn't create a single extra unit of affordable housing. It doesn't move anybody off the waiting list. It uses up public resources, and it tends to have an adverse effect on the portfolio as a whole. So though it is not in the recommendations, it remains in the appendices, and I encourage Council to step away from this perennially unsuccessful strategy. Thank you. You said you had two questions, but they've been done, have they? Right. <laughs> I'm taking yes for an answer here, so. All right. Uh, Mr. Mahar, thank you very much. Appreciate your coming here. Uh, the next five, uh, Brian Oliver, Al White, Enzo Flacco, Janja Zapatowski, and Sherry, uh, Sherry Williams. So Brian Oliver would be up next. Is Mr. Oliver here? Are you Mr. Oliver? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All the next three of us are actually from the same organization. So. Brian Oliver, Al White, and Enzo Flacco? So you're going to appear together, okay? Thank you very much. Over to you. Um, hi, my name is Brian. Um, I'm on behalf of Sound Times, which is a mental health organization. Um, we are we have about 2,400 members that, that are, are part of our organization. Um, many of which, well, all of which have uh, mental health concerns and a lot of them aren't able, able to articulate uh, the problems that they have within the buildings, whether it be rooming houses or the buildings themselves. And there's been a number, a growing number of concerns uh, regarding health, safety, violence. Um, and there's a number of situations where a lot of our clients are fear fearful of even leaving their homes due to the increase of violence and, and safety concerns. And so, um, oh, sorry, I'm nervous. Um, so yeah, I was just wondering how, how we can make uh, Toronto community housing more accountable, uh, uh, treating them as a smaller landlord, if there were the, these kind of concerns, how, how do we hold Toronto, to Toronto community housing the same, same way we would hold a smaller landlord? If there was these, these kinds of concerns, then there would be a lot more, there should be a lot more accountability. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I need to say. Yeah, hi. Hmm. My name is Andrew Polacco. I'm here also on behalf hmm. of Sound Times. Sound Times, um, I became a member a long time ago, and um, they really helped me out. I had nowhere to go. I had uh, very little prospects, and they changed my life around. So for me, um, it means a lot to speak for them. Um, it's made from 2,400 members, like he said. And the main thing there is it's safe to go there. And you basically are safe from dealers, you're safe from the crime on the streets, and you're safe from most, most other uh, uh, things that you can run into when you are homeless or when you have a problem. Um, I found that 
their, the workers do generally really do care, care about the people that come in. So you, if you want help, that's the place to go. Now, as far as getting help and finding a place to live, they're the, they're the professionals, they're the ones really with that I wish would have come today on my behalf and speak also. Um, but they did a great job for me and I, that's all I really, I'm, I've got to say for myself. Uh, as far as um, sometimes they're, they're probably one of the best uh, um, uh, services downtown that I, that I come across, period. And I've been to them all. I've, I've stayed at all, almost all of them. Um, I found them to be one of the best, period. And uh, thank you for listening. <clears throat> Cool. Um, my name is actually Tim, um, and we had a lot of consultations with people who wouldn't normally be consulted through the Sound Times uh, model. Uh, we talked to a lot of different people, and they identified things like safety, but they also identified things like their windows were locked in their buildings, which is actually dangerous in the summer. When you're scared to go out, uh, you know, hydration for seniors, but also for, for everyone is, is a real concern. Um, so we, I guess some of our recommendations are uh, <clears throat> more inspections and community education will improve safety in buildings. Uh, and one of the things that come out of our experience is getting help and giving help as, as peers is the benefit of having support workers going into buildings, bringing their personal expertise from their own experiences. Uh, peer workers can, can make buildings safer because they have a different approach. They work with clients rather than dictating or uh, trying to act as the police. Yeah. Uh, we're really focusing on building communities. I think we've heard a lot about uh, that importance. Uh, one of the, so the focus was rooming house uh, tenants being represented on those committees. Uh, and also tenants uh, bringing experiences and expertise into the contracting process. So not just the consultation on the big picture, but actually being involved in in the actual uh, the, the decision making on a building by building or and service by service decision making. And that, that even extends to, to choosing agencies that will be involved. Uh, we've talked a lot about, our, about the one that's helped us, but just in general, uh, agencies have different expertise and uh, having peers and people with lived experience involved in choosing those, those agencies can actually promote accountability and uh, better service overall. Um, we know that support makes, there's a negative way and there's a positive way, and I'm just gonna do the positive. When, when we're supported, we, we uh, stay housed. We stay out of the emergency room. We stay out, out of the police involvement. We stay out of the fire service involvement. Uh, we stay happier and we're, we contribute more to society. Uh, we're happier and we uh, have dignity as living in supportive housing. Uh, and I think that dignity and respect creates a space, and it's one example, but at the sound times, you know, we, we have some, some people who have been written off by other agencies, people who have been discarded by society, and it is a beautiful space. Um, what, I will invite you down to Parliament Street, uh, Parliament and Dundas, and, you know, there's a lot of rough people around, but sound times is a beautiful space because of respect and dignity. And so we're not going to fix all of TC, T, uh, Toronto Community Housing, but uh, the model based on respect and peer support uh, and peer workers, or basically workers with lived experience, is one that I, I'd recommend to, uh, to the Executive Committee and Council. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. Are there questions for the deputants? Well, I thank you very thank much you. for your being here this afternoon and for your patience. Uh, now, uh, Janja Zapatowski. Okay, you're up next. Finally. <laughs> I'm a tenant at uh, 717 Broadview Avenue, which is a Toronto Community Housing Building uh, designated as affordable housing for low income seniors. I think it's on. You just have to speak a little closer to it. That's all. Thank you. Did you, okay. 
That's better. Can you hear me now? Yep, a little better. Thank you. Okay. D uh, do I need to repeat? Yes. No. Uh, I want to, uh, today. I want to stress the importance of a senior's portfolio, and I'm encouraged that the tenants' first advisory panel are recommending a new seniors' housing and services entity, which is in <coughs> integrating programs and services for seniors. Um, I've been in uh, our building for about six years, and um, we've experienced ineffective management at all levels, and are aware that the present model is not working. Although the advisory panel recommends the creation of a new seniors housing and services entity, it does not address the specific needs of a vulnerable and growing demographic. As well, the issue of affordability has not been addressed. In spite of the designation affordable housing for low-income seniors, rents are increasing and pensions are not keeping up with the cost of living. Since 2014, we've been unsuccessful in our attempts to meet with top management in Toronto community housing to discuss a policy or strategies to maintain low rents in keeping with the mandate, in spite of all the letters and um, signatures that we sent in, we just are met with silence. The economic reality of our seniors is that our rents will become unaffordable. We want to age in place, and there are concerns for our future such as a declining standard of living and possible relocation. We understand that other seniors' buildings, which are similarly designated, have concerns about the issue of affordability. With a goal to providing expertise, skills and resources for a vulnerable and growing population, I would ask that the Tenants First Advisory Panel identify the unique needs of seniors tenants in the seniors designated buildings. In order to determine what those needs are, I'm suggesting that Toronto Community Housing seniors' involvement in giving feedback on their challenges and needs is important. As well, it is of utmost importance that Toronto Community Housing honour the mandate for affordable housing and that the new seniors housing and services entity grandfather this mandate. It's our understanding that the issue of funding from other levels of government is crucial to the success of this plan. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much, Ms. Zapotowski. Uh, are there other, other questions about this deputy? Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Yes, I just want you to explain a little bit more about the affordability. You're in a market uh, market building, yes, and the rents are proceeding at a much higher level than anybody's pension on the fixed income. That's right. And you aren't. You, are you telling us you're not? Uh, you don't think TCHC is thinking about that, or has heard your concerns about well, that? Council recently, Fletcher, if they're thinking about it, they certainly haven't let us know. And unfortunately, there has, as everyone knows, there's been no continuity uh, because we've had three CEOs in the last five years or so, and uh, there's no consistency. So um, we're just met with silence, so we don't know. And there's mostly uh, mostly women in your building. Mostly women. And you would agree that the fixed income for women is far lower than the fixed income for men pension wise i would so this is uh you'd like the new housing unit to address this particular issue for any market buildings that and market tenants that is correct thank you okay thank you thanks councillor fletcher uh other questions seeing none all thank you very much for being with us today thank appreciate you. it very much uh sherry williams Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
We have three minutes uh, for presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My name is Sherry Williams. I'm a mom of five. I get emotional when I talk about the scattered homes, but that's what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Six years ago, I sat here fighting for, to save my, my then home, a scattered TCHC unit that was proposed to, for sale. During that time, what ifs? During that time of what-ifs, my children's grades plummeted. Not only are what-ifs stressful for adults, but they are a scary place for children. I have since moved to home ownership with Habitat for Humanity, which has put, my, put back the driver's wheel for my family's future in my hands, because the previous scattered home, home could not provide that for us. We were never sure if the next TCHC budget meeting or the city budget meeting would include another discussion on selling our home. And if sold, it would force us to either try to squeeze into an apartment building that w we couldn't fit into, or force us to have to live in a home that would use more of, our, more of my money on rent instead of on my family's food, education, and health. This is why I am here to ask you to support the idea of these houses being transferred to a land trust. Each of us in this room know that our city is facing a housing crisis. We have a record setting number every month for people waiting for affordable housing. We have a housing stock we could be proud of if invested in, but instead tenants, especially the scattered home tenants, like, the, like I used to be, have homes that have been neglected to the point that families are living in unsafe conditions. We need to remember that different people have different needs of, type of housing. Families like my own, which are large families, and families like my friends who have differently abled members need larger spaces. And so, some moms and kids who are fleeing violence need a home where not everyone knows where they live. This is why having the scattered homes are really important. It is time to preserve the scattered homes as affordable housing. They just don't seem to fit in the TCHC portfolio like other types of homes. TCHC has never given them the attention whether it's because they haven't had the funding, the interest, or have been, neglected, have been neglecting them with the hopes to get rid of them. I believe that a land trust would be the right solution for the scattered homes. Tenants deserve a decent, safe home with stability. And I feel that this can be done in trust. I understand that there is a process that is being suggested for selecting a group of operate a group to operate the home, homes, and I really think that the tenants need to be a part of that process too. Give the tenants the respect they deserve in their homes and lives. Make sure that scatter homes stay affordable to give tenants a sense of stability to raise their families, and make sure there are systems in place that keeps whoever ends up operating accountable to tenants and the city so that we don't find ourselves in the same place down the road. Please follow your task force and staff reports and actually put tenants first. Keep the scattered homes affordable and in a land trust. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions of uh, Ms. Williams? Councillor Fletcher. Yes. Um, did you write this great little book, If I, Walls Could Talk? I did, sitting in here, fighting and, for my home. <laughs> uh, when you were working with other tenants around single family homes, one of the things that you did was writing, writing deputations and presentations. So yes. uh, that's where you started writing this, is that right? That, that's right. And just to talk about the tenant engagement, tenants actually got together. Was there any TCHC staff or city staff that were leading tenants, or were you just together with other single family home tenants? It was, it was just a group of tenants. In actual fact, we never heard about our homes being proposed for sale by TCHC. We heard from other tenants that were from buildings. Yes, and so that was truly a resident-led or a tenant-led exercise, 100%. 100%. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions of Ms. Williams? Thank you very much for your attendance today. Uh, Brian Davis, Toronto Mental Health and Addiction Supportive Housing Network. Brian Davis. Uh, Anne Wolger, founding director, Matthew House Refugee Reception Services, Toronto. Oh, you're Brian. Are you Brian? Sorry. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Oh, sorry, a bit out of breath. Sorry. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, Three minutes, sir. So my name is Brian Davis. I'm from Housing Community Homes, and 
Uh, HouseLink is one of the members of the Toronto Mental Health and Addictions Supportive Housing Network, of whom I'm re representing today. <clears throat> so our network is comprised of uh, 27 organizations that operate both city and provincially funded supportive housing in Toronto to, to, <clears throat> to individuals living with persistent mental illness and often um, coupled with substance use challenges. Um, so not on the same scale as TCHC, but most of us own and operate nonprofit housing, and we know the challenges of running a viable operation and meeting the needs of people with complex health issues. So with this in mind, we stand with you in your advocacy efforts to acquire a shared and sustainable funding commitment from the provincial and federal governments, along with the city also making it a funding priority. We are relieved to see that despite TCHC's financial pressures, the city recognizes the value of retaining the scattered homes and transferring them to either a nonprofit or a land trust as noted in recommendation number five. These homes are mostly in rapidly gentrifying neighborhoods and they fit with our goal and the city's goal of creating inclusive communities. Uh, in addition, a number of us uh, members have very successfully used these houses to house individuals and families who need our supports and all of them are well integrated into the community. We also strongly support the retention and revitalization of TCHC's rooming house stock. Uh, this is stock that makes up a significant component of the rapidly decreasing affordable housing stock in Toronto. And again, there are a number of us who have ex ex extensive experience in working with rooming house operators as well as operating multi-tenant homes ourselves. We're also in full support of recommendation number six, a decentralized and innovative approach to community development and local action planning. This speaks to the importance of creating strong local partnerships, especially if TCHC is going to have a narrower mandate. Um, there are a number of critical partnerships between members of our network and TCHC, particularly in the high needs sites that can be scaled up and replicated. Uh, these are integrated partnerships that attend to both standard property management performance indicators like arrears and vacancy loss, as well as community and individual health outcomes. We know that individualized wraparound supports for tenants, on-site staff, and a variety of programs that foster social connections and address the broader social determinants of health are key to success. So in, in summary, with shelters at 94% occupancy this past winter and our waiting list, um, our centralized supportive housing waiting list that is over 12,000. We all need to act with a sense of urgency. Our members have expertise and resources that we are prepared to leverage to assist TCHC and the city to move forward on the plan, particularly recommendations number five and six. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Davis. Are there questions of uh, Mr. Davis? Well, thank you very much for your patience Thanks. and being here today. Much appreciated. Uh, Ann Wolger. Uh, founding Director, Matthew House Refugee Reception Services, Toronto. Ah. Did I get your name right? Was it I right the first time or the second time? Soft G or hard G? Hard. Hard. Well, there you go. Thank you for being here and thank you for your patience and you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to um, note that tomorrow is World Refugee Day. And while there are many sad stories that we hear regularly in the news about refugees, I'm happy to say that there's a tiny little house in central Toronto called Matthew House, which is a good news story. And this house happens to be owned by TCH. My name is Ann Wolger and I'm the founder of Matthew House Toronto. My vision for opening Matthew House um, came af close to 30 years ago when I began working at a city run shelter for homeless people. And it was there at this shelter. Pardon? Am I? Oh, do I need to get closer? Sorry. I hope that. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Is it not on? Oh, okay. Sorry. It was while working at this city run shelter that my eyes were open to the plight of newly arrived refugee claimants. They're the ones that arrive in the city that have no one to welcome them, they're simply numbered among the homeless. And I recognized that thousands were arriving and there were literally some of them being re-traumatized at some of the shelters. So out of that, 
I had a vision of opening a home that would be a caring place where, well, where refugees would be warmly welcomed. And I'm pleased to say that in the summer of 1998, Matthew House opened in a rented home on Dundas Street West, and as mentioned, it was, it's owned by TCH. Since opening, we've welcomed over 1,500 refugee claimants from 98 different nations. We have also expanded to having several other transition homes, including one specifically just for unaccompanied minor refugee teens. I could sit here and tell many success stories of how the refugee claimants have been integrated and have been quite successful over the last 19 years in their life in Toronto. But suffice to say that I believe the thing that would be of most interest to the city is the fact that because we are a privately funded nonprofit charity, we have actually saved the city of Toronto, one could say, since these the people that we assist are ones that would have had to otherwise stay at city-run um, homeless shelters. We have saved the city more than $5 million in homeless shelter fees. We have also at the same time paid TCH more than $350,000 in rent in order to assist the people. And because we take pride in ownership of our shelter, we have spent over $75,000 in upgrades of the um, home on Dundas West. I have to ask you to conclude shortly. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so given these facts, we would very much love to um, continue to upgrade and continue to improve our home, and therefore we would love to own it. And that's why we celebrate um, this proposal of the um, ROE, uh, uh, Request for Expressions of Interest, because we, for one, would be very interested. And we've been actually speaking for more than 10 years with people at TCH and counselors, and even Art Eggleton came and visited our home, and they all support this proposal. It's just a matter of figuring out the process by which we can do it. And all right, so, I, I do have to ask you to okay, stop there. thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, are there questions of uh, Ms. Wolger? Okay, well, I will thank you very much for your patience and thank for you. your uh, deputation. Thank you very much. Jay McLeod. Can I apologize? I'm feeling a little off right at the moment, and I apologize. Uh, I, first, also, even if my time is starting now, I just also wanted to thank the Toronto Fire Services as uh, someone who lives and works in the Baldwin Village area for the amazing work they did containing the fire at 33 uh, Baldwin Street, uh, not only for tenants of TCH, but for the entire Toronto community who benefits from that. Phenomenal job there, and I just have to say. Mr. Tory, I'm sorry to be confrontational to you, or I hope that's not the way it's going to sound here, uh, but uh, you and I first met when we sat at the same table at the 519, and while I'm here mentioned that uh, we heard uh, but didn't listen, I don't think we even heard people at that 519 meeting, that first meeting. Uh, you and I, I'm a little older than you, you're better preserved, but we were both straining to hear what was even said at our own table. And by the time after you left, the meeting never went anywhere. And I, I followed this whole process to the uh, press conference at Regent Park, to the tenants' first meeting in this room, where a room full of concerned people got winnowed down to 13 people. And I see who's behind this task force. I'm sorry, when Mr. Gillies then goes to work for Enbridge and wanting to privatize Toronto Hydro, I'm going to think you take his meeting. And I'm concerned here that... Uh, with you've come on with a tenants charter here, um, you must know that uh, we've frequent we've recently had a community standards series of meetings, taking staff and goodwill of tenants to come and meet over and over again for bromides that a great four class could come up with. We have a service and human rights commitment posted in every foyer. But also, our situations here are with unions 416 and 79, where their terms of accountability to the public are in the actual labor agreement, and there will never be a time when there is accountability of those individuals to tenants. If we have a problem, which we frequently have, of abuse from contractors or staff members, there can be no accountability directly to us, and I ask to come back to you to tell me how there will be accountability or how there is any accountability here now or ever will be for tenants to, from staff members, in other words, for tenants to have accountability from staff members. It is the number one thing we ask for over and over again. I'm also gonna to say to you, my friend, 
while at the same time you're asking Kathleen Wynne and other levels of government to contribute here, and Mr. Perks wants to raise the taxes and so forth, any long-term tenant has observed waste of an exponential level here. These buildings were bought, or some cases were given to the city for next to nothing. The mortgages have been paid for over and over again. You're now taking that money from the mortgages at a time when interest rates are going up, and we are literally paying six people to go around measure closets, somebody to pay paid $90,000 to tell people how to shift, sort garbage, etc. Before we can ask for any more money, we have to have accountability here on the most basic level. And the first principle has to be when you live in these buildings, when you are paying the rent, when you are paying off the mortgage, you are the number one stakeholder, my friend. There is nobody else who has more right to determine the future of that particular unit than you do. But Mr. Tory, I also have to say, sorry about that, I was here one day primarily to be concerned about the Fir Grove situation because Fir Grove is being torn down because nobody cleaned out the eaves for 20 years since the common sense revolution. I'm not speaking about Ernie eaves, I mean the eaves troughs. That's why that building is falling down. And that's why I don't have any heat because somebody doesn't put water in the boiler. That's what Mr. Leah is telling me with the limited resources. It is now resolved that we then call the mechanical company to put water in the boiler and they charge us money. We've got to tighten this up. But also, when I was here at... Uh, it may get your last point, sir. Yes. You know what, sir? The problem you have presented about people being rehoused in Toronto community housing has been explained to me by Mr. Johnson, senior, senior counsel, as symbolic and theoretical. The people who are finding their way back into TCH are doing so illegally, and the only solution to that will be, instead of hiding in 931 Young Street, people are actually on the ground in those properties doing what they must be done. Other people have said that better than me. Thank you. And I'll Thank ask you. you to respond to what I've said to you about... Thank you, Mr. McLeod. Thank you. I can only ta say the report is meant to take account of the need to decentralize and bring the management further down uh, toward, you know, closer to the tenants. The legal changes are designed to make it easier for us to get people uh, not rehoused that you think shouldn't be rehoused and so on. We're trying to be responsive to all the things that uh, you've talked about today. So, are there questions of, uh, of Mr. McLeod? Sir, I'd also disagree with that characterization that you've made up a, f a fictional problem that is not the real reason why people are coming back to CCH problem situation. You also have a security unit there that is not accountable. Mr. Tory, why are they driving around with ram bumpers on their cars? Are they going to ram into the walls and drive out the drug dealers? I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, Mr. McLeod. Are there, are there questions of Mr. McLeod? Well, hearing none, I'll thank you very much for being here this afternoon. Appreciate your time. Uh, Tim McGuire, President of QP Local 79. Good afternoon. I also have with me the next deputant, uh, who is a member of QP Local 79. Uh, who works at TCHC. So if I could go and then she, can go, she goes, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Tim McGuire. I'm president of QP Local 79. We represent many of the workers at uh, TCHC providing services in, in, in the communities. Um, Local 79 supports many of the recommendations in this report with some uh, caveats, uh, the largest caveat being funding. Uh, TCHC can only become the kind of housing provider tenants deserve if it is properly funded and now. Missing also uh, from this and other discussions are concrete plans to increase the supply of rent geared to income social housing in Toronto. Over 90,000 households are on a, on, a, on a social housing waiting list. I'll name a few of the recommendations that we're making and if we have time I'll go into them further. Uh, we, uh, we, we think the City Council should commit to increasing the City's subsidy to TCHC now to guide development of the interim funding model and ensure appropriate funding levels in 2018. Invest in expanding Toronto's rent geared to income social housing stock. Make any new seniors housing entity a division of the City. And while that hasn't been specifically articulated, I don't think yet today I can get into that a little further later or if there are questions around that. Involve frontline workers at TCHC in the development and implementation of the decentralization pilots. Ensure frontline workers have the st stability they need to focus on delivering services to tenants in the midst of more change by providing successor rights uh, through whatever organizational governance changes are made. There has been a lot of instability over the years since the inception of TCHC, change after change, 
and we need to have stability. And while the final point we were making is a comparator in terms of the scattered housing, we think that there has to be some caution taken to ensure that the stability is actually remaining in scattered housing um, and ensure that uh, um, service isn't automatically determined to be better provided by other providers and there should be an audit in terms of what services are provided and ensure that the appropriate services are provided in the most stable way. Uh, um, um, and I also suggest to stop calling it scattered housing. If these houses are part of the continuum of social housing that needs to be provided, I would suggest we come up with a different name uh, to make sure that it reflects that it's part of stable social housing in the city. Again, uh, um, back to the issue of funding, the PricewaterhouseCoopers analysis indicates that TCHC will require $402 million in additional funds in 2018 and $415 million in 2019. TCHC has not been adequately funded for capital repair and the capital plan faces a $2 billion shortfall over 10 years. So we think the subsidy should be increased and that subsidy uh, uh, should happen now. The most significant cause of current uh, crunch is the fact that city subsidies have remained relatively flat despite rising operational costs and growing service needs. According to the staff report, the 2017 $37 million subsidy increase to TCHCs, the only cash increase from the city in 15 years. Um, so I won't go too much into the funding at the moment. Expand social housing to match the growing needs of our city. Again, over 90,000 households are on a waiting list, and yet the city has not developed a strategy. Uh, recently, as we've discussed earlier, housing is being closed without a strategy on what to do about it. And again, a new s services seniors housing division should be created at the city. There's lots of examples in the city where there's cross-divisional service supports. Uh, uh, just an example has been the investing in families, investing in neighborhoods, where TESS, public health, and recreation uh, cooperated to provide various services. Is, am, I, am I out of time? Yeah. Okay. No, but sorry, I'm going to turn it over to a frontline worker who can continue. Thank you. My name is Cam Pasquale. I'm a tenant services coordinator at Toronto Community Housing. I've been with the company since 1989. First, at the tenant placement department, now known as Housing Connections. After 10 years, reorg reorganization moved several employees, including myself, out to the field and into positions called property administrators. Very quickly, I learned the difference between working at head office where names and application numbers supporting documentations were just that, a dehumanized version of the people we were trying to help. Once I started meeting the residents, the level of service one provides changes very quickly and a sense of ownership in the community you work in becomes part of your job. When amalgamation happened, the service approach evolved and moved to a centralized model slowly began. I was part of MTHA, or Metro Toronto Housing Authority, where a decentralized approach was preferred. Using this model, PAs like myself, together with other maintenance staff, would have a hands-on approach in every tenancy. From the moment we were notified of a move out, we would oversee its preparation for occupancy. And since most of the work was done in-house, we could turn a unit around in less than 15 days. Unlike the current model, which has proven to take up to six months before anyone is housed. Over a period of time, the centralized model took a toll on TCHC, both from a business and customer service perspective. Site staff were left powerless to prevent any revenue loss due to the shift in responsibility. Head office also began signing leases for different communities, which proved problematic as well. We no longer knew who was supposed to move in, leaving the door open for potential fraud. In addition, residents who were recently evicted for cause were being rehoused within months. A decentralized model allowed site staff the pleasure of being the resident's first point of contact, which is key to ensuring the long-term level of comfort people have when moving into a new community. This initial connection ensured that the rules and responsibilities that govern residents and staff were clearly discussed at the onset in addition to things that make each community unique. Residents quickly recognized the fact that TCHC is in the business of keeping people housed despite some of the challenges they face in ensuring compliance with the requirements subsidized housing obligates them to follow. Once a resident moves in, the challenges of life sometimes takes a toll on their tenancy. 
Having a connection with on-site staff relieves some of that anxiety that people feel when coming forward with difficult issues. I'd ask you if you could conclude uh, shortly. Yeah. In conclusion, there's a reason why head office is often referred to as the ivory tower. And that's because there is perception that the people who work there are detached from what's really happening in the various communities. Each building, townhouse, complex, and community is unique, and even though a successful tenancy may mean many different things, it is the site staff that invest the most time and effort into ensuring that residents achieve that success because we are just as invested in it as they are. Thank you both very much. Other questions uh, from uh, Councillor Cressy? Uh, well, thank you both for being here. So I just want to make sure I understand correctly. So QP Local 79, uh, on the seniors point, you're supportive of the recommendation, but you think it should be a division. It should explicitly note what, what, the, what the governance model will be. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. And, and while there has been, as I indicated earlier, successive change in TCHC, which has brought a lot of instability to our members, for us to be sitting here advocating uh, and agreeing with further change is somewhat contradictory. But we think it brings the, the best line of accountability back to city council uh, um, and there can be lots of things done between city divisions in making sure on the seniors issue between seniors uh, uh, um, TC seniors uh, housing uh, long-term care and on the housing front um, from shelters uh, uh, seniors yes. okay so th that I understand that on se seniors housing and on the scattered homes recommendation and I, I took your point that uh, perhaps a different name, I heard Councillor Fletcher mention family homes would be more appropriate, but do I understand correctly that you are supportive but cautionary, is that correct? I'm cautious about assuming that all of the, uh, I, I think it's unclear what services are being provided to whom in the scattered housing, by whom, to whom, and I think there should be an audit of that, a review of that, and not assume that all the services that are provided at TCHC should be provided by another provider. Uh, we're not saying don't review that, don't make any changes, but uh, uh, make sure that, what, you know, what are the principles of service provision that need to be maintained and follow through on them, those principles and then decide on who the provider of the services ought to be. And again, if there are governance changes to make sure that those uh, employees affected are provided with redeployment or successor rights, whichever is appropriate. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor uh, Fletcher would be next, and then uh, Councillor McLean. Thank you. I'm just really interested in hearing about a little more about the decentralized model of turning a vacant home or a vacant apartment back onto the renting market so quickly. And was that done in the operating, like the CHU level, for many years, and now it's been centralized? Yes. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Um, and then there was Bing, I think, was in there at one point. And if I can add this, this is one of the reasons, an example, why it would be important to have frontline workers involved in the models of decentralization pilot projects that are going to be happening so they can bring to the table what actually happens on the, on the ground uh, um, in housing. And there's, uh, I think that's helpful. Uh, anything else you want to tell us about that turnaround? What made it so quick? Um, we, we were actually mandated to turn it around in five days, to be honest. So as soon as we, no we were notified of a move out, we were there inspecting the unit and calling out contractors already, uh, unlike the current system where we actually have to wait until the unit is vacant before any work is even done. So you wouldn't wait till the unit is vacant? No, because the, the lease provides us an opportunity to inspect the unit prior to them vacating. So oh, we I use see. That opportunity. So when somebody would be leaving, let's say on June 30th, you would know that you would go in ahead of time, you'd look and see what work needed to be done, and line up the contractors. Correct. Yeah. And now you have to wait till somebody leaves on June 30th, and then start the process at that point. Well, that that's actually only part of the problem. Part of the part of the issue also includes the offer process. The offer the offer process was taken away from the site office and, and is now done through our head office. Offer process in offering? Uh, selecting people from the waiting list. I see. But how does that have to do with the turnaround? Well, we would also be doing that prior to anybody moving out. Oh, so you'd have a tenant selected, knowing they're moving in uh, whatever time, 15 days later, so within a certain period of time, they would be guaranteed to move in. Right. And is that all documented somewhere, that process? 
I believe it was back in the Metro Toronto Housing Authority days. So that's the MTHA model. Right. And then we moved to a different model that you think isn't as good. We should reconsider. If it wasn't broken, don't fix it. Yes. Well, putting the three companies together, I guess they just decided on one direction and not the other. So it, you, you're suggesting we, we revisit that model from MTHA days to be more efficient with getting units open and people in them as quickly as possible. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Councilor McMahon. Thank you very much. This is just a quick question with regards to your comment, Tim, about um, terminology. So, so with the use of the term scattered homes, so what I've heard opposition and, and support for both opposition support for that term, what, what would you recommend? I don't have a recommendation. I just think scattered doesn't make it seem like it's part of a system, a continuum of social housing. I'm hearing single family homes in my right ear. Uh, what do you, what do you, what I don't have a suggestion. Do you, no, but what do you say when you're referring to them? What's the term that you use? I use scattered housing because that's the current okay. terminology, but Wait. I think that better we need to, okay, greater we minds should think about that. Thank you. Make it, make it, it's part of the social housing safety net. Thank you. Any other questions of these deputies? Councillor Burnside. Uh, through you, thank you. Um, we've heard some issues, well, quite a few issues about safety and quality of life, and I know you've mentioned some ways, um, you know, to have the on-site staff more involved to address that. Do you have any other suggestions? Well, sorry, no. um, just a quick one. Our community safety unit was actually stationed off of our communities, especially the larger ones, and they were in contact with the site staff on a regular basis. We don't really see that anymore. Uh, we also had a really close relationship with the uh, Toronto Police at one point, and we all sort of worked together in resolving any kind of issues that we had in the community. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and this is uh, probably... So if I can add one more, because yeah, I think absolutely. one of the pilot projects that's being looked at here is, is, is coordinating with the city on making sure that the appropriate uh, services are there for youth at the TCHC and the city. Uh, and we applaud that but let's involve frontline workers that actually provide those services at both in determining uh, how that project to work. We think that TCHC can be more responsive uh, to community needs, particularly on this front, uh, and this is a positive move, just to engage others in that process. Okay, thank you. Um, in term, you mentioned some staffing issues of the changes, like successor rights. Yes. Um, have you sort of looking at, uh, taken a look at the totality? Are there a lot more issues, and is there a cost, what would the cost associated with that be? Well, that, I, I wouldn't be able to determine that because we don't know what governance decisions are going to be made, and different governance decisions may affect more people than others. But let's take senior citizens, senior uh, services, for example. I think we represent about 450 workers at TCH and uh, maybe 50 or 100 that work in seniors. And so if that's going to be a division of the city, then the people providing those services should have successor rights to that work. Or if the city makes another decision where part of TCHC goes someplace else, those workers should have successor rights. Okay, but you don't have a, a cost no. quite yet. Okay, and then my last question, because I have eight seconds. Um, the, you identified $402 million extra additional dollars needed for 2018. That's from the report itself. Right. So we're um, just, yeah. So do you see that all coming from the city? And if so, how? We see, we see the city, that the city should increase its subsidy to the TCHC to start solving some of the problems that are happening at TCHC. Of course, I applaud the moves by the city to be advocating senior levels of government to actually make their contribution as well. And I think we should develop strategies on how to do that. For instance, at the FCM. The FCM, I go to the FCM all the time. The FCM talks about physical structure physical infrastructure, they ought to be talking about making sure that cities are appropriately funded on social infrastructure side, particularly social housing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions of these deputants? All right, thank you very much, both of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Sandra Marcock. Ms. Marker. Mike is on? Yes, yeah, on. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity, dear to our hearts. On behalf of the uh, more than 110,000 tenants who couldn't make it today, when does the tenants' first part start? I don't know. 
I would like to focus on accountability and tenant participation localized on the issue of the wasting of $45,000 in the participatory budget process at 11 Sullivan Street. It's been going on for five years. It's a, it's a Brazilian concept to encourage democracy, community building. If you manage it as badly as TCHC, it does completely the opposite of what it was intended to do. If you have an agency that can waste $45,000, the profligacy proflig is impressive and therefore the discussion about funding within this organization is, it loses all credence. I am focusing on accountability and tenant participation because the participatory budget process is actually a perfect demonstration of its failure. If you could waste that much money, how can you justify selling people's homes from under them when you don't even do anything for them? I have recently met and got to know a woman with four children, gone back to work, been in a house for seven years, never a single thing from TCHC except collecting rent. Last year I was here and I lost my focus. I was introducing the concept of the Grange pilot where we're really trying to do what the decentralization pilot might do next January. So that's a year and a half with no progress on that issue. Um, at that time, I lost my focus and I instead went off on the handrail and the doors. The handrail and the doors still don't get clean. They're filthy, they're gooey. Why QP people are being paid and can't clean a down handrail beats me. There was a person who spoke earlier who said, no amount of effort touches the problem. Well, yes, you can actually make it worse by continually requesting that the handrail be clean, in which case I have suffered not just illegal entries into my apartment, but two instances of sabotage, which the company pays for. If you destroy the plumbing in my kitchen and it causes flooding over a long enough period of time, you have to do mold remediation. There are people within QP79 and TCHC who have less integrity than you might hope. There are single women living in poverty. Anytime I've mentioned it, people know, people. Yeah, they come into my, they've taken things, yep, sure. So you can make it worse, but I'm still gonna fight for the handrail being cleaned. I would like to propose, following from the Grange pilot idea, that since TCHC is subject to the licensing process to be ready for July 1st with a maintenance schedule, that not only QP79 be included in that front line, um, worker decentralization thing, but that tenants be encouraged to say, okay, it seems like unless we press you, I will say first, over the last seven years, I did successfully get the door clean partially two times. Right. I'll just have to ask you to come to a conclusion. Uh... Okay, so a ref respectful collaboration between tenants and the staff on the front lines is possible. Why not start immediately? Tenants are suffering certain situations and one of the contributors, certainly in my case, is the retaliation for just pushing for things to be done. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any questions of Ms. Markov? Thank okay, you I'll very much. I'll just say it really is 45,000 wasted. Thank you for being with Thank me. Thank you so much. At Doris Power. I don't think so. So I offered my slot to other people, but they didn't take it. So I will say something today. And not as part of Tenants First that you may have seen or part of any of the housing committees that I belong to, but as part of Tenants for Social Housing, who have been with you now for how many years? The houses first started getting juggled in 2006. And six years ago, we were here with it being held over our heads. My colleague there, Sherry Williams, told you 
some of the things that happen in families when they don't have security, the stress that it causes, not just to them, but to their families. And we all know, I'll make this short, we all know that housing is the prime determinant of health. And I lay this on this stress of the relocation, the front page eviction, all of that which took place in 2011. And I'm still there. And I said at the time, what? All the promises, all the private meetings are with the wish that, you know, we'll, we'll hang around, she'll die. And I said, I'll show you guys. But now you may have your wish. And it's not fair, and it's not fair to all those tenants. As far as the, as, as the other things I might say is, we as tenants are all for inclusionary zoning. We are all for universal design. And if this council had foresight and was thinking about future generations and about housing, they would see that universal design was part, was law in all units, in all new building, whether it be private or public. That's all I have to say today. Thank you, Ms. Power. Are there questions of the deputy? Hi. Thank you very much. There, there never Ken Hale, Director of Advocacy and Legal Services, Advocacy Center for Tenants. Good morning. Good, sorry. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Hard good to evening. remember what time it is when you're locked in a room all day. But um, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak on behalf of the Advocacy Center for Tenants Ontario. Uh, we were here a year ago advocating that you support the Tenants First report. A uh, lot's gone on in that year. Um, there's been a lot of work by the staff, but I think the work of the Tenants First Residence Advisory Panel has been really exemplary, and the final recommendation of the staff report that Council thank the members of that panel should be the first thing that you do. Our work, our thoughts about this have really been guided by the insights that the advisory panel offered, and because I only have three minutes, I'm not going to go through those points, but I really encourage you to take a look at that report. It's very user-friendly. You can read it in 10 minutes, and there's a lot of real wisdom there that I really think you would benefit from reading again. Everything they ask for can be, should be provided by the city. And to the extent that the staff recommendations support those directions, we support the staff recommendations. But we have an important qualification, and that, you've heard that qualification from a number of deputants. The qualification arises from the statement in the staff report that says these recommendations have no immediate financial impact. This suggests that this is not really an implementation plan. Um, you're, it's another report giving direction on what future reports should look like. It sets up some directions and it suggests that you should continue your lobbying. But we don't believe that these actions are sufficient to create a way forward. The city has to make an emergency budget adjustment to provide more money to CCHC. The ongoing starvation of TCHC is causing real misery to the people who live there and the people that are on the waiting list. You're not going to move beyond the failures that are documented here and that some of these plans can remedy without putting more money in. And you, the members of the executive, as members of the executive and members of council, have the power to raise that money and to allocate it to this housing. We know you don't want to do it, but there's a couple of reasons why we think you should. One, the legal rights of tenants are evolving. So far, landlords, governments have been managed to evade their responsibilities for housing people or for keeping housing in good repair. We don't think that's going to last. We, we will continue to support tenants in demanding their right to decent housing. But the second point is about tenants first 
and when is it going to be tenants first? It seems that your whole approach here is property taxpayers first, tenants somewhere down the line. And the way you understand the taxpayers' demands are, we don't want to pay anything more, damn the consequences. We don't think that's what the City of Toronto voter thinks like. And, you know, are there really people who want to see these tenants continue to suffer just so they can save a few bucks on their property tax? Are you willing to sacrifice these tenants in order just to pander to this kind of person who doesn't really care about the future I'll ask of the people that live there? there. We'll, we'll conclude on that note. We're, we're 45 seconds over. Uh, are there questions of uh, the deputy? All right, hearing none, I'll thank you very much for your submission. All right, thank you. Uh, Gillette Sampu, resident tenant leader. Galette Sampu. John Alexander. John Alexander here. All right, uh, Susan Gapka. Hi, Susan. Welcome. Good. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, that's I'm hardly good morning. afternoon. <laughs> um, so I'm Susan Gapka. I'm a tenant. Uh, live again uh, nearby, um, two blocks from from Eaton Centre and two blocks from uh, Social Services. I um, I was a founding member of the We're Not Tenants for Social Housing. We're not for sale, and we heard about some of the things that happened with that. I'll take that off. But I ran. I ran 10K Saturday morning after being out late uh, Friday night, so I uh, figured I'd be rather proud of that, um, that I could still do that. But, um, um, and I, we were with a group, Save Our Structures, that got about $380 million, I think, um, about 10 years ago from all levels of government. So um, putting tenants first has been a long time coming and, uh, and really important. Generally supportive of this report, um, but I am going to wave some alarms around the funding for it because it won't be sustainable without a uh, direct funding model. Um, let's go back about 30 years to the cutting of the national housing program by the government of the day, um, igniting the crisis that we have in front of us today. And 15, later, 15 years later in 2000, the downloading of social housing in an amalgamation, which is actually, I'm going to call it the curse of this city, um, and the downloading without the funding for capital repairs. Um, and what's happened since then, and we've heard some stories about just housing being a political football. And with some good fortune and some oversight, perhaps we can stabilize that formula. I'm looking at the time and three minutes just isn't enough. But, um, uh, but what I've done, I'm co-chairing an engagement strategy with uh, TCHC now, and I've been to a number of these forums over the years. We want a better accountability. There's themes though, there's a saturation point. Uh, tenants in decision-making authority or local decision-making. Um, for TCHC to be more responsive. Uh, we want <clears throat> elevators that work, plumbing that works, affordable rents and affordable hydro, and safety and security. And we heard some of the de horror stories of some of the conditions earlier today. And we can go a law and order route, Mr. Mayor, or we can go a health and safety route also and address social determinants of health. And I'm going to suggest that as a wise strategy moving forward. Um, I wish I had more time, but I'm going to perhaps use the seniors portfolio to make a few points. Um, Perhaps I don't, I, when you say a few points, you're at three minutes right now, and I'm, that's the end of your I'm, time. I'm trying so I'll to give you 30 seconds to make one point. Well, the point that without the funding in place, moving into nonprofits is a repetition. I can't say it. Um, we have to be very cautious because without a hotel tax or a dedicated revenue stream, it's not sustainable. But the one point I want to leave with you 
not an eighty three geogra the entire city because i said amalgamation is a curse let's align them up with the lynn so we can provide and any time you are dividing the portfolio up for better accountability align them with the lynn so you have the management overseeing the buildings effectively and you have a separate portfolio health and services for tenants for vulnerable tenants I think and that's, um, that's a point worth that's what i can to do right now that. Uh, thank you for that other questions of uh, uh paul Ainsley, councillor paul Ainsley? thank you mayor um susan can you just elaborate you said that um earlier that the tchc had to be more responsive than you mentioned capital repairs is is that what you mean by them being more responsive or well, in some ways, yeah, in my building, they've been very responsive, but I know there's a lot of uh, challenges in other buildings. Um, since the mayor's task force has been started, I've been making these recommendations to the board for years. Apparently, you need to be a mayor to have a task force to get some, but I found that they've been more responsive since this process has been started and since we've been coming here. And I find that um, that has definitely improved. Um, uh, CCHC seems to be attempting an engagement strategy. Um, there's been a lot of barriers. The one thing that I think is the hardest piece to overcome is because of the, the disadvantage is a real lack of trust. And so perhaps we can really work on that moving forward. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Thank, thank you, Susan, very much. Much appreciated. Uh, Adina Lebeau, CARP Toronto. You know how this works, Ms. LeBeau, three minutes. I do, thank you. Uh, my name is Adina LeBeau from CARP Toronto and we support the Tenants First Phase One Implementation Plan. We believe that decentralization is the way to go. TCHC is too big and the system doesn't work. As a seniors advocacy group, we fully support the newly proposed seniors agency and the strategic integration of all city seniors housing, 83 buildings, programs and services for seniors under one roof, housing, health care, mental care, paramedic services, meals on wheels, long-term care. It goes hand in hand. It's a continuum that focuses on people first, not systems first. Unfortunately, big government bureaucracies have become silos where inter-silo communication doesn't happen easily. So this proposal to break it out and combine all the services, put them in one agency, reporting more directly to city council resonates with what is already happening in other levels of government. It's the right direction and we applaud that. We would also like to emphasize flexibility needs to be a key factor in the system. Many seniors are still in a family way, raising children and grandchildren, so compulsory moving into seniors' facilities at 65 is not the way to go. Seniors must retain the choice to stay in mixed facilities and scatter houses. Since many seniors live in the scatter houses, we also support the recommendations that nonprofits, co-ops and land trust sectors or land trust sectors be contacted to seek out interest in managing this as a decentralized unit. We do not want this inventory sold to high price bidders even though it is easy money in the city coffers. We do not want the number of houses diminished. Many people live in big families and cannot have everyone living in a bachelor or one bedroom apartment. We want the houses we have to be repaired and maintained in inventory. Many seniors are living alone on fixed incomes and can't afford apartments, so rooming house revitalization program may work as well, where seniors may be able to rent a room in a boarding house with other seniors, share services. These seniors' boarding houses may be something to look into to put into the new seniors' agency as well. In the time that remains, I would like to talk about the funding of this transformation in social housing. All this is going to cost very big money. I see numbers touted for capital at a half a billion dollars, operating and maintenance half a billion per year. We at CARP believe that all levels of government must contribute. 
This is not just the domain of Toronto, but also the Ontario and federal government. And we will fight with you to get them to contribute. But first, here in Toronto, we also have to do our due diligence. Charity begins at home, and this government has to start using its revenue tools in order to raise its own money locally to support the transformation. All right, I'll have to ask you just to wrap up in about 15 seconds because you've had 30 seconds extra already. Okay, so we have low property taxes. KPMD did a whole study on how to use the revenue tools. We have to do our part in order to get the money flowing from the other levels of government. And we ask you to do that so that we can live in a great city. Thank you very much, Ms. Lowe. Uh, are there questions of the deputy? Hearing none, I will thank you very much, as always, for coming to see us and uh, your, for your submissions. Uh, that would bring us to Mark Shishakli, Sh 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 Tenant Building Facilitator. Is it possible to use the... Uh, here on the top? The, the, what did you want to use, sir? Right here on the... The top. overhead? The yeah. Top. You want to turn it around the other way, I think. That's it. Okay, my name is uh, Mark Shackley, and while I have been responsible for 2015 and 2016 for funding in terms of capital repairs of $150,000 for two buildings, I also live in Ward 27, and I have been a tenant building facilitator since 2010. In this regard, my main concern is the focus and strategy for the national housing. There's nothing good about decentralization. Therefore, for myself to expect to engage tenants in a situation that is beyond uh, the city's uh, control, I would concern myself with the quality of housing and the quality of living. Instead of worrying about the numbers, I would prefer to have a governance structure that is suitable for a Toronto Community Investment Fund that allows for every, anyone interested or who is eligible under trust to even people that live in Toronto Community Housing to put money into the fund and perhaps benefit by it through, let's say, municipal dementors that are tax-favored income and obviously preferred or fixed, especially for seniors who in this analysis report are treated separately as the difference between the next 10 years uh, for determination and results of uh, um, the, the facts and figures on the accounting level. Also, I would suggest that while um, there is, um, quote, uh, um, a request for an annual budget process be reviewed as well as for reports to other governments and a mandate or order um, for reviewing the budget that this be between the various levels of government put to, um, uh, as how can I say, participation of tenants who perhaps um, would not be left outside of this. Uh, while we live in Canada, of course, we want to make sure we have some type of, um, let's say, regular correspondence through the Toronto Community Housing website, which I find that Toronto Community Housing has focused and will continue to focus on the core responsibilities as a result, which have been uh, from this report. So I do want to thank the tenant uh, first implementation plan members who've taken the hard work to prepare the report. And while this is only phase one, I do hope that the city council and the various levels of government understand um, what it means to engage tenants. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shackley. Are there any questions of the deputant? I thank you very much for your attendance here today and for your submissions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carl Andrews. Carl Andrews here. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Andrews. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Three minutes, Fraser. Thank you very much for having me. 
Done? Yep, I think you're okay there. Am I? I believe so. Is the light on there? Red light. No. Nope. Little red light. Yeah. Good. Uh, my name is Carl Andrews. Uh, I am the vice president of OPSU Local 529. My local represents members of the Community Safety Unit at Toronto Community Housing, who are the frontline security staff, which consists of special constables, community patrol officers, parking enforcement officers, and security dispatchers. I will be speaking briefly about the Tenant First Phase 1 implementation report. But before I begin, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to share the thoughts of my members. My members believe that the Mayor Task Force did a wonderful job in seeking advice and guidance when we met with Senator Eagleson. I have worked with Toronto Community Housing since 1992 as a Community Patrol Officer and a Special Constable. I had the opportunity to work on the all three different entities, that's MTHA, MTHC, and now TCHC. I can attest to the challenges and barriers we faced over the years working in some of the most troubled and marginalized communities with limited resources and fragile support systems. Today, Local 529 support and share the city goals of improving the lives, of, the lives, homes, and lived experience of tenants and their families. There are many transformative ideas in the Tenants First Report Phase 1 implementation that Local 529 agrees with and support. Example, better funding and support of integrated services for seniors, families, young people, and vulnerable tenants. There was an acknowledgement through the Tenant First report that social housing overall was underfunded and under-resourced, and we know that. Prior to 2003, our complement of officers within the Community Safety Unit was more than 150. Today, we stand at just about 100. While we, have con while we have to continue to do more with less, we seek the need to transition back to a more reactive model to a proactive model in our community engagement. Local 5 to 9 is committed to work with the city and THC management towards improving safe communities for tenants, their families, and staff. Safety and security were important issues and focal point of the Mayor Task Force and the Tenants First Report. Local 5 to 9 was given the opportunity to share information, make recommendations prior to, the re to, prior to those reports. However, the same is not true with this report. I have to ask you to wrap up pretty shortly. You're 45 minutes over time, and I, you're the last one on this item, so I Thank give you a little latitude, but I have to ask you to wrap up. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Because we were not engaged or involved in this, in the implementation of this report or asked for ideas, we are interested to know what would happen if and when it is implemented, what would happen to mm -hmm. our members because these communities would continue to have criminal elements, they would continue to have uh, antisocial behavior, and who are going to do these works? Those are important questions that our members would like to ask and like answers to. All right, we'll perhaps stop you right there, because uh, I think you put some of those questions on the record. I do have to stop you, just because we've got a minute and a half over the time. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Just stay in case there's any questions. Uh, any questions of the deputy? Okay, well, I will thank you very much for your patience today, sir, and for your submission. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, did you have a question, Councillor Burks? Yep. 
Sorry, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I understand this. You were never invited to be part of a conversation about the, this change? About your, this, your, this, your this, this phase here, this implementation, we, our local was not invited. We, had, we have a local 79 and 416 of QP. They were, but local 529 was never called. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Thanks thank very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Andrews. All right, that brings us uh, to the end of the uh, deputations on uh, 26.2. Uh, and I'll be seeking some guidance shortly about what we're going to do. I'm sorry, Councillor Cressy? Yes, we're going to go to questions of staff. So uh, questions of staff, and of course we'll begin, as always, with the uh, council members who don't belong to the Executive Committee. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I guess I'll direct these to our Deputy City Manager and our Interim exec um, CEO of uh, TCHC. On the state of good repair backlog, the building repairs backlog, for 2018 and 2019, how much money is needed that is currently not available, that we currently don't have? To the mayor, the, uh, for 2000, just on the capital repairs, 2018 is approximately 262 million, and 2019 is 428 million. Uh, 262 and 428 over the next two years. And if, if we don't, receive or secure that money, how many units would close? If we don't receive any additional funding, we would close a further 400 units in 2018 and a further 800 units in 2019. Okay, now recommendation 4A in the report says that the city will identify that money we will continue to work on the province who should pay their fair share, but in the event that they don't, we will backstop it and come up with those funds. I guess my question to Mr. Marshman is, can TCHC scale up funding fast enough in 2018 to ensure that we do not close a unit? So if the money comes in, can we scale up the spending of those funds quickly enough to ensure we don't close any of those 400 units in 2018? We can scale up funding uh, sufficient not to close units in 2018. It would be a smaller number than the number quoted in the, uh, in the report. Um, when you say a smaller number than the number quoted in the report, meaning, meaning what? That we would look to uh, spend somewhere between 250 million and 300 million next year in building capital repairs, and it, that would leave us with a funding shortfall of about 190 million as opposed to the 260. Uh, and that funding shortfall would mean that some units wouldn't be repaired adequately, but they wouldn't close. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, if I can now move to recommendation five on, on the scattered homes. So the report I identifies... You're, you're, I think you've just got a little bit of time left, Councillor. Oh, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already over three minutes. I'll, I'll, I'll pause. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Perks. Thank you very much. I, um, Recommendation 6A, local service model. Has any costing work been done on, what, on that, or is that for the long term? Through the chair, through the mayor, that's for the longer term. So we're just doing the pilots now to try and assess how effective that would be and what the costs are, might be, and then we would report it as part of the longer term. And that local service model, that came out of recommendations of the mayor's task force? The, local the decentralized service, service delivery came out of, yes? Mayor's task force and reinforced through the work we did in engaging stakeholders and tenants. And as we've heard from uh, I believe one of the deputants from CUPE, we actually used to have a more decentralized, there was the community housing, housing unit model, there were frontline staff in, in, in buildings. So it's something we've done before, perhaps not exactly the way you want to do it, but we have had more decentralized service delivery in the past. That's correct, in the past. So, I, I, please forgive me if this sounds harsh, but I want to understand. The, mayor, the mayor's task force recommended you do it. We have an historic model that we could have drawn on, and yet we have no indication of what it would cost us to deliver it in this report. I'm correct in that? The, the uh, historical reference was pre the amalgamation of the three housing companies, so that is going back a distance. I'm sorry, no, the Chews were here when I got here in 2006. The, 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 yeah, the two, sorry, I thought the deputant no. was referring to uh, previous. 
The existing pilot that is taking place in the Weston Mount Dennis uh, operating unit is being undertaken within existing resources. We will uh, work through that pilot, understand what the financial implications are for the company as a whole. Okay, in, in conversation with TCHC about their operating budget needs, um, has the, for the short term numbers that are here in this document, is that for providing the same standard of tenant support, the same standard of uh, small repairs, the same, so no improvement in any of those standards. Those are the numbers that are in front of us for the short term funding model. That's correct. Why did you decide to bring us a short-term funding model with exactly those same standards despite the fact that there were recommendations in the Mayor's Task Force to make improvements in all of those areas? What we're trying to understand is the over we want to get Council's concurrent concurrence with our overall vision so that we can drill down on the governance models and some of the operating models that we might be able to put in place to better support this and we want to do it in the most efficient way so we're using Council's resources in the best way to leverage the best outcomes for tenants. And finally, Council directed that you have a funding, a long-term funding plan in front of us here in this report. That was the Council direction. Why was it decided not to do that? Part of that decision is to see how we can leverage provincial and federal dollars to help us move this portfolio forward and with the seniors entity there's a there's a great deal of alignment in terms of the services that and the directions that the province wants to go so there's opportunities that we would like to explore in that area thank you very much thank you uh, councillor perks uh, other yeah councillor yeah thank you it, uh, chris on that pilot at western mount dennis which pilot is that Toronto Community Housing and the City are working together on a local service pilot. Uh, the focus is the Rexdale Weston operating unit. Which, which one? I'm sorry. OUC. Operating unit C, which is the northwest part of the city. Wait, but what's the address? It's a, it's a district. It's a, it's That's a district. It's a district. We're working to identify within that district the focal the specific buildings that we will be working with and then you'll come back to us with the buildings we'll undertake the pilot and advise that will inform the report back in november on how to further that work okay um now in recommendation one on the, on the 83 seniors designated buildings okay and if i can ask that so i, I guess uh, I'm a little disappointed in, I mean, I support the recommendation, but I'm a little bit disappointed because I think that the concerns that I have brought up, and I know Councillor Palacio and Councillor Fletcher has brought up when we were on the House, on the board, is that we have a number of buildings that were built in the 60s, early 70s, that were built as seniors residents. And what's happened over the years, they, they brought in mixed uh, families, and that's where the buildings that we're having uh, criminal activities and there's a lot of problems in so when are we going to be focusing on these buildings and these vulnerable seniors that live in these buildings and protecting them in which they've been advocating to us uh, that they want to go back to seniors residents when are we going to focus on that just so you know councillor you'll be your time will be up at 6 45 because oh, I'm sorry started at three no 3 45 6 45 up there oh so you've got a minute and a half oh okay through the mayor, the seniors entity that's being proposed here will look at, will focus in on the 83, but will also coordinate services and ensure appropriate services for all the seniors scattered across all of the buildings. So that's one of the emphasis and the benefits of trying to coordinate all of the seniors programs and services that the city provides directly and leveraging uh, opportunities with the province for the and the LINs for the services that they also provide towards seniors. So would we be able to add uh, those buildings on the list? So I, I believe um, uh, Councillor Palacio has a motion that would direct us to look at the list and review buildings that were originally seniors buildings that have now become mixed buildings to identify uh, a strat which building should be brought into the seniors entity and a strategy to achieve that. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend adding buildings to the list today. All set. Thank you, Councillor Nunziata. 
who else do we have on the uh, members uh, visiting from outside the executive committee? Anybody? Okay, we can go to members of the committee then, and we'll start with Councillor Palacio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. To see this step, it's a follow up to Councillor Nunciara's question with regards to recommendation number one. That's with a, a strategic integration for seniors. And I'm going to refer to two apartment buildings that were former, that were built by the Metro Community Housing in the past, 61 Pelham Park Gardens, as well as 1901 Western Road. These were buildings originally built for seniors, but over the years the tenancy has changed and it has become a real, real problem overall for those seniors and other people who are living there right now, especially people with mental disabilities. So in terms of reporting back, how would, what kind of metrics would you use to ensure that these buildings hopefully are going to be part of the, of the portfolio? Just to give some time to, answer, to think about the answer, I have to do something at six, as you know, uh, and I think the committee has agreed in an informal consultation to keep working and if I can just have a motion to extend and we're going to try to complete the agenda. So moved. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Okay. Through the Mayor, we would work with, um, through the Seniors uh, Housing and Services Entity and Toronto Community Housing to look at each building, understand the specific population, what the best strategy is res to respond to the needs in that building, where there are buildings that are appropriate to uh, move back to seniors only, um, those, uh, that review would come back to Council for, for decision and direction. We, we do need to look at it though because there are many issues associated with turning a building from seniors only or uh, back into seniors only. Thank you. With regards to the issues that you just mentioned, some of the major issues, it has to do with on-site support services, especially for those with mental disabilities, and also on-site um, and uh, security services as well. When you come back in November with that report, will you include all that information in terms of the service that need to be provided to through the, through the mayor, yes, we would provide that information. And again, just to re-emphasize, the seniors entity that we're proposing, while they'll manage the 83 buildings, they're going to coordinate and ensure appropriate supports for seniors across the city, so including those mixed-use buildings. Great. Uh, thanks so much. No further questions. Thank you, uh, Councillor Plateau. Other members of the committee wish to ask questions to staff. Councillor uh, Pasternak. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So when it comes to uh, recommendation one, um, staff are being um, asked to find some kind of an entity uh, to roll these buildings in. Now, how much power will that entity have? Will they be able to uh, control the rent increases? Will they collect the rent? Uh, will they be given a capital fund and a capital spending envelope that they have to stick to? How, how powerful will that will that be? So through the Mayor, part of our review in terms of how we would implement that is coming back with the governance structure and we're going to be looking at all those aspects including working with our own facilities management to see if there's opportunities to leverage um, different expertise within the city on how best to collect rents, manage buildings and coordinate those services. So that's a review that we're going to drill down on over the next few weeks so that we're ready to report back in the fall. Well, what struck me is the, the underlying theme here is having an entity that is having a process that's closer to council where city council can have uh, more say over the day-to-day, -day, not so much the day-to-day -day management, the overall management for better quality housing, more affordable housing, good, good repaired housing. But if you create this entity uh, with barriers, uh, you're going to find yourself in the same situation as you are now unless unless we can control rent increases uh, repair cycles training of staff so through the chair a large large portion of this portfolio is rent geared to income so those rules are set out in legislation with regard to um, coordinating and integrating services we're going to look at that those may not there's going to be some services that the city directly provides there's going to be other services that we're going to leverage opportunities with the LINs and other community agencies and other stakeholders and partners that we have in order to provide the most efficient 
an effective service to support the seniors so that they can remain in their homes as long as possible. Now, uh, through the mayor to, to, to staff, um, uh, the, the reality is that we're underfunding our social housing portfolio, but when we hear, when we hear from individual tenants, uh, they identify uh, more of a, a, a lack of expertise at the local level to identify um, problems, asset problems in their early stages and, and get in there and repair them. And then there's obviously as, as homeowners, you know that when you let something go for a long period of time, is the, is the problem we're facing uh, more uh, the expertise and training on the ground of the staff there than, than the, the bulk of money that we need to fix these problems? So through the chair, TCHC has um, engaged the services of an independent third party to help assess the state of those buildings. So it's not something that they just relied on internal staff expertise to arrive at. But that, that level of assessment only takes you so far. So the situation like for a Grove, when they did that level of assessment, it was identified that it needed a certain level of repair that would put it down the path of a reset. When they went to do that second level of testing, once they were ready to start, that's when it became evident that there was other issues with regard to um, that particular building. So they follow industry standards. Unfortunately, the stock that we've inherited um, isn't necessarily the most um, well, well built, so we, and it's aging, a large portion of it is aging all at the same time. Now within the report. I'll have to stop you there, Councillor Pashnak. here. Okay. Okay. Uh, other uh, questions from uh, members of the committee? Uh, I have some of no one else. Uh, Councillor Bailow, go ahead, please. Councillor DeGiorgio, you have some too? Okay. Councillor Bailow. Um, let's, uh, starting with the uh, single family homes. So the 684 um, number, it's the total number of homes that are occupied either by agencies or ten directly with tenants. It's a total number of the homes that we have, right? That's correct, not including the ones that council had already taken a decision on uh, several years back. And what it's proposed here, so either through the land trust or through the co-ops, it's a way to protect these homes. So the significance of these homes in the social housing sector has been recognized and we're just finding a way to uh, operate them in a different manner, most likely through land trusts or co-ops and, uh, and protect them in our social housing stock. Is that what we're trying to get through this? That's correct, Aaron. The advice to Council once we undertake the REOI and understand the business case behind it would be should any properties be uh, transferred that it be conditional upon those properties remaining as social housing. So you'll be looking for that protection even if it's transferred to other organizations? Correct. Okay. Uh, with the uh, decentralization project, do you need us to move any motion or I, I, I thought we, in conversation you said that you would be involving frontline staff and uh, tenants in, in, in getting those models together, is that correct? That's correct. We need, need no further authority to undertake that work. And it's already in the plans, correct? It's already, uh, yes, the planning is already underway. Okay. With regards to the finances, you, um, so this year you're actually expecting on the operating budget a surplus of 15.7 according to table one, is that correct? And then on the... In 2017. So this year you would be expecting, because there was a deputation say we should do an emergency, but you're, TCHC for the operating this year is actually forecasting a surplus of 15 million. Am I reading this correctly? That is correct. Okay. Um, and on the building repair capital, uh, you're actually bringing in $480 million as well. I'm assuming that most of this is through IO refinancing and other things. And you're spending 250, so you're actually going to have a surplus as well of 230 million. That is correct. That is correct. So, um, so this 230 million is also money that is specifically earmarked for capital repair backlogs. That's why you borrowed this money. 
That's correct. Okay. And in uh, you're doing a 2018-19 because you need to do an analysis of the, how the portfolio is going to be divided, the repairs that need to be done with the new in entity and the ones that stay behind. And we do understand that the funding requirements for the seniors might not be exactly the same as the remaining of the TCHC. So we have to produce all this analysis and you're basically saying we're going to need more money in the next two years, approximately this, and we need to come up with a new funding program. That's correct. Okay. Now, I understand the financial transition. Are you going to put forward also a recommendation on how we're going to develop this transition as a team in the future? So is it going to be a city-led transition? Is it going to be, because I know you now have a very short, tight team of people working on this, but you know, this is getting bigger and bigger. The transition is going to require more work, both on the city part and the TCHC part. So should we expect something like that to come towards the end of the year or how the relationship between the city and TCHC to implement all these changes? And that's your final question. Through the mayor, yes. Um, and page 25 of the report talks about, identifies the TCHC advisory group. So that's a joint TCHC city table that will be focused on the new TCHC and a seniors housing advisory group that will do that transition work on the seniors housing and services entity, all of which will be reported back at the end of the year. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Councillor DiGiorgio. Uh, Mr. Marsman, just help me reconcile in, in my mind. On, um, on page six, table three, in 2017, we've got, um, we're spending 250 million to do capital repairs, correct? That's correct. We anticipate that we're going to be in a position to spend 437, 438 million next year. How realistic is that given the capacity of the industry to do the kind of work that we require? That 400, sorry, that $438 million was what was in the original 10-year capital plan from 2013 to 2022. Understood. The question I'm asking is, if we are able to actually spend 250 million this year to do some capital repairs, we anticipate spending 438 next year. Are there available, is there available capacity in, in, the, uh, in the industry to allow us to spend that much money, I think is what I'm trying to get at. Certainly, I think realistically what we can spend next year is somewhere between 250 to 300 million dollars in building capital repairs. Okay, and 2019, somewhere in the same neighborhood? While we could... Or higher, I don't know. So, yes, so let me answer that. While we could ramp up operations, I think it is far more prudent for us as an organization to stabilize our, our spending in the 300 million range. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Councillor DiGiorgio. Uh, I had next, Councillor Shiner. Through you, Mayor Tory, um, so we're splitting this into a seniors housing and our other housing. Am I correct? That's the intention here. What did we have? <clears throat> what did we have prior to amalgamation? So through the chair, what we're recommending is a seniors entity. Yeah. Housing will be one part of that. Um, responsibility for the entity. The other part is coordinating the services that, um, that seniors would need in order to su successfully stay within their homes. And we would do that in partnership with the Lins I'm and the province. i am like you to help me understand the difference now then to what our housing was prior to amalgamation when we amalgamated the two divisions. There were three uh, uh, preceding companies. Um, the uh, Metro Toronto Housing Company Limited um, was primarily seniors but not exclusive. There were family uh, units in the MTHCL. Uh, City Home, which again had a range of housing types, and then MTHA or OHC. And the difference now is we're going to have two types? The report is recommending um, the two types, so taking seniors' buildings, regardless of which former 
uh, predecessor company they were a part of. Um, and uh, the new TCHC, the third stream is the scattered housing and the recommendation to undertake the REOI for nonprofit uh, management of that. So I'm just trying to be sure I understand the difference from what the before was to what the recommendation is now, because what's currently there didn't work. So and I just want to before, clarify before that seems, before, yeah. my understanding of the before was that entity was focused on strictly on the housing. What we're proposing here is a seniors entity that yes, manages a 83 seniors only buildings, but the other responsibility, just like today, we have a children's services division that coordinates and manages the services that are needed for families with children. This entity would be responsible with, for working with the province and the LINs on coordinating services that the seniors would need in order to stay successfully housed in their units. Separate budgets so, or one budget? We're looking at that whole governance model now. As I say, we're going to work with facilities to see if the, you know, what model might work with managing the actual housing and then and how we would manage the coordination of the other services. That's if council approves these recommendations, we we would report back in the fall on an appropriate governance model to manage all the aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shiner. Uh, I had uh, Councillor McMahon next. Thank you very much. So um, some people today mentioned the consultation process and I just want to know if you feel that, that the consultation was adequate with both uh, with tenants. Um, through the Mayor, yes. The, uh, um, I'm actually very proud of the work that um, staff have done in the consultation. With the one exception of the last deputant, uh, we did not speak to that uh, local, so that, that is an issue we will have to redress. Um, apart from that, uh, the consultation was fairly deep and I feel um, was well represented here in the deputation. So it was extensive and inclusive, you feel? Yes. Um, and um, through this proposed model, do you believe that the new TCHC will be able to better focus and deliver its mandate as Landlord of Excellence? That's the overall intent, yes. And with the $250 million that you will deliver annually for capital repairs, is, um, is that an increase since 2013? Yes, it is an increase since 2013. And what um, one of the deputants mentioned the term uh, scattered homes today, and I've heard this many times, is what, what do you call it, um, these homes? What do you refer to it, and are you open to revisiting uh, the terminology if it's, if it's deemed offensive? Of course, we would be open to uh, revisiting the terminology. But at this point, you refer to it as scatter, them as In the past, homes? that's what they've been referred to, and we just continued that term. But of course, we would be open to looking at better terminology. And historically, that was... I'm guessing that was because they're scattered all over the city, but I don't know historically because I wasn't here when they were first named. That's correct. That's, That's correct. correct. Okay, thank you. Other uh, members of the committee wishing to ask questions? Well, if not, I just have a couple. I want to, it's uh, going a little bit over ground, but I think it's so important so that we can make sure that uh, especially members of council understand these numbers. Um, so where Councillor McMahon left off a moment ago, let me just start the clock here. Uh, we were talking about and, uh, what, what sort of was spent and what could be spent. So back in 2016, um, can we just talk about uh, what was budgeted and what was spent in terms of your capacity to deliver repairs in that year? Mr. Marshman. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, we spent in 2016, we spent $238 million on building capital repairs against a budget of 250. And that, did that represent at that time, am I correct, uh, basically the capacity you had to deliver those repairs regardless of what the budget was? It, it was at that time because we were continuing to ramp up operations and had ramped them up significantly since 2013 when we only spent $68 million. Okay, and so now for this year, uh, we've kept the ramping up going and we're projecting to, to deliver, am I correct, uh, $250 million by the end of the year. Yes, and, and my staff has confirmed that we will, in fact, spend $250 million this year. 
All right. So then looking at 2018, uh, can you tell me what you think you'll be able to deliver? And again, I know this is ground we kind of touched on a few minutes ago with Councillor DiGiorgio and others. What do you think you have the capacity? Let's forget how much money you know you have available. What do you think you have the capacity to deliver in 2018? We have the capacity to deliver between 250 million and 300 million in 2018. Would I then be correct in saying that if you combine that with the uh, development capital that you won't get, even though there's a number in the report that's over $400 million, we won't get there in 2018 while that number's there. Um, it's not a number that's going to be attained in terms of, uh, of, 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 of the spendability or the, our ability to spend that money effectively in 2018. That is, that is correct. Had we had assurance of that funding some time ago so we could have planned, we could have ramped up operations to achieve that. But as we stand today, we cannot achieve more than the 300 that I mentioned earlier relative to building capital repair. All right. And uh, so uh, what does that mean? The shortfall is given the, and again, this is something that was touched on a few moments ago, given the existing financing arrangements and other things, what is the amount that we would be looking for uh, based on that $300 million approximation you just gave for 2018? Sure. Be, a, be about $190 million for building capital repair. So as opposed to the number people are throwing around, and I realize they're throwing around because it's in a report of 409 million, I think that's what it is, the number that we're really going to be looking for based on everything we've just talked about is closer to uh, what you just said. It, it's closer to that. The report also includes development capital, and there's a, a need of about $60 million for, for development capital. That's new home construction as opposed to refurbishment. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions of staff? Okay, well then we can go to uh, speakers and uh, we'll start of course with speakers from uh, City Council who are not members of the committee and I see Councillor Cressy, uh, his hand is up, so you can start, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. L let me begin by thanking our, our tremendous city staff for all their hard work. Uh, our Toronto community housing staff who have equally been spending a great deal of time on this. Uh, and I, I suppose most importantly, the residents of TCHC, these are in fact their homes. Uh, they have to go back every night and sleep in the units which are being debated here, and it is, it is them who we really need to recognize. Uh, and, and I should note that notwithstanding the incredible hard work and good intentions of TCHC staff and the relentless advocacy of TCHC tenants over many years, I think it is very fair to say that as a city and a province over many years, we have let the residents of TCHC down. That we, we have closed their units, we have boarded up many of their homes, and they deserve better. And, and I think the tenant's first report created by staff and tenants alike is an important step to make Toronto community housing for everybody, whether you're a single or a couple or a family or a senior or somebody who is living in a vulnerable situation, it will make life better. But the context for making life better is simply that we have an aging housing stock that is literally falling apart right now. It is falling apart. And then we also have 188,000 people on a waiting list for new housing. And in a province, in a city as wealthy as ours, we should be sitting around this committee table today debating how many new units of housing to open, not debating how to better maintain and manage the units we have. That's the shame of this debate. Now, the specifics of this report will make life better. Uh, bringing the 83 TCHC uh, seniors buildings closer to the city ideally as a division, will improve the lives of our seniors. Ensuring that the 684 scattered homes are protected in perpetuity, that never again will our residents, be they families or singles living in neighborhoods right across the city, have to wake up and say, is City Council going to sell my home today? Ensuring that those houses will be protected both from sale, but more importantly, that mixed income communities are maintained is important and a new model, a decentralized model for better management is critical. These are important recommendations and our staff and the ten tenants who've developed it are to be commended for it. But we cannot as a city continue to endlessly debate how we maintain our housing better when people are crying out 
for housing. We have people waiting for housing. And so this is merely a step. But if this city is serious about building equity for all, and this province is serious about it, then we have to shift the discourse from how we maintain what we've got better to how do we build more for the hundreds of thousands of Torontonians who need it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cressy. Uh, Councillor Perks. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I want to begin by thanking all the people who came out to make deputations today. Thank you. It's been a long day. I appreciate your patience, but more importantly, and I'll get back to this, I appreciate the wisdom you've shared with us today. Looking at the report that's in front of us, it does two big things. It talks about the seniors in scattered homes being set into uh, new entities, so it re-slices the pie. And it also, for the first time, puts down some clear dollar figures about what we need to do to keep things from getting worse. Those are the two things the report does. In listening to the deputants, though, that's not what I was hearing the conversation was about. I was hearing concerns about safety, I was hearing uh, arguments for decentralization, for better social supports, for maintaining the buildings better and doing small repairs. That's what you told us. And when I asked city staff, is that, despite the fact that that was in the Mayor's Task Force report, is that costed here, is that planned for here? The answer was no. We're doing a pilot to test some of those ideas, but if you look at the report, those things will not be tackled till 2020. 2020. After the next election of the next provincial government, the next municipal government, and the next federal government. So these three governments have, have decided not to hear what you have asked for. Instead, we've been engaged in a, in a high-level, high-stakes negotiation about who pays to keep things from getting worse. Well, it started out high-level. Now it's more of a street brawl. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. When I talk to residents from Ward 14 who live in Toronto Community Housing, they do not care. They do not care whether it's Kathleen Wynne's fault, it's Toronto City Council's fault, or Justin Trudeau's fault. They just don't care. They want us to shut up and fix it. But more importantly, they want to make the quality of the units they live in today better. And we did not get a proposal for that in front of us, despite requests from the Mayor's Task Force and despite City Council direction to talk about giving us a report that makes Toronto Community Housing the housing provider of choice. That's what should have been here. All the air has been taken out of the room by three governments passing the buck on a big capital repair backlog. Well, Mr. Mayor, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of Harry S. Truman's famous dictum. Maybe I, he used to have a sign on his desk that said, the buck stops here. Maybe we at Toronto City Council need to get one of those and put it on the, the podium right in front of the speaker and so that we remember when we're debating these issues that there are real quality of life failing in our housing company today that we are choosing not to address. Mr. Hale made a very good point when he said, we have it within our authority to meet at council on July and announce we're gonna tackle these things, issue a special temporary property tax levy and improve the quality of life for people in Toronto community housing. We're choosing not to do that. Thanks, Councillor Perks. Uh, other members of uh, Council uh, not on the Executive Committee wishing to speak? Councillor Nunziata. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Palacio is going to be moving a motion which uh, I will be supporting. Um, it's on the questions that we ask staff to um, include other buildings in, uh, in that list as far as the uh, seniors designated buildings. Um, so I hope you will support Councillor Palacio's motion. Um, and, and the reason I'm, I'm including my building in, on the list is 1901 Western Road. And, and Mr. Mayor, you attended and you spoke to the seniors that day at, uh, at uh, Western Lawrence. And um, as you know that on the main floor we have um, a, a senior centre on the main floor that's a tenant 
and that's paying rent to Toronto Housing, and they've been there for t over 20 years, 25 years, and they're providing programming and services to seniors, and they've been doing that for years. And what we've been trying to do is in this building, actually this building could be a pilot because it, uh, it, we could use it as a partnership where we can have agencies, outside agencies coming in, a partnership with Toronto Housing and providing the services and programming that we need. They're there, they're located in the building. And supportive housing is also involved in that. So I think that we should be, we should be looking at that citywide how we can partner with various agencies. So I'm, I'm hoping that that motion, um, you would support that motion. When Councillor Palazzo and I were on the board uh, for Toronto Housing, one thing we heard over and over and over again, and we actually hosted meetings throughout the city listening to tenants, and the biggest issue was security, seniors, tenants did not feel safe in their buildings, and as well the cleanliness of the building. Uh, just mopping up the floor, just painting the wall, things like that that needed to be done, and that's not capital funding, that's just uh, operating uh, funding, operating budget. And that's one thing that we lack to do in our buildings, cleaning up the garbage and picking up the garbage in the lobby. That doesn't need capital funding. That does not need millions of dollars to be put in the budget. It's just a matter of maintaining and doing the work that you're supposed to be doing in our buildings. And over and over again, we kept hearing that, well, it's this and that. There's no excuses for being dirty. You don't need money to clean up. And so that's so frustrating that we had, and that's re really the reason why I chose not to be back on the board, because I didn't feel that we, should, that we were doing what we should be doing for our tenants. I have a good relationship with all my tenants and all my buildings. I have a number of buildings. I work with them. They call my office and address their issues they have daily, and I, I provide that information to Toronto Housing. But we need to do a better job in managing our building and supporting our tenants. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Nunziata. Uh, other uh, visiting members of Council? All right. Uh, we can then move to the uh, members of the committee who wish to speak. Councillor Palacio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to move the following recommendation, if I can ask the clerk to explain it. I did work with um, city staff on this recommendation, and Councillor Nunziata spoke to to this recommendation as well. One of the things, Mr. Mayor, members of, uh, of the committee, is that uh, I happen to be very and, um, knowledgeable and, and I do understand the nature of the problem throughout our Toronto community housing. Yes, when I was in the, in, the, in the board, as well as, but today I'm going to speak on behalf of my tenants, <coughs> 61 Pelham Park Gardens. This is a building that was built by then, by the Metro Toronto Community Housing. And, um, and when it was downloaded to the city without capital funding, by then, for example, this building, and we have 83 more buildings that are in the list in attachment five, in, including the next two that I have on my motion there. These uh, buildings ha used to have on-site support services. They used to have on-site security service as well. So tenants felt uh, secure and safe. But over time, the tenancy aspect has changed dramatically, where we have now tenants with mental issues, exacerbated patients, and what's happening is totally inhumane. Tenants are living in very deplorable conditions with a total lack of respect and human dignity. It just, Mr. Mayor, angers me when I go and see tenants living in such a situation there that there is a lack of understanding from multiple levels of management with, within Toronto Community Housing. Is, um, these are safety issues that have to be addressed in a proper way. In terms of equity, when I look at it, the Toronto Community Housing is uh, home to the most vulnerable and marginalized tenants in the city, including gender-based, in terms of poverty, physical and mental health issues, systemic discrimination. That's an issue that's boiling out there. It's the boiling pot, for God's sakes. The social ex exclusion. Tenants living in deplorable conditions once again. This is something that where the status quo is not acceptable anymore. 
this is something that is um, all the levels of government, we all have a responsibility to move forward in a very inclusive way and to do the right thing to correct the wrongs of the past. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Palacio. Other uh, speakers? Are there no other speakers? Well, uh, uh, Councillor Bailon. Motion um, Mr. Mayor. Um, and just to, uh, to explain, this is something that is in the body of the report and I wasn't included as a recommendation and I'm just transferring it uh, as a recommendation just to, uh, to have staff working with uh, our labor representatives as the process uh, develops. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, all the tenants involved and, and many of them were, were here today but uh, the ones that participated in the sessions, the ones that have participated here and uh, a lot of them have been through this process several times and, and it's hard to go back to them and, and say trust us, you know, this time is, is something is going to happen, something is going to be different because some of them have seen consultation after consultation with little result. And so uh, I, I, I think that we, we owe you uh, our gratitude for uh, trusting that uh, we, we really want to move forward with these recommendations and we need you at the table. So thank you for participating. I also want to thank staff as well because as one of the uh, uh, deputants said, this is not an easy file. If it was an easy file, it would have been solved by other orders of government when they had this, uh, this, uh, this file and when they wouldn't just dump it out on, on the municipalities. And, and now that we have it for decades, uh, we've been trying to deal with this. So thank you for, for um, bringing this forward, both the team at uh, TCHC and the team here at the city um, through our uh, uh, deputy city manager both of them that, that signed the report. Um, if there's one thing that we came uh, out of the, um, the task force is that the issue was not only a capital backlog. And uh, the, the mayor's task force clearly identified that we had more issues than just a capital backlog, but that we were choosing to address that issue because we did go from spending $68 million back in 2013 to spending this year 250 being planning at least, as, as the CEO said, at least 300 million for next year. So we chose to address this issue and continue to choose to address this issue because as the task force did say that there was an operating issue as well and, and that the capital issue was not the only one and if we don't address the operating issue, you're gonna be back at the same location in a few years. This council also chose last year to increase the operating budget of TCHC by 18%. There's a further request here to continue to have that increases, which I'm hoping and, and, and I will be fighting hard to make sure that that continues to happen in the next budget cycle so this organization is not in the same position in future years. There's also revitalizations going forward. We have $1.5 billion of revitalization projects in this city. There's seven revitalizations going on and the city is stepping forward. Last year they were short. There was $106 million that the city came through to ensure that Regent Park was going to be finalized. We need to continue to invest in that work. It's the revitalization of TCHC, but at the end of the day, is the revitalization of our communities. And finally, there's the organizational that needs to happen. It's not all about money. It's about attitude. It's about the way that we govern this, this, uh, this organization and the way that we treat our tenants. And that's what is a lot of, it, of that in this report. The senior strategy and how it's going to work with the city, uh, the, the centralization and the work that needs to be done with the uh, with the, uh, the the tenants and the scattered and then the work that is going to be done with the scattered house and importantly as well, TCHC has the duty I think and can play a huge role in the nonprofit sector and strengthening the no, the housing nonprofit sector as a whole. And I think that through the work, through the transformational work that needs to happen at TCHC, that can happen as well. So what we're doing here is further investing in this, in, this, uh, uh, in this organization, but above all is investing in the sector and above all investing in our tenants. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Robinson. Did you want to speak? Yeah, I sure have a question about this. So what is your objective for this motion? What's your objective? So um, there, is, uh, there is a lot of conversations that need to happen. As you know, there's 1,600 uh, employees that are part of TCHC. And as you're going through 
the transformation of TCHC, you need to have staff involved. And there's a recognition of that in the report. Uh, um, if you speak to our staff, they recognize that all this work needs to happen. I'm just, just making sure that it happens in the, as a recommendation uh, uh, and not just in the body of the report. So this is exactly the language that was in the report as, as a point, and I'm just putting to, as a recommendation. So uh, well, I guess my question is, the, if it's in the report, why are we pulling it out? It, why are you pulling it out? I'm just making it a recommendation just to make stronger, just to, so that all our stakeholders feel very comfortable that this is the direction that is going and staff is completely fine with it. This is exactly the same language that they used in the report. And so your recommendation is that we, that they, the parties identified, engage in a discussion with labor reps regarding employment issues, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. A, a discussion, a negotiation. Yeah, it needs to happen, it needs to happen. Yeah, these are, we have two unions at TCHC, it's the same two unions that, uh, that we have uh, 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 at three, three, oh, so, uh, three unit, unions, and, uh, and so we need to have those conversations uh, as, as we uh, uh, decide on the governance of the new entity, uh, what to do with the scattered houses, so that's all, uh, it needs to happen. The same thing happened when we brought in housing connections. There was conversations because those were also members of our local unions and, but they have different contracts. They don't go under the, uh, um, the contracts that we had with, uh, with the city. So same thing happened with housing connections when they were brought inside. Thank you. Councillor Plato, a question? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councillor Bailao in terms of your question. So your intention, we think, is, for example, that uh, we have uh, cleaning staff or superintendents that at the local level, they, they are overworked, underpaid, and they've been asking to be treat, treated fairly. Is that more or less the, where we are going with this as well? Um, I do believe in all that, that we should treat them. But this is actually, as you are transferring uh, uh, the workers are, or to this entity or, or to the city or the future seniors housing entity, there's a whole bunch of conversations that need to happen, like su succession rights, like uh, uh, contract rights. Right now, uh, our 416 union has a, uh, uh, an agreement with the city, but they have an agreement with TCHC as well. I'm not 100% sure that all everything is the same, so there's conversations that need to happen. There's negotiations that need to happen between our staff and our, our, uh, our, our unions to make sure that, uh, that those things are worked out and that, uh, that as we proceed with the process to, to create these organizations, that they're addressed, that's all. And that we are aware of, of what's coming down the pipeline. Thank you. No further questions for Councillor Bailo? Uh, okay. Um, are there any other speakers besides myself? Okay. Well, uh, if I can uh, just say a few words, I and I'm going to finish with a fairly pointed comment. I want to say thank you to the tenants in particular uh, and the staff. I, I do have a motion to put up here which really just involves some fairly straightforward numbers being put into the report uh, to Council in early July. I want to thank the tenants, I want to thank our staff. Uh, we're still falling way short uh, on this, obviously. I mean, in terms of uh, how much we had to catch up on and how much we have to do, and that applies both to the repair capital but also to the kind of standards that we uh, are prepared to, uh, to accept. I heard one of the deputants early on, and I made note of these expressions that were in the deputation that that person made. They said this is about better housing, it's about, uh, it's about uh, decentralization, it's about reaching management easier. It's about listening and acting. Uh, the focus uh, for seniors, uh, recognizing their needs are different. Uh, changes not tomorrow, but now. Some of them will have to come tomorrow, but they're going to start now. Uh, and the objective being to make us a really great landlord. And that really is, I think, at the foundation of this report, to make sure that first and foremost we can become a really great landlord and then partner with people uh, that can help us to deliver um, services better than probably we could ourselves. And these are partners that are not far away from us and that are well-funded and well-equipped uh, to do so, including Linz and others. Um, but what it's going to require on our part is going to require a, a new structure, which this report is going to begin to deliver. It's going to require a change in attitude, and it's going to require a degree of will. I just want to sort of finish my comments by saying that I'm disappointed 
um, in uh, the response received thus far uh, from the MPPs who represent the very same people we do in the City of Toronto that we wrote to and asked them to help us with some advocacy uh, on the need to get some help with the capital uh, that uh, we need to get this job done. I will say in fairness, two of the New Democratic Party members wrote back and reiterated Ms. Horvath's commitment uh, to us. Uh, Mr. Ballard, the minister, uh, wrote back a what I call a combined boilerplate special in that he gave us uh, uh, the boilerplate on housing, but he also threw transit in for some reason I'm not uh, familiar with, even though he's the housing minister. But I do want to finish on this note, and I think it's important, uh, even though, because I think uh, one of our members here, uh, Councillor Perks, chose to be very critical of this administration. And I would just say this. I, I've only been here two and a half years. And, and others, including the councillor and others, have been here a lot longer. And there was no task force before that. There was no mayor's task force. There was none. The spending uh, on capital was $68 million. Now it's $250 million a year. And do I think it's enough? Of course it's not enough. But what I would rather see, rather than getting these kinds of, uh, of, of, uh, of sort of lectures that to sort of assume there's a degree of self-righteousness that applies to some people here and not others, is that we stand shoulder to shoulder and that we say to Queen's Park and to Ottawa, Ottawa looks like it's going to come through with some help, but particularly Queen's Park, that they have to step up as a moral um, and, 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 and just a, a, an imperative that rests with them to partner with us on this uh, before we start sort of saying, well, it's up to us to come up with this all on our own. That to me would be a concession in the wrong direction to absolve them of any responsibility for this. I haven't been doing that. And I would point out that uh, normally I'd do it through the chair, but I am the chair. I'll point out through myself. <laughs> that, that I, I would suggest some of those members that are giving these self-righteous lectures most have attended uh, uh, the, a number of meetings with Queen's Park and Ottawa that would resemble a, an oval that a skating rink is uh, that is a very small number, like how about zero, and have not stood shoulder to shoulder with me at any press conferences or stood in front of any buildings with me advocating as I've been doing relentlessly. I'm doing that on behalf of the tenants that we all represent because I've been to the buildings and I know they're unacceptable. And I know that even the 250 million this year and next year and the year after is not going to be enough. But we need help with that. It is not right to ask the property taxpayers of this city alone to shoulder that burden. And so I'm going to keep fighting for this because it's the right thing to do for those people, our tenants, our fellow citizens in the city of Toronto. I think this report represents a good start to move forward on changing the governance, changing the structure, doing a better better job as a landlord, doing a better job for seniors and other tenants of, uh, of TCHC, and we will keep working hard on the money because it's necessary that we do. Um, so uh, th th those are uh, my remarks, and I'm, I think we're ready to call the question on. So we have uh, three motions here. Uh, the first is motion number one by Councillor Palacio, which we can put up on the screen, I hope. We'll have a recorded vote on that. On motion one by Councillor Palacio, all those in favour, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bailao, Councillor DiGiorgio, Deputy Mayor Minimwong, Mayor Tory, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Pasternak, Councillor Robinson and Councillor Shiner. Motion carries unanimously. Motion number two comes from Councillor Bailao. Recorded vote has been requested. On motion two by Councillor Bailao, all those in favour, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bailao, Councillor DiGiorgio, Deputy Mayor Minimwong, Mayor Tory, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Pasternak, Councillor Robinson, Councillor Shiner. Motion carries unanimously. And finally, the third motion, which is mine concerning some numbers for the uh, City Council meeting uh, requested of the CEO of Toronto Community Housing. So, recorded vote requested. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. And now the item then as amended. Um, we should have a recorded vote on this, I think. We can, Madam Clerk. On the item as amended, all those in favour, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bailao, Councillor DiGiorgio, Deputy Mayor Minimwong, Mayor Tory, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Pasternak, Councillor Robinson and Councillor Shiner. The item as amended carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And thank you again to the staff for all their hard work. Uh, now. Well, I, I had one other request in that regard. Can I just ask the members if we could just focus here for a minute? Uh, it, uh, Councillor Carroll has this matter that had a deputant who is not here anymore, and that's number 26.43. Uh, and the question was, with the members of the committee, was this going to be a straightforward matter other than the deputant? Was that the only reason it was held? All right. Well, so would you rather then hold it for some discussion or questions? 
I don't think that's what she had in mind, but. But you wanted to send it away in another manner. Huh? Yes, I do not want the report. Do not want the report. I, I don't think it's going to be a short item. Uh, there's at least one councillor that does not want the report you've asked for, and uh, so I think we're going to have to have some discussion. Okay. Uh, councillor Pasternak, did you want to try and do something? Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. Yeah. If you could try and exit quietly, it will help us to carry on with our business because we have a long way to go. Just item 30. I think she wanted something really Which one? You can release one? Uh, Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I have to ask those that are leaving, uh, we still have a meeting going on here. Could I ask, please? Ladies and gentlemen, please, if I, I've got to just ask you to, to leave quietly, you can talk outside. All right, uh, 2621, uh, if I could just have a look. Bartley Drive, uh, Deputy Mayor Menon Wong is willing to uh, release uh, release that and move. he's moved the staff recommendations. 26-21, uh, uh, all those in favour? Sorry, can I know what the item is again? It's 2621, he's moving the staff recommendations. He 186 helped. Bartley Drive. 186 Bartley Drive, update on confidential agreement. All those in favour? Opposed? Carry. All right, and then I think Councillor Pashnak, you had something you wanted to raise? Yes, I can release uh, item 30. Uh, it's a motion drafted by staff. These are technical uh, amendments. Um, that's all I have to say about it. All right. Councillor Pasternak is moving a technical amendment, which is on the screen. Uh, do we, and it's just, concur, I assume, clarifying some numbers? It's 26 30. 2630 Children's Services Amendment to the 2017 Operating Budget to reflect increase in provincial contributions. And this uh, motion is up here to clarify some numbers. The, the net effect is not anything anybody should be concerned about, Con Councillor Pasternak. It's just a technical amendment drafted by staff to make Technical sure amendment numbers. drafted by staff. Because of changing that's, numbers. That's the reason Mayor, this was held down. You want to hold Mayor it down? Tory. Are people ready for the question? Mayor Tory. All right. Moved by. Mayor Tory. Yes. And staff just shake their head. That's what it is. Yes, they're all, there's head shaking going on there, like, Thank you very furiously. much. All right, uh, may I ask? Did you, <laughs> did you guys have any doubts? Call, call, it's nobody slumping over. Call the question, all those in favor? Okay. Opposed, carry. Item is amended. Item is amended. Uh, uh, now, all those in favor? Opposed, carry. Okay, uh, that, does that bring us next then to 26 point, uh, sorry, Jennifer, I have one here somewhere, but it's buried. We're at number, what, three, is it? Three. So, I'm sure some of you will say last but not at long last rather that we're at 26.3, proposed regulations for short-term rentals for consultation. And we have uh, deputations, uh, lots of them, and so I would ask the following. First of all, if I could ask you to, to make your points as succinctly as you can, you only have a total of three minutes, and I know you've been very patient, and I really am very grateful for that, and grateful you're so interested in this. And secondly, ask my colleagues to be uh, judicious in the asking of questions of the deputants so that we can uh, get through this, because we're going to try to complete the whole agenda uh, tonight, and that means uh, some, uh, I think it's uh, 61 deputations as of the moment, as of the list that I have in front of me. So here we go. I'll give the first five again so that they can be ready to uh, appear. Uh, Barbara Disman, Terry Mundell, Linda Brett, Chris Lahane, and Elias Ali. Those are the first five. So, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Disman, you're up. Aren't you lucky to be first? Tur did you turn on the mic there, Ms. Disman? I think it's just to push that button, yeah. How's that? There we go. Perfect. Thank you. My name is Barb Disman. Um, my family emigrated here when I was a child. I grew up in Toronto. I've been living in Seton Village for the past 20 years. Um, I work as a, a ESL teacher at a language school. For anyone who's familiar with that kind of job, it's not unionized. There's no benefits. It's hourly. And if there are no students at the school, I don't have work. So for example, this year between January and April, I didn't have work. I'm an Airbnb host. If it wasn't for Airbnb, I wouldn't have my home. I was fortunate enough 20 years ago, I'm a single parent. My mom was able to help me get a home. I have a huge mortgage and, you know, 
without a job, I can't keep it. So um, I'd also like to take a second to acknowledge Mayor Tory, the Council, and Ms. Cook for the report. I really appreciate the detail that was attended to in that. So, um, so I'd like to point out that I'm just a person. I'm not a hotel. I pay my taxes. I'm happy to do so. Um, you know, I try to provide a place for guests who, for example, um, I have Typical guest of mine, there's two. One, students waiting to move into their student housing or adults who are visiting their adult uh, children who live in the neighborhood and don't have space for them. That's basically my guess. You know, these are not people who would stay in hotels. These are not people with a lot of money. I don't have bags of money falling out of my pockets. I'm just trying to cover my mortgage. Um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity and I think that it's really important to acknowledge the fact that, you know, as an Airbnb host, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not making a living off of other people's backs. I'm just trying to, you know, provide a good service, to be upfront with people, to pay my taxes, and, you know, to try and make a living. Um, and also, you know, I'd like to ask, too, I'd like to ask the council to consider that, you know, I'm happy to pay a fee or to register my home, but I would ask that it not be punitive because I don't believe that we should be punished for offering a service. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions of the deputy? Well, uh, thank you very much. And thank you for mentioning three times that you pay your taxes on time. <laughs> Thanks. We like, we like that here. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Terry Mundell. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the Executive Committee. My name is Terry Munnell. I'm the President and CEO of the Greater Toronto Hotel Association, here to speak on items 26.3 on the proposed regulations for short-term rentals consultation. GTHA supports the recommendations in the report, including that the Executive Director of Municipal Licensing and Standard is to conduct more public consultation on the proposed licensing and registration framework, and we look forward to participating in the consultation. I too want to acknowledge the work of the team at Municipal Licensing and Standards and their colleagues in other departments for the efforts in the preparation of this report, the approach to such a challenging issue and the delivery of a report that builds a solid foundation is a testament to their commitment to their city. To comment on a few items in the report, GTHA is very pleased that there's a definition of a short-term rental that will be eventually added to the city zoning bylaws. That definition combined with the definition of principal resident establishes an important difference between traditional home sharing, which has been around for years, and illegal commercial activity, an important issue for our industry. The short-term rental is only permitted in the principal residence of any owner or tenant in residential and mixed-use zones and in all residential type buildings. GTHA recommends that during the consultation process, Staff review the issue of a cap for the amount of days per year that a short-term rental can be, moved, can be rented out. Currently, the consultation document has no limit, albeit there was some discussion from staff about the potential of a cap, but it being difficult to enforce. We think it's a good opportunity to have another look at that. We also think the city during the consultation coming up should review the density of residential and mixed unit zones to determine if a limit on home sharing should or shouldn't be established in specific areas of the city. We also support the establishment of a registration system for short-term rental operators and a licensing system for short-term rental companies. Requiring operators to register and rental companies to only advertise operators with a valid city registration is a step in the right direction. We do recommend that the process for registration be designed so that it's not confusing for short-term home sharing operators to register, yet is clear on the requirements as it relates to the definition and confirmation of principal residence and safety and security requirements. In other jurisdictions with complex registration systems, the home sharing operators do not register. Subsequently, a significant component of the home sharing economy remains underground and we don't believe that's a good resolve for anybody. We also recommend that enforcement measures including appropriate fines and penalties be part of the consultation coming up for those that don't or won't follow the rules. We also look forward to discussions on the hotel and short-term rental tax bylaw report as tax fairness is important to us. We look forward, Mr. Chair, members of the committee to participate in the consultation. Go forward. 
Thank you, Mr. Mundell. Right on the dot, three minutes. Uh, questions of uh, Mr. Mundell? Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your input on that, and uh, thank you for your patience today. Uh, Linda Brett, Bloor Street East Neighborhood Association. Ms. Brett, welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor Tory. I guess it's good evening now. Uh, and members of the Executive Committee, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. And my name is Linda Brett, and I'm currently president of the Bloor Street East Neighborhood Association. And I am, in my personal capacity, pra practiced income tax for over 40 years. I'm here today with my colleague, Mara Epstein, who will also be deputing later on other issues. I put on the screen the areas that are crucial that we are requesting specific direction on by the Executive Committee. In general, we're in agreement with the, uh, with the report that's come forward from Municipal and Licensing Standards Committee, but, we have but I personally have concerns with the principal residence uh, definition in the report having practiced tax for 40 years. Person who has designated the property as their principal residence on income tax filings or, gov or other government filings or records. As a former tax professional, I find this a flawed definition. For income tax purposes, both federal and provincial, a principal residence is not designated an annually on an individual's tax form and only applies to owned residences. The other form that might be applicable is the Ontario tax application form for any year, and it may or may not be applicable. The Ontario property taxes is for, credit is for property rented or owned. There's a family qualification, age and marital status, one per family, and the properties, some properties that are exempt from tax do not qualify, and it's family, inco in it's family income tested, so it's phased out. The other issue I have is it's designate, so, so, so it's, 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 in my recommendations, I'm looking for a definition that replaces the, per, uh, the term person with persons 19 years of age or over, and one such property per couple, either married or common law, or some wording that restricts the number of principal residents to one per family unit. The, uh, my other concern with tax filings is privacy concerns, uh, uh, allowing a carte blanche access to both personal tax records and other unspecified government documents and forms. So as a minimum, we're requesting consideration of one principal residence per family only. Then my other, our other concern is short-term lease of an entire home. Page 11 of the report indicates limiting short-term rentals to a dwelling unit that is a principal residence of the operator ensures oversight of the property and retains the intended residential use. We fail to see how this can be accomplished with a non-resident owner by someone who rents their entire home and is not there. So it begs the question, where, when is a change of use? Again, this is a tax term that I'm quite familiar with. And, and request clarification in the consultation uh, process and requ request the executive committee to make sp specific requests with respect to that. Uh, I'm now over my three minutes, so I have some examples, but I'll cut it here. All right, That's very, thank you. That's very respectful of you of the rules. I appreciate that. I was gonna ask you to wrap up, but you did that yourself. Thank you very much. Other questions of uh, the deputy, Ms. Brett? All right, well, thank you very much for uh, sharing. You, you've left this uh, material in writing with us as well, have you? Left this material in writing with us as well? Uh, it might just be useful to leave your suggestions here that you had on the sheet you had up in front of us, because uh, then we can inc incorporate that into the material going forward to the consultation. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Lahane, Global Head of Public Policy for Airbnb. Welcome to Toronto and to the Executive Committee, Mr. Lane. You have three minutes. Thank you very much. Privileged to be here. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Members. I've spent the day here in City Hall. I have to say that uh, Toronto certainly lives up to its reputation of having exceedingly nice people. So thank you for having me here. Um, uh, uh, really appreciate the work and the rigor that has gone into the process so far. Um, this Council and the report reflects 
uh, a seriousness of purpose. Uh, I spent uh, last night here in Toronto. I actually stayed uh, at East York off of O'Connor. I stayed with my host, Caroline, who you'll be hearing from later on. Uh, she has a basement apartment that she makes uh, available in her house uh, when her adult children aren't there. Uh, I also felt very safe because she's a police officer here in Toronto. <laughs> Um, you know, today, Airbnb uh, is a platform that has had 180 million guest arrivals. We're in 65,000 plus cities, 191 countries, and we've really been blessed with this type of growth because of the value proposition that we deliver. Uh, we are a platform for the middle class. Uh, we're democratizing tourism uh, by really making it more accessible for the middle class. One in three people who travel on Airbnb will not have been able to travel or stay as long, but for the fact it's more affordable for them. Uh, in fact, today we're releasing an analysis just showing that here in Toronto, middle class families are able to come and visit this great city uh, because it's a more affordable option for them. And this is in the context of the hotel industry doing exceedingly well here and there's a big enough pie for everyone to do well. Uh, secondly, we're democratizing the revenue from travel and tourism. Uh, we want to keep the money here local. 50% of the money spent by an Airbnb a traveler actually stays in the neighborhood where they're staying. That generated $417 million last year in Toronto and travelers spending $100 million uh, that went to the uh, restaurant industry. And then third, we're democratizing capitalism, making sure that the middle class is really benefiting from this. 80% uh, of our hosts are using the homes that they live in that would otherwise not be available. They make 97% of the money that they list their home for. A typical host here does, uh, makes their home available 53 times a year and makes about 3,500 bucks. 52% of them actually depend on that money to make their mortgage and make their rents. This is really the difference between many people being able to stay in their homes or not. I think you'll hear that from our great hosts uh, today. Um, over the course of the last year or so, we've put in place more than 350 partnerships, agreements with governments around the world, and I think we've learned some important lessons. I think the first lesson is that every city is unique and different, uh, and that you need to work with those cities to address their issues, and we're happy to be part of the process here. Um, I think the second thing that we've learned is that uh, we do believe we need to be regulated. Um, there's that this is a new thing in the same way you went from a horse and buggy to a car. Uh, you need new rules for the new thing and it's our commitment uh, to help provide the tools that we can to help put those new rules in place. And then third of all, um, and for us really important, is that we really should be optimizing for using this platform to help the middle class. Uh, this is a tool of economic empowerment at a time when there is economic stagnation. Uh, particularly pleased that we've received the support of Unifor, which is the largest private sector union in Canada, a group that has always fought for the middle class and working families. And I think that reflects the fact that this is a platform uh, that is designed to help the middle class. I, in conclusion, I'll just say that really, really, really um, impressed with the work that has been done here. We're at the table here to help work with the city and to support the city. We understand that's our responsibility. For the last couple of weeks, we've done partnerships in Mumbai, India, in Japan, inclusive of Tokyo and Osaka, uh, and most recently, Mexico City, which I understand is actually a sister city uh, of Toronto. I'm happy to answer any questions, but again, thank you for the time and thank you for the work that this committee has done. Thank you, Mr. Lehane. Uh, are there questions, first of all, from... Uh... By the way, uh... I've been here two and a half years, so you have the distinction of being the first person that actually came forward and said, I think we need to be regulated. Nobody <laughs> ever comes here and says that. Well, well, Mr. Mayor, I'll tell you something. I stood before the U.S. Conference of Mayors, which is an entity in the United States, about 250 big city mayors, and about a year ago I said, stood up before them and said, I'm going to say something no private sector entity has ever said, read my lips, we want to pay our fair share of taxes. Uh, so we do believe in regulation, and part of that also is paying the tax piece, so thank you for saying that. Questions of Mr. Lehane. First, anybody from uh, outside the uh, executive committee? All right, members of the committee. Mr. Councillor Palacio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you. So, in uh, principle, you do support the recommendations that uh, everything is? Yes, uh, certainly based on what we've seen in, uh, in the report. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, I, I really um, applaud people for the rigorous work that's gone into this. Because uh, Airbnb work in collaboration with policymakers and within other jurisdictions to have uh, regulatory frameworks that addresses local needs and concerns that have been expressed all throughout? And if so, do you have any examples? I'm sorry, so the question and was? If you have any examples of other jurisdictions where you've been able to work in collaboration with? Oh, sure. I just, I think, mentioned a couple. Mumbai, India, we just uh, worked on. Mexico City, we just got done. Uh, the country of Japan, 
Uh, we have more than 350 plus partnerships in the United States, places like Chicago, Philadelphia, uh, New Orleans, San Jose, state of Arizona, various places in Florida. Um, you know, it's been our commitment really dating back to the end of 2015. We put out something called the Airbnb Policy Compact, where we committed to working with cities based on a series of principles, paying our communities a fair share of taxes. That means paying the hotel or tourist tax. Mm -hmm. uh, we now have 250 actually agreements where we take on the responsibility of collecting that tax and then remit it on a monthly basis uh, to cities. It's been very, very successful sharing data so cities can see what the platform looks like down to the neighborhood level. Uh, and of course, coming up with those individual policy solutions. I think one thing that it appears that the report has really taken into account, you know, is an understanding that while there may be 15 to 30,000 units of housing that are vacant here in Toronto, one of the real big issues here is that the cost of housing has gone up, I think about 30% in the last year or so. Again, people here would know this better than I. Um, while at the same time, wage stagnation has been a big challenge, about 1% increase in wage over the last year here in Toronto. And so I think what the report really reflects is an understanding that you know, people using the homes that they live in, homes that would otherwise not be available, spaces that would otherwise not be available, can be used to generate that supplemental income. So very impressed with what the, what the report reflects in that regard. Thank you. Are there any other short-term rental platforms in Toronto, for example, that uh will uh, that have not uh, been taken into account in terms of, of what's happening with the short rental for, and i'm referring to and to flip key or home away and whatever else is there anyone else are you working in collaboration with them and where do you see yourselves in relation to the other disruptive sure. Technologies that are coming forward. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I can't speak on behalf of the other platforms and other companies out there, uh, but certainly our commitment has been to work with cities to put in place these regulatory frameworks. Again, I think we need new laws for new things. Home sharing itself is not necessarily new, but over a digital platform is new. And so, how do we sort of develop those new laws? But we do fundamentally need to be regulated, uh, and that has been our commitment. You know, what I would say, and again, I say this, you know, with, with the utmost respect, you know, as, that is, as this committee and as this council considers the issues, I do think, you know, it's important that um, as many processes are put in place to encourage as many other platforms to participate in the process. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen, and, you know, a good example of this is in a couple of European cities where we have engaged and we are actually helping those cities to be able to enforce the regulatory structures they put in place. Some others may not have. Um, and what has resulted is that some folks have moved off to the other platforms. So ideally, we put in, you, this body puts in place you know, a structure that uh, really facilitates as many platforms as possible participating, but we certainly will from our perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Palacio. Other questions of uh, Mr. Lehane? Uh, Councillor Barlow? Thank you. So you said that about 80% of your users uh, use their principal residency, correct? So do you know out of those 80% how many use uh, the entire home or part of their home or a secondary suite? No, I don't. Uh, and it's a great question. And I think one of the lessons that we've seen um, uh, across the world is that that is an incredibly difficult question to answer because people will define things in any number of ways. And I think one of the big lessons that we have extrapolated, and again, I think this is reflected in the report that has come through at some level, is that using a system like the pass-through registration, where you have some type of a process where people identify that the housing they're using would not otherwise be available for the long-term market, uh, serves as a very effective way to get at the goal of making sure that the platform is not being used to take long-term housing off the market. Can you tell uh, me a little bit more about that? Sure. So you could have, you know, the pass-through registration, as I understand it, this is how it works in some other cities. So I'm assuming that the Toronto version will be similar to this, but obviously defer to this group. Um, so uh, a potential home share will sign up, and when they go through the pass-through registration, they are potentially asked a series of questions. Sometimes you check the box, sometimes you give some type of an attestation. Uh, but as part of that process, you would be identifying uh, and basically attesting to the fact that whatever part of your house, whether it's a basement, whether it's the whole house, whether it's a room, however you're structuring that is housing that would otherwise not be available for the long-term market. And then some other parts of the world you know, have other provisions that they can build into that. Um, you know, we've seen some places that take a look at 
Um, and some cities in the U.S. will have a provision where uh, they have something where you're prohibited from being able to evict someone from their housing in order to either raise the rent or to use it for something else. And some of those places actually keep lists that we can use those lists to help effectively uh, make sure that housing is not Very being taken off the long-term market. So, oh, um, yeah, I'm sorry. So if I, mm -hmm. if I feel that this report actually needs a bit more work on that, you'd be willing to do that work with our staff? Uh, ha happy to, to work, uh, and certainly based on our experiences. And, you know, the one thing I would say on that is that, you know, clearly agree that we want to work together to make sure we're not taking long-term housing exactly. off the market, but also keeping it simple enough so you don't create a bunch of ways yep. that people begin to. And, I, and our experience is there's certainly ways to do that and, and would like to work with, obviously, with this. With Fantastic. This the other question is on the enforcement side. So mm -hmm. uh, you seem to be, you're one of mm -hmm. many home sharing companies and you seem to be very willing to cooperate. Uh, do, you, do you feel like there's uh, enough in, in the report that f for other companies that are not as willing to cooperate with the city uh, to make it so, or, or enough penalties that would discourage it not to do that? I, I, I do, obviously, happy to have lengthier conversations about it. Um, I, I, and this also comes back to that pass-through registration system. Um, you know, with a place like a Chicago, a New Orleans, a Denver, uh, now San Francisco is in the process of doing is using pass-through, so you're required to have to go through the pass-through connected to your license to be able to operate, you know, in that particular jurisdiction. Now, that doesn't mean that someone could go off the books or to a different market, but it creates a much easier way for the city to be able to effectively be able to enforce, because if someone hasn't gone through that process, you know, almost by definition, they presumably would be in violation, you know, of the existing structure. And so it just makes it a lot easier you know, on the enforcement side. And, you know, obviously, I, I think, you know, we're one of the larger platforms out there. And I think part of what we have talked about is that, you know, we're willing to do this stuff and help try to bring along the whole market in that process. But the pass-through does give you an awful lot of those tools. And, and not to be repetitive here, but in the same way we talked earlier about how you need this new law for new things, the pass-through actually is the equivalent of going from the horse and buggy to the car going from five miles an hour to a different type of speed limit, but still making sure that you're protecting people from a safety perspective. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Barlow. Uh, other uh, councillors wishing to ask questions? All right, well, well thank you very much, Mr. Lahane, and thank you for your, uh, your uh, submissions and for your uh, cooperation with us, uh, your company. It's been uh, helpful so far, and I'm sure it will be going forward. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, council members. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Mr. Ali, I presume. Thank you very yes, much. You're yes. waiting for your turn right in the wings. We appreciate that. Appreciate that. You uh, have uh, your turn. Good evening, Mayor Tory, council members. Uh, I'd just like to thank the hardworking staff at City Hall, the executive committee, and everyone here for their diligent work on the proposed regulations. Um, I live in the original block of City Place, so I own my unit. Uh, I live there. It's my primary residence, so it's not a unit that's being taken off the market. I just kind of want to tell you my story about Airbnb, what it means to me, why I started doing it, and why I think it's a great service. Um, so I initially started hosting after experiencing the hospitality of others while traveling through Europe. Throughout my stay, I experienced various forms of accommodation, uh, hostels, couch surfing, and even had a chance to try out this neat little service called Airbnb. Um, by far the most enjoyable stays I've had were while staying in people's homes getting access to people with local influence. And I found the travel experience to be exponentially better and enjoyed the cities far more, seeing as how I had a local perspective on things. This experience led me to try it out when I got back. So I list my primary residence in its entirety. Uh, since it's my home, I'm open to renting it out for periods where I'll either be out of town, planning to travel somewhere, or visiting with friends in or outside of the city. Um, I make an effort to personally greet and settle my guests in, and we're in constant contact throughout their stay. That said, my community and my neighbor's happiness is very important to me, which is why I prefer to host people who will be treating the neighbors and the shared areas with respect. It's fine to have a great time, but it's important to remember that these are people's homes, and I've yet to experience one of these wild parties or a guest that has been cause for complaints at all. It also helps that I love meeting new people. As a host, I try to go above and beyond in welcoming people to this city and often take guests out with my friends to some of our local hangouts. As a result of this approach, many of my guests have become my friends and they end up sending people they know 
to Toronto based on their experiences. So home sharing allows me to be an ambassador for the city and it also helps me to become more of a global citizen and many have offered to host me when I'm in their corner of their world. So initially the extra income earned from hosting was just an added benefit. But after a while I found that it helped me stay afloat and ultimately stay in my home. We're all aware of the rising cost of Toronto living and as someone who's part of Toronto's creative community, I also work for a startup. And there have been times where the income from Airbnb has helped me stay in my home. Not only does this benefit me, I feel like it benefits the local businesses that I frequent. It's quite often that people ask me for recommendations on where to eat, what local events or activities to check out, or even where to watch some live music. That's a nod to uh, Toronto's Music City Initiative, by the way. Uh, if I'm not taking them out personally, I give them an itinerary of where to go, what to do, and who to speak to in order to get in at some of the venues and restaurants I support. Now, it's not just for tourists. Most recently, I hosted an Irish couple who are moving to Toronto, but wanted to discover the city in a few different areas before committing to a place in the city. I'll have to ask you to wrap up shortly, Mr. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, in closing, I understand that there's a need for these structured regulations, and I'm happy that we're doing this. And um, I do appreciate that there are no condo blackouts because I do live in a condo and I feel that being an owner, there is some right on my behalf to control the guests that come through. Sorry to uh, go over there. No, that's okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, questions of the deputy? All right, seeing none, I will thank you very much for taking the time. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Nunziata. Just, uh, just one last question. Um, so you live in a condo? Yep. So you, the condo board allows you to rent out your unit? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, initially, there was no pushback on it, um, but after a while, they did say that they didn't necessarily appreciate uh, Airbnb in the building. Uh, I'd had discussions with the condo board, and it was as a result of some people not being responsible for the guests that they brought in. So uh, we have an agreement where I bring them in, and there hasn't been any strikes against my record as of yet. As of yet. Any other questions of Mr. Ali? Okay, well thank you again, sir, for your patience and for being with us today. Uh, next was Douglas Parker, but he's gone to deal with uh, some, uh, with his children, and he said he's gonna come back, so we'll stand him down. So I'll just give the next five names again. James Miller, Charlene Chalmers, Ben Zifkin, Maxine Louis, and Jeff Timmons are the next five. So that would make Mr. James Miller next. Mr. Miller, thank you for your patience. You have three minutes. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Mayor, Executive Council. I'm James Miller. I live in Carlton Village in Ward 17 on the west side of Toronto. First, I want to take a moment to thank the Executive Committee, all the hardworking staff here at City Hall and the MLS for their efforts to help develop the proposed regulations. We've been offering the spare bedrooms in our home to guests through Airbnb for three years. To date, we have hosted people of all ages from over 25 different countries. The majority of our guests have come to Toronto to study English at one of our language schools here. Some have come for tourism. Some have used our home as a starting point while they search for long-term rental as they have come to Toronto for working or student visas. Many of our guests stay with us for longer than 30 days. The additional income we earn through hosting has been a real game changer for our family. As a result, my wife is able to work on a college degree from home on an online program. My two boys, aged four and six, do not need to attend daycare before or after school because my wife is at home. There are no hotels in our neighborhood. Being an Airbnb host allows us to promote and support our local shops, pubs, and restaurants. We love to describe all of the wonderful local businesses to our guests. The Junction Strip is just a 10 minute walk from our home. Whether it's for groceries, a meal, or a beer, our guests are putting money into our community while they stay. Beyond the financial component, I want to speak on the social aspect for a moment. Traveling is expensive. Visiting new places and exploring them can be hard if you are alone. Hosting people in our spare bedrooms provides them a safe and affordable option to visit Toronto. It provides them with a family connected to the city to offer information on where to go, and what to do. If settling here, we can recommend to them great areas of the city for them to look for housing. Being an Airbnb host makes me an ambassador to our great city and to our great country. 
There have been countless evenings around our dinner table as we converse with great people from all over the world. We learn of their home and help them to understand ours. My children, at only aged four and six, are confident when speaking to new people. They may come from different cultures, they may have a different appearance, they may even speak with a different accent. But my children already know that inside, humans are, as a whole, inherently good and wish to do good to others. We've been able to bring the world to them without them ever leaving our home. For their future, I feel this exposure has been indescribably invaluable. In closing, I'd just like to suggest that with registration or licensing, I do welcome it, but ask that it's fair and not punitive. And I'd like this committee to, suggest, uh, to consider rather that the verbiage for primary residence be considered to one residence that the owner owns. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Miller. A uh, question from Councillor Palacio. Thank you, Mr. M Mr. Mayor. Through you is um, James. Good to have you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. As, um, as a constituent of my, I understand that how involved you are in the community and the level of uh, civic engagement that you bring forward. So I do appreciate that. And Gillespie in the whole area is an amazing uh, community where you live. Thank you. Now, um, you did mention that, uh, yes, you are married, you have two children. And um, in terms of the rental, this uh, whatever supplemental income that comes in is, can you be just a little bit more specific? How does it help you? Sorry, repeat the question. How does it's it help me? Supplementary income that comes in in terms of the rent. How does the Yes. Well, my wife isn't uh, does not need to work, and is able to go to school from home. So she's on an, in an online course, and this enables this money coming from Airbnb enables us to make this happen. Would be fair to say that um, knowing you and other neighbors in the in the community, there the majority of hosts in this case would be millenniums given the level of gentrification that's taking place in the community with young professionals, with young families, and, um, and a few seniors as well. In your opinion, who are the main guests that uh, are attracting the host from whatever in terms of ages? Who are the main the guests that are attracted? Um, my experience personally with guests that have come in through Airbnb, Airbnb tend to be in their early 20s. Uh, we have had some in 30s and 40s, however. Uh, but as a majority, they are here, as I mentioned, for attending English schools or also to relocate. Uh, we recently hosted a couple that was on a working visa and needed somewhere to stay until they found permanent residence. They were in their young 20s. In the average of those who are hosting, approximately, in your opinion, what's the age in the 30s, 40s? Um, in my experience with those I've met, it's incredibly varied. I've met seniors, I've met people younger than I am, uh, I've met people my age. So I, I wouldn't say that I've seen a specific demographic. I've seen a very, uh, a very varied uh, age demographic of hosts. One key qu question that I have for you, it's um, you have a, a beautiful home that I, actually, that I know the home quite well. You know exactly, actually, I was surprised to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so my question to you is, um, in the absence of having an additional cell contained unit or units perhaps, you, you are choosing to rent one or two rooms and whatever. Now in terms of common space, when you have to share that space with prospective guests, is um, how does it go? I just want to understand a little bit more in terms of sharing that space. Yes, absolutely, sure. So I'm not sure how we managed to do it, but we got a five bedroom home in Toronto, which I still shake my head that we were able to do it. Uh, and so the top two bedrooms we rent out. So those spaces we've uh, we furnished with a mini fridge, television, try to make them as much as their own living space as possible. Of course, the bathroom, the bathrooms are shared and the kitchen is shared. Uh, one of my usual questions to uh, our guests is, are you a night shower or a morning shower? Because we're gonna have to work this out, so. Uh, but you know, in the three years, we've never had a, an issue with that. People, uh, they love to be in our home. They love to live with us, but they understand the idea of privacy as well. Uh, if my wife and I have the movie on at night in the living room, they know what's going on and they retire to their space. Thank you, James. Thanks so much. Thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Miller? 
Well, Mr. Miller, thank you very much for being thank with you, Mr. Us Mayor. And for sharing your thoughts. Uh, Charlene Chalmers. Thank you, Mayor Tory, the Executive Committee, the hardworking staff at City Hall, and MLS for working so diligently to come up with the proposed regulations. My name is Charlene, and I started doing Airbnb three years ago in my home in Bloor West Village. My daughter had traveled quite a bit using Airbnb, and after telling me about her experiences, convinced me to jump on board. After all, two of my three children had just left home, and I had two empty bedrooms. Also, what better way to share my home with like-minded travelers from around the world and make some extra cash at the same time? My first guest was a gentleman from Spain who was with us for three months. He was here on a contract from Metrolinx. He had been renting an apartment but found it lonely and much more preferred living with a family in a neighborhood and experiencing Canadian culture firsthand. We, at the same time, learned a lot about Spain. He even got to know our neighbours and friends and would frequently run into them in the village while doing his shopping. I will never forget cooking Thanksgiving turkey. He was so excited that every time I checked the turkey, he had to take a picture and send it home. Many couples or individuals who are just new to the city have stayed with me for a few days or weeks until they could find a more permanent place to reside. During this time, I've taken the time to introduce them to my neighbourhood my city, assist them in apartment hunting, help them with banking, and any other pertinent questions they may have. They have all been truly grateful, and I still keep in contact with some of them. Doing Airbnb in my home has provided many parents, grandparents, and adult children an affordable place to stay while visiting family in the neighborhood, attending graduations, weddings, or spending time with a sick family member in the hospital. Guests have told me that because Airbnb is an economical way to travel, it allows them to extend their stay, and therefore our neighbourhoods and surrounding neighbourhoods benefit, from the coffee shops, local bars and restaurants, to the retail shops and cultural neighbourhood festivals, not to mention all the other great attractions the city has to offer. My husband and I have used Airbnb, which have all been positive experiences. We have even had the pleasure of hosting the couple we first stayed with in Arizona. Being part of the Airbnb host community has been an enriching experience for my whole family. There isn't one guest that leaves, and I haven't learned something interesting about them, their culture, their city, their country. It's like traveling around the world without ever leaving your home. I hope that the City of Toronto will recognize that Airbnb is a benefit to the promotion of Toronto neighbourhoods and city life, and not a detriment, as some people paint it to be. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions of Ms. Chalmers? Uh, Councillor Pasternak. Thank you uh, very much for coming in. Thank you. I'm assuming you've taken a look at some of the regulatory framework that's before us today to vote on. Uh, pages uh, one or two of the staff report. Uh, your thoughts uh, on that? Is there any merit in there of having some of those regulations, or or you believe in free market systems? How would you how would you assess it? Um, as long as the the regulations are fair to everyone, I'm I'm in a, in, a, in agreement to, like Chris said, to participate in the regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pashnak. Other questions of Ms. Chalmers? Thank you again very much for coming in today. Thank you. Uh, ben Zifkin. Good evening. Mr. Zifkin. Um, let me provide maybe a little bit of a different perspective. My name is uh, Ben Zifkin. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Hubba. Hubba is a Goldman Sachs-backed company, a scaling company here in Toronto. We uh, service about 60,000 brands and retailers in 140 countries around the world, and we do that all here out of Toronto and our headquarters here. In addition to our for-profit work, we've launched many community programs to increase digital, digital literacy amongst the underserved communities here in Toronto. And I also have the privilege to serve in uh, an advisory capacity to Councillor Holland on the uh, city's Innovation uh, Economy Advisory Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on the matter of regulating short-term rentals here in Toronto. 
I'm pleased to see that this report recognizes the importance of the sharing economy. I can tell you firsthand that Toronto's reputation as a center of innovation is one of its strongest assets. Embracing the opportunities of this new economy means championing it and that change that comes with everything about the new economy. Toronto embraces a dynamic, creative, and entrepreneurial culture, one that challenges old paradigms and status quos. This is the kind of thinking that motivates me and the amazing young people that work with me to get up every single day and do what we do, always pushing the limits of progress and its positive impacts on how we live, on how we work, and how we play. I recognize that innovation is dynamic. It never gives us the luxury of enough time to assess, fully understand and respond before it changes again. And I recognize the challenge that this poses for governments, especially cities, to respond in a timely and inclusive way that balances the needs and impacts of so many different groups and interests. While home sharing is not new, platforms like Airbnb are responding to what consumers want and enabling them to leverage innovation and participate in a sharing economy. These changes in innovation are happening and they're going to continue to happen in ways that we can't even imagine today. By creating the role of advocate for innovation, the city has acknowledged this new reality. If Toronto wants to remain an economic leader, we have to be at the forefront of innovation and clearly demonstrate that the city welcomes the opportunities that come with change. It is important that regulations for home sharing recognize that today's tech entrepreneurs work and live on a global scale. This includes living and working in more than one place. We need to be careful not to send the message to innovators and entrepreneurs by placing undue burdens on innovation. In terms of home sharing, this means respecting the rights of Torontonians to flexibly share their homes, the places that they live. In finalizing the details of new regulations, I encourage the city to keep rules flexible enough to meet the evolving needs of Toronto's innovators. Thank you, um, Zika. Uh, questions of Mr. Zipkin. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's an important message. Uh, Maxine Louis. Thank you, uh, Mayor Tory and uh, Executive Council. Uh, for all the work you're doing uh, about proposed legislations for short-term rental and thank you for the opportunity for me to speak. I think you're going to hear a lot of the same things today. To start with, I'm both a host and a user of Airbnb. I've traveled in the States and in Europe and I've really enjoyed my travel, I think more because of the local places that I've stayed. You know, they take me to their, they recommend their, their places that they eat and um, and their take on the city, and I've, it's, it's made it much more interesting as well as much more affordable. So when the Pan Am Games were coming in 2015, I thought, oh, I should start. So I tidied up my house. I, I'm an empty nester, okay, and I tend to be cluttered. So Airbnb gives you good incentive to declutter. Okay, anyway, it turns out that none of the guests that came came for the Pan Am Games, but they came to visit Toronto. And it really gave me and my partner a chance to just boast about all that Toronto has to give. And I live with the Danforth. Um, Mary Fragadakis is my um, counselor. And there's not big hotels on the Danforth. Um, in fact, there aren't any hotels where I live. So I found that people come to that area. There are yoga conferences and, se and seminars. There's a Danforth Music Hall. Uh, and as someone else mentioned, people who, have, who live nearby but don't have a lot of space will ask if they can have their father or their uh, mother come and stay at our place because it's close to them and then they don't have to drive downtown. And again, it's money because uh, staying down, I, I did look at the price of hotels for um, some other guests who uh, were coming to Toronto and I thought, wow, 200, 300, Four hundred dollars a night. I mean, that's it gets pretty pricey. And I find that you know I'm we're catering to the middle income who can come to Toronto and stay for a week because of Airbnb. 
And I've had many people come here, they're booking for one to two weeks because they are looking for a place. Right now I have a, a blind pianist from uh, Vermont and he and his uh, partner are coming here looking for housing. And I said, it's a daunting task. But luckily with Airbnb, it gives them uh, the chance to uh, stay for a while and, and look. I've had guests who are students, I've had guests who are uh, just economic travelers, um, and it's just wonderful meeting them. Uh, like I say, you get to travel even staying in your own place. And in the Greek town, I, I was in, introduced them to Vaughn Donuts or to Dolce Gelato and uh, Mezzi's for their souvlaki. And we bring a lot of business to the Danforth, and I hope that, um, Mary Fragadakis, you can uh, keep that in mind, okay? We, I'll yes. ask you to uh, conclude shortly, uh, Ms. Lillian. Yes, okay. And I'm on pension now. I mean, I, uh, and no matter how much you have saved, and it's, it, it's a drop in your income, and I rely on this income from Airbnb to help me with my taxes, to maintain a home, and it's expensive to maintain a home here. There's always something that needs updating, and if your house is 100 years old, there's a lot of updating, let me tell you. So Airbnb gives me that cushion that I can do this, okay? Uh, and I love the flexibility of Airbnb. Uh, I love the fact that they support, um, they support the hosts. Um, I just have to ask you to conclude now, if you would. Yes, okay. All right, thank and uh, you. anyway, I think Airbnb is good for me and it's good for Toronto. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Any uh, questions of the uh, deputant? Okay, thank you, Ms. Louie, very much, much appreciated. Uh, Jeff Timmons. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Council, for allowing me to speak today. I know this proposal has been in the work for a long time, uh, and I appreciate the city staff and MLS for their time and effort. I'd like to start tonight first with a quick story. A few years ago, I traveled to Prague alone, and I had used Airbnb for the very first time. The host in Prague invited me out to a local pub, introduced me to his girlfriend and a bunch of his friends, and we spent several hours there talking about the local culture, the politics. We shared stories, laughs, and most importantly, they shared with me tips on how to see Prague as a local. It was that trip that changed the way I travel, and it was also that trip that made me want to host here in Toronto. Since that trip, I've been hosting for uh, just over three years now, and I've met wonderful people from all over the world, including seniors, students, business and medical professionals, and even directors of films who participate in the TIFF. They all want to visit our amazing city in a cost-effective manner so they can stay longer. And just like my host in Prague, I too have taken my guests out to a local pub, introduced them to my wife, my friends. We share stories talk about the hidden gems in Toronto, and we learn about each other's cultures, which helps break down the barriers, making this world a little bit smaller. As a responsible and passionate host, I'm quite well known in the community as I've offered free mentoring to dozens and dozens of hosts in the city, tips and tricks on how to make life easier for them, safety and security standards, and making sure guests have amazing time in the city, because after all, we are ambassadors for Toronto. I've also managed and assisted with local fundraising and charity events with our hosts. We participate in fundraising activities for local charities, uh, including uh, volunteering uh, for fundraising walks, soup kitchens, and even building a home with Habitat for Humanity. Not only that, but I also donate a portion of the funds that I earn from Airbnb to the Canadian Breast Cancer Foundation, and my guests also participate and donate as well. I'm thankful to see the city did not put a nightcap requirement and that we're moving towards legitimizing home sharing. I do kindly ask that you do not discriminate against hosts who do not live in their home and ask that you consider to remove the restriction of hosting in a primary residence only. While I don't live in the home that I host in, I still meet and greet each of my guests and make it known I'm just down the street and ready for anything if need be. 
I suggest leveraging the one host, one home policy that's currently being leveraged in New York, San Francisco or Portland. And while I believe there should be a different set of rules for commercial operators with multiple listings, I just want to host in one home. I hope the right to share my secondary property won't be taken away from me. Thank you. I will ask you, uh, we generally don't have applause in here, and I say it now only because if somebody else comes up later and you don't agree with them, I won't want you to be jeering, and so we just generally conduct these meetings without that in here and in the City Hall generally. So if you could respect that, I would appreciate that very much. Are there questions uh, for this deputant, Mr. Timmons? All right, hearing none, I'll thank you very much for thank your you. thoughts, Mr. Timmons. I appreciate it. Uh, Fernando Ruiz. Dear Mayor Tory, members of the Executive Committee, staff at City Hall, and MLS, thank you for your hard work in coming up with the proposed regulations for home sharing. My name is Fernando Ruiz, and I live at 462 College Street. My wife Karen and I own, the, own this three-story building. I am here to tell you why this proper and fair regulation is so important to me. Karen and I come from working class families, and for the last 20 years, we each have worked very hard to earn every penny. We chose creative careers that fill the soul, but not the wallet. We love what we do, we both pay our taxes, and nothing has been handed to us. Karen is a milliner, a hat maker, and what makes her unique is the fact that every piece is completely handmade at her, college store in, at her store in College Street. I'm a sound designer and creative director who for the last 20 years ran a small independent ad agency in Boston. A complete random trip brought me to Toronto. A random walk through College Street brought me into a, in front of a hat store. And my appreciation for hats allowed me to stay in touch with Karen. Long story short, we fell in love married, so Toronto has been my home for the last two years. Sadly, because of my years of experience, I have outpriced myself and I haven't been able to establish professionally yet. That's why the income we generate through our Airbnb is extremely crucial to keep us afloat. 462 College is a three-story building built in the early 1900s. Karen has worked very hard to maintain historic distinction. If you know anything about owning property and owning your own business, you realize the expenses from taxes, utilities, and maintenance are pretty high. The hat store is on the first level. We live in a one-bedroom apartment on the second floor. And the third floor is an open space loft apartment. There are very few spaces in the city that, offers, that, that offer what our loft offers. A unique, a unique space with exposed brick walls, wood beam ceilings, the skylights and windows that bring natural light from every corner. Located in a historic building above one of the last remaining atelier shops in the world. The loft is furnished with our favorite and personal belongings, which gives, gives it a very unique feel. We have been Airbnb host for over a year. And if you read 82 reviews of the people that have stayed with us, you'll realize the unique experience that we have provided for them. If you look at the profile of the average Airbnb traveler, you'll find the kind of persona who enjoys immersing him or himself in the community, who wants to experience a neighborhood, who wants to be, feel part of the city, and who chooses a property that feels like a home. They patronize considerably the local shops, the coffee shops, the restaurants, and all the businesses. I'll ask you to conclude shortly, Mr. Sure, sir. Thank you. I, re I, I really hope that when you form the final regulation, you won't discriminate the second suite host, because that will be devastating for Karen and I. We look forward to comply with fair and, uh, and the regulation, because home sharing is a great business opportunity for independent people like us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ruiz. Uh, are there questions of Mr. Ruiz? All right, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Christina Chan. Ms. 
Chan, welcome. Thank you for your patience. Yep. Good Take evening, Mayor and Councillors. Uh, I am an Airbnb host. I first started home sharing shortly after I split up with my husband and moved into my own condo. The company of the travelers who passed through my new home was a great comfort to me during this difficult time. Hosting has become an important part of my life. I welcome regulation, and for the most part, I'm happy about the recommendations put forth in the report for the proposed regulations for short-term rentals. In particular, I like the proposal to amend the city's zoning bylaw to create a new land use called short-term rental, permitting hosts like me who live in condos to continue to operate so long as it is their principal residence. I would also like to applaud the research that has been done based on looking at other cities. I admire the recognition that nightcaps are difficult to enforce and therefore not worth pursuing. There were, however, two deficient points in the report that I saw. On page seven, paragraph two, it is cited that there is, low, there is a low but growing number of criminal occurrences related to short-term rentals. A number of percentages are then listed to illustrate the types of activities. These percentages add up to over 100, so there may be an error there. As well, there were no comparable statistics from the hotel sector that would help to put this information into perspective. The other point in the report that I don't think is justified is that the short-term rental tax is proposed to be up to 10% <coughs> while the hotel tax is capped at 4%. I haven't received a straightforward answer as to why there is such a large discrepancy. I spoke with my counselor, Kristen Wong Tam, and she only offered a brief explanation mentioning the high cost of setting up a new tax. On that point, I believe the hotel tax is relatively new as well. Ultimately, she said that it was a recommendation that came straight from the mayor. On a separate note relating to hotels, the report neglects the possibility that the hotels, uh, that ho the possibility of hotels listing on such platforms as Airbnb. This does occur in cities outside of North America. Anyways, for the next draft, I would urge you to expand on these points so that we as a community may better understand the rationale behind them. And also, since I have a few seconds left, I'm just wondering if any of you counselors have stayed at an Airbnb. <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. Not yet. So, uh, thank you very much for your remarks. Other questions of uh, Ms. Chan? So, no questions. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Uh, ben Devernas. Thank you for coming. Good evening, everyone. Uh, name is Ben Daverna here. Uh, we first, my wife and I, got introduced to uh, Airbnb by being guests there some years ago when this whole concept came to light. And uh, we thought that's an interesting way of traveling or doing things, uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, and then eventually, uh, about two years ago, we decided to get in the game ourselves and uh, become hosts. And uh, I guess the rest is history, but uh, it's been, initially we got into it because of the whole thing, extra income, uh, Toronto's an expensive city, um, you know, costs keep going up, wages are kind of stagnant, so uh, it's another source of income. Uh, and I guess unbeknownst to us, the personal aspect sort of, uh, came into play here uh, during the last two years. It'll be two years in July that uh, we were doing this. And uh, most of our guests come from Europe, a few come from Asia, China, Japan, Korea, sprinkling from North Africa, Brazil, other parts of South America and the US. So it's a virtual UN uh, in our house the last few years and it's been an eye-opening and revealing experience. Uh, when you talk to these people about uh, life in their homelands and just about every other subject under the sun that uh, comes up uh, when they sit down for breakfast. Uh, you hear about this sort of thing in the news about stuff that goes on in other parts of the world. 
And over the last two years, we've been sort of getting the first-hand accounts about life in these other parts of the world. So that's sort of been a byproduct or a benefit, uh, if you will, from this whole thing, which started out being as a way of earning extra money. Uh, now, the extra money was an important thing because two years ago our furnace went and uh, last year our hot water tank went, and so this was obviously helpful. Uh, getting back to the personal thing, I guess our guests are so mesmerized and like to stay here because they always leave these little notes here on the uh, dresser and they fill out. For example, this one from Ronnie and Michael from Germany. Uh, thank you for everything. It was a little happy face. Shortened to the point. And then this one here from Eloyd and Anthony. I think they're from the US. Uh, thank you very much for your home and your hospitality. This one's my favorite. Dear Ben, thank you for this wonderful stay at your home. You've been great hosts. And this is the Austrian way of saying thank you. A nice big Austrian chocolate bar uh, from Sarah and Stefan. If you haven't had eaten Austrian chocolate, I mean, it's experience, so, I mean, <laughs> this alone makes it worth everything. So that's just a sample of the, uh, I guess, the personal touch, and uh, that's about the size of it. Only one more thing I want to add to it. Uh, apparently, there were about 450,000 guests here last year. Um, now, let's assume they spend about 500 bucks for the few days they stay here. That's $225 million, so if you run that, figure in your head a few times, that's quite a significant number. Uh, it's something that should really be paid attention to, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for your submissions. Are Thank there uh, any questions of this deputy? Yeah. Councillor Nutsiava. So, do you claim that extra income when you do your taxes? <laughs> yes. You do? Well, I'm in the accounting business, so I do all so our stuff like that. As too, a, yeah. as a, okay. And don't forget, even though the income is in there, there's also expenses, so there's gross and net income, so. Yeah, so yeah, we do, because. Yeah. What would you have done if you said no? Never mind, I don't want to know. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would move receipt of the report before. <laughs> oh. Thank you very much for your, uh, your uh, deputation, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen the Rue. The room. Thank you for coming. You have three minutes. Thank you. I'm a bit short. I'll try to <laughs> take it. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Tory, councillors, city staff, and fellow community members as well. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and the ongoing work you're all doing to come up with fair regulations for short term rentals. I'm pretty much on board with things so far as things stand right now. My name is Kathleen LaRue. I am a single, self-employed artist, and I own a modest two-bedroom home in Ward 32 Beaches, East York. Over the past two years, I have shared my home with 21 international guests through the Airbnb platform. I do this responsibly, and with the blessing of my neighbors, I am not taking away any housing from the long-term rental market. On an artist's income, it is difficult to travel in traditional ways. I cannot afford hotels. I have historically relied on the hospitality and generosity of family and friends on the occasions that I've traveled abroad. In the last few years, because of Airbnb, the world has actually opened up for me. Not only can I travel more easily, I can stay in beautiful homes, meet wonderful, generous people, and experience a city in authentic ways off the beaten path, which is by far my own preference. Airbnb is a wonderful alternative way to see the world. By being a host with Airbnb, I am opening up my city to people who are on a budget like me, giving them an affordable way to spend time in Toronto. I love showing people my city. I love going the extra mile to make people feel welcome and comfortable, recommending my favorite local East End businesses, providing a safe resting place and good company. I love sharing meals with my guests and engaging in stimulating conversation about our commonalities and our differences, our travels, our work, 
our lives. Through Airbnb, I am creating international friendships and good memories. Veronica, a young theater artist from Uruguay. She was here to take a physical theater course at Zero Gravity Circus. She had not seen snow since she was six years old. On one of the few snowy days that we had this past winter, we went together to the Greenwood Community Rink and reveled in the fun of skating in the fresh, thick-flaked snowfall. Aki, a young nurse from Japan, was so grateful as I helped her navigate the daunting long-term rental market in Toronto for her year-long work stay. Just last week, I received a delightful email from Aki updating me on how her year has been unfolding. These are but two of many stories of my experiences with my guests. All of them have been positive. For me, Airbnb is an elegant, honorable, flexible way to round out my, func my fluctuating income. Hosting is both socially and culturally meaningful. It's about relationship building and learning. It's about offering others like me an affordable, authentic experience of my city. It's about being a responsible and proud ambassador citizen of Toronto. I'm counting on you, councillors, to help me grow and thrive in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. LaRue. Uh, questions of the deputy from Councillor McMahon. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming all the way down. Ooh. So why do you think that people want to stay in our area, in the beach, versus downtown? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I did a little audit of my own uh, 21 guests. I don't have the stats here because I didn't feel I was going to be asked the question. But um, what I remember is that about four of them were here because they had family members in the area. So they were here to be close to their family members in the beach area. Some of them wanted quiet outside of the city centre. They just wanted a really lovely, quiet spot to be able to walk along the boardwalk and do that sort of thing. Um, uh, let's see. Another, a couple of them also were here to take courses in the neighborhood, so Zero Gravity Circus. I had one woman who was coming to have some very specific um, back treatment done at Spiral Praxis, which is also in our neighborhood. So there are things about our neighborhood that, that draw people um, for those reasons. So that's what I can remember offhand. Sure. Yeah. And are there, are there any other options for them for accommodations that you're aware of in our neighborhood? In our neighborhood, I'm not aware of other accommodations except for one particular Days in hotel down one teeny tiny motel. teeny tiny little motel thing yeah and um, and you feel that your guests have really uh, supported the local economy oh absolutely in fact I have like this list of the uh, recommendations that I go to the green eggplant I go to the lazy daisy those are my top recommendations all of them go to those places that I recommend um, other other things as well in terms of shops and everything, but yeah, definitely some of the, the restaurants and uh, cafes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Ms. LaRue? Well, I'll thank you very much for your, uh, your, your interesting thank you. deposition. Thank you. Uh, I'll just ask in case he's come back, has Douglas Barker come back? Okay, we'll carry on. Uh, Alain Pescador. Good evening. Oh. Thank you uh, for the chance to speak to you in support of the many community benefits of home sharing in a global city like Toronto. Uh, my name is Alain Pascador. I am from Mexico. Uh, I'm a former Airbnb host and a frequent user of the service. I work for a Toronto-based not-for-profit organization that aims to build more inclusive communities. I see Airbnb's values and culture as consistent with this mission. As well, the platform has supported me financially at times when I have needed it the most. Home sharing is about breaking down barriers, building new connections across borders and cultures, and an openness to new experiences and ideas. Airbnb, through my own personal experience, and the frequent emails I receive from them on how they've evolved their thinking uh, from a corporate perspective, I believe encourages global citizenship 
and belonging. I'm pleased the city's report recognizes the importance of flexible cultural travel and tourism opportunities. Airbnb and its hosts, like myself, are passionate contributors to their communities, advocates for their neighborhood and ambassadors for their city. Airbnb users, like myself as well, must agree to the community commitment of the platform, a pledge to treat everyone without judgment or bias, demonstrating the fundamental importance of inclusion and diversity to Airbnb's home sharing community. I was also very pleased to learn about Airbnb's global commitment to connect refugees, evacuees, and other people in need with Airbnb hosts who have offered to temporarily house displaced people free of charge. Airbnb has partnered with agencies here in Toronto to make this program available to people in need. As you continue your consultation process, I encourage you to recognize the value of home sharing in building communities that strengthen inclusion, diversity, and the values that make us distinctly Canadian. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Pescador. Are there questions of Mr. Pescador? Seeing none, I'll thank you very much for your patience and for your deputation. Uh, Karen Ruiz. Welcome. Thank you. I started with good morning and then I crossed it out, put afternoon, yes. and now I'll say good evening. Right. Um, good evening, Major Tory and members of the Executive Council. Thank you very much for allowing me to share my story. My name is Karen Ruiz and I am an Airbnb host and a business owner. For the last 28 years, I have designed and made hats in my college street boutique called Lily Put Hats. My shop is a rare gem in the city. There are not many shops like it in the country, and I'm very proud to be able to show visitors the process of making a hat from start to finish, and they love buying something local and handmade. It's an amazing tradition that is my absolute passion. Every evening when I lock up my shop, I feel a surge of pride for my business, my building, and my brand, which I worked very hard to build as well as a unique and vibrant workplace. My husband, Fernando, that you met earlier, and I live on the second floor, and we have for the past year rented our third floor loft through Airbnb. We are responsible and accountable hosts. I love that my work and home life is so intertwined. It is my understanding that the proposed legislation may not affect our secondary suite, and I do hope that is the case moving forward. Being a small business owner in the city is both daunting and exciting. The past few years have been quite challenging business-wise. The face of retail is changing. More people are shopping online instead of purchasing from bricks and mortar stores. And there's always been competition in my product category with overseas made goods. It's very expensive to manufacture in the city. My raw materials are priced in US dollars and my wholesale business has dwindled due to mass-produced goods offered at super low costs. I employ five amazing full-time millinery assistants who are passionate and talented. One has been with me for over 20 years. It has always been very important for me to pay these women a fair living wage, but in the slow months when no one's shopping on College Street for a hat, it's really difficult to maintain five full-time jobs. The secondary income from my Airbnb allows me to provide the security to them in these uncertain times. They can feel that their jobs are safe and they will not be laid off or have hours cut when things are slow. This makes for a workplace that is both relaxed and meaningful. My work staff are self-sufficient, loyal, and invested. Recently, I was able to implement a very modest um, benefits package. So now we are all able to enjoy um, getting eyeglasses, dental care, prescriptions, and uh, some physio to offset some of the physicality of the work. 
The secondary income also allows me to research and develop new techniques and new materials, as well as pursue creative pro more creative projects and participate in international juried arts and crafts show. I love what I do, and having this Airbnb allows me the flexibility to be an entrepreneur and make creative use of my space to host my family from Sault Ste. Marie and Fernando's family from Mexico. Airbnb also supports my deep commitment to the community I live in. And as a host, I recommend local businesses to ensure that they thrive along sh alongside my own shop. I'll have to ask you to uh, wrap up. Sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, this income from, from Airbnb is essential to keeping my life going, my business evolving, and the five women gainfully and securely employed with benefits. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Ruiz. Uh, are there questions of uh, Ms. Ruiz? Uh, Councillor Barlow? Thank you. So how long have you been a host? I'm, I, I'm not uh, sure. I've been a host uh, just over a year. Just over a year? Yeah. And do you rent parts of your home or? Um, no. Uh, my business is on the main floor. Fernando and I live on the second floor, and we rent the third floor loft. OK. So what was the third floor loft before? this year that you started being a host at Airbnb? Uh, we had pre previously, I had, te I had tenants. S so and when, those ten uh, when the last set of tenants um, had moved on, um, I saw it as an opportunity to do something different with the space, um, to be able to integrate it into the fabric of my financial security. And the, the timing just worked out as such. And what led you to go from long-term rental to short-term rental? Well, what what, what are the main reasons? Um, definitely, it's the it's the increase in in earning that we get. But we also I also wanted to make um, a, a more fle have a flexible use of the space to host our families, um, to use it as a um, a creative space that Fernando and I can develop aspects of our businesses separately. So you are getting more as an Airbnb rental than a long-term care rental? Um, it's a little bit, no. uh, it's, it's, it's a little premature for me to speculate because we've only been doing it a year and there was um, considerable expense starting up the, our Airbnb. Thank you. Well, I, you know, mostly in my, um, in, in my, in my um, uh, comments, uh, it would really affect um, the day-to-day -day seamless running of my business. Um, certainly, it would be a challenge for me to employ the long-time employees that I've had. And as well, I believe my husband spoke to the challenges that he'd, he has had um, securing full-time employment since, um, since our marriage about five years ago. So it would significantly inf in, impact my day-to-day -day life. Thank you. Okay, any other questions of Ms. Ruiz? Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your patience thank you. and being here with us. Uh, Tam Tamara Handler. Tamara Handler. Uh, Parul Bansal Sonder. That's how it was written down. Did I get it right? Not really. Not bad, <laughs> not really. Well. It's like Carl with the P, Parl. <laughs> Ah, okay. Sorry about that. I was just I was reading it as it was written, but you're most welcome here, and you have three minutes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillors uh, Mayor Tory. Uh, so my name is Parl Bansel, uh, Head of uh, Business Development at Sonder. So Sonder is a fast-growing Canadian hospitality company that provides short-term stays to travellers in cities across the world. As a proud Torontonian, I am very excited to be launching uh, Sonder here in our city. Since we arrived last year, August, we were welcomed by both neighbors and worked with our neighbor, or sorry, welcomed by both owners and neighbors and are working with neighbors to, uh, uh, to be respectful to their space. Presently, we manage 12 properties across the city with plans to continue to grow. When we arrived here in Toronto um, and the October short-term rental report was released, uh, we as a company decided to halt growth and dive into how we can work with the city and be part of the city. Uh, we wanted to use concierge service. We acquire properties by leasing them directly from landlords and then we list them for short-term rentals and manage them fully. This model allows us an extra layer of control over each rental that most platforms can't provide. Uh, and it means we directly uh, we can directly address important civics concerns like nuisances and cleanliness, 
So for example, uh, trash never piles up at any of our properties because we partner with local housekeeping companies to regularly maintain each property. We have a 24-7 rapid response staff here in Toronto to address any issues that may arise from our guests or neighbours. And in that sense, we, we essentially have enforce, uh, our own enforcement mechanisms in place to prevent any destructive behaviour. I am also uh, here representing a group of 150 short-term rental operators that are providing great services in our city. Uh, you've not heard many of their voices because many of them are fearful of the repercussions the city will have uh, taken against their businesses. <clears throat> Although they may be a quiet voice, they have provided an important service, uh, he and here's a few quick examples for you. Uh, new immigrants to Toronto who need affordable places to stay turn to many of these operators. Families who face crises, for example, uh, homes that have burnt down, uh, can share in these homes. Families who've come abroad to celebrate weddings and babies, uh, and extended families who want to be closer to medical patients, uh, to their, um, to their uh, family who has uh, medical patients. Sonder and all the 150 other providers are contributing to local businesses. Uh, a few examples, a uh, bike shop near one of our units uh, will be offering bike rentals to our guests, a service they've never provided before. A cafe on College I have to Street. I ask that you to uh, move to conclude, if you could, Charlie. Perfect. A cafe on College Street was impacted by last summer's uh, sidewalk renovations, and our guests go there regularly for breakfast. Uh, Saunders is really excited to be here in the city. Um, we care about our neighbors, and we want to offer our services here in Toronto. And we look forward to being part of the conversation further. Thank you very much. Are there questions of the deputy? Just may I ask you, uh, when, when you say you manage these properties, are the, are the owners in residence at any of them or are they not in residence? They're not in residence. Not in residence. So they're properties that are owned by somebody somewhere else and you manage them and rent them out to these people on the different bases you described? That's correct. Okay. And, and uh, okay. Um, so obviously, from the standpoint of your business, the principal residence requirement would not be to your liking. Uh, yes, and we also operate in many commercial spaces as well. Commercial, okay. All right. Any other questions anybody has? Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. Um, Vanessa Tam. Hi. Tam, three minutes. Thank you. Hello. Hello, my name is Vanessa Tam. Uh, before I begin, I want to say a quick thank you to the Executive Committee, City Hall staff, and MLS for all the hard work put into the proposed regulations. Uh, so I've owned my condo in the King and Spadina area for a few years now, and last year I began sharing my home on Airbnb. Uh, I list a private bedroom with all other living spaces shared, and just that one bedroom a couple times a month has significantly helped uh, offset condo costs. Before Airbnb, I waited tables as a second job to get by, and now, still as frugal as ever, I've integrated home sharing because it adds to my social life and uh, helps financially. I'm relieved to see that nightcaps are not imposed because this kind of balance is important to my life. I do believe it's the depth of each person's experience that can measure social impact. My first Airbnb stay was in Philadelphia, where I volunteered for the Philly Film Festival, and my host Christina and her dog Panchito welcomed me into the city. Christina gave us directions, recommendations, and shared a slice of her life. Uh, she works at Google and eventually had the opportunity to come to Toronto. She, she messaged me right away and I was happy to be able to return the favor in my home city and of course show Panchito all the dog parts. Now, uh, I don't know if my parents would have the same, uh, would have been this tech, uh, this, this tech savvy, so I was thrilled to receive my first Airbnb guest request from the sweetest retired couple who decided to road trip across Canada. I told myself, Vanessa, this is what you uh, want to do when you get to that age, adapt to new things, and live life to the fullest. Personally, um, I feel that in the digital age where people are head down on their phones all the time, the beauty of home sharing for me is that it gets people back in touch with real life. People who would otherwise never uh, meet each other and add value. 
um, to, people, to people in really real ways. So since I've started home sharing, I've ventured to the different cultural pockets of the city with a woman from India, and she left amazed at how the city celebrates diversity. I've attended local tech events with a guest from Ottawa who works at Shopify, and because he invited me, I've expanded my professional network. Home sharing is an important part of my income. Uh, my quality of life and how I interact with my city has improved in tandem. And I hope to continue sharing uh, my condo without a nightcap and doing it responsibly. Um, and I'm excited to see how my city decides to regulate short-term rentals. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Tam. Questions of Ms. Tam? All right, thank you very much for your deputation. I much appreciate it. Thank you. Peter Toma. Roma, welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the executive committee. My name is Peter Toma. Uh, I'm a partner with the firm Urban Metrics. Uh, Urban Metrics is a land economics and real estate advisory firm uh, located here in downtown Toronto. We've run 30 years of experience doing economic impact analysis uh, for both public and private sector clients. Earlier this year, we were approached by Airbnb to provide an independent third-party evaluation of the home-sharing platform in the City of Toronto. Uh, using 2016 uh, Airbnb data in tandem with other expenditure, uh, tourism expenditure um, uh, data compiled by RTO5, which is the regional tourism organization, um, we prepared an economic impact statement, a copy of which most of you uh, uh, should have uh, have seen in the package. Um, we've determined that the economic impact uh, of the Airbnb platform in 2016 was $417 million. That's $417 million that are coming into the city in the back pockets of, uh, of guests. Um, uh, at Airbnb. Um, around 70% of that uh, expenditure is captured directly by hosts uh, and businesses that are located in the City of Toronto. Uh, in turn, that spending activity is spent um, 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 in, in, in local restaurants and uh, in shops and attractions, um, and that uh, amounts to around 6,000 full-time person years uh, of jobs in Ontario, 82% of which are located in the City of Toronto. And while we appreciate that much of the, uh, the visitor expenditure would have happened regardless of Airbnb, uh, we have to recognize that there is a growing segment of visitors to Toronto that simply no longer uh, prefer to stay in conventional hotels. Um, people are certainly looking for more authentic and personal experiences. I want to talk quickly about, uh, about the four key economic benefits of Airbnb. Uh, we've heard, we've, we've, we've heard uh, uh, throughout this, uh, throughout this uh, uh, evening session that uh, it provides important supplementary income. Airbnb provides uh, income for homeowners, uh, a safe and reliable platform helping homeowners monetize underutilized assets uh, such as spare bedrooms and furnished apartments. In 2016, the average Airbnb host in Toronto earned a total of $5,330 using the service. Um, that's about $450 a month, and that would repre represent about 7% of the median income uh, uh, for a household in the City of Toronto. Supporting tax relief. We've heard repeatedly from the Bank of Canada um, uh, around warnings that the, uh, that the Canadian economy is deeply vulnerable uh, to the impacts of high mortgage to income ratios. Uh, according to the survey of hosts in Toronto, more than nearly 40% of those hosts uh, use the uh, use the income earned on Airbnb to uh, to pay down the uh, the debt in their. I have to ask you to uh, wrap up now. Sir. Okay, so in in wrapping up, we'd ask that uh, that uh, this executive committee recognize that Airbnb and other home sharing platforms uh, provide a cause a positive contributor to the uh, to the economic landscape of Toronto and uh, the global brand proposition of Toronto as a must see destination, um, and that there are important uh, there are important considerations. Sir, I'll, I'll have to ask that yeah. you wrap up. Thank you very much. Are there questions of, uh, yeah, okay, Councillor Palacio. Thank you, Mr. Ma Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one question. Through your study, what uh, would be the economic impact of Airbnb to the city? And also, I'd like to know a bit more about what would be the average spending per guest 
and perhaps where do they spend the money? I'm thinking about food, accommodation, whatever else. Can you just, within your report, just enlighten us more or less what's, what's what? Uh, sure. So uh, in in the report, we have a we have a detailed breakdown in the ways and means that uh, both hosts and guests uh, spend uh, uh, spend uh, the uh, the uh, the monies that they you know that they that they bring into the economy uh, through Airbnb uh, outside of outside of uh, for the guests uh, outside of. Um, outside of the accommodation itself and outside of the travel costs, airline tickets, uh, gas. Uh, certainly restaurants are the single largest, uh, the largest contributor uh, to that. So one of the things in the economic impact that we looked at was the net benefit. So we recognize that a certain amount of travel would have happened other, what would have still happened and been served by the hotels. But we've looked at the amount of additional uh, the additional spending that was made by virtue of the fact that people stay longer, are able to stay longer because they're not spending as much money on accommodations and they're redeploying that money elsewhere into the economy through restaurants. So the restaurants definitely are, are representing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the lion's share of those additional expenditures. And my question was, uh, what's the average spending per guest and where the money goes? Sure. If you don't have that information, that's fine. Yeah, it's in the, it's in the I direct you to the to I page seen four it. of the report. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Palacio. Uh, any other questions of Mr. Toma? Sir, well, thank you very much for your deputation. I appreciate that. Aaron Zifkin, Regional Host, Community Operations Director, America Airbnb. Aaron Zifkin, okay. Diane Emery. Emery, welcome. Hi, good evening. You have three um, minutes. Thank you. Good evening. You have to turn your mic on there. I don't think it's on. Maybe it is. Hello? That's it. Now okay. We're there. Um, my name is Diane Emery, and I've been hosting an Airbnb unit in my home for the past one and a half years. I live in Little Portugal in Mike Layton's neighborhood or ward. Um, I would like to speak to the up to 10% tax you're thinking of implementing. Um, the City of Toronto is, is planning to implement at almost 10% tax on my Airbnb guests. Big international hotels in Toronto pay about 4%. The people who stay with me aren't business people. They are typically middle class people who are here to visit family or young people who want to explore our city. They don't have an expense account. When they pay for accommodation, they don't whip out their platinum company visa card and pay the bill. They pay for money they have saved, sometimes for years, to come to Toronto. You will be charging my lovely Peru couple who stayed with me for a week. Their son lives in my neighborhood and his wife recently gave birth to their first child. The proud grandparents, grandparents traveled up to Canada. They don't speak English and they don't have a lot of money. Excuse me. They can't afford a week in a hotel. After they left, the new parents dropped by my place with their baby and thanked me for taking care of their parents. I love Toronto hotels. They give wonderful service, but they are big. They are busy and they are corporate. People get lost. My spot is quiet, it's personal, and it's welcoming to young people to students and to proud grandparents. Your 10, up to 10% tax will also be charged to my sweet Irish couple who recently stayed with me um, about uh, in the early spring. Rory is newly retired and has never traveled to North America. His promise to his son who lives in Toronto was that when he stopped working, he would come to Canada to visit him. This spring, he made good on his promise. His son rents a tiny apartment five minutes away from me. Rory, his wife, and their son would spend most of their time in my neighborhood and in my house, visiting, eating meals at home, as well as going to local restaurants. They experienced the best of Toronto. They visited Kensington Market, the AGO, even CN Tower. 
Um, they they uh, went over to Center Island before it was flooded. They fell in love with our city. They were living in a tiny house in a tiny neighborhood in the best city in the world. We make this possible and accessible to people who may never come if they had to pay hotel costs or increased fees. I am not a big corporation and my guests are not business people who can easily accommodate expensive trips. Please remember who exactly will be paying this tax and please make the rate fair to people like my Irish and Peru guests. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Ms. Emery. Are there questions of Ms. Emery? Hearing none, I will thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Kirsten Hildebrandt. Ms. Hildebrandt, hello. Three minutes, uh, yeah, that should be okay. Hello? Oh, yep, working works. fine, thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. Thank you <clears throat> for this opportunity to speak. It's my first time doing this. Um, I have been an Airbnb host for uh, since uh, fall of 2015. And I can tell you it has helped me tremendously. I'm self-employed, have been self-employed for 40 years as a window display artist and uh, also a part-time yoga teacher. And you don't get rich in either of those professions. So. Um, uh, in 2015, my income as a display artist dropped by about 30% with a lot of brick and mortar stores closing down and online taking over. And so that's when I started doing Airbnb and it has allowed me to pay my mortgage, which I'm going to be paying for a long time still. And um, I still got a little bit to go before I can collect a pension, a year and a half. and. Uh, um, it's just, honestly, it's just been a godsend, a blessing for me. And the people that I have met in this, I could write a book. It just, I want to cry sometimes when I think of the people whose, um, I'm going to cry, <laughs> whose lives have touched me and whose, um, whose lives I have touched. And I have so many beautiful thank you cards and, um, messages from people to say thank you and I feel like you know even though if my if my business dies out as as a window display artist I can replace that and as an ambassador to, to Toronto and I can I realize how much I love hosting people and oh my god I wasn't gonna do this anyway <laughs> um, I take people to the farmer's market. I take them to the local places to listen to, to music. We've got a little place called Relish in our neighborhood. I'm, I'm in the Maine and Danforth area, by the way. And um, it's just such a lovely neighborhood and close to the GOAT station, close to the subway, main subway. And uh, it's just very convenient for them. There's, you know what, there's no hotel where I live, no hotel. There's one down at Leslie and Queen, but it's just not convenient and it's not that big. Um, so I would, I'm really glad that there is nothing on the table, at least not that I know of, in terms of limiting how many nights I can um, have my two extra bedrooms in my house uh, offered as accommodation for people. So I really do feel, hope that, that there will be no regulations in that respect. And I am totally fine to, I've got 15 seconds, I've got totally fine, I'm totally fine to, um, with a tax on that, but please, please make it fair. Um, and I do pay my taxes. I, I declare my income from Airbnb. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hildebrand. Is there any questions for uh, uh, Councilor McMahon? Thank you very much. And I will, uh, thanks for coming down. I'll ask you the same questions I asked. Uh, yeah, they're a wonderful Ward 32 deputant. So yeah. why do you think, uh, people want to uh, stay in in this neck of the woods and the Danforth, the Danny or the Daniel I'm hearing now. Okay. Um, why in this neck of the woods versus downtown? Well, it's Besides just- Besides the counselor. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> um, it, well, we've got the beach. Can you beat that? We've got the beach. We've got lovely restaurants. We have, uh, the Beach Jazz Festival. Um, 
yeah, there's just so many great things about it. It's a lovely walking neighborhood. I've got a bicycle in my shed. I let people use that. Um, um, there was something else I wanted to say, too, um, in terms of the people that come to stay with me, um, and a lot of other uh, debutants have shared that already, they don't have a budget. You know, a lot of them are here on a, on a working holiday visa. They can't, you know, they, this is the only option for them to be able to stay. And um, uh, artists, people from the film industry that are on short-term contracts, I'm not answering your question, am I? Um, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, they just love the area and it's very close. It's very easy for them to get downtown with the GO train if they need to, 10 minutes. Um, yeah. And you're near a park? Oh, our parks, yes. yes. Definitely Q Park. We have Stevenson Park. Um, we have music in the park on Thursday nights. We have a fire pit now. Um, all kinds of uh, things, events. I teach a yoga class there Saturday morning, if any of you counselors, <laughs> as well. <laughs> Nine and, to ten in the morning. And you're saying there's no hotel or motel or other no, accommodations in sight? No, not nothing right. that I know of in that area. And people, yes, the other thing is I've had a lot of people come to stay with family, relatives, babies are being born and grandparents coming from Japan to come and meet the baby and so forth and, you know. Great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor McMahon. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Hildebrand. Uh, that brings us to Caroline Miller. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. My name is Caroline Miller. I've lived in Toronto my entire life, and I'm proud to be a Torontonian. I'm equally as proud to be an Airbnb super host. I have earned over 100 five-star reviews from tourists, newcomers to Canada, and citizens of this great city. When the last of my four adult children left home three years ago, I decided to list my basement apartment on Airbnb to generate extra income and to connect with people from around the world. It has been an enlightening and culturally, culturally rewarding experience. I would like to share my favorite story of a wonderful family who were immigrating to Toronto from India early, earlier this year. Rohit, Rina, and their one-year-old son stayed with me for one month while they looked for work and arranged for long-term long accommodations. <clears throat> I was actively involved in providing them with family resources for new Canadians, parent-child groups in the neighborhood, and connecting Rohit with a potential employer. Yeah. We, re we remain good friends to this day. This is I try to greet all my guests in person when they arrive, giving them recommendations on local restaurants, shops and attractions, and helping them get the most out of their experience while visiting Toronto. When I have family members visiting from out of town, I have the flexibility with Airbnb to block my calendar to accommodate them. If I had a long-term tenant, I would not have the luxury of being able to do this. Airbnb gives guests an unparalleled, immersive experience in our vibrant, diverse city. Speaking for myself, and I'm sure for most hosts, when looking to regulate short-term rental units, all we, all we ask is for fairness and equality. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, questions of uh, Ms. Miller? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Karen Yang. Good evening, everyone. And I'm very excited and honored to be able to speak to Mayor and all the councillors in the room tonight as an immigrant, new immigrant here. My name is Karen Yan. Um, I live in uh, Midtown, Toronto. I moved from China to Toronto last year, just last year. Um, and then uh, I want to share my uh, story quickly. Um, so basically, as m like most of the new immigrants in the city, um, I've been through a very tough moment at the beginning because, um, because of the language issue, lack of social life, and then um, I need to learn the new system of a new country from beginning. 
So it's very tough, especially um, the thing is that I cannot find a full-time job that match my experience immediately. That means I have um, problems supporting myself financially. So um, that would be huge for me. So I rented a two-bedroom from my landlord, and then um, because my families are coming to see me from time to time, so I rented one room um, on BNB when my families are not here. Um, I talked to my landlord about this, and she's very supportive. Her thinking is that, first of all, um, I trust that you will choose your guests carefully. Second, you are the sole responsible for maintaining the house in a good shape. So then we have a deal. I have her consent, and ever since I've become a super host on Airbnb. So I just want to highlight two things on my experience. One is that um, through this um, renting, the income actually really literally helped me a lot to take a break, step back a little bit, and think of my next step. So now I'm taking some management courses in George Brown, and I'm also doing uh, part-time headhunting, which helps me to stand in the city. And on the other way, I have hosted so many uh, new immigrants in the city, and I was able to be there and share my experience and tips with them, which I think is w very helpful in their future life. The second thing that I want to emphasize is that I feel very comfortable with the uh, platform, because if you are not comfortable with any certain guest, or the guest is violating your house rule, you can just call Airbnb, and they can solve the problem um, in five minutes. Um, so I'm very comfortable using them in the future. I want to sum up that um, I have traveled to 23 countries so far and more to come. And I choose to immigrate to Toronto, um, the reason being that Canadians are the most friendly and welcoming um, people in the world. And uh, Toronto is the most diverse international city that I know of. So I have a New York guest. Um, he's saying that Toronto is more diverse than New York. And I asked him why. And he's saying because everyone goes to New York and become New Yorker. Everyone comes to Toronto and they still have part of their culture and custom. So I really appreciate that. And I really hope that I can continue being a host and represent the spirit. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Yang. Um, and I can confirm to you, Toronto is more diverse than New York, so you can tell your friend he's right. Um, are there questions of this deputy? We thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you for your time. Uh, Todd Hoffley. That's not Todd, I assume. That is Todd? It is Todd. I thought you were running away, uh, Mr. Hoffman. <laughs> people, have done the, people have done that from here, and actually at some points in the evening we give credit for that, but uh, <laughs> you're most welcome and you have three minutes. Okay, hey, thanks for having me. Uh, let's see, turn this on, okay, there we go, all right. Uh, my name is uh, Todd Hoffman. I'm here today as an individual who wears a lot of hats. First, I'm the president of Toronto Standard Condominium Corporation, number 2164, Liberty Tower and Townhomes. Second, I'm the founder and president of the Liberty Village Residents Association, a collective of 18 condominium corporations consisting of approximately 5,500 condo units and 9,000 residents in and around Liberty Village. We share our condo board experiences, our best practices, and in five and a half short years have become the largest residents association in Canada and very possibly the world. So you might say community building, particularly in high density condo towers, is my thing. And you'd be right. It's become my passion, it is my expertise, and I've been fortunate enough to be recognized for this, the most significant of these recognitions being a Civic Action Diversity Fellow alumnus. Third, I am an employee of Airbnb. What I would like to speak to you today is what I see as a lot of anecdotal evidence combined with a hefty dose of hyperbole and then amplified by the echo chamber of media when it comes to the effect of Airbnb in condos. This makes me nuts as I'm a data-driven guy. I'm a lefty, progressive, community-building, social justice kind of guy, but a data-driven guy. As a president of a condo corps, I see everything. Fire alarms caused by people who thought that using power tools to saw wood in the stairwell was a good idea. People who shove pillows, sofa cushions, and deceased pets into garbage chutes. 
Cigarette butts being thrown off of balconies and causing fires, flooding from people forgetting to turn off the, the bath, and plenty of noise and party complaints. In fact, in my building, and my building is 65% owner-occupied and 35% long-term tenanted, long-term tenanted. We've had over 26 complaints in the last six months, and we're a great building and an amazing community. I bring this up for two reasons. First, as a president, all of these issues are real, they are substantive, and they are of constant concern, but they are also occurring all the time across the city in every condo or rental building because they are part and parcel of multi-unit residential living and not an issue caused or exacerbated by short-term rentals. Second, in the city's own report, it cited only 20 noise complaints over 41 months. That's three and a half years made to the city's 311 line regarding short-term rentals. In a city in which hundreds of thousands of people live in multi-unit residential, this is hardly the epidemic that some would wish to paint. I assure you that I share the same values as many in this room, but the world is changing. We need to move forward with it and look at Airbnb and its tools, not as a threat to the established order of multi-unit residential living or affordable housing, but as a solution to it. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hoffley. Um, are there questions, uh, uh, Councillor Cressy? Yeah. Hey, Todd. Good to see you. Hey, Joe. So on data, I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, so you work for Airbnb? Yes. Okay. How many Airbnb hosts don't live in the homes that they rent? Um, so I, I, the, the proposal here is for people to, who are in their principal residence can home share, but not people who, in their secondary, third, fourth, fifth residence. So how many Airbnb hosts are using a second, third, fourth, fifth? That's actually quite difficult because of the nuanced nature of the platform. And I believe that um, um, Mr. Lehane spoke to that earlier on so, so because it's self-identified. Uh, self so, but does Airbnb know? Well, no. No, okay. Um, does Airbnb know how many formal rental units have been converted into short-term Airbnb properties? Um, I, I'm not sure. So that's I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure how I could answer that question. I mean, that's that's a pretty long and, you know, I, I, I don't think we actually, I, I, I just don't know. So do we know in condos, because I know you're speaking specifically about condos, yep. how many condos have been purchased and used as short-term rentals as opposed to residences? Do we no. have that data? I don't think so. So that's the data I'd like. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cressy. Uh, any other questions of Mr. Hoffley? Okay, Mr. Hoffley, thank you very much. Cool, thanks. Uh, Alex Dagg, Public Policy Manager for Canada Airbnb. Alex is not appearing, I guess. She's, I know she's been around, but... Uh, nope. Okay, Jane Murdoch Adams. Thank you all for welcoming us so patiently and so warmly. I'm an Airbnb host in Ward 20, Major Street, also an artist. We have two bedrooms in our primary residence, and we've lived there for 38 years. Um, the key point I want to talk about is the whole idea of nightcaps, that is a limited number of nights per year uh, that's mentioned as a potential. I just wanted to tell you that three years ago we realized that we could not afford to keep our home any longer. We were house poor and Airbnb alone has allowed us to stay in our home these few extra precious years. And in those uh, three years we've had over 700 people. I'll just make a quick story about neighborhood impact. Uh, a woman about my age in our neighborhood became uh, terminally ill, and in the course of a year, we had 18 uh, nights of home stays, her friends and family that wanted to be near her. And during the course of that time, Christmas came along, and because we were hosting parts of the family, they had their Christmas party in our house. And then, not long afterwards, she died. And the, the kids phoned me and said, we have to have a wake. We have to have a wake today. 
and they had the wake in our house because we were like sort of housing central for the street. And I was really proud and honored to be able to, to, offer, to offer our house as that kind of a resource. Um, our rooms have never been rental property, so we're not taking anything off the market. It's one of those narrow houses on Major Street near Bloor, and it couldn't be a housing, a housing unit. Um, we require Airbnb to keep our home, and so any cap on the number of Airbnb nights would mean we would have to sell our house. Um, as other people have mentioned, um, these guests spent you know, a vast amount of money in the city every year. Um, but I want to tell you that, um, say 700 people, just say they spent two extra days in the city, and a number of people have said that guests come here, sometimes be because of Airbnb, like they wouldn't come at all if it wasn't for Airbnb, and we've often heard that. But a lot of people said, oh, I came for a job interview, or I came for my daughter's graduation, but because of Airbnb, I only have to spend $70, $75 in your place. I'm gonna stay for a week. And so people stay extra. This is really important and interesting to us. Um, so just say 70, 700 people uh, stay, stay two extra days and spend $250 a day, which they do because they go shopping, they go to all the, the wonderful places, that's $350,000. Is that possible? I mean, that's it. They come with money and they spend it. We ourselves make about $30,000 a year, and I want to tell you, we spend it all in Ward 20. We don't even have a car. We spend all our money <laughs> right there in our neighborhood. I don't know where Joe is. He would like to hear that. Um, we're, um, um, I'm about uh, taxes, a couple of people mentioned. I've got to you to wrap up. Uh, okay, yeah. done. We don't want any to pay. Well, any Joe's not paying tax. attention. We could all put in a pitch for you to come spend money in some other. Uh, yes. Boards. No extra taxes. He, no he's cash. not even paying attention yeah. now. Uh, just to hang on, just for one second, in case there's a question, ma'am. So maybe, any questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Murdoch Adams. We appreciate your sharing that with us. Uh, Lucille Yates. Rahim Lalani. Regina Sternberger. She's not here. Not here. Uh, John Carew from uh, Tavia. Thank you. I made this list, I see, for uh, deputations. And in 10 minutes, I may be asking you for that glass of warm milk mm. that you offered Mr. Uh, Councillor Shine earlier today. Uh, thank you for hanging in, folks. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to provide some observations on how home sharing and short-term accommodations are having a positive impact on many local neighborhood businesses that make up Toronto's 82 BIAs. I've had the opportunity to meet with a number of the Airbnb hosts, and I can tell you that they are passionate about their neighborhoods and supporting the diverse local businesses that make up those neighborhoods. Many are also small businesses, as you've heard today, uh, whether on College Street or, or in the beach. Uh, hosts who are sharing their homes and spaces, or in my opinion, concierges, I wouldn't call them ambassadors, but they are in fact concierges for their neighborhoods and the local business community. Uh, they help guests feel welcome to the neighborhood by uh, connecting them with their favorite places to eat, as was noted, as well as where they can find uh, and buy the things that they need during their stay. Uh, things like cough syrup at 2 a.m. or in fact, let them know where the latest festival is taking place throughout the diverse neighborhoods of this city and the number of festivals that we put on. We see firsthand how these accommodations are uh, spreading the economic impact of tourism to more businesses across the city, to areas that traditionally didn't benefit from or experience tourism spending. <coughs> Guests to, the, to, to Toronto are looking for authentic local neighborhood experiences that our BIAs uh, provide. 
Popularity of these accommodation models means that neighborhoods without any hotels or very few hotel rooms are now destinations. A word on uh, tourism tax. While I realize that uh, the details of that tax aren't a part of this report and will come before you uh, at a later date, at Tabia, we know the taxes are the foundation of city building. And in fact, BIAs are based on a levy system. Tabia supports, in fact, Tabia insists that introduction of a tax on short-term accommodations uh, is important. But we're asked that the executive committee uh, consider carefully where these funds are allocated. We would like to encourage that the, if the use of these dollars is for destination marketing, that it is initiated across the city. Home sharing and short-term accommodations should not be feared, but embraced with uh, smart and sensible rules that recognize uh, the fact that positive impacts they have on local small businesses and the business community. BIAs, RBIAs, are independent entities. Several of them have already initiated contact with Airbnb to make sure that their hosts are actually encouraging uh, the visitors to visit the neighborhoods. So all said and up, and I will wrap up, uh, congrats to, the, uh, to staff for a report that I think is balanced, forward-thinking, and certainly we look forward to seeing the rest of the report as it unrolls here. So effectively, the small business community in the City of Toronto is supportive of a balanced uh, Airbnb presence and other hosts. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Carew, very much. Any questions of the deputy? Well, thank you for your patience today and for being here with us on a number of matters. Uh, Rigo Susharan. Thank you, Major John Torrey and the Executive Committee and all the hardworking staff and the MLS for um, coming up with this proposed um, regulation. So, um, my, uh, my wife and myself, uh, Laura, um, Laura and myself, we host um, in our basement, it's a totally self-contained suite, fully, fully uh, furnished, and um, it's been given a five-star review. And um, the reason for doing it is that, of course, the economy was raising for us, and um, we have two girls still at home who want to further their education. So um, in order you know, to meet all of these commitments, um, we decided to go with uh, Airbnb. Um, even though we had made some savings previously over the years, but it just wasn't enough for the, the rate of increase in the education system. Um, so what happened is we uh, posted our place for a couple months to go for a long-term renter, and um, it didn't take for one reason or the other. Um, so then we decided to go with Airbnb on a short-term rental basis. And actually it works out better because we get to constantly go and update the place, keep it um, going. And um, we found that electricity is being used less and also utilities because most of the guests who come, they, don't, they are not there for most of the day. So that's good. And, um, our guests are coming from all over the world and Canada. We have guests from London who come, sometimes there's a, a sport meeting, they come for one night. We also had a guest from Paris who, him and his family, he has two little kids, even though our place is um, for two people. Um, once the kids are like under five, we accommodate them. And they were looking to migrate to Canada from Paris. So they really loved the place. You know, we had them, we had a party next door, we invited them. And he's going to come back in October again and, um, you know, try to look for some jobs so that he can bring his family over. Um, we have had a, a lot of, made a lot of friends and we had a lot of revisits. Um, and the feeling that we give people is that we keep the place as if it's somewhere that we would want to stay. So they really feel at home and... You know, they try to leave the place as clean as they found it. And um, as far as the recommendations go, we're hoping that um, 
you know, they, they don't come down too harsh on us because we are already claiming the taxes um, for extra income that we get. So that's it for me. Thank you very much, Mr. Susharan. Uh, are there questions of the deputy? Well, thank okay. you very much. Thank you very for much. Time today. Nick Christofferu. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Three minutes. I'd like to thank the executive committee and uh, the mayor for their work in formulating policy for short-term rentals and welcome recommendations which recognize the difference between short-term rentals and home sharing in one's primary residence. I also commend you for not discriminating against condominium owners when referring to homeowners as this represents a large and growing segment of the homeowners in Toronto. I've been a resident of Ward 27 for more than 20 years and I've lived through an unprecedented boom that has added dozens of high rises and thousands of residents to this part of the city. This has created opportunities but also added pressure on residents as the city has become more expensive to live in. Now in my early 50s, personal circumstances including having to make financial contributions to my father's home care at an old age facility have led me to explore various options in order to supplement my income. One of these options, home sharing, has proven to be a big help. I occasionally host a single guest at a time in the second bedroom of my condominium using the well-organized Airbnb platform. And unlike regular visitors, these guests are subject to checks and balances and are held accountable because they pay with a credit card and their personal information is known. I'm here to greet my guests when they arrive and to supervise and do not burden our concierge by having them drop keys off. I prefer hosting occasionally over having a long-term roommate because it gives me the flexibility to choose when to be alone while allowing me to accommodate my sister or friends when they come to town to visit. The people I host come from other parts of the country and from all parts of the world. They typically stay with me one to four nights and are here to attend conferences, conduct research, go to job interviews, scout locations, or just explore the city. They're professionals, university students, or just people attending an event such as a play or a trade show, and they need a place to sleep. My guests have been respectful and quiet, and they don't come here to party. I can tell, tell you they're not coming here to party in my home, although I've gone out with them on occasion for a drink. Although I began doing this out of necessity, I've really enjoyed meeting these people, and I, like, as other people have said, I act as a representative for the city in my neighborhood. When I, time, I, or I have a, when I have time or a rental car, I show them around uh, different parts of the city, uh, take them the walks through Cabbage Town, Kensington, or the distillery. And um, I think it's great that both I, my guests, and local businesses benefit from this activity. That's all I have to say. I want the city to be open-minded and to bear in mind that a lot of us live in condominiums here now. And, um, We'd like your support for what we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Christopher. Uh, are there questions of the deputy? Thank you very much. Appreciate their message. Uh, Stephen Tufts, Fair B and B Coalition. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm a member of the Fair B&B Coalition, and a further disclosure, I teach geography at York University, but I hope you won't hold that against me either. Um, I'd like to thank yourself, City Council and staff, for aggressively addressing the issue of short-term rentals in Toronto. The impact of short-term rentals enabled by platforms such as, but not exclusively, Airbnb is significant for affordable housing, the hotel industry, and community cohesion safety, both inside and outside of condominiums. The proposed regulations contained in the staff report have for the most part reached a fair balance. Homeowners who wish to rent out rooms in their principal residence will continue to be allowed to engage in the practice. Multi-unit hosts and speculative real estate investors, however, will be forced to return properties to the long-term residential rental and housing market. Given the importance of these units to the business model of platforms such as Airbnb and Hotels.com, I do hope that the city will hold steadfast if owners and or platform operators initiate litigation as they have in other jurisdictions. Toronto must not be intimidated by those determined to establish ghost hotels in our city. There are further, um, some further issues the executive may wish to consider with respect to the staff report. 
First, the self-declaration model of operators is vulnerable to abuse. Those renting properties should be required to demonstrate that the properties are indeed their principal residence. Second, regulations are only as good as the enforcement mechanisms and penalties attached to the violations. There needs to be a set fines that are significant for host violators and platforms. Further, platforms must also agree to suspend those who did not comply. Um, third, condos are a major source of short-term rental activity. If a unit is to be rented by a condo resident, evidence must be provided that the condo regulations allow short-term rentals. While some condos are open to such activities, many are not. Fourthly, I'd like to uh, point out to the issue of um, secondary suites and or sometimes granny suites. I actually lived in one of these suites. They were, and as you may recall, under Mel, Mayor Mel Lastman, regulations were expanded to allow um, granny suites uh, more easily to be rented to uh, tenants in the late 1990s. Uh, it was a stopgap measure. There was a housing crisis at the time. Many municipalities have allowed or even encouraged secondary suites, accessory suites, or laneway housing in the midst of affordable housing crises. While there are real limits to this as a housing strategy, if the city continues to allow such development, they must not allow these granny suites or secondary suites to be, to be turned into short-term rentals. Further, currently illegal or secondary suites must not be allowed to be used as SDR the SDR platforms as a way of normalizing their unsafe spaces and evicting tenants. They must be encouraged to become long-term rentals. There's a great deal of critique launched at cities regulating short-term rentals as stifling innovation and the digital economy. I'd ask the executive committee to ignore this criticism. Innovation in cities is driven by people, not platforms. More specifically, innovation is driven by talented young people who require flexible, affordable housing as they develop their careers by moving to and from different cities. Innovation can't happen in a city that doesn't do everything in its power to establish affordable, livable, diverse neighborhoods. Regulating short-term rentals is a crucial part of this process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tufts. Are there questions for Mr. Tufts? Thank you very much for your deputation. Appreciate that. Ms. Zora Jamasi, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Sarah Jamasi, okay. Uh, Trish Hennessy, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Uh, Chris Penrose, producer, producer DAIS. Mr. Penrose, welcome. Thank you. Um, Three minutes. Stays creative. Is DAIS. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. I know it's been an incredibly long day and night for you. Um, my name is Chris Penrose, I'm with Days Creative, and thank you to the Executive Committee for the work you're doing in developing policy and having this conversation. Um, Toronto is a city of the arts and striving to become a music city. Um, as managing director of and uh, producer at Days Creative, I have both a professional and personal appreciation for the positive impacts of short-term rentals for professionals in these sectors. Um, I want to provide my perspective on short-term rentals and in particular home sharing through Airbnb and how they're helping Toronto arts creative industries thrive. I communicate with artists from across the city, province, country and globe seeking to bring them to Toronto for art installations, music, radio, video projects, web series, short film. Access to spaces through Airbnb has enabled us to bring talent and foster world-class collaboration in ways that were just not as visible as before. Um, with home sharing was part of the marketplace. For example, we had a video that won an award for best video at the MMVAs yesterday. Uh, a good amount of the crew stared in, stayed in Airbnb while they were here filming. Um, embracing home sharing is essential if Toronto is going to rem remain an innovative and talent-driven global leader in design and arts. Creative industries depend on flexibility and adaptability. Our talent is working on a global stage with unpredictable schedules, income and travel being a common experience for many who are making a living through the arts. Being able to share homes as well empowers creatives locally and creative entrepreneurs with the income they need to pursue their passion. Many people working in the arts can't maintain homes in multiple cities but need to be in multiple cities and home sharing is a factor in being able to do that. Um, and for many, maintaining a place to live in that more than one city is really a luxury. So I just wanted to say, um, you know, short-term rentals and home sharing 
have emerged as an important part of the creative industry and creative economy in the city. And it's my hope that the regulation by the City of Toronto considers the value and the impact of these decisions on the arts and creative industries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Penrose. Uh, are there questions of Mr. Penrose? Well, thank you very much for your deputation. We appreciate your patience. Good night. Thank you. Uh, Liz Pimentel, Fair B&B Coalition, Unite Here, Local 75. Ms. Pimentel, how are you? Good. Good evening. I'm wondering if it's okay if I uh, combine with Mike Casey, who's at number 50. We think we can do both our deputations in under three minutes. That's our goal. We, we would we, we'd give you a special prize. I, I thought you might give permission for that. Yeah. <laughs> permission enthusiastically granted. Excellent. No offense to your representation. You go right ahead. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mayor Tory, members of the Executive Committee, visiting councillors, and city staff. My name is Liz Pimentel, and I'm the chair of the Fair B&B Coalition and the president of Unite Here Local 75. I want to use my allotted time today to compliment city staff for doing their due diligence on the short-term rental file and for producing a set of proposals that has the potential of protecting Toronto's strained rental housing market and of establishing fairness within the accommodation sector. We will finally catch up with other innovative cities who have embraced regulations such as San Francisco, New York, and Berlin. We have an opportunity to get this right the first time. To ensure that the proposed regulations achieve the desired results, we need to strengthen the proposal in a few ways. Uh, one, we would suggest that we need to make sure that the principal residence requirement will be a requirement and not a voluntary self-declaration. Number two, we need to ensure that Tor Toronto's secondary suites stay on the long-term rental market so that they help ease the city's rental housing crisis. Three, we need to ensure that condos who prohibit short-term rentals will be automatically off-limits to short-term rental use. Four, we need to establish significant fines for both non-compliant platforms and hosts uh, to disincentivize abuse. Five, we need to consider the idea of caps on the total number of nights a unit can be rented each year. And six, three words, enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. Um, we look forward to continue working with you and city staff throughout the summer and fall of 2017 as we move towards a finalized set of fair and safe regulations for home sharing. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor Tory and members of the Executive Committee. My name is Mike Casey. I'm president of the San Francisco Labor Council and a founding member of the Share Better Coalition in San Francisco, and I work for Unite Here Local 2. Uh, the union representing 12,000 hotel workers uh, there. I'm here today to share our experience in San Francisco where we've been working on this issue for many years and have been through several rounds of regulations and revisions. The City of Toronto uh, has the chance to get it right the first time with your proposed regulations, unlike what we did in San Francisco. One of the things we learned in San Francisco was that registration system based on voluntary compliance doesn't work. When the initial law came into effect, the estimated compliance rate was only about 20%. Because Airbnb listings continued to grow, eating up the city's rental market, lawmakers decided to require real enforceable regulation and registration for those breaking the law. The city was subsequently sued by Airbnb and HomeAway, another platform. On May 1st this year, Airbnb announced that it had reached a settlement with the city to abide by the law and including registration licensee regulations that require platform accountability. San Francisco is home to some of the world's largest tech firms, including Uber, Yelp, Twitter, and Airbnb. I say that knowing that Toronto is giving our region a run for the money in innovative tech center. Um, we've shown that we can hold these uh, rental platforms accountable, and we look forward to Toronto helping lead the way in making uh, affordable housing, the issue that it is for all cities like this. Thanks very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, both of you. Uh, are there questions of these deputants? Councillor Cressy. Thank you. It's, it's late, so I'll be brief. So, um, Liz, you chair the Fair b, &B Coalition. I do. So, the Fair b, &B Coalition supports regulated home share, correct? Yes. Okay. The, the issue of secondary suites, I understand that that was one of the five issues, enforcement, enforcement, enforcement being one, uh, <laughs> not three. Um, what is the concern around secondary suites and their permission within somebody's principal residence? 
Well, I think a lot of the secondary suites that are under consideration could be long-term housing, so uh, basement apartments that have separate entrances, um, the in-law suite or granny suite, as people discussed before, uh, the laneway housing that's being considered right now to try to allevi alleviate the housing crisis. Um, you know, if, if we're going to start freeing up some of those spaces for people to live in, it would just be a shame if they got eaten up by these platforms. Yeah. And, and are you aware of, of any current rental housing units that have been taken off the market and converted into short-term Airbnb properties? Uh, well, an article just came out uh, just now about a building in Kensington Market where basically the entire building has been converted into a, an illegal hotel um, and people were evicted from that building. And is there any data on how many rental housing units have been lost during the secondary, tertiary, entire buildings being converted? Do you have any? I've asked Airbnb for some and not received it. Is there any data showing how many rental housing units we've lost? It's difficult without disclosure from these platforms, but um, from the data scrapes that we see, we know that there are over 6,000 entire homes on the platform at the moment. Uh, it's, it would be harder for me to say what percentage of those are 365 day a year ones versus you know a few nights a year, um, which is why I think it's worth considering caps. Um, but 6,000 homes is a lot, and they've picked up about 1,500 a year. And so, you know, we're looking at this summer probably another 1,500 going off the market. That's a really dangerous situation for a city with 1.3% vacancy rate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cressy. Any other questions of these deputies? Councillor Bailao? Just, just a quick uh, clarification. So you're fine with, uh, you know, somebody going on vacation or being away for a month and renting their old, their house, right? I be yeah, I believe that, that should, that's real home sharing. That's a person's primary residence, and if they want to, you know, share either a room in their house yeah, or, 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 you know, rooms, their entire they home. Have a couple of rooms. But or if, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think we can all agree that that's not removing long-term housing from the market um, and, and makes sense to allow, and, and that's, that was the real purpose, I think, of this platform. Um, but when you have you know, ghost hotels, operators who own uh, many units, we heard from at least one or two of those tonight, um, those, are, those are homes that could be put back on the rental market. Other questions for these deputies? Well, thank you both very much. Mr. Casey, if you can go back and just confirm to your friends there that we are competing aggressively for oh, those jobs. <laughs> we intend to win and in Toronto. You can tell them the weather was fantastic up here because occasionally there are questions about that. I'm not sure what they're talking about being cold. You tell them it was warm as toast. Toronto is a great city. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm we'll all tell them you said so. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for coming. Uh, Deepak Ruparel, Silver Hotel Group. He's not here. I didn't see him here. Okay. Linda. Pinizzato, Chief Executive Officer and Founder, Condo Owners Association, Toronto. Hello. Good evening, Mayor Tory, um, members of Executive, Councillors, and uh, MLS. Um, I'd like to first disclose I am the founder and the CEO of the uh, COA. Now, the COA Ontario was uh, founded in March of 2010. One of our major mandates was to represent, provide leadership to condominium owners and a united voice advocating fostering quality lifestyle, prosperous and sustain sustainable condominium ownership. We're very concerned about the entire short-term rental situation within condominiums. It uh, varies quite differently from standard single-family dwellings. Uh, one of the major reasons are is because you know, we have standard occupancy in most condominiums. So even if we have individuals using their own place, um, say, you know, owner-occupied kind of situations, the problem is, is that if you have a one-bedroom, say if your family comes in and they have uh, two adults plus the individual, that's now three. So now you're going over the standard occupancy. That will actually put a toll on the maintenance fees within the building. All of the operating costs with any, within any condominium will dictate exactly where the value is. So you can't have increased maintenance fees, uh, which would also affect your operating budgets and your long-term reserve fund studies. So, you know, we understand um, home sharing. We're not against it. Uh, we do run into a problem when it comes to condominiums because one shoe does not fit all. You have to segregate the style of your, your regulation from condominiums as one style in comparison to another that would be for single-family dwellings. Um, the condominium... Um, 
Owners Association, we originally uh, were able to open up the Condo Act Review working with the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services. So we were involved in the Condo Act Review right from the beginning stages. One of the biggest problems with declarations are is that they are immediately uh, determined by the builders, lawyers, and at that time, it's the Bible of the building. A lot of owners buy into buildings that they don't even know what's in that declaration with respect to short-term rentals. So we can't isolate buildings that have that in their declarations because unfortunately, it, it, doesn't, be, it doesn't create a safe playing ground for people that own in those buildings in comparison to buildings that today no longer allow short-term rentals in their declarations. So we would certainly like to see maybe a cohesive uh, communication between the, the City of Toronto and the Ministry so that we can understand exactly where the guidelines of the Condo Act fall. Because the Condo Act plays such a heavy weight even if a condo board of director, and I have been the president uh, as a disclosure, I have been president of the board for two buildings in Trinity Spadina for over 21 years, government relations chair of the real estate board, I've been a realtor for 36 years. Um, there is, it, it's undeniable that we will have an impact. Uh, new construction right now, they haven't determined what their maintenance fees are going to be until about a year later, once they finish occupancy registration, and then all of a sudden they have 10 or 15% increases. If you turn around and you can't control usage of hydro, water, all of these common expenses, wear and tear on the building because you're treating it like a hotel, those are going to impact um, the standards of where uh, the occupancy costs are going to be within I'll the building. I'll ask you to uh, conclude shortly, if you could, please. Thank so you. our main concern is is dealing with the regulation on how it stands right now. Our main concern is how the large impact. We'd like to work with the city further, and where the impact is going to be in long-term sustainability of our condominiums, recognizing condo owners and their wealth that's inside these buildings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Pinzato. Are there questions of the deputy? Uh, Councillor Pasternak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Shouldn't this be handled through the province and the Condominium Act rather than municipality? 100% uh, we wish it had have been. We tried desperately for seven years to get them to understand that they needed to deal with it, but unfortunately they didn't. And I will tell you and thank you all seriously because when we heard that the city was going to take the bull by the horns and deal with it, we were so grateful. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions? Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Minnesota. Uh, Jordy Dent, Federation of Metro Tenants Association. Okay. Uh, Ruth Donsky. Uh, Tony Alinas, President, Chief Executive Officer, Ontario Restaurant, Hotel and Motel Association. There he is. Good evening, sir. Thank you. Good evening, your workshop and members of the City of Toronto's Executive Council, I'm Tony Lanis, President and CEO of the Ontario Restaurant Hotel, Motel Association representing the hospitality industry across the province of Ontario. The accommodation sharing economy, as with many other technology-driven models, arrived in municipalities around the world so suddenly and has grown so rapidly that literally caught everyone off guard in dealing with solutions. It's not the practice of governments to curtail innovation. It's the role to encourage them to grow and to expand. So we realize decisions at the start are tough. But as these models mature, the cowards come out and the good, the bad, and the ugly are better known and defined. And governments begin to drop regulations to provide the required solutions. Here it's about the housing issues and a fair playing field with the hotel industry. Competition is encouraged, and an action to ensure all business operate legally is most ethical and most critical. We thank the City of Toronto for moving forward in establishing regulations that will enable a regulatory framework of the accommodation sharing economy. We thank MLS staff for the work they have done with the report presented and addressing the hotel industry's views, especially on the restrictions of rental unit commercialization. The, this regulatory framework will become law, and it's a law for the future. Currently, the hotel industry is enjoying a healthy growth 
after a decade and a half of performance pressures. But the economy falls into a cycle. A downturn has the potential to impact hotels and employ jobs. We support many of the report's recommendations, a great report, but we do see opportunities in the report to better serve its overall constituents in areas such as location density, which influences hotel investment, registration and enforcement, and are looking forward to providing our input in the upcoming consultation stage. Thank you once again. Thank you, Ms. Rielinas. Uh Are there questions of the deputy? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Joseph Montano, uh, Expedia, Inc. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you for having me, sir. Good evening, Mayor Tory and members of the Executive Committee. My name is Joseph Fontano, and I'm the Toronto Government Affairs Manager for Expedia, Inc. Again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to allow me to speak today and testify on these proposed short-term rental regulations. On behalf of the Expedia family of brands that include vacation rental leaders, such as HomeAway and Vacation Rental by Owner, or VRBO, I'm here to express uh, some concern with this proposal and highlight the dangerous impact it could have on local vacation rental owners and the broader Toronto travel and tourism industry. HomeAway is the world's leading online marketplace for whole home, short-term and vacation rentals with over a million listings in 191 different countries. HomeAway and VRBO provide a platform for property owners and managers to list their homes for rent. These short-term rentals serve a variety of different purposes, uh, for, apart from leisure, including hosting families that are remodeling their homes, business people who are in town for a few days, and families here on extended medical stay because their relatives are unfortunately hospitalized. Um, but there's also, you know, folks having university graduations here that need to be in town, so we host those as well. HomeAway supports policies that are fair, effective, and allow the activity of short-term renting to legally operate. As families are traveling more often together and for longer periods of time, it's important that the City of Toronto employ effective and reasonable ways to regulate the industry while not adversely affecting the local tourism economy and undermining the rights of property owners. So for generations, whole home vacations have been a critical part of Toronto's local travel and tourism industry, helping traveling families find a place to stay together and assisting local homeowners cover their mortgage and save for retirement. In fact, Vacation Rental by Owner, or VRBO, has been a long-standing actor in the short-term rental market for over 30 years, and because of that reputation, our demographics skew a little bit older. So the folks who travel using HomeAway and VRBO are around 50 years of age with a family of four. And the reason why they use our services and why we're unique is because they want all of the amenities that they would have in their own home while they're on vacation, such as a kitchen and a dining room table. Sometimes it's nice to eat with the family instead of congregating in some hotel lobby. Um, so traditional vacation rental owners should be respected and treated equally under any short-term rental legislation, uh, regardless of whether their home is their primary residence or their secondary residence. Lastly, since this proposal has been made public, we've received an enormous number of calls from le and letters from Toronto residents who are home away property owners and managers who expressed grave concern with the potential ramifications of the proposal. 54% of homeowners who rent out their homes on HomeAway earn enough income to cover three quarters of their mortgage. So I know you guys can understand why they're a bit you know, worried about the proposal going through. So we welcome the opportunity to work with you and your staff, and I can't thank them enough. They've been nothing but supportive in reaching out to us and allowing us to have a seat at the table. So we hope to continue these conversations, and I urge the committee to reconsider the primary only provision. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Montano. Are there questions of Mr. Montano? Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Hamish Wilson. Don't see Hamish here anymore. I think he's gone. Okay. Uh, Gordon Wild, Director of Director Vidya Inc. Mr. Wild here. Uh, Vent Kataswara Bagavatula. Oh, Gordon Wild is here. Did somebody say? No, Gordon Wild. I don't think so. So, uh, are you Ben uh, Kataswara Bagavatula? That's me. Thank you. How did I do on that? No rating. Uh, <laughs> so so bad it was below zero. I apologize. So, uh, some... Sir, you have three minutes. You're most welcome. 
Thank you very much, um, the Mayor, and uh, thank you, the Council Members. Thank you for being patient. I'm here to tell you how Airbnb helped me and my family achieve one of my goals. Many of you own the cottages and use, or must have used your friends or others' cottages. You must have paid rents there. They are in the rural areas normally, but they are the secondary residences. People are earning money out of their secondary residences too. Uh, we have a detached home in Mississauga, and our downtown condo is what I would simply call an urban cottage for me. My wife and I both were born and uh, were brought up in major cities, in Delhi and Bombay, for example, and neither of us enjoy rural or quiet countrysides as much as we are living and vacationing in big cities. We mostly travel only to places like New York, LA, San Francisco, Paris, and Rome. We don't travel anywhere else, usually at least. We have a teenage son, and his favorite way of celebrating his birthdays is coming to downtown and just spending his day here. Uh, so when he grows up, he wants to live in Toronto, and that's the reason why we bought this secondary residence, even though we have a primary residence. So that's the main reason, but we couldn't have afforded this house if but for uh, the Airbnb, because what we want to do is to have short-term rentals when we don't uh, like the long-term rental at all. And uh, because the other reason, major reason is I am a traveling IT consultant and my wife hates staying all alone in the house, especially because my son sometimes has to stay in boarding and other places. So to pay the second mortgage, a short-term rental is the option that we have chosen to uh, take up. So we have a freedom of enjoying the city life while also living in the uh, suburbs. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is we are talking, uh, we are moving towards the 21st century. There are, I know some of the uh, people have spoken about uh, the platform and the, uh, the development of the new technologies. I understand and empathize with the hotel employees and other people, but within IT industry, from where I come in, there is a significant uh, reduction in employees, there is a significant dropout of the technologies, and I realize that no job is secure here. So with the changes in technology, we need to embrace the new technologies that are available, and we should be uh, aware of the fact that all the jobs will not be secure in the future. And that's my, those are my three major points at this point of time. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bagavatula. Uh, are there uh, questions of the deputy? I uh, thank you very much for your patience and for being with us today. Uh, Carmen Ballard. Carmen Ballard. M Mara Epstein, Bloor East Neighborhood Association. Hello, Ms. Epstein. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for yours. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor uh, and members of the Executive Committee. Uh, my name, as mentioned, is Mara Epstein, and I'm here on behalf of both the Bloor East Neighborhood Association, along with my colleague Linda Brett, who spoke earlier, um, but also to represent Toronto Standard Condominium Corporation 2328, uh, which is located in Ward 27, as its board president. Um, upon review of the report, I'm very encouraged by its contents, but I'm speaking tonight to highlight the following concerns and requests for additional action to be taken on three matters. It is our primary request that consequences for non-compliance during any part of the licensing and registration process be further explored. These can include but not need be limited to implementing fines as well as leveraging temporary and permanent license suspension for operators who provide incomplete or falsified documents during self-certification. It is currently very difficult for condo corporations and property management teams to enforce short-term rental regulation compliance by both property owners and their tenants as we have extremely <laughs> limited authority and an ever-growing lack of bandwidth to do so. I personally spend a great deal of my own time attempting to track down operators who are in violation of our six-month minimum lease term, uh, which is part of my own building's declaration, and sincerely hope that the proposed regulations are able to prevent current and future residents in my building and others like it from even getting to the stage where they register as operators and advertise their suites for me and others to find on various short-term rental platforms. In order to validate operators are in any way intentionally omitting details or outright falsifying information during self-certification, language that permits the right for the city to inspect documentation should be included in regulations, as well as during the registration pro process, <clears throat> excuse me, for operators to accept as part of the terms and conditions. If condominium corporation declarations, bylaws, and or copies of executed leases between owners and tenants are provided and filed as part of the registration, 
It would permit only those operators who are in compliance with the proposed regulation, as well as their specific properties, the ability to advertise and rent out their primary residence. It would also allow the city to more easily delve deeper into suspected violations, since many of these documents specifically cite whether short-term rentals and subleases are allowed or prohibited within the property or individual suite. If necessary, this also provides a way to initiate dialogue between the city and the condominium corporation, suite owner, property or property manager should issues with an operator arise. It would lastly be our hope that a permissive building list be developed, which should allow condominium corporations and property management companies with the authority to act on behalf of their property to register their building as a site in which short-term rentals are allowed. This would serve as a comprehensive database for the city as well as prospective operators to further ensure compliance and provide visibility at the outset for operators who are unsure of whether or not the next steps they are taking are in fact sanctioned within their property. Thank you for your time. And thank you very much for your time. Are there questions of the deputant? Hearing none, I will say thank you very much uh, for your uh, time, Ms. Epstein, and for your patience. Uh, Lisa Marion, H&P Properties. Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for sticking, sticking through this. So um, as mentioned, I am Lisa Marion. I'm the co-founder of H&P Properties here in Toronto and a longtime host. Been doing it for seven years here in the city. So I'm here to express both my support for reasonable regulations and taxation for short-term rentals, but also my disagreement with the suggestion that they should only be permitted in primary residences. So as a proud Toronto entrepreneur myself, and my company depend on services such as Airbnb, Booking.com, TripAdvisor, et cetera, to create jobs not only for ourselves, but for our employees and all of those from, um, accessory businesses that uh, benefit from our short-term rental management business. So just to give you an overview, we work with owners of residential properties to rent them out, whether that's with a traditional long-term lease or uh, renting on the short-term rental market. We're responsible operators that take pride in our business and city. We're just one of the growing number of short-term rental companies in the city that believes in hosting responsibly and maintaining the neighborhoods as they are. Many of our properties would not be on the long-term rental market because they're used occasionally by the owners and not available, or because the owners prefer short-term rentals over longer ones. Why? Well, in our experience, it's because of the Unfair Residential Tenancy Act. It's weighted in the tenant's favor and does not allow landlords any recourse when they encounter a bad tenant. These owners have had bad experiences with non-paying tenants, damages, and long eviction processes, none of which tend to happen with short-term guests. The city itself endorsed our company in 2015 by granting us a $5,000 uh, grant and educational courses through the Starter Company program upon receipt of our business plan. So I'm pretty sad to see that after giving us support, the city now wishes to destroy a growing sector of the tourism and accommodations industry. It's a little hypocritical. Um, from our perspective, Toronto must maintain and build upon its reputation as a global leader and centre of innovation. Recognizing that the market for accommodations is changing and embracing short-term rentals will strengthen Toronto's competitiveness and a dynamic world economy. It will empower entrepreneurs like myself and everyone else that's represented here and provide flexible options that global talent now expect and demand. All right. So I just want to say there is more to short-term rentals than just tourism. It does help everyday people in our city, which we've all seen today through all the other deputants. Um, it helps small businesses like ours operate and provide jobs for our employees and the accessory businesses that I mentioned. Those include cleaning services, baggage services, key runners, and more. There's always something new popping up, and it's great to partner with them and give them our support. Short-term rentals are not just a fad. They're not something that needs to be regulated into submission or banned. They're the future of our accommodations industry and should be allowed in any legal, privately owned and suitable investment property. We feel that the proposed regulations cross the line into dangerous territory by not allowing investors to rent their properties in the best way for them. The city could benefit tremendously from the taxes. Try and find a conclusion now if you could. Oh, I'm very sorry. 
Thank you. It's all right. So my conclusion is uh, don't, you know, by restricting short-term rentals to primary residences only, you're taking away the freedoms of property owners in the city, the livelihoods of many, and the tourism income generated by this style of hosting. You're quashing a budding industry and becoming regressive rather than progressive. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Marion. Uh, are there questions of this deputy? All right. Well, hearing none, we'll thank you very much for your submissions. Uh, fifth, uh, Cameron Tabata, Tabata by. Hello, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and the Executive Committee for having us. Uh, this is my uh, uh, partner, uh, Zach Malowitz. Uh, we, a couple of years ago, we started a company that helps Airbnb hosts uh, who don't have time to manage their own properties, uh, provide those services to guests. Uh, about 65% of our properties are primary residences. Uh, prior to this, I was a policy, I was on the policy team of Deloitte Canada, and uh, before that, a macroeconomics and politics student, so I understand the complexities involved to coming to this decision. My argument is that the city is currently facing a massive shortage in the affordable medium-term rental housing market, which I define as one to six months. The reason for the shortage is that traditional long-term landlords don't have the economic incentives to provide this type of rental to students, individuals, and families in between homes, young people in transitionary phases, and professionals in fields requiring geographic flexibility. The gap between the supply and the demand in the medium-term rental market will increase over the next few years due to, the, due to both immigration and workforce transformation. Given the majority of full-time short-term rental units are one-bedroom one units, a significant number of them are incentivized to offer medium-term rentals outside of the May to September peak period due to the comparable income that can be generated between the two types of rentals. This helps reduce the shortage local residents face in the medium-term rental markets outside of this period. Back in the, in the summer, May to August, uh, period students leaving and offering short term, sorry, medium term rentals uh, during that period kind of offsets the short term rental providers moving back uh, into the uh, short term rental market. Based on available data, there's no statistical correlation between growth in short term rentals and rental vacancy rate. If all full time short term rentals were put in the long term rental market, uh, it is likely, uh, based on 2015 MLS condo rental data and Airbnb data, uh, that's publicly available and filtered that the long-term rental market would adjust back to the current level in approximately one to two months. However, the supply of medium-term rentals would drop dram dramatically. I'm relatively aligned with most of the recommendations in the report. However, I do believe there should be a commercial operator's license for co condos that do have one-night minimums, as well as commercial properties uh, with mixed-use uh, zoning. Uh, to answer the councillor's question earlier uh, about the number of condos and residential units converted, full-time uh, based on filters such as uh, Airbnb hosts who have uh, one review in the past six months uh, and have been occupied for more than 90 days. Uh, the approximate number we came up to based on publicly available data was 2,000 units, which represents about 0.002% of the private occupied dwellings in the city. Thank you. Hi, so my name is Zach Manlowitz and I'm also on the list. Uh, we just decided to speak together. Um, the issue that I want to address to build on Cam's points is tourism. By not providing a commercial license for owners that wish to list multiple units, the city could cause the average daily rates or ADRs of rooms to skyrocket, thereby pricing out the average tourist from exploring our great city. By making hotel rooms too expensive, the average tourist would then seek a more affordable travel destination. By following the report's policies, we risk shrinking our $8.2 billion tourism industry, which would result in less tax dollars for our federal and provincial governments, potentially jeopardizing the funding of government programs that affect a much wider scope than just the citizens of this city. Right now, according to Tourism Toronto, there are 110,000 travellers in the GTA every day and hotel capacity is only 38,000. We are facing a hotel shortage, which is a really big problem when you also consider that there are plans to repurpose eight hotels. This has already caused a spike in the average daily rate of hotels. We were at an Expedia event last week and they confirmed that the average daily rate year over year growth is expected to increase by 10 to 15% this year. From calculations stemming from the data in your report, for which I'm happy to go into more detail, the removal of commercial owners from the short term rental market would add 870 nights in demand. And to be clear, that's not 870 people, that's 870 rooms that have to be filled every night. 
Someone has to fill that demand and to do so, we can see a drastic spike in the ADRs. When tourists go to select their next travel destination, they may consider other great North American markets like Chicago or Miami after seeing how dramatic this spike is. And that's just one way that hotels can win here. The commercial short-term rental market is not just competing on price, but also on quality of service. The commercial STRs are able to benefit from economies of scale to not just meet the quality of service of hotels, but exceed it. Under a distributed hotel model, we can show tourists different side of the cities that the hotels are currently underserving. Queen West immediately comes to mind. We can and have also made investments in automation to streamline the customer experience in proprietary ways to make us more operationally efficient than your typical hotel. What I'm seeing is a market similar to Uber, where you have one traditional incumbent and a disruptor, and the City of Toronto, through the powers of regulation, has the ability to choose the winners and losers of this market. By removing the disruptor, hotels will be able to dominate on quality of service and charge a premium to tourists for it, further risking the shrinking of, the tourism, of our tourism industry. So overall, this is much bigger than just a municipal issue. The tax dollars associated with an $8.2 billion tourism industry can play a critical role in funding programs that affect all Canadians between our provincial and federal governments. Therefore, I urge the Executive Council to demand a more thorough investigation into how the report's policy would affect ADRs and the city's tourism industry, passing the policies from the report in their current form without understanding these economic impacts would be irresponsible. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Ambassadors uh, Tabatabai and uh, Mandlowitz. Are there questions of these gentlemen? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Marianne Maroney. Well, it's hard to come after those guys. <laughs> um, uh, uh, pardon? Yes, I do. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor and the Council, uh, Executive Council. Thank you for um, taking this quite seriously. Um, prior to this discussion, there was a lot of discussion about seniors, and I just want to say that being an Airbnb host allowed my mother-in-law to live out her life in her home. And that was made possible because my husband and I moved in to be with her for the last five years of her life. And in her homes, she has two homes side by side, and one of them, we didn't want to have long-term uh, tenants there, mainly because she was in her 90s. And um, we knew that it would be part of the estate. So because the, ta the taxes still are there, we needed some form of income, and Airbnb ended up being the most fantastic platform for us. Not only have we hosted 140 guests, we've got friends all over the world, and I can say that I've got great places to go and can hardly wait to go. Um, can now, since my mother-in-law has passed away, unfortunately, but at a happy 95 years. These finances really helped offset the costs that we had, and since short-term really was not an option for us, it, it allowed us to, um, the house now has been sold to our neighbors, but they did not have that money up front last year or uh, two years ago. So it was a, a wonderful circumstance that allowed us to keep going. Um, it's an excellent platform and it can be, and it's peer reviewed. So it's, it, I have had 140 guests. I haven't had any, ha had any issues. Um, it's, uh, it's allowed a lot of people like myself to travel since I don't have a pension, I don't have corporate c credit cards, I have limited funds, this has allowed people like me to travel so much more and come to this city and drop a lot of money. Um, most of the people, because where I'm living, is, uh, are coming to the university for some reason, either write an exam, find, uh, do, uh, come as a, a, a speaker, a guest speaker, um, host different uh, events. So our, our location was fantastic for these people to come and spend 
one night, well, uh, it has to be a minimum of two nights, but two nights to three weeks. I've, we've had professors that were waiting for long-term uh, residencies that they needed a month. So we've just had this wonderful opportunity. Um, so please do not strangle this necessary industry. Um, we're no longer living in an old-fashioned economy. We've got to really understand that this is a necessary place for and, and a movement for us, like these gentlemen have ex expressed in, in much better ways than I could. Um, so I don't believe that there's a cap that needs to be necessary, and I think that you should be very cautious on uh, worrying about having um, uh, not your primary residence. All right. On that note, uh, we've uh, just given you an extra 30 seconds there, but we thank you very much for that deputation. Other questions? Hearing none, I will thank you again for your patience and uh, move to our final deputant, uh, Anton Zilberberg. Uh, good evening. My name is Anton Zilberberg. I'm a property manager and I'm a commercial operator of short-term rentals. I own a business. We're not home sharing and we're not renting a second bedroom. We're a commercial operator and we're incredibly proud of this industry. There's overwhelming demand for what we do, both from an investor side and from the guest side. It's important for us to, it's important to understand how big of, an, of a role we're playing in the growing Toronto tourism and hospitality. There's two things that I'd like to explain. The nature of this growing industry and everyone that works in it, and what we actually expect this regulation to take into consideration. So let's start with the commercial operators. The product and service that we offer is a niche right between home sharing and traditional hotels. We work with investors who are interested in offering their properties for short-term rentals. There's, there's demand for it and they're able to increase their returns. We work with guests. Those are those people that are visiting Toronto and are simply not interested in booking a hotel. We had a CEO of a really big beer company stay with us simply because he doesn't like hotels. He wanted to cook, a din cook, cook dinner. Whatever there is the reason, they simply want to rent an apartment for the duration of their stay and they're willing to pay for it. It's really as simple as that. Being a part of this emerging and growing industry means that we actually work with cleaning companies, general contractors, plumbers, electricians, painters, laundry mats. We have accountants, bookkeepers, marketers, software developers, insurance brokers, lawyers, realtors. We buy furniture and supplies. We collect HST and we pay our taxes. Lastly, there's us. We wouldn't be in this business if there wasn't demand for our product. This is a really big industry. It'll really suffer if it's not regulated correctly. When it comes to the actual regulation, what we would like the city is to acknowledge our industry and help us embrace it. We'd like to see the restriction of only primary residents removed. Investors that choose to buy a property and be a part of this industry should be allowed to do so and contribute to the growth of our economy. They shouldn't be, we shouldn't punish them for it. In terms of Toronto's tourism, excluding commercial short-term operators from the equation will create a supply problem that only the hotels are going to profit from. Average daily rates at hotels have been growing 30% year over year. That's according to Expedia. The hotel industry is making money. The short-term rental industry is making money. There's no just justified reason to kill that completely which is basically what's being proposed. I want to end it with stressing how important it is that the result of this legislation helps support the economy and encourage our industry in a responsible manner as opposed to outlawing it. We're happy to pay taxes, we're happy to get licenses, but we want to make sure that it is done in such a way that encourages businesses to operate rather than outrageous requirements that attempt to kill this industry altogether and then deal with the resulting black market. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Silverberg. Are there questions of this deputy? Can I just ask you one, since no one else has, but uh, just uh, I didn't quite square the fact that, say, the Airbnb people who appeared here didn't by any means say that we're trying to kill the industry with these draft regulations, which are, are subject to further consultation, yet you say we're going to kill the industry. Yes, there's a lot of uh, businesses such as ours, and there's a lot of cleaning companies, and the commercial operators actually provide a lot of inventory daily, like our friends here from the spoke before. This is really this is really troubling, right? Because there's not going to be enough inventory for everybody who's visiting the city. This is a big problem. This might actually kill the short-term rental industry as we know it. It might completely reshape it. We have a lot of clients who stay with us just because we're offering a superior product than hotels. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your patience.
All right. Uh, I want to ask one more time, just because the gentleman said he was going away and was coming back, and I asked once before, but Douglas Parker, did Mr. Parker come back? Okay. Well, then we've completed the list. That's 100 deputations between the two items that, uh, actually more than that if we add in the transit items, probably 110. Uh, so that would bring us on this item to questions of staff. And I'll start with uh, members uh, outside of the uh, uh, executive committee, uh, Councillor Cressy, Councillor Nuziaz. So, Councillor Nuziaz, you go ahead first. Uh, to staff, so what we have before us, uh, your recommendation is that we go out for community consultation meetings and and then report back to municipal licensing, correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, yes. What we've provided here is a proposed framework to inform a next round of consultation so we can have very specific dialogue with uh, interested parties. Currently, the recommendation is we return to uh, planning and growth for the statutory public meeting and then licensing and standards for the licensing and regulatory side. Uh, I understand that may be a point of discussion, but yes, we will be coming back. So well, how are we going to consult? Um, are we going to be inviting residents? Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, we, I think we had a very robust uh, process leading up to this report. Okay. Uh, we do have intention to post this information on our website and make it available for public comment for people who can't attend meetings. We've also developed quite a lengthy list of stakeholders and interested parties that we communicate with through email uh, and public meetings as well. Okay, now on page seven, neighborhood and nuisance issues in the report. Mm -hmm. So there have been a number of complaints through 311 and as well as uh, through councillors' uh, offices. And you had 213 property complaints. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So through you, Mr. Mayor, and yes. also through police services, there were, um, there were also uh, 116 criminal occurrences. Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor, just to provide some clarity to that, the Toronto Police Service did a word search for us for occurrences where any of the five more popularly used um, uh, home sharing websites or platforms were, were used. Uh, they vary. The, the largest bulk looks like they were uh, occurrences related to fraudulent listings, people who said they were on one of the platforms and actually weren't. Uh, that seemed to represent a fair volume of those. So any complaints that came that came uh, from the council's office to, to your department where there's been a, a noise complaint, police were asked and there were charges laid. So how, when you investigated that, how did you investigate and determine that it was uh, an Airbnb? Uh, through Mr. Mayor, uh, great question, Councillor Nunziata. Because a lot of them were vacant houses. In, in many cases, people thought they were Airbnb or home-shared home uh, homes, and they actually weren't. So with every complaint, we have to investigate the conditions that we encounter, what's going on in the property, and whether or not it was a short-term rental or not. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to say with absolute uh, definity, definity uh, whether it was short-term rental related or not. Um, it seems to be a growing number. People are saying, oh, I think it's a short-term rental, I think it's Airbnb, I think it's whatnot, and it may not be. Well, I was told by your department it was on all my complaints. Oh, okay, uh, yours, thank you. yours, may, yes, be. Thank yours you. may be. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to our chief planner, what is, what is a healthy vacancy rate considered in a, in a major city like Toronto? Through the mayor, a healthy vacancy rate is considered to be approximately 3%. 3%. And what is Toronto's current vacancy rate for rental units, that is? Through the mayor, we're hovering between 1% and 1.3%, so very, very low. And, and has city planning witnessed the removal of some rental housing in recent years to be repurposed and reused as uh, so-called home sharing? Through the Mayor, we understand that to have been the case, uh, in part by some of the data that has been provided by Airbnb. So just to be very blunt then, does the removal of existing rental properties for reuses, so-called home sharing, negatively impact the rental housing market in the City of Toronto? Through the Mayor, it is something that is of concern. Okay. To, to our Executive Director of uh, Municipal Licensing and Standards, 
Is the rationale for your recommendation of a principal or primary residence only because of your concern of the impact on rental housing? Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor, absolutely in partnership with city planning and recognizing we we're trying to balance many competing interests and, and city objectives, uh, we felt that identifying principal residents was paying true word to the notion of home sharing versus our concern about the incidents and impacts we've had where it's been commercialization of residential properties. So certainly the potential impact on uh, housing availability and affordability as well as nuisance relating to commercialized use in residential uh, areas is why we went the principal residence route. Okay. Now, you've gone the principal residence route, but you allow for a secondary suite. So that's not a room in somebody's house, but it could be a basement apartment. So if part of the rationale for a principal residence is to um, not have a negative impact on the rental housing market, why permit a secondary suite when that could be a rental housing unit. Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor, and then I'll, I'll ask uh, our chief planner to weigh in as well. But I think there is there was a distinction where a secondary suite is an ancillary to a, pr a principal residence of the owner or the uh, tenant. Uh, this was a topic of discussion whether secondary suites should be included or not. We fell on the side of being um, balanced in respect to property rights and interests and, and thought secondary suites because it's principal residence owner-occupied, those concerns about negative impacts of community uh, nuisance would be addressed. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that was, the, that was the last question. You didn't do us a favor. You actually got a little bit of extra time. Uh, other questions of staff from uh, visiting council members? Okay, members of the committee with questions of staff. Okay, uh, then uh, I will, I think, but was there one? Sorry, Councillor Palacio, yeah. Very, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, to you, to um, city staff. How costly it would be for uh, Toronto to regulate the service, and can, um, can we enforce it as well? In terms of cost, how costly it is? Have we done any analysis, cost analysis, in terms of uh, sorry, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm having a bit of a hard time with the background noise. You're asking about the cost of enforcement? That's correct. So we've not prescribed uh, numbers or staffing, et cetera, around enforcement because really that's leveraged off of the regime that we are dealing with, and then we will determine what the enforcement results or enforcement needs are as a result of the regime we're enforcing. A more strict regime would require more enforcement. A, a more permissive regime is balanced on enforcement. So that will be a piece of uh, work that comes back with the final report. Overall, in terms of enforcement, we have uh, within the proper standards and new regulations that uh, have been approved by Council, there is quite a bit on your plate in terms of enforcement. So thinking forward, now we, have, we are adding another layer of enforcement, perhaps citywide. Is, uh, so within that context, I'm just wondering to what extent the loopholes will be there and people will take advantage of that. So I'm thinking, will you have the manpower to do the real enforcement there? And if so, how costly that's going to be? Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm just thinking aloud and uh, in terms of moving forward. Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, and as I mentioned, Councillor Palacio, the more strict or restrictive a regime is, the higher the expectation is on enforcement. And I think what we've looked at, even in crafting this regulation, is to find balance between you know, pr being permissive and allowing people to participate while still being mindful of the other city interests and objectives we have. Uh, we will report back on what the enforcement would look like, depending upon the priorities and objectives of, of Council and the enforcement outcomes we're seeking. And my last question is, I'm going to be moving a motion is uh, with regards to revising the proposed definition of principal residence. And, uh, and I did chat with you a little bit earlier. And as a request for, to have that in the report, do you, would you have a problem in terms of supporting that kind of uh, mm -hmm. recommendation? Uh, no, through you, Mr. Mayor. I think the, the beauty of the way we've approached this is uh, by delivering a proposed set of uh, regulations, it opens the door for conversation on maybe some tweaks or changes, and we're happy to report back on uh, as a result of the feedback we've had from our deputants today and from you. Thanks so much. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor.
I had uh, actually Councillor Barlow next, uh, Councillor Shiner. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. I wanna follow up on that secondary suite um, matter. Um, and I know that the province and the growth plan actually uh, came out with the secondary suite issue. W what's the objective of a secondary suite? Uh, through the mayor, there's a variety of objectives, but one of the key ones is to add density and to add additional forms of housing, particularly in low density areas across the region. So it's about creating permanent residencies for people. Through the mayor, that's correct. In the context of the new growth plan, the province has uh, indicated that they will require all municipalities to have an affordable housing plan and in that affordable housing plan to identi identify a variety of different ways to accommodate rental housing and they specifically identify the inclusion of secondary suites as a way of addressing affordable housing as well as achieving minimum intensification and density targets in the plan. Is, is that one of the reasons why we're looking into laneway suites for example as well? Through the mayor, that's correct. Great. Um, with regards to uh, penalties for uh, companies or hosts that are not registering, could you talk about um, how you're gonna address that in through this report? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, with all of the new bylaw or updating bylaw work that we do, we do look at the system of fines or penalties that can be uh, embedded in the regulation, uh, and we expect that we will do the same thing here, consideration of special fines as appropriate, and what that does is provides a platform for a justice of the peace to, uh, to levy an appropriate fine subject to the circumstances of the offence. Okay. Uh, was uh, uh, also the fact that you used the principal residency to try with, to deal with, even though there were, you know, a small number, but some of these issues that we had with parties and, and you know, the, the lack of oversight over some of these suites, was that why you tried to have the principal residency in there as well? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, certainly, Council by Lau, that is a consideration. We feel where owners are directly involved or engaged with their properties, we see a higher standard or a, a better care. Uh, so certainly between the, the concern about our residential neighborhoods becoming commercialized was a primary concern. Uh, having owners or tenants of, of properties where they live involved directly in the activity we felt would help mitigate uh, some of the, uh, the uh, off, uh, seldom occurring, but does occur um, incidents with community nuisance. And when we have the reports coming back with the Oscar. regulations, will we have also the business case? So how much it would cost to put this registry together? How much, uh, you know, what we're going to recover through fees and so on? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, absolutely. That will be a piece of the report back, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Councillor Shiner. Thank you, Mayor Tory. Just of the Executive Director of Municipal Licensing, in regards to your consultation, would you also be coming back with recommendations of whether we should either limit the number of days that a property can be used for short-term rental or have a minimum number of days that it has to be used as a principal residence? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, we did have a discussion about imposing a, a cap on the number of nights. Uh, the second part of your question, I think, is very good and has merit to when we're looking at how do we define or how do we look at what a principal residence is. Uh, we did not recommend it in, in this particular uh, proposal, but it, it will naturally be a part of the ongoing consultation as we work to define uh, how this regime will work. So when it comes back to us, you will be able to tell us what was heard at the consultation and if there is a desire to impose either a maximum number of days of rental or a minimum number of uh, days that it has to be occupied, you'll have some feedback on that. So through you, Mr. Mayor, we, we did have that feedback through our initial round of consultation. Uh, and as you'll see with the proposed regulation, we did not recommend imposing a cap uh, for a variety of reasons. If you would like us to include that in the assessment of the report back or if it comes through uh, more loudly in consultations, uh, we can certainly report back, include that in the report back. Well, I would like to know, so do I have to move a motion or will you just include it in the work? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, given it's 10, 10 p.m., sir, I am happy to give you my word that we will include <laughs> that discussion in, that, in the report back. And I appreciate, and so do my colleagues very much. <laughs>
Okay, uh, Councilor Shannon, thank you. Uh, other questions of staff by uh, Councilor Robinson? Uh, I'll, I'll be very brief, but just um, the secondary suite issue. Other cities across the world, we're all facing this. It's a global movement. So what are they doing about secondary suites? What are your findings about that? Or uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, there's a variety, uh, Councillor Robinson. Quite frankly, we, uh, we did a pretty deep dive on the North American jurisdictions that are dealing with this issue, and we're probably about a 50-50 split on whether they would permit secondary suites. Actually, I'd say they more side on the permission for secondary suites than not, but it's about a 60-40. And certainly that depends on the market and whether or not secondary suites exist in those particular cities. Is there a best practice out there that you can reference or? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I really wish so. Uh, this is new for everybody and everybody's evolving the regulations as they go. Uh, you know, I think we've looked at uh, broadly across various jurisdictions and ones that are like to us as well uh, to try to get some sense of where things are at. Really, the, it, it takes some time for these regulations to be implemented, us to see what works, what doesn't work, where there's challenges or not, and, uh, and then come back. So we've not found a best practice that would fit a made for Toronto uh, solution, but there are bits and pieces that we're looking at. Okay, so, but just based on the many deputations we heard today, it's my understanding just from some of the stories and the narratives and the themes, that if we were to cut secondary suites, which I think was being alluded to here, I'm not sure, by uh, poten potentially uh, s uh, someone around the table, uh, that would have a big impact on this sector industry, correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, certainly we can go from the anecdotal information and people have different types of circumstances in the properties that they own. Uh, you know, I did, we heard, and we heard through the consultation that people wanted flexibility, uh, especially in respect to their own property. Um, so it's, you know, whether it would take 10 units off or 10,000, it's very difficult to say. We don't have the data that specifically identifies which are, sh are uh, secondary suites. And that's some of the work we'll do as we enter into regulatory regime. We collect data, we have registration systems, then we'll be in a better place to know how many are we actually talking about in respect to secondary suites so and that, others. So you don't fully understand the impacts? But you are saying, I believe, that the majority have secondary suites in other cities, when, I'm, when I'm, re I'm referring to other cities. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, just doing a quick scan down the number of cities that we looked at, it's 50-50, 60-40 on whether secondary suites are permitted to be used or not. Of course, that does not, I don't have it right in front of me if they actually have secondary suites right. in the first case that are permitted. Okay. Uh, so it's a 50-50, it's a I say is safe. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor Robinson. Other questions of staff? Okay. Uh, I will thank the staff then for, for that, uh, for their answers, and we'll move to, uh, to people who wish to speak. And we'll start with our visiting councillors, Councilor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and in particular, thank, thank staff. Uh, it seems that Tracy gets all the easy files always uh, and manages it wonderfully. Uh, listen, uh, with your indulgence, I'm still here at this late hour joining you in this committee uh, because the issue of home sharing is a big issue in my ward, in Ward 20 in downtown. Um, and I fully support home sharing. People have been sharing their homes for decades. You go away on a trip, you share your home. You have an extra room in your place, you rent it out to somebody. And, and it works for many reasons. And so sharing your homes, your primary or your principal residence, frankly, we're just looking to legalize what has already taken place and we should have done a while ago. What I don't support is the systematic removal of rental housing for use as so-called home sharing. In, in my community, I can point to addresses. 299 Augusta in Kensington Market, we built three rental units. They're now, all three of them, Airbnb short-term accommodations. 38 Kensington Place. We had five large units, large family size units. The building was purchased, tenants were systematically dehoused, and it's now being converted into nine Airbnb listings. 
180 Sherborne, outside of my ward, was a rooming house. Precarious housing for 12 adults. It was purchased, they were dehoused, and there are now 12 Airbnb units there. I had, a, I had a host in to see me last week, and I put host in quotation marks. He lives in my ward. He doesn't rent out rooms in his house. He owns a half dozen condos, which he rents out as Airbnb short-term listing. I asked him why he didn't rent those out as rental units. He said he would only get $2,500 a month as a rental unit. He was getting $6,800 a month as a ghost hotel. That's the difference between home sharing and investor-driven ghost hotels. And so this is not a debate about the digital economy. This is not a debate about whether or not we embrace the innov innovation in our city. It's a debate about how do we permit home sharing without exacerbating the rental, house rental housing crisis. That's all this is. And so I think it is absolutely critical that we get this right rather than just getting it done. I'm confident in the team led by Tracy Cook with the support of our chief planner. Uh, and I, I think it's also critical as we move to the next phase that secondary suites are eliminated um, and that we have enforcement, 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 as one deputant said. Thank you so much. Thanks, Councillor Cressy. Uh, Councillor Nunziata? Uh, just briefly, um, I, I also have issues in my ward, and I won't go into details. I've reported it to Tracy. But the recommendations that we have before us for uh, consultation and I'm on licensing as well so I'm looking forward to those consultation meetings and in fact I encourage members of council to send out notices to the residents on the consultation meeting so they're aware because what's the what would be a big mistake is if we don't consult with the residents and then it you get complaints from residents in communities where they're complaining and not knowing what's going on and they and they call the police, they call the counselor, they call 311. So it's really important that we consult and when we consult, we have to consult everyone. So I'm uh, looking forward to the consultation meetings. Thanks, Councillor Nziata. Uh, are there any other visiting uh, councillors? Uh, I don't see any, so we'll move to members of the committee who wish to speak. I know I saw some motions floating around, so there must be some. Councillor Bailout. Councillor McMahon. Councillor Bailout, you're up. Yes, I have a motion that I'd like to put up. And uh, I start by thanking staff and everybody that has been involved in the consultations because uh, I think there's been um, uh, some of the uh, home sharing companies that have been extremely helpful in, in assisting staff with, uh, uh, with uh, these recommendations. Uh, I do have uh, some concerns, and, and by the way, I should also say that I, I, I think the concept itself, it's great. Uh, I think it is a different form of, of tourism and hosting people in our city. I think it's welcoming. I think it's, it's, uh, it should be here, and we, we just need to make sure it fits in with the objections that we have as a city. But we are facing some, uh, some challenges with, uh, with, uh, with housing, and in particular with rental, with a very low vacancy rate. And, um, you know, the numbers are not clear. I mean, the report says that since 2002, we have had about 1,700 secondary units built. We don't know if what, what was built before that. We don't know that. Uh, but I think it is important that we find ways to make sure that whatever units are part of our long-term rental stock continue as, as long-term rental stock, while giving the opportunity to uh, continue to be wonderful hosts uh, of Airbnb as they are. So I want staff to have this conversation because we are doing a lot of work in this city to create, and, and, and the province, to create secondary units, to increase the, ha the, 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 uh, the rental stock, and it just doesn't make sense that on the other hand we're taking those units away from, from, from the long-term rental. This is an issue in our city. We've had people having their rents doubled in the city of Toronto. This is a big pressure that is facing our city, and we need to deal with both. The same way that we need to welcome the world to Toronto and, and work with our wonderful hosts in the home sharing and the hotel industry, we need to deal with the housing and the people that live here every day and that want to live here. 
And this is part of the solution because many of you today said as well that home sharing is part of that affordability, that you are able to afford our, your homes because of this income. And so it's this balance that I think that staff has been trying to achieve and that I, we, I certainly hope that by the end of this process we're there, uh, we're there together. But I think we need to, to look into the secondary suite um, opportunity. Um, I also think that to the companies that have been uh, doing the work with us and that we'll do it in the future, it's, it needs to be clear what the penalties are for the ones that don't. It's, it won't be fair to have companies and hosts that will play by the rules and then have others that don't and basically we don't have the teeth to really enforce this. So I think that creating a, 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 a plain level field that has everybody uh, playing by the same rules would be really important to everybody that is in that business and that's why I'm, I'm looking forward to having that recommendation. And then the recommendation of principal residency. I think that we have to do it in a very uh, easy wrap, and wrap fast up, and in a, in, a, in a platform that works well with, with the way that we have. It's online, it's fast, but we need to make sure that we are able to verify that, uh, that principal residency. So. Thank you. Councillor McMahon. Thank you. Uh, so I'm shout out to Tracy Cook, who is getting her ego is growing by the minute because she is getting so much, uh, so many accolades. But thanks, Tracy, and your team for for all the hard work you do regularly, especially on this issue. And I am uh, supportive of staff recommendations. And as you saw from some of my residents today. Airbnb exists and, and uh, the home sharing goes on in, in my ward um, tremendously. And, and I'll tell you, um, if, you're going, if you're traveling, who wouldn't want to stay in basically a seaside town, which is the beach, um, especially given the fact that we don't have any other uh, accommodation options available uh, apart from one small um, fully booked motel in um, especially in the summer so I'm I think this is great that we're having this conversation we need to get on board we need to get progressive with the sharing economy we've done it with other uh, uh, other aspects of the sharing economy and I'm fully supportive thank you thanks Councillor McMahon uh, other speakers Councillor Palacio thank you Mr. Mayor I have a motion that uh, I'm going to ask the clerk to thank you. So it's uh, first and foremost, I want to thank all the deputants for taking the time to come and speak to the, to the committee and, uh, and city staff, of course, for, for the great work that they have done. And of course, there's going to be much more work. So the purpose of this recommendation literally is uh, to ask um, city staff to revise the proposed definition and uh, to look into it. That's something that we heard from the deputants today. And I think we are all trying to get to the same point. Now, one thing that um, we heard from uh, many deputants, and one of them it was my own constituent, James, that's still here, and um, who is married with two children, and, uh, and he's sharing his principal residence a few nights uh, each month. And when I ask him, and what's the real purpose? And he says, well, the, supp the supplementary income, it's what uh, helps him to carry the mortgage and utility bills and whatever else. So that's a classical example of what we are dealing overall in terms of, the, of this Airbnb platform is, um, and I think that's a very responsible way to do. Now, and we have heard from the majority of people as well that and it seems that most of the people with the level of gentrification that's taking place all throughout the city, we are dealing with not only with uh, millennials, but also, as we hear from the deputants, from uh, some uh, people who have very li limited incomes and that's assisting them in terms of moving forward. One thing that I would like to, to ask members of the committee is to be mindful as we move forward with some of the recommendations as well. And um, one of my concerns is in terms of possible loop loopholes that could be created with basement units, secondary suites, 
and that are allowed as a right right now, and there are restrictions and requirements under the Ontario, Bu Ontario Building Code and the Fire Code. So the requirements are very rigid. But however, if a homeowner decides at whatever point to go around the rules and to get rid, for example, of a basement unit, a secondary unit, and create one single unit overall, who are we to control that and to tell that very person, no, no, you can't do it? Who are we, for God's sakes, to control people's lives? It's up to that very proper owner to make decisions on their own property. They're paying property taxes I'll and allow them to do wrap up. what's right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Those are my comments. Thank, thank you very much. Question of the mover. Um, Councillor Palacio, so you mean that a person can own one residence and can use that on a platform for short-term rental by your one Toronto residence? As long as uh, we are not compromising a long-term rental market unit. So the purpose of the recommendation that's before you is for clarification purpose, and, and I put this recommendation forward based on the, on the arguments and put forward by deputants. So I think is overall the definition of principal residence as not written in the report does not compromise a long-term rental market unit. And what I'm asking, as you can see, is for a report but, in terms of clarification. But if it's one residence, if it's a principal residence, it's where you live. If it's one residence, then can you not have multiple family members putting in their ownership, your wife, your child, and others, individual residents in between that household by four, five, or six homes and put them on as rental units on short-term rental if you make it one Toronto residence? Let me give you a classical example. Is I own... And I don't mean to be, I just want to know, don't you think people could do that? I own more than one property and, and I don't use Airbnb at all or any other platform in any way whatsoever. But I do have a secondary residence and where I go and visit my mother. And I spend perhaps three or four or five nights uh, per week now, if I was doing this, most likely, probably, I would have taken advantage of that, and I want some clarification on it. I want to have that clarification so there won't be, the, the loop won't, won't be there. Mayor Tari, I'll, I'll speak briefly on the item, if you have no other speakers now. I'm sorry, I just couldn't hear you. Have my question's been, Yes, answered. you now wish to speak? Yes, please. All right. Great. I'm sorry. You have a question. No okay, problem. please. Councillor Palacio, um, from what I'm reading then, wouldn't this open um, the door to all kinds of investment properties as well? So Absolutely not. No? Absolutely not. Not in my opinion. Absolutely not. So so what I'm asking city staff is to look into it, look at the definition, come up with they are the professionals. Let them look into it and come back with something that is, uh, we can feel comfortable with. I'm not trying to compromise the integrity of what you are also working with. And I think no, it has all nothing, of us we are working quite the opposite. That has nothing to do with that. Okay. Uh, then we had Councillor Shiner to speak. That's me. So in, in regards to the issue that's in front of us and the recommendation from staff, I am supportive of the direction they're going and appreciate the fact that we're trying to put some rules at play. I really would like to see some further input as to limiting the number of days or the requiring the number of days that you could live in a residence because the intention is that it not become uh, a rental property. And some of you may recall that I've had incidents where wonderful homes in my community were used for party houses rented out in the weekends, ended up with a shooting, ended up with prosecution in the end, and a large fine. And you have it throughout the city, and our staff were very, very good on that. And I think um, my colleague, Councillor Bilo, raised some very important issues about the loss of second suites. Because if you recall the history of that, in many parts of the city, they were not permitted. And we changed the zoning bylaw because we wanted more affordable housing and the ability to rent out a second suite and a home. 
but let me tell you that I don't believe my community believes inside of its wonderful 1960 subdivision that that second suite that second suite should be one that has an ongoing rotation of people coming and parking and using it because it was never intended for that. It was intended to provide a second home for another family within the building and if it is rented out on the odd time for a short-term basis because that person may not be there or otherwise, that might be how it's dealt with. But to turn the basement unit, or as I heard someone say here, I have three stories. My first is my office, the second is my home, and the third is my rental. I don't think that was the intention, was to create a rental unit on the main street like that, where it's always a rental unit. And I understand the issues that my colleague, Councillor Cressy, is having as well, and seeing the loss of those units now being changed over to short-term rental units, because you make a lot more money at that and you just become a landlord. So I think the recommendations that are here are reasonable. I, I have concerns about how this may come back, but I'll look to it forward to what the consultation is and listen to the input of all of my colleagues to see and hopefully what their thoughts are and make a good decision on recommendations in the end. Thank you, Councillor Shiner. Councillor DiGiorgio and Councillor Deputy Mayor Renner Wong to speak. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Mayor. I'm I'm looking forward to see what the uh, consultation in various areas of the city brings us in the final report. Uh, you know, we've, uh, we've got to dis differentiate between the primary stock of rental housing and the secondary stock. Most of us know that all the condominiums, a third of the condominiums are out for rental. They're not owner occupied. So there is a lot. I don't think the vacancy rate for rental is one and a half percent when you consider uh, that a lot of condos are empty. So when you take everything into the into consideration, the rental rate is much higher than one and a half percent. That is to say, the vacancy rate. Um, for the longest time, we've seen conversion of rental buildings into condos. For the longest time, they they don't allow conversion of rental buildings in low-income areas into condos. But I, I couldn't I couldn't estimate the number of rental buildings that were actually converted into condos. So that nobody, nobody cried the blues and said, oh, we're, we're losing rental units. We're losing rental units at that time. Uh, my own opinion with respect to secondary suites is that in some areas, there is a very, very um, big incentive to actually convert to these, um, to the um, Airbnbs. Whereas in some other areas, like in my area, I don't think, for example, if someone has a basement apartment and they rent it out, they're not going to look into uh, renting it out on a short-term basis. They're, they're interested in the stability of having a tenant in the home, and they're not going to worry about it. Uh, so I think there are lots of, uh, lots of points to take into consideration. I'm not a big, a big um, proponent of we're losing rental housing. I think that there's, uh, there's a lot of rental housing around. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor Minimum Wong to speak. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, firstly, I'm happy to support the recommendations and that this is going out for consultation. And I'm exceedingly relieved that this is gonna go to the Planning Committee or the uh, Municipal Licensing and Standard Committee. So when it comes back, th they're gonna have to <laughs> listen to all the deputations all over again. And it's not gonna have to come back here. I. I I will say this, um, I just have a couple of comments on the secondary suites, so um, firstly, I, I, I agree with Councillor Palacio and I'm glad he spoke up, so, so I don't agree necessarily, I'm, I'm reluctant to embrace this regulation of the secondary suites as a natural instinct and as, and as, a, as a first action. I, I don't think that's right. I think we should uh, regulate as a last resort only when it's necessary. I'm mindful of the deputant who um, said that the number of offenses based on the number of units is very small, right? And so before we go out and knee-jerk reaction and decide that we're going to regulate, we should actually de decide if this is a problem or not. And it's not yet clear to me whether it's a problem that needs to be done. And maybe if it becomes a problem, we should look at it. But until such time as it becomes a problem, we may think it may be more prudent to leave it alone. Um, People have been rec renting out secondary suites for a long, long time. And, you know, they've been renting it. People ha 
families haven't been able to afford homes, and the only way, way they can afford homes is to rent out the basement or something like this. And, and so, so this is just a different arrangement where instead of a long-term rent, it's a short-term rent, but you can make a lot more money. And, and unlike, you know, Councillor Cressy, who is decrying the fact that, um, you know, that these people were making a lot of money, I don't have a problem with making a lot of, with people making a lot of money. I think that's great. Um, in this city, you know, I mean, the, it is becoming harder to buy a home. It's becoming harder to live. It's becoming harder for seniors to stay in their homes and it's beco becoming much harder for young families to afford homes. So the idea of making short-term rental available so people, so young families can actually buy homes in neighborhoods, single family homes, you know, buying a single family home in my neighborhood, we don't have any young families anymore because they just can't buy a home. They can't afford a home and finding some relief where they can actually use this to offset their mortgage, I think is something that we should look at. And if it's not a problem, then, then, then I think we should be very careful about, about that, that type of regulation. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Minnan Wong, are there any other uh, members wishing to speak? All right, I think we're ready then to uh, call the question. We have uh, uh, two uh, motions to deal with here uh, by way of amendments. First one is from Councillor Bylaw. Call the question. All those in favor? Uh, opposed? We better count that. I guess we better do a uh, recorded vote. I just I think it looked like it passed, but I just want to make sure. Yeah. Pardon me? You can do Dave Austin. Well, sure, if you want, if, you, if that's your wish. Let's do it a recorded vote by. On part one of the motion by Councillor Bylaw, all those in favor? Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bylaw, Councillor DiGiorgio, Mayor Tory, Councillor Shiner, all those opposed? Councillor Crawford, Councillor McMahon, Deputy Mayor Minnenwong, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Robinson. Part one failed. This fails on a tie, correct? Part one fails on a tie. All right. Part two. On part two of motion by count. Five failed five. on a tie. Yeah. Part two. On part two of motion one by Councillor Bylaw, all those in favor? Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bylaw, Councillor Crawford, Councillor DiGiorgio, Councillor McMahon, Deputy Mayor Minimwong, Mayor Tory, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Robinson, Councillor Shiner. Part two carries unanimously. And part three. On part three, by motion one by Councillor Bylaw, all those in favor? Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bylaw, Councillor Crawford, Councillor DiGiorgio, Deputy Mayor Minimwong, Mayor Tory, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Robinson, all those opposed? Count Councillor McMahon, your vote? Councillor McMahon? Sorry, Councillor Pachano, you, you were on affirmative? Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, then we go to item uh, motion number two, amendment number two from Councillor Palacio. Uh, all those in favor? We want to record a vote. All right. All, all right. A motion two by Councillor Palacio. All those in favor? Councillor Crawford. Councillor Palacio. All those opposed? Oh, sorry. Sorry, Councillor Robinson. All those opposed? Councillor Ainsley. Councillor Bylaw. Councillor DiGiorgio. Councillor McMahon. Deputy Mayor Minimwong. Mayor Tory. Councillor Shiner, motion two fails. Okay, and uh, the item is amended. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried. You're not opposed. You just left your hand up a long time. Oh, sorry. I'm oh, just asking. There's a question mark at the end of that statement. <laughs> All right, I'd like to do some, uh, some uh, just quick releases here if there are any. Uh, you don't think, that, what happened with, uh, well, For starters, Councillor Shiner, are you st you're still holding Toronto Hydro? Mayor Tory, uh, can I? I'd like to. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've got some business left to do here. Please. I would like to confer with the Chair of Toronto Hydro on it, and I understand that we can defer it till September. 
and still have it come to council in time. So with no staff being here to answer any questions, I'd just like to move to defer it to our September meeting. All right. I, look, if the committee concurs in that, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. Uh, the, the motion to defer until the next meeting. Uh, this is the hydro item. Toronto Hydro, he wants to confer with the chair. Councillor Shiner wants to confer with the chair of the hydro Councilor board. Barlow. And that opportunity hasn't arisen today, so rather than... Gary. So all those Gary. in favor of deferring to... Uh, all right, motion is carried. Uh, then the next was... Uh, uh, which other ones do we have left then? Uh, Sorry, Mayor Torian, a point of order. Is, is Mr. Derek Moran here? Sorry, Mayor Tori. Yes? Just on a point of order, number um, 23, I've spoken with staff. I have some uh, concerns about it. Uh, not enough people or organizations were consulted. They currently have BMRs, and uh, staff are comfortable if I refer it back to them for further consultation. Who, who is that? 26 point, 20, 23, Councillor Ainsley? 23, yes. Yes. Lori Lorianne Graven. Is Lorianne Graven here? All right, well, then it's not a quick item. We'll have to. Uh, all right, well, that's fine then. Uh, if, if that's the case, if you're content, I'm sorry that you've sat here all this time, but that's the way it goes. So uh, then, Councillor Cous Cous Ainsley has moved this be deferred back, referred back to staff for further consultation. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Thank you, and thank you for your patience, ma'am. Much appreciated. So you'll have a chance to. Uh, all right, and what else do we have? Uh, is is Derek, Derek Moran here? All right, that's. Well, I can withdraw an item. All right. Like at this that hour. Motion to receive that item. If he's not here. Well, you know, we'll do that. But we just, uh, since Councillor McMahon put up her hand to withdraw an item, that is the neighborhood office. Yes, so I would like to withdraw uh, EX 26.44, Office of Neighborhoods in the City of Toronto. I have another way to do this. It, uh, accor according to the, the clerk tells me we can't, you can't withdraw it, unfortunately, because it was sent by City Council over here. So defer indefinitely. So we can defer it indefinitely. It's any die. Is it deputation? There is. Uh, who's the deputation? <laughs> is a Peggy... Oh, no, Peggy's on post right. Okay. Oh. Well, then, that's not a sh quick release item. And then uh, the, the one, there were ones that Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, pardon me? Derek no, Mr. Graham Glavich is here. Der Derek Moran is not here. Not here. So we have two items. Number eight, 2618, which is uh, the uh, investment report. I'll ask one more time. Is Mr. Mar Mr. Moran here? Okay, he's not. Uh, can I have someone move the staff recommendations in? Moved by Councillor Crawford. Uh, all those in, fa in favor? Opposed? Carried. And then there's also uh, 20, uh, 2614, which is the implementation of city policies. Mr. Moran, ask one more time. Not here. All right, uh, moving the staff recommendations then. May I have a motion to move the staff recommendations? Moved by Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Giorgio. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, let's go down then to the um, uh, anti-black racism report, which is item 20, yeah. uh, 6.5, and uh, we have some uh, deputations, and first on the list is Dennis Keshenro, Caribbean Global Mission. I haven't seen Mr. Keshenro here. Is he here? Dennis Keshenro? All right. Next was Donardo S. Jones, Director of Legal Services, African Canadian Legal Clinic. Is Mr. Jones here? All right. Next, and I did see Anthony Morgan, I think. There he is. Anthony Morgan, please. Mr. Morgan, welcome. Sorry it's so late, but <clears throat> it is democracy. That's exactly right. Uh, so you have three minutes, and uh, you're most welcome here. Pardon me? Three minutes. Is that a Mary Tory three minutes? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> it's a way to start, right? Way I'm going to gonna start. start your time over again, wise guy. <laughs> you, you now have three minutes. <laughs> All right, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, 
Um, uh, I'm, I'm certainly pleased to have the opportunity to, to speak to uh, the interim action plan uh, or the, the action plan to confront anti-black racism within our city. It's a really important initiative. I should say a, a, a couple words about myself. My name is Anthony Morgan. Uh, some folks may be familiar with my work. I worked for two years with the African Canadian Legal Clinic as the policy and research lawyer, which allowed me to delve real deeply into issues of anti-black racism within our city, within our province, and across Canada. Uh, and I am currently an associate at Faulkner's LLP, uh, a civil litigation firm. But I, I should stress that as I speak tonight, I, I speak more as a, as a community member, uh, a resident of our city, and of course as a young black man who experiences anti-black racism and has a keen interest in addressing uh, these issues. Being cognizant of, of my time, I will say that uh, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons I think this should be uh, supported is because what we see in the development of this action plan is something that's very unique as it relates to community consultation that is genuine, that is robust, that is embedded in a kind of partnership and respect that we rarely see from government and government institutions, frankly. Uh, when it relates to the African Canadian community, often we hear that uh, if decisions are being made, for or uh, purportedly in support of the community, they're, they're being made without active engagement, support, and ongoing uh, development. One of the major uh, elements that are worth supporting in, this, uh, in the action plan uh, that, uh, that I would say make it worth moving forward with is that uh, much of the report is embedded in understanding what has been done before. So we're not starting from scratch as if there has been no research, as if there has not been any recommendations that have come forward to uh, address issues of access and opportunity for African Canadians. And so uh, for all these reasons, I think it's critically important that, uh, that the, the action plan be moved forward. It has full community support. Uh, some may feel that this is just uh, coming off the whims of Black Lives Matter and it's a Black Lives Matter initiative, but no, speaking, continuing being embedded in community and having many conversations, myself being at some of the consultations uh, that have happened throughout the city, I've heard uh, from folks young and old, from the Caribbean, from the continent, queer and trans people, uh, folks writ large in the business community and religious communities, I'm hearing consistent messaging that this thing needs to happen. Uh, and so I, I encourage folks uh, to, to support it. Uh, I encourage you uh, in your capacities to continue to work and build with the community as, as we look to make change, to make this truly uh, a Toronto that all African Canadians can, can be proud of and participate in fully. Thank you very much, Mr. Morgan. Are there questions of the Deputy uh, Councillor Cressy? Uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, you, you struck a very optimistic tone there, which I'm pleased to, to hear. Uh, and so I guess I would ask, we produce many strategies and reports at the city, and there have been many strategies and reports over decades uh, on issues related to, to African Canadians and anti-black racism. What gives you greater confidence this time around? Again, looking at the ways in which there was engagement, meaningful, deeply embedded engagement. Uh, I think there were, uh, uh, we had, 41 community consultations, uh, 18 community agencies and community groups having multiple meetings within community to hear from community leaders who brought the, their own uh, parts of the African Canadian community within Toronto together to ha come have these conversations. And uh, around the city, I saw rooms full uh, of energy, of optimism, uh, of hope, uh, seeing that we're, we're actually not just being spoken at, spoken to. Mayor Tory has been out to a number of, of these meetings and, and just his presence alone made, uh, gave the strong message that this was not going to be another one of those processes. And also who, the folks who've been hired, frankly, on this project inspire confidence uh, within the community, uh, whether they be in, as a consultation capacity or part of the facilitation team. They're people that within the community have a lot of respect uh, admiration and trust. And because those folks have already been brought in uh, to developing and articulating and, and the rollout to this, there's already a tremendous amount of confidence in this. And I think many would be totally disheartened, disappointed, uh, extremely frustrated if, if after all of that, after all the hope and all that's been built into this, uh, we didn't see it move forward.
And are you aware that City Legal has some job openings at the moment? And are you interested? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I appreciate that. I'm happy where I am. <laughs> on that question period, uh, Mr. Parker. Just sort of evening up for the last. Uh, uh, other questions of Mr. Morgan? Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your patience in uh, staying with us tonight. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Sarana Sandy, Chief Executive Officer, Skills for Change. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillors, for having me today. I am the CEO of Skills for Change. Skills for Change serves 14,000 people in Toronto, greater Toronto area. And we're one of the community service agencies who participated in the consultations. We held consultations at three of our nine locations with uh, members of the black community. We are an agency that serves immigrants and refugees in general, and a significant portion, portion of our clients are uh, black Torontonians. Personally, and as an organization, we are very supportive of the Interim Toronto Action Plan for Confronting Anti-Black Racism, and I strongly believe that the City of Toronto should implement this action plan. During our various consultations, we had the opportunity to engage with various members, very young people, elders, um, leaders in the community, professionals, students, etc., and we heard the tremendous negative challenges that they encounter as a result of anti-black racism whether it's a young man breaking down in tears because of daily, daily stops by the local police, whether it's elders speaking of 40 odd years of research and no action, and whether it's deep issues that are facing our young black people because of high unemployment rate and impact of being touched by the criminal justice system. So I believe that the city of Toronto can make a tremendous impact in changing the lives a black Torontonians civically, economically, and politically by implementing this action plan. Specifically, um, by the city taking a leadership role in developing strategies to integrate young black people in work and leadership and mentoring opportunities within the city of Toronto, but also taking a lead in engaging uh, public or private organizations for them to make changes to impact employment issues for young black professionals. This Implementing of this, implementation of this action plan would enable changes in both black people access to good employments, career opportunities, improvement in social engagement, and most importantly, for them to fully, fully enjoy living in the city of Toronto. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, and uh, so are there questions of the deputy? Thank you very much, Ms. Sandy. Very much appreciated. Uh, Denise Franz, uh, Director of Research and Programs, Women Health, Women's Health in Women's Hands Community Health Center. Good evening. Hello. Uh, thank you to Mayor John Tory and the members of the Executive Committee for the opportunity to present to you today. My name is Denise Franz and I am the HIV Testing Intervention Coordinator and I'm representing Women's Health in Women's Hands Community Health Center. Our organization is actually celebrating its 25th anniversary and we are the only community health center in North America which specializes in pro providing primary health care for black and racialized women. We commend the city for showing its leadership and commitment to addressing anti-black racism and support the Toronto Action Plan to confront anti-black racism that is being discussed today. As one of the key organizations selected to facilitate community conversations which helped shape the action plan, we heard firsthand from black women how the devastating effects of anti-black racism had impacted their lives and the lives of their families. We also heard the key strategies for success they put forward that we feel have been well articulated in the action plan. We do want to emphasize the following for your consideration. First, our work and research as health care providers at Women's Health and Women's Hands has shown the devastating impact that anti-black racism has had on the health of black women and their families. In the city of Toronto specifically, black women make up 66% of all new HIV infections. Black women have the highest rate of low birth weight babies, and black women have some of the highest rates of diabetes and other stress-related chronic illnesses. One factor that has been implicated in the exacerbation of poor health outcomes is the current inadequacy in the delivery of health care and social services that provide culturally appropriate support and fail to address racism as a determinant of health. 
We therefore want to emphasize the urgent need for consistent, equitable, and sustained funding for existing Black-led health and community services and new investments in resources to address the service delivery gaps which have been identified by the Black community consultations. In the socio-economic, racially stratified society that we exist in Toronto, an individual's inability to gain access to and receive, receive appropriate health care and social services that address their unique needs and concerns is not merely a result of their own lack of initiative, but rather it is in part a consequence of the structural barriers caused by anti-black racism. We therefore want to emphasize and advocate for the city to adopt an inclusive anti-black racism framework that respectfully addresses unique gender issues, LGBT issues, as well as immigrant and refugee issues, which were clearly highlighted in the community consultations. We also emphasize the need for consistent and accurate collection of race-based statistics to aid in evaluation and monitoring. In order to achieve the goals set out by black community members, there must be an acknowledgement and understanding of barriers which determine the nature of an individual's uh, participation in our health and social service system, their access to services and the types of services that are provided. In an anti-black racism framework will act as a lens through which all decisions, organizational activities, and programs are viewed, developed, and evaluated. It will also provide the mechanisms through which the City of Toronto will report back to the community in terms of improvements in outcomes for the black residents of our city. In conclusion, as a young black woman in our great city of Toronto, who was given the opportunity to participate in these consultations that allowed us to get here today, I want to thank you for your time today and applaud the city for a successful initiation of this process. We look forward to our ongoing participation in the implementation of the action plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Franz. Are there questions of Ms. Franz? All right, well, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Brianna Lorado Mokwele, Council Coordinator, African Canadian Social Development Council. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Brianna Lerato Makwali. I'm the Council Coordinator, as Mr. Terry Mayer said, of the African Canadian Social Development Council. Um, before I get started, um, I would like to invite my brothers and my sisters up here as we are doing a collective joint presentation. Is this, uh, just so I know from my list here, is this uh, uh, Shaquille Griffith, is an Abe Goodwin, and so? Is it, yes, Mayor. And so, because I've got, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven names that come from the Tobono Institute. Is this all that's left after we put you through the, uh, the this long wait today of, that we've all had? I believe so. Okay, so, that, so that'll, okay, well, that's fine. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll allow, some, obviously, some extra time. I'll, in fact, we'll just start over again and allow some extra time because there's some of you that are down here separately. Right, thank so, you. Please go ahead as you wish. Good evening, I'm Nene Wazikafele, Tabono Institute. Uh, we're here to support the interim action plan to confront anti-black racism that has been put before you <clears throat> for consideration and to provide some important feedback on it. We represent a diverse cross-section of members of the African-Canadian community in Toronto. We commend you, Mr. Mayor, and the city we commend Denise Andrea Campbell, I think she's somewhere here, for her tenacity and amazing leadership, and her staff, and all the facilitators who did such a wonderful job, some of them are here today, yeah. yes, in uh, pulling our community together to give you deep and insightful feedback and useful recommendations. And as uh, Anthony said earlier, the uh, hopes and aspirations of our community are tremendous, given the exercise we just went through. Um, African Canadians are successful contributing members of this fine city, but we continue to see their aspirations and full potential restrained by the toxic mix of state violence, income inequality, and anti-black racism. In our school system, in child welfare, in policing, in employment, in hate crimes, Anti-black racism manifests in numerous ways, and as noted in the plan, this has been outlined in over 41 separate reports. 
As you know, the evidence of econ the economic cost of racism and anti-black racism for the city is also clear and compelling. The time for concrete action is now. African-Canadian communities are a vital part of the city, and we all lose when anti-black racism crushes human potential. Our community has not only been struggling and speaking out for justice for generations, but has also been involved over many years in building numerous concrete community-based initiatives to build capacity and combat oppression. In this regard, we applaud and support the persistent advocacy, activism, and commitment of Black Lives Matter Toronto without apology. However, Mr. Mayor, we believe that there are some critical elements that must be considered in moving this plan forward. First, there needs to be a coordinated intergovernmental response. We recognize that solutions to anti-black racism require engagement and collaboration from all three levels of government. We commend the city for becoming, whoa, was it something we said? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we commend the city for becoming a leader in this work and for sending a strong signal through actions that Toronto is serious about addressing anti-black racism. We note the commitment to working with the province, for example, the three-year anti-black, anti-racism strategic plan. But this collaboration seems a bit underdeveloped. We did not note any similar recognition of the need to collaborate and align with the federal government. To continue, African-Canadian Community Oversight and Accountability, on page 47 of the plan, references the need for engagement from African-Canadian community experts to create working groups to guide the implementation of this plan. We believe this is essential. However, the plan needs to be articulate, clear, and a consistent vision that values a framework for African-Canadian community development and engagement that provides for diverse African-Canadian leadership, oversight, and respectful collaboration at every level of the plan. We therefore propose the following amendments to the staff report. Staff report back on the possibility of working with African-Canadian community to establish a diverse, representative, African-Canadian Affair Oversight and Collaboration Committee. The membership of this committee would be determined by a process developed by the African-Canadian community and would ensure that planning, decision-making, information sharing trans and is transparent and promotes a robust and respectful permanent structure for ongoing engagement between the city and the African-Canadian communities. Additionally, the need for appropriate and meaningful resources. We believe it is critical that the Executive Committee support the need for the plan to be appropriately and strongly resourced through the allocation of new resources, new investments. We recognize that the many demands on the city's budget and that the current financial framework of the city presents a problem for a comprehensive anti-black racism strategy being adequately funded. We strongly suggest that the framework needs to be seriously reviewed in order to not undermine this important agenda. An important measure of this strategy will be evident in the resources applied to it. Additionally, where feasible, where feasible examine the reallocation and prioritization of existing spending for programs and city grants to take on an African-Canadian community focus. This is a cost-neutral way to immediately garner resources for the plan. Finally, the, creation, the creative exploration of leveraging resources from other jurisdictions is also recommended. Almost finished. Next, the need for a whole system approach. Because we're mindful of the complex nature of city government, Internal alignments, integration, collaboration, and accountability are all important conditions for success. We strongly believe that the plan should, number one, direct all directors responsible for the recommendations to review and consult with their staff to develop a multi-year plan of action in response to the recommendations, including existing programs or services, existing budget allocations, and any new services and relevant required programs, services, and funding emerging from the action plan. 
Number two, direct the Office of Partnerships to work with the directors and the community to develop a round table of funding partners to explore funding and investment for moving forward. And finally, direct the Diversity and Human Rights Division to track, monitor, and report on the implementation of the plan to the Executive Committee on a tri-monthly basis in the first year and biannually thereafter. In conclusion, Mr. Mayor and Executive Committee members, we urge you to approve this interim action plan to confront anti-black racism and to push for its full approval at Council. By approving this plan and supporting its implementation, the city will show that it is in genuine solidarity with its African-Canadian residents. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Um, we have uh, then questions of the deputants. Uh, are there questions of the deputants? Could I just, oh, oh go ahead, please, Councillor Cressy. I think there's, um, yeah. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, were there I'm more? I, I thought when you finished, you were all finished. But if there's more, please, uh, please go ahead. Now, the clock reset itself right in the middle of the, uh, of the whole thing. And, and I was going to allow, obviously, because you've consolidated some extra time. So you take some time, if you wish. And uh, I'm sorry, I thought you were done when, go ahead. Thank you. I am Tony Juno Baptist, the program manager at Taibu Community Health Center. Taibu Community Health Center provides primary health care services for the black population across the GTA as its priority population and residents of the local community of Malvern. Recognizing that systemic oppression has fostered conditions of ill health with black communities, we strive to deliver services through intersectional, equity-based and culturally affirming practices which promotes holistic wellness, health education and prevention. Taibu recognizes and affirms the City of Toronto's definition of anti-black racism as the beliefs, attitudes, prejudice, stereotyping and discrimination that is directed at people of African descent, which is rooted in their unique history and experience of enslavement and colonization in Canada. Taibu applauds and supports the Toronto Action Plan to confront anti-black racism that has been put forward to you. And most, most importantly, we also believe that the 22 recommendations and 80 actions to tackle the five issue areas are more specifically children and youth development, health and community services, job opportunities and income support, policing and justice and, and the justice system, and community engagement and leadership. If they are truly addressed from an anti-racism and anti-oppression framework, the outcomes could rigorously undermine the legacy of anti-black racism which lies in the current social, economic, and political marginalization of black Torontonians. In conclusion, Taibu believes that, like the Ontario's Black Action Plans strategy, that the City of Toronto should give some serious consideration for the allocation of new and meaningful funding and resources to help to reduce some of the critical immediate disparities for black Torontonians particularly in the areas of mental health, okay. community service, job opportunities, and income support. All of the research that has been garnered so far to produce this interim action plan to confront anti-black racism provides sufficient ev evidence for the aforementioned areas of concerns. Nine years of experience in working with the black population across the GTA it is evident that anti-black racism is systemic and embedded and entrenched within Torontonians' society, its institutions, policies, and practices. It was Bell Hooks who said that, I am moved by the knowledge that I now know that I can take my pain, work with it, recycle it, and transform it into a source of power. With the city's contribution and the work that you have done so far, you are working collectively with marginalized, historically marginalized and black population.
to help them to do just that, to transform their pain into a source of power and change. Right. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, sir. Now, was there one more? Yes, sir. I'll, I'll make it short and sweet, guys. I know we've been here for a very long time. Uh, my name is Ebenezer Forger. I'm just here to kind of speak to some of my own experiences um, related to anti-black um, racism. Um, more specifically in the workforce, as I find that's kind of where I've noticed it the most. But I mean, in an everyday perspective, it's something that I deal with and something that I've learned how to deal with. Um, so just a little bit of background, um, you know, I've grown up in Toronto community housing, um, you know, I'm part of that, call it diaspora, where I've, you know, my parents have immigrated into Canada and, you know, of a low income family. Um, my father passed away when I was really young, so I grew up in a single parent uh, household with my mother. Um, you know, I, she forced me to go to school and I appreciate her for doing it. Um, so I ended up going to the University of Windsor and I got a, a degree in sport management. Um, going through that process um, was tough. Um, I, I like to say that I have over 10 years of job experience at a tender age of 26 um, because I've always had to work. And, you know, part of that was being, you know, from where I've come from and, and you know, seeing a lot of different things. Um, you know, I, there's, there's two paths, and I chose a path that I figured would be best for me. Um, the reason why I support what's going on here and this plan is because, um, you know, I find it very difficult um, now that I've actually gone through school and I've joined the workforce to get sustainable employment, to be able to stay within a job and within a company. And I can attribute a lot of that to some of these things that some of my colleagues haven't faced. Um, what I speak about is basically when I join a, a company or a job, I stick out as a sore thumb um, because I'm black. Um, you know, I notice that a lot of times there's a higher expectation for me too. You know, there's an old saying that goes, you know, when you're black, you got to work twice as hard. Um, and, and I think it's been something that I've engraved for so long that I just don't know how to not work hard. Um, you know, and, and many times in certain scenarios, I've been given very harder or harsher punishments for things that I've done. Um, and a lot of it is because there's a lack of understanding as to some of the struggles. For instance, if I show up to a job late, which is, you know, not the best thing to do and not right, it, it may be because I'm actually working and juggling four different jobs. Um, I always joke around with myself that every year around tax season, I wonder how many T4s I'm gonna get because usually I'm employed by at least eight different places within the year, um, mostly on a part-time basis because it's hard for me to get full-time employment for whatever reason. Um, basically, just speaking to the fact that I'm not the only one who faces a lot of these hardships and in, you know, John Tory says it, Drake says it, in the best city in the world, um, you know, it's, it's very dis, disheartening to know that not everyone has equal chances to be successful. Not everyone has equal chances to, you know, pick the path that they want for themselves and be able to excel in that. And I think it's very important that we do put these motions forward and this action plan forward to address some of those things. It may not be the end all be all, and I don't expect, you know, every problem to be solved, but I know it will definitely help. Uh, speaking from my own perspective, and I think that it'd be great for you guys to adopt some of these and push it forward and be something that we can all look forward to. And in closing, that way, you know, a guy like myself can get married, you know, buy a house and, uh, you know, enjoy some of the luxuries of this beautiful city. And um, I look forward to, to being a process of it. And that's why I'm here. I've been here since the, the day and it's very important for me. Thank you, guys. Thank you all very much. And we now would move to questions of you. Uh, if there are some questions, did you have a question, Councillor Cressy? Just, just one question on account of the late hour. Uh, you talked about a proposed amendment which was to, to, for staff to consider a potential African-Canadian Affairs Oversight and Collaboration Committee. What is, the, what is the principle behind that? What is the form of engagement that you feel that might help to realize if it was done in a, in a meaningful way? Well, uh, historically, we, we have been consulted to death, but we haven't really been meaningfully involved in decisions that affect us, and we believe that a different process, not unlike processes that have been developed with other communities, for example, the Aboriginal community, that would ensure that we are more than an occasional consultation, 
that were actually part and parcel of the process of planning and review and accountability and decision making and so on. We have abundant talent and skills in the community. And if we're truly committed to a community engagement approach, then it means community voices should be present in meaningful, permanent ways. So we have made a commitment as members of our community that we're going to develop a couple of models that we want to propose to you about how we could do that in the current context with the current opportunities we have. So it is about sharing, it's about building, it's about supporting, communicating, involving, joint decision making as appropriate, etc. So nothing about us without us. Exactly. Any other questions of the deputies? I should say to you, the four of you and your colleagues who are with you, um, there are some motions forthcoming which are actually quite responsive to some of the things you've said. So rather than take up time asking questions at this hour of the night, I think you'll see the motions will cover off some of the things you want to see some further work done on. So uh, don't assume if there aren't questions that we didn't hear what you had to say. And, and I think in fairness as well, the, the question, for example, of the resourcing, um, you know, will come through the work that's going to be done now. Uh, it says quite explicitly in the report that that's part of the work that has to be done on the business cases. So that's a lot of what's going to be done to get, find out how much money we need to, to give life to this stuff. So are there any other questions? Well, hearing none, then I'll thank you very much. And uh, you can, you'll obviously see in the next few minutes, we'll, you'll see some motions go on the table that are directly responsive to some of the things you've talked about in your deputation. We thank you very much for all the time you've spent here with us today and this evening. Uh, now, I'll just have to make sure of who we covered off. I think that means we covered off many. Uh, Shaquille, Zaneb, Gwyn, Brianna, Ebenezer, Andrea. Were all those covered by that group, or is there? I beg your pardon? Oh, she left. Hi, my name is Andrea Pierce. Yes, Andrea. And um, I first want to commend you, Mayor Tory, as well as this fine group of people, leaders that you have with you, for acknowledging this problem and doing something to address it after all this time. Um, I'm particularly concerned about this issue. Uh, as a black woman and a leader, um, I run a company called Career ABC, but I used to be the director of business systems and development for Infrastructure Ontario, which is the pub Ontario Public Service. Um, so I acknowledge your leadership here to deal with this problem because I don't think that, I think you guys are, are on the leading edge in addressing this properly and engaging with our community. As usually a lone voice in leadership, I want to say that I would like to see, not just in recruitment, but in promotion, that more African Canadians are recruited into leadership and become part of this process. Because right now we see many soul leaders, and as a soul leader, your voice is not heard. And so I'm encouraging you guys to make a real change by including more black African-American leadership, African-Canadian leadership in the Toronto public service. The last thing I'd like to say is, speak of accountability, is that I would like to see a report, a report card for the work that's being done so that we know that the faith we've put in you guys are being properly um, addressed. And I really appreciate all the work that you guys have done. I appreciate your patience in waiting here all this long day to hear what we have to say. And I would love to see a regular report card that our community can feel confident that is not just lip service, but that, that you're truly committed and that you've already shown that commitment by um, engaging us in a meaningful way and we would like to continue to be a part of that process. Thank you very much for your time and we really appreciate your consideration. Thank you very much, Ms. Pierce. Much appreciated. Uh, I had a couple others just listed here. Uh, I think Tony Bat Batiste was already heard from, correct? Yes, so thank you. And then we had Miguel uh, Villa Velarde. Uh, I think I didn't see Miguel here, Miguel here uh, earlier, maybe in the day, but he's not here now. Okay. Uh, so uh, that would be the end of deputations and could lead us to questions of staff by any members of council. Okay, uh, then we, we will have some speakers, I know, because we have some motions to be moved, and we have uh, Councillor Cressy wishing to speak. 
Yeah, and, and, and in the interest of time, I'll be very brief, though I, I certainly think that the subject matter warrants a longer discussion. Uh, just very briefly, I acknowledge completely that diversity is our city's strength, but, but inclusion, and by that I mean real inclusion, remains elusive for far too many. Uh, and for the African Canadian community in our city, uh, anti-black racism permeates nearly every aspect of far too many of their lives. And so I just want to commend our city staff uh, and Denise Andrea Campbell in particular for all the hard work they put into bringing this forward to the hundreds uh, of African Canadians who, who brought their lived experience into committee rooms and larger forums uh, into the mayor. For, for in this term making the issue of anti-black racism a, a personal priority for him as well. And so in that, I look forward to staff coming back and, and I understand there are a couple motions that are being brought forward in response to some of the uh, suggestions we've heard from representatives and deputants here today and, and I, I encourage my colleagues to support them and, and thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Cressy. Uh, other speakers, uh, I know we have some motions here so I could guess at who might wish to speak. How about uh, either well, we've got Councillor Bilo on all the motions, so obviously you wish to speak. There's a number of them. Um, so uh, there was a mention, so thank you to the deputants, and we have to thank you for staying here with us uh, this long day, so thank you for uh, waiting with us. Um, there was a, a request to have the, um, uh, to establish a uh, representative city council advisory board, uh, body, the African Canadian Affairs Oversight and Collaboration Committee. So that is uh, motion C that I'm asking for your support. And uh, the other two motions are uh, with reference to creating a five expert working groups. And this has been uh, something that actually has been brought forward uh, by staff. Um, given the recommendations that were uh, being put forward. And then the um, uh, motion B, it's actually asking for um, uh, intervention strategies on three different areas, collaborative service planning, community investments, and uh, policy development. And um, I just want to reiterate that we are to hear back and, and uh, staff will report back to executive committee in the fourth quarter of 2017 with the results of all this work. So we will be able to follow up and to hear back on the results of, of all this work. And so I just uh, place this motions, ask for your support and thanks staff and you mayor for uh, for taking the leadership on this issue. Thanks Councillor Barlow. Others wishing to speak? Well if there are none I'll just say a few words if I might. Uh, first of all I want to say thank you as well to our staff team and to the people uh, people broadly taken across the community. Uh, the staff team of course led by Denise but also the the team across the community and some of the people here tonight that have stayed with us at this late hour were part of the team that uh, did engage in what somebody described, and I was so pleased to hear it described this way, I think it was Anthony, uh, as a meaningful engagement, because I think it was. Um, it, first of all, it was community-led, um, and that's important, uh, because we wanted it to be that way. We were advised by some of the leadership of the community to make sure it was that way. Um, and it was uh, fairly broad in the sense there were 41 uh, community conversations led by different community organizations, not led by people from the government uh, or by me or by um, officials. Um, and I, I will just say that, um, you know, it, it, I went to four of them and that wasn't uh, as many as I would like to have gone to, but it was enough to learn the following. First of all, if I didn't know it before, which I did, but if I didn't know it before, I would understand from listening to people, this is a real problem um, for us, a real challenge for us. Um, it, it is a real obstacle uh, for us in terms of achieving the kind of society that we want to have and that we uh, strive to have in Toronto, and it's inconsistent with our values. Uh, it is diminishing routinely on a daily basis opportunity for people. It is diminishing hope. Um, it leads people to, while their con contributions at these conversations were extremely thoughtful and very determined in terms of wanting to see something done, um, there was also a certain sense of resignation, which, which almost alarmed me the most, because when people start to become resigned that it's always going to be this way, that's when you have a real problem getting them to help you um, if you uh, come to the table as a partner. And so uh, if I have any concerns about this, it's only that I, and I, I don't, I'm not really concerned about this first point. We are now going to design business cases and an implementation plan in the next very short time 
but the implementation plan will over itself be over time only because if you look at a lot of these kinds of things to do with big issues like employment and health and so on, they're not problems that anybody, even the most collaborative arrangements between governments is going to solve overnight, but we've got to start. Um, secondly, and I was so glad to hear the point made by a couple of the deputants, the collaboration with the other governments is a necessity. A lot of the points made to us in the community conversations were points that, that and this is not a buck passing exercise, it is simply an acknowledgement of the reality that when it comes, say, to health care, while we have certain responsibilities for public health, the majority of what's done when it comes to the provision of health care, including health care for African Canadians or any other group of people, are done under the auspices of the province. And so um, it's, not, it's not enough that we sent along the recommendations that were provincially focused that came out of this exercise to the province. I now have to go and sit down with Mr. Dr. Hoskins, with Mr. Coteau, um, with the Premier and say together between their program and our program, for once and for all, we've got to have one program that results in the two uh, sets of efforts and with the federal government's participation, if at all possible, put together so that we can achieve something and not end up with this kind of finger pointing exercise that's often gone on in the past. And I'll just say two more things. One, we've got to have the involvement of, this is going to be one of my three minutes, uh, Anthony. <laughs> What's well, only 2.52, I just wasted six seconds saying that. Um, We've got to have the involvement of the community, and by that I mean the, in the broadest sense. I don't, I don't just mean the African-Canadian community, but I mean the community, including the business community, the professional community, and so on. They have to be a part of confronting, acknowledging, and addressing the issue. And then secondly, we've got to deal with things in our own house. And I should just tell you so you know, we've already had one meeting um, with some senior leadership inside the city here to talk about this, including some of the senior black leadership inside the city, to talk about what we should do inside our own house, because we've got to set an example uh, in here of how we can do better uh, and take on this issue, address it, and make a difference on it. And so I, I think this is just excellent work, and we've come quite a distance. Uh, now the challenge is going to be not to become report number 42, that didn't get implemented, and I'm quite determined uh, to make sure that's not the case because I think it's past time for Toronto to deal with this and to be a model for other communities uh, around North America and around the world. Um, and so uh, we will get on with doing this most valuable work that happens between now and the end of the year, but we'll have a report back before this year is out, and then it will go forward to Council for approval and, and implementation. And so I thank you all very much again for, uh, and through you to all the people, hundreds of them who took part in getting us to where we are today. Thank you very much. So, we have uh, three motions uh, that are amendments to the recommendations contained in the uh, report. Uh, motion A from Councillor Bylaw, which we can just put up on the screen, which asks for the five expert working groups, and I think that does amend it from a higher number that was here. Um, and our, if there's no other discussion, well, I'll ask for the question on motion A. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Uh, motion B uh, is, again, uh, an instruction to engage a resource group of black subject matter experts to help us with uh, policy development and whatnot and to report back coincidentally and concurrently with the rest of it in the fourth quarter of 2017. Uh, all those in favour? Oppose? Carried. And then finally, we have the motion referred to by Councillor Bylaw that has to do with the uh, asking the city manager to advise us on the establishment of a City Council Advisory Body, African Canadian Affairs Oversight and Collaboration Committee. Uh, all those in favour? Opposed? Carry. So the item now as amended. Uh, all, recorded vote. On the item as amended, all those in favour? Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bailout, Councillor Crawford, Councillor DiGiorgio, Councillor McMahon, Deputy Mayor Minimwong, Mayor Tory, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Robinson and Councillor Shiner. The item as, amended, item as amended carries unanimously. Thank you all very much for your immense patience with the day. Hey, we're, not, we're not done yet, but uh, th that item is for now, uh, and uh, on with the work. So, uh, we have uh, a couple of items then, or one, w w two left, I guess, with deputations. Uh, the first is uh, 2643, which is the um, getting back to normal, keeping residents updated. And uh, is Mr. Glavich still here? There he is. Thank you, Mr. Glavish, for your patience. You have three minutes. Okay, three minutes? Yep. 
Good thing there's no election anytime soon. I wouldn't vote for you. Okay. Uh, I agree with Councillor Carroll's motion, and this is the first time and the only time we'll ever agree with something Councillor Carroll uh, says. Whenever there, there is a meeting, an example is that rooming housing, multi-tenant housing uh, meeting thing going on. With all due respect, many of the, the public consultations that the city sh uh, should, should be doing, that's a horrible uh, way to, inf to inform. The city has a horrible job on informing people of public consultations. Even I have a, have a problem. And an example is the rooming houses that have multi-tenant housing public consultations. The flyers that were put in, in there were, were put in, in, the, in Councilor Carroll's area an hour before the meeting, the public consultation meeting. A lot of the when you guys inform in the city, you only do it in English. There are pe many people in the city who, who, whose English is not the first uh, l uh, language. Uh, and people with visually impairments under AODA can't read things sometimes. My father has a vi visual issue. My father uh, was born in 1923. Make the math on, on how old he is. Obviously, my mother's 21. He can't see whenever he gets all the flyers from, from the city or even Councillor Kelly. He lives in Councillor Kelly. He can't read it. I have to go from Southeast Skyward, take a bus an hour, because he keeps nagging, nagging me to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to read it. Another method is Twitter and Facebook and use social media. I use social media because I can't call my counselor and call him for, for any issues. My, my hearing is not the best, you know? The city that could use uh, social, uh, social, uh, social media, media good. The mayor, you, you do great social, uh, uh, social media, you know? <clears throat> uh, the, again, the rooming houses, I found out through count, uh, an email from Council, Councilor Kerry Janice, and I don't live in Councilor Kerry Janice, you know? There's one over here who, who left five seconds ago. D didn't even send, send, an email, uh, send an email. Most, uh, even the... Uh, the city uh, staff should inform the councillors, and the councillors should, should also uh, send an email along with the, with the city. You all know, know how to type emails, right? Your, your, your staff, you know? You could do a lot of improvement and think of AODA, people with different dis disabilities, you know? I can't call 311 to find out, and many of these, even, even a consultation on, on the What's called on, on, on the Gill Park, which is a you know long term. I had di 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 difficulties in finding out some of some of the sessions. I even after I talked to Councillor Ainsley, he started uh, doing right. it. You know, if there's something lo long term, it should be every six months, not just once a year. Okay. Thank you. We will uh, we will call it a day on that, uh, Mr. Glavis, because that's the end of the time. We're a little bit over actually, so I thank you very much, and we'll see if there's any questions for you. Seeing none, I thank you very much for your patience today and being with us. Uh, are there questions of staff or any motions to be received on this? Uh, you have a question? Very uh, fast. Yeah, I mean, my understanding is I, I'm going through multi-year infrastructure projects in my ward, and we're having lots of meetings, like almost too many meetings. So. I don't understand what this motion's about. We're all, in my, my mind, we're already doing this and doing it well. Certainly, transportation, water, and engineering and construction are doing a great job of outreach with residents. So I don't know about other divisions, but I guess if somebody could answer my question. A question directed to the staff, and I wonder who would like to. Uh... So uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I think on behalf of Cluster B, uh, <laughs> we, we do uh, make every effort to engage in co all our consultation activities as broadly as we can. Uh, I actually just signed a, a requisition for additional public consultation unit staff for engineering construction services. So, uh, you know, I think we do a pretty good job. In some cases, I think we do an exceptional job. 
and uh, I'm not quite sure what the impetus behind this was. No, me neither. I think we're, you know, I think we're doing a pretty good job and certainly using, as uh, the deputy mentioned, numerous methods to outreach to the yes, community. Yes, I, I would agree. And Thank I guess you. to the city manager, uh, your thoughts on that. I do agree with what Tracy said. Uh, I don't think there's a, a challenge here. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, my, my observations are this is not needed and it's already in play and actually staff in most divisions, if not all, are doing an excellent job. All right, uh, are there uh, any questions, other questions of staff? If not, I'll ask for speakers. Uh, anybody from outside the executive committee wish to speak? All right, members of the committee? Councilor Monroe, yeah. Deputy Mayor. A motion to defer indefinitely. A motion to defer indefinitely. Yeah, it's uh, what, Jay Robinson, uh, Councillor Robinson spoke very well, and then if meetings need to be had, councillors can organize, and organize them themselves. That's part of our jobs as local councillors. Uh, I'm, I'm prepared if there are, uh, uh, to call the question on the motion to defer indefinitely. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, then uh, we have the Office of the Neighbourhoods, which has a deputation from uh, Peggy Mulder, Etobicoke Lakeshore Community Planning Group. You do deserve a medal, uh, Ms. Mulder. Wow. <laughs> this is the yes. longest executive committee meeting so far in my term in office, the 26th one and the longest, and you are the last deputy. On this one day. On this one day, yes. Okay. Um So, um, uh, a friend uh, told me about this um, issue. Um, he, he noted it in the Metro News. Um, Councillor McMahon has proposed that City Hall harness the power of neighbourhoods. Harnessing the power of neighbourhoods is another name for public consultation, which is poorly conducted in the City of Toronto, which <coughs> I know that you uh, might not agree, but the problem is, I can explain is that when city staff show up, they've done a lot of research, they spent a lot of time, they will come forward with one or two alternatives, and then they basically refuse to budge from those issues. Having done all their work, they didn't bring it to the public, and the public says, no, what about this, what about that, what about the next thing? And then staff say, oh, well, we've done all this work, so we're not prepared to make any changes. And this is the failure of public consultation. The experts on neighborhoods are the people who live there, not city staff. So anyway, the problem, the new Office of Neighborhoods would identify and support great initiatives. That was the quote in the Metro News. And here in lies the problem, that city staff are often a barrier and not a conduit to communications between residents and city council. They consult with the residents, then they go back to city council and give their version of what happened and what they recommend, and oftentimes what we uh, have said at these meetings is basically ignored and not even mentioned to city council. So basically, uh, city staff are often a barrier and we need our own voice aside from what city staff might say. So the only ideas that get presented to city council will be those which city staff recommend within the context of what they think is best for them to do and not in the context of what residents want. This has always been the case and I've been involved in um, our neighborhood in Ward 6 since 2010. This is the case that they simply don't listen uh, under the current uh, systems and routines at City Hall. Um, while David Topping's unofficial map of residents' associations is interesting, I have reviewed it in great detail, and I found much of the information is out of date. Neighborhood residents' associations, unfortunately, largely arise to oppose issues which they perceive will negatively impact their neighborhoods. These residents' associations frequently come and go. We don't have the time to spend fighting all these issues on a full-time basis. And unfortunately, we find ourselves doing this and people get exhausted if they haven't gone through one battle and they can't just keep up the fight. So once the um, issue is dealt with, whether satisfactory or otherwise, these um, residents' associations often disintegrate. 
So the point is not residents association, the point is the communities themselves. That needs to be the focus, not residents associations. So any city expenditure of time, energy and resources must center around communities and must present opportunities for all the residents within particular communities to participate. If I could ask you to draw to a close, that would be. Okay. Thank you. Well, the point is Toronto has 140 neighborhood communities and 2.8 million people. So no office of neighborhoods can work effectively with this number of people. Um, okay. Um, a major problem is that we need um, legislation to protect us. And also um, the city has um, tried to remove the right of appeal by residents on planning applications. So I will be filing a complaint with the Department of Justice and the province on this issue. And I have appealed this matter to the Ontario Municipal Board. And this is the attitude that we are facing from Toronto City Hall. All right. I think on that note, ma'am, I'll have to ask us as we're a minute and a half over uh, that you, uh, and you've been so patient, I, uh, but I just think we have to be fair because we've done that all day and you've been very patient and uh, so. But again, you know, this is the problem. Three minutes on complicated issues is not the way to deal with this. Yeah, ma'am, I, I, I will not, uh, you know what, I, I, I feel badly about that on one hand, but we've heard a hundred deputations today and, so and we've sat here for 14 or 15 hours. And so it is, and, that, and, we're, and we're, I don't think you're going to find it's going to be finally dealt with. I think you're going to find it's going to be sent somewhere else for some further discussion precisely because of some of the points you raised. So in fairness, the three minutes applied to everybody today, a hundred other people besides yourself. I, I, I agree that, it's not enough. That but is not the right way to um, conduct government business on behalf of this, the people of this no. city. Sometime I'll ask you what your suggestion would be when we have 100 people that want to be heard, but for, for now have, that's... I have. I sent you legislation, that's, that's draft the, that's, legislation, that's, that's, and obviously nobody here has read it. Yeah. And this is the problem. You okay. don't pay attention, you're not interested, you just do what you want to do, and our time and effort doesn't count. We're just here to pay, that's it, all. It counts for a lot. Now, uh, I, I, uh, the questions of the deputy? Seems to be getting up, so. Yep, Okay, are there uh, other questions of staff? Questions of staff? No, all right, uh, speakers. Councillor McMahon. Thank you very much. So I have a motion. I was going to withdraw this and do it another way, but we cannot. So I have a motion to refer it to the city manager for consideration. And I'd like your support for that. I won't fully get into it, but this is, um, this is not something new. It's done in uh, many other world-class cities. It is just a support system for our neighborhood groups. Uh, we are a city of neighborhoods. We have a lot of uh, fantastic residents associations, community associations, neighborhood associations that do a uh, lion's share of work on a volunteer basis. And this is just um, to help uh, connect them with each other. We don't even have a list at City Hall of them. And I think that's a shame. It's also uh, in um, partnership with our Transform TO um, item that's coming down uh, to council this, this month as far as building resiliency, sustainability, and um, connecting, as I said, uh, leveraging the power of community. So I would just uh, ask your support. Thank you, uh, Councillor McMahon. Uh, other speakers, Councillor Deputy Mayor Renan Wong. Yeah, so I, I'm not really sure what the in intent of this is completely. I, I actually 100% agree with what the deputy said. So in terms of the consultation process, I think oftentimes we have these community meetings and they think that it's a, there, there's a preconceived outcome and the, the, it's just a, they're just going through the motions just to reach an outcome, whether it's bike lanes or transit projects, you name it, they feel that they're, they're, just, they're just doing this on a process to get to an outcome. I, I don't know that an office will solve this problem. In fact, I, I don't believe that, you, that neighborhood groups are really helped by bureaucracy, by bureaucracy and City Hall. I think neighborhood groups get their power from them being strong community groups and I wouldn't overlay lay bureaucracy, um, bureaucracy over that. So I, I don't think this is necessary. I don't need to see a report. Um, we have community councils that deal with community issues. That's the nature of that. And if there are community meetings, they should be organized by the local councillor. 
Um, that's, I, I just think that's the best way that it should work. When we ask City Hall to organize neighborhoods for us, then we failed in our job. Um, and so I just think we should keep it, keep it the way it is. For indefinitely. Have you put a motion to do yeah, so? There, I see, okay. Which has to be dealt with first. Are there other speakers? I'll just say the, the concept is, is, is a great one. It's, it's an ideal scenario, but I can't get the grass cut in my ward. I've had 20 emails in the last three days about grass and cul-de-sacs, mediums, like to the point that it's up to people's knees or mid mid thigh. So just the uh, the idea of adding more bureaucracy, and I don't want to risk that. Uh, I rather just get the grass cut because I I don't know how to facilitate these. I'm thinking about it actually. So uh, I can't believe the the number of emails I'm getting about that very issue and the parks. I've been to several in the last two weeks. They're they're a mess. They're the grass is very long in all of them. So I think we have to focus on our, uh, our, what we need to do as a city, and that is cut the grass. So I'm not voting for this. I'm voting for Denzel's motion. Did you call the Chair of Public Works about the boulevards? Yeah, I have. Other uh, speakers? All right, then if there are no other speakers, we're ready to call the question first on the motion to defer indefinitely. Uh, all those in favor of the motion to defer indefinitely? Uh, I see, do I see three? Okay, opposed? No, four. I'm sorry, four, opposed? Two, three, four, five. Uh, the motion five. is is lost. Five, four to five. Four to five. No. All right, let's do it again. All those in favor? Put your hand up high, please. High, if you're in favor of the motion to defer indefinitely. One, two, three, four. Right? Okay, all those opposed? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, motion is lost four to five. Uh, then the motion to uh, refer it to the city manager for his consideration. All those in favor? One, two, three, four, five. Opposed? One, two, three, four. Okay, motion is carried. All right, last but not least, uh, the 731 run -and meet item, which is number, uh, what's the number of it, uh, Jennifer? Clerk? 15. 40, uh, 20, uh, 26, 15. Uh, so I guess we would start then with uh, questions of staff uh, from uh, Francis, uh, Councillor Nunziata. I'm the only outside councillor that's are. here. Uh, so question uh, to Joe Caselli. So based on the report, uh, $17 square foot is fair market value, correct? Yes, we believe that to be so. So. And for the first month of the lease, we are making an additional payment of twenty-six thousand one eighty-four twenty-five. So basically, in the first month of the lease, we will be we will be paying thirty-four dollars square foot when fair market value is seventeen square foot. The, the reasoning behind we're paying that, an additional month's rent. The, yes, the reasoning behind that is the landlord had indicated to us that we've been in negotiations with him for over a year, and that he should be somewhat compensated for that. Uh, lengthy negotiation. So, and as you mentioned, you've been negotiating for over a year, and the recommendation that uh, came forward in community development is to negotiate a lease, and if not, look at alternate sites. Now, being that the landlord is um, uh, was very difficult in the past year, playing mind games with the city, um, why would we why would we have to give him an extra month's rent? Um, it, I'll just say it was part of the negotiation in order for us to come forward with a transaction to committee to consider. We had to go that, uh, I'll call it the extra mile to uh, get him to sign an offer to the city. So we go the extra mile and pay uh, thousands of dollars extra just so we can satisfy a landlord that in my opinion is a slum landlord? Well, um, in, in terms of the negotiation, I, I would say it was lengthier than what might be normal. Um, it wasn't uh, uh, just the landlord's doing, the city had some part in that also. So when we had the uh, community public uh, meetings that we've had over a year ago, uh, it was we uh, 
communicated to the public, and so we actually misled the public, that this would be a temporary shelter. So why are we negotiating, and with always a lease for five plus five, ten-year lease, so why is it that you're uh, presenting today ten plus five? Um, when we communicated to the public that it was a temporary shelter and it would only be five plus five. Because um, for the landlord to agree to the $17 a square foot, he indicated that he would only sign a 10-year lease. We also considered that uh, we were putting considerable capital into the building uh, and through discussions with um, other city staff, we um, looked at how much our investment was going to be and the fact that we would most likely exercise that second option anyway. So we're willing as a city to make deals with landlords and pay thousands of dollars extra so we can get into a warehouse for a shelter that's not appropriate and that we would, just to please a landlord, and we, not thinking about the thousands of dollars and millions of dollars it's gonna cost the taxpayers. Well, if you look at that, that one month's payment over a 10 year term, it's not that significant really. Oh, you don't think that's significant? Not one month out of 10 years, no. Well, what about the five extra years that we, uh, that we misled the public on? Um, this, was, this was originally a temporary shelter. Now it's 15 years. That's misleading the public. It's, it's 10 years with two options to renew. Yeah, but that's not the way it was communicated to the public from the public meetings. Um, and when we're going through negotiations, you never know exactly how those neg negotiations may turn out. What I was attempting to do was to bring the best possible offer I could to committee and council to consider. And if you feel that I haven't, I'll, I'll say negotiated hard enough, you can either turn me back to the landlord or uh, just say, look for something else. But before you today is, is a signed lease by the, by the landlord. So among the, among the terms and conditions, um, that the tenant would be responsible and for, the, for the landlord, for the cost to repair and maintain the prem, uh, premises, so it's a plus a 10% administrative fee. Is this typical of a lease that we're paying a landlord 10% over? It's a 10% management fee. Yeah, management yes, that's, fee. That's typical. That's typical. To cover operating costs, uh, the landlord usually charges a management fee. So this is the way we make deals. That's how the marketplace yeah. works with respect to leases. That's it for my questions, I'll speak. It is recommended that uh, the site be leased until the Georgia Street uh, revitalization project is completed. Is that correct? I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. The recommendation is that this site be leased until the Georgia Street re revitalization project is completed. Is that correct? Through the, through the mayor, uh, what council approved was that this be set up as an emergency shelter. Uh, with an initial occupancy of 50. There is no um, limitation in terms of it ending once the revitalization was over, but it, that is something we would consider and reevaluate at the time. Yeah, well, in, in the summary on page one of the report, that clearly states that. Is um, a follow up to Councillor Nunciata's um, questions with regards to community consultation, actually I was part of the panel together with uh, Councillor Doucet and Councillor Nunciara at uh, two massive public meetings where the public was assured by city staff that um, the negotiating lease was going to be for five years. So in terms of principle, in terms of being open and transparent, our local communities where members of council were responsible for it. I personally took your word, whatever you said, at face value. So I'm just wondering at this point, why do we come with these different options? What does it mean when you have two or three or 500 people before you and we are so clear with those statements and all of a sudden something else coming up? So I'm just wondering, 
Do we have an explanation for that? Through the chair to the councillor, back to your first question. Um, in terms of the George Street revitalization, this shelter was tied to the George Street revitalization, which the earliest date that that would open would be 2025. So that would be a minimum of eight years with some flexibility there depending on construction time and when that would actually open. And with regards to the... So further to your second question, then the five years would not, would not get to the 2025 or until George Street opened. And that was the reason for the, uh, the length of the lease, to be able to accommodate the construction period of George Street. So the statements by staff literally contradicts exactly what you're saying, because at that point, it was well known when the St. George uh, revitalization was going to be completed and what uh, city staff was looking for in terms of a new lease is a little bit different. So I'm just trying to understand as why two different messages were sent out, which is not clear, for the community, no fair. So through the chair, I can't speak to the five-year piece. Uh, the George Street revitalization has always moved into the mid-2020s. Uh, on that planning phase, so I, I do not know the reference to the original five-year lease. Will you need a shelter after 10 years after the completion of the George the, Street? The intention is to close this shelter location once the George Street, uh, the new site opens, and we're hoping that that would be in 2025. Uh, but there would be, you know, in, with construction, there could be some flexibility there in the uh, opening time. So what's the purpose of having the option of renewals? I'm, I'm, I didn't get, I'm sorry, so I didn't understand. Through the chair, the options to renew beyond the 10 years, is that what you're referencing? At that point, it would just be an option, and there might be other city purposes that you might want to use that building for at that time. So we just, we felt there was no harm in actually having the options in case there's an, another use that we might be able to use that particular building for. Thank you. Okay, Qu question, uh, questions by Deputy Mayor. Yeah, so um, Councillor Nunziata said this was originally a temporary shelter, is this correct? That is correct. Oh, so so um, do you still deem it to be a temporary shelter? That is correct. So, okay, so it's still a temporary shelter. And so, um, how long is the first lease for? It's for, a year. Period of, it's for a period of 10 years. So that's still 2028? It starts in, uh, starts June 1st, uh, 2018. So, 20 so June 1st, 2028 with an extension? With two options to renew for an additional five years each. So that's our option. So that, that's what you deem as temporary? No, basically what I was trying to do is negotiate the, the best possible terms for the city to use it either for a shelter or for other city purposes. The options don't cost us anything. Right, but you're indicating to the community that you're turning, that something that could go for a potential 20 years, that no longer looks like temporary, that looks like permanent. Uh, through the chair, the intention is to use this site as a shelter until the George Street site opens and then to close it as a shelter. And it would be uh, then uh, the option of the city to use it for a different purpose or to not use it. So, so th but this is an unusual arrangement, Mr. Chair. And also, so you must have some indication. We usually don't sort of decide that we're going to, we, we've already got it, unless we know what we're going to use it for. We don't normally enter into leases for some undefined open arrangement, do we? So, Mr. Mayor, because given, in fact, given the fact that George Street, we haven't actually initiated that revitalization, we felt it's safer to err on the side of having options. As um, Mr. Raftis explained, the earliest George Street would be ready is 2025, so in the mid... Three years. So, so you're giving years. yourself a three-year buffer. And I, I guess you would do that given the fact that we seldom get projects completed on time. And through the chair, we're still trying to secure the funding to actually start the project. So my second question is, is could, could we, 
Could we arrange the, the extensions to be year over year as opposed to five years? Uh, we, we could go back to the landlord with a counter offer, but to me, um, our, our ability to utilize the building for another five years, if we can negotiate a rate that's, um, I'll say, acceptable to the city or complementary to our needs, then, um, you know, at least we have... But it also constrains period. you as opposed to one year as opposed to five or nothing. Frankly, we could go back after the 10 years and renegotiate each of the five-year periods. Just to my other problem. question, sorry, Mr. Chair, this is important because, uh, Councillor, yeah, it's very quick. Councillor Nunziata said to me that this, this particular location is not very well accessed by transit and is not there, therefore doesn't really serve, a, serve the, need, the purpose very well for which it, for which it was meant. Perp it's, not very, it's not great for a shelter because there's no transit around. Is that true? Through the chair, uh, no, the transit is adequate and the services in the area are adequate. Okay. All right. I'm sorry, we're, we're not, you, you'll have you'll have a chance to speak in a moment, uh, Councillor. Uh, Councillor McMahon. So Pardon I'm me? just wondering um, how hard it is to find uh, locations for shelters and, and to find another space for this. How hard would that be? It has uh -huh. been very challenging. We've looked at hundreds of sites with city real estate and we're continuing to look for additional sites. And how long has it taken you to find this site? I think it's been about two years. Thank you. Councillor Barlow. So we are um, looking f and to replace shelters and open new shelters because of the George Street revitalization and because our uh, capacity is at 94, 96, something like that? Yeah, through the chair, our occupancy has been floating between 93 and 97 percent. And this is even before the George Street revitalization and relocation happening. So we have an issue right now. George Street is going to make it worse. and. We are, we are in need of locations, is that right? That's correct. And so you have a lease that is, gives you 10 years, so it, it gives you a three-year buffer to 2028 with the option of extending or not. That's correct. And we put together a plan to um, assist the community and to help with the integration of this shelter in the neighborhood? That's correct. For the last 12 months, there has been a team working with a community liaison committee um, to look at services in the area and different recommendations from the community. And the community has been involved? That's correct. Okay. And the beds were reduced from 100 beds to? The, the initial occupancy is 50. You concluded your questions, Councillor. Uh, thank you. Uh, any more questions of staff? Okay. So just to be clear, I, I, I understand the notion of a temporary use, and I understand that things will revert back to normal in the longer term, and we're talking about 10 years. But I just want to just make sure I understand Councillor Nunziata's original statement, and that is that when this thing went, I thought it went through a zoning process, to be honest. They had numerous consultations with the community as opposed to just putting it in on an emergency basis. And my question is, on what basis was it put in? Emergency, yes, but did, did they have a time duration? Did they communicate to the public that the, the time duration would be one, two, three years? What? Well, if that's the case, what, what, are we, what are we grappling with? If they were told that it would be on a temporary basis, but over a fairly lengthy duration, so what are we what are we wrestling with here? I will speak to that question when it comes okay. time for speeches. Sorry. I, I, I certainly will. If others don't want to, but do, does somebody want I'm to finish? Staff, that was a question to the staff, not to me. As to what the public were told about the duration, that was the question. So the, the public were told that it was a temporary shelter until the George Street uh, shelter George Street revitalization project was complete which would have been in the mid-2020s. All right, so we're being consistent reasonably. That's fine. Thank you. Are there any further questions of staff? 
All right, speakers. <coughs> uh, Councilor Anciada. Yes, I have a motion. What Councilor Palacio will move for me is um, that it be uh, for 10 years with no options. Um, it's on the screen. First of all, I, I, I really don't think it's fair that we should mislead the public and even mislead the committee here. First of all, when staff mentioned that there's services in the area, there are absolutely no services in the area. We're going to be spending millions of dollars to bring those services in. There's no services in Ward 11. There's no services along St. No, I, I'm going to stop you there. Yeah. Because when we had, we had an incident just recently at City Council involving a member who talked about staff misleading people. And I just don't, I don't find that to be parliamentary language. Uh, that's certainly not acceptable to me as chair of the committee. I don't, uh, and so I would like you to withdraw the fact that our staff are misleading people if you want to find another way to put that. But the, 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 it's just not right and fair that we should have our professional public service accused of misleading people in this committee or, t or anywhere else. I will, I will withdraw the comment, but Mr. Mayor, this is what happened a year ago when we had the public meetings, the same thing. The staff presented my community with all these services and they were all vacant lots. So we continue, and this is frustrating for me because we keep saying things and they're not there. Uh, as far as transit, there's no transit on St. Clair. There's a bus on Runnymede. So as far as enough, if, there's, if we have enough transit in the air, we don't. Um, we were communicated to my community that was a temporary shelter, and that's what they bought into. Originally, it was 100 beds. We, we got it down to 50 beds. They were all happy about that. They, they accepted that. This was a year ago, the negotiated lease. It's been a year later. We haven't been able to negotiate with the lease. Uh, with the landlord. The landlord has been very difficult. He's been going around uh, communicating to my residents on the city negotiating the lease. There was private information that the, that the landlord was communicating to the public. So my residents knew all about the negotiations even before the city knew or even before I knew. So my, my community is very frustrated because they were told it was a temporary shelter was five plus five, and now we have a lease because the landlord um, refused to sign the lease. We're not only we're paying them an extra month's rent, we're paying thousands of dollars in renovations, and as well we have to extend the lease an additional five years because the landlord won't sign the lease. So what are we doing? Are we catering to these landlords? Are, are we just throwing away money because landlords are, know that the city needs a shelter, so they're playing these mind games. They know that whatever they ask for, they're going to get, and that's going to continue for any future shelters. So I'm, I'm encouraging the committee to please support the motion that Councilor Palacio um, will move on my behalf. Um, we have to be truthful to, to the residents. We can't, we can't continue um, without giving them giving them false information. Thank you, Councillor Anziano. Other speakers? Councillor Palacio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would move that recommendation on behalf of uh, Councillor Anziano. As I mentioned while I was asking questions, I was part of this um, two, cup, uh, two public meetings, massive public meetings that took place and um, in Council Musiera's area, and I was invited to attend by residents in my own ward as well. And uh, somehow, through the questioning aspect, and the community was led to understand or believe that um, the lease was going to be for five years and perhaps an additional five. And, that's, uh, and that was said over and over again. And I think that when we're consulting with uh, our local communities, and that it's extremely important not only to inform, to inform them about what's uh, going to take place and when we're taking also community input, but uh, to try to is to bring that sense of comfort in whatever way that we can. Now, this part of St. Clair is extremely depressed in that section of Runnymede. 
in terms of uh, with planning, there has been a tremendous pushback and putting the brakes on growth and development through OMB appeals and whatever. So the community is literally suffering. Suffering. Together with Council of Sierra, we've, we've been trying to work compromises all throughout to get some level of revitalization in the community there. But um, our city planning staff have dug their heels and on the notion of uh, no further changes and all kinds of restrictions. So um, there is a need for to do something there. Now, one thing that's very important, members of council, to understand is that there is a high concentration of poverty in this area, and the area is in need of revitalization. This area has been declared by, and it went through council as a neighborhood improvement area. It's uh, with a very low equity score in relation to other communities. Here we have a score of 11%. 11 when you look just a few blocks down by Blue West, we have an 85%. Uh, equity score. So uh, this uh, emergency, uh, this uh, shelter, even though that there is a need for it, but the location is not the proper location. I even offer a, a place in my own world. So this area is not only that they are suffer suffering because of um, all the stigma stigmatization that's taking place and uh, due to the level of poverty, drug dealing, crime, and level of uncertainty, but um, I think it's only fair to, um, to be truthful to what we say, and I'm referring that, uh, including members of council when we talk to our communities. So um, hopefully that this recommendation will be um, hopefully supported. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Who, who, uh, other speakers? Well, I'll, I'll just say that it's very frustrating when we bring up, when we discuss shelters, and, and there's still such a stigma uh, with residents and, and with counselors, I'll, I'll say, and I think we need to be more open-minded and supportive. Of, of shelters, and we need to be more respectful of city staff. They work hard, uh, and they it's, it's not easy finding a location for a shelter. It takes a long time, and, um, you know, we've seen a lot of the not-in-my-backyard mentality, and, and I think we need to do more education uh, and more outreach to combat that. Um, it's my understanding there are services uh, around this this location, I, I was at CDR, CDR for to hear the deputations for this shelter, and I just think we need to uh, embrace uh, the concept of of helping each other and and supporting shelters. Councillor Giorgio, very quickly, Mr. Mayor, I. Uh, Ironically, North York had uh, had a bylaw that didn't permit shelters as of right, whereas the rest of Toronto permitted shelters as of right. And uh, in my own area, even though even though a shelter was not permitted, it went in on a temporary basis, no consultation, no meetings with the community, and I basically accepted the fact that there was a need for a shelter. I'm not saying it was the best location. I'm not saying there's great services around there, but. Like my colleague said, it's, it's reminiscent of group homes when they first came on the scene in North York. We needed to accommodate certain things, and staff are very, very, I think, um, sensitive to finding locations that are reasonable to introduce shelters. I mean, they're, they're um, as, sensible as, as sensible as they can be in terms of um, working with the community to try and have the community embrace shelters because they need to be embraced, unfortunately. So those are my comments. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I just think this ties back to the last item, Mary, Councillor, the deputy on Councillor Margaret McMahon, Mary Margaret McMahon's thing on how the city, city doesn't listen. They feel that they're not listened to. And so, so what I heard from Councillor Nunziata and Councillor Palacio was 
this is supposed to be a temporary use, right? And Councilor George was right, and so is Councilor McMahon. These things are not very easily accepted, and here we are, we're extending it out another five years. This is not the agreement that we had with the community. Firstly, they're asked to accept something that they really kind of don't want. But, but, they're, but you send people in, you try and convince them, and you basically say it's going to be a temporary use. And now this report comes back and it says, you know, we're going to extend it another five years. I think the community is right, and I think the councillor's right, to view this with a healthy degree of skepticism, if not suspicion. And I, I, I think councillor, I'm going to support councillor Palacio's motion. We said it was going to be temporary. It should be temporary. And that, you know, because, uh, uh, you know, 10 years turns into 15 years, and then, you know, then what does it turn into? Temporary starts to become permanent. And that's not what they were told. And I think we, we, we the, the, there was a bargain made with the community, and the, the, uh, the community, you know, had some, had some serious, and serious concerns, and um, we should you, do the best that we can to keep that bargain. Who else wishes to speak? Councillor Barla? I'll try to be brief. Um, I, what is in front of us is actually uh, the lease, and I know that we were going back to, is this the right location, not the right location? I think that we went over that, and there has been a lot of work with the local councillor to make it um, uh, to make it work in that location, because everybody agreed that it was going to be there. Um, I think that... Um, the important thing is the community was told that it was going to be done, the, the shelter would be there until the George Street was done, which is minimum 2025. We have an agree, a, a lease that is going to give us a three-year buffer, which we know, which we know all, along, all around here that, you know, it's probably, it might be about right. By the time it's ready, we move people and so on, it might be about right. And then we have a 10-year option. So I think staff tried to do a deal that was the, the best for their money, given the circumstances. And that's what it's in front of us right now. Um, so uh, I understand all the work that the councillor did, and it was an incredible work. There, I went to, with the councillor to the first meeting. It was a very difficult meeting. Absolutely, these things are never easy. That's why we're trying to work with staff to find a new way to, to deploy these shelters and work with these shelters. But what we have in front of us is a lease that is going give to us, give us a shelter with a little bit of a buffer time, which we might use or not, as we heard from staff. But the commitment is the same. The shelter will be open until we have this George Street revitalization done, which the earliest is 2025. Thanks, Councillor Baller. Other speakers? Okay, well, I will speak now then. Um, I'm very disappointed that this, this, this discussion is taking place because I don't think we're being honest about what's really uh, on the table here. Uh, Deputy Mayor, with respect, you're a lawyer. Uh, an option that exists in the lease is an option at our option. It's for us. If we choose not to exercise it, then it won't be exercised. The lease will be 10 years, and I then associate myself completely with the comments of Councillor Bylaw. It's a 10-year lease, which gives us the period of time that was contemplated, which is the opening of George Street, plus a buffer, which I think we'd all agree would be wise in the circumstances. And then it provides for two options at our option, if we wish to exercise them later on. But let's talk about the real issue here, because really by sending this lease back, probably we're going to put this, uh, this arrangement that has been years in the making in peril. And I think that's really what the idea is here. And you talk about the work the councillor did, and I'll give her full marks for that, and she's been a very loyal supporter of mine on many, many things. But I also went out to that ward twice as the mayor of the city to help uh, to talk to the residents and help with the negotiation with staff of these things because the fact of the matter is we just don't need this shelter. We need, I think, 10 more after this. And if this gets turned around and doesn't get put in, we'll have trouble locating another shelter anywhere else in the city because every other member of council and other people from residents associations will be empowered by this to believe that if you just push back hard enough and long enough, and if the councillor just does what I, I understand. I have to get elected by the very same people, the very same people. 
And I'll go back out there again. I've been twice, and if you want me to go to a larger public meeting and explain to people, as I have to explain, I'm the one, I'm the one, more so than anybody else in this room, when people are homeless in this city, has to answer for it. And I'm not going to answer by saying, well, I'm terribly sorry, we, we just couldn't find anywhere to put a shelter because people kept pushing back. Our conscience as members of this City Council, as people elected to come here and deal with these issues and deal with the, 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 the problems of our most vulnerable people should be what's on our mind now. And I have here, in the, I got it, and thank the clerk could fortunately print it off, four pages, in some cases of unprecedented improvements or, or, or things that were done to make this shelter more acceptable to this community and to make it to the point where when our officials, I don't want to put words in their mouth, when they were out there the last time we were out there a week or so ago, they said it was unprecedented in terms of the kind of place this would be, the number of services that would be offered to people in this building. They'll be among the best cared for people in the entire city. But the question we really have to ask ourselves is, if we, if we send it back, and if we then have this end up you know, on the cutting room floor, as it were, because the landlord just says, forget it, you know, the deal was the deal, then I'll, I'll be looking to, to people here for where it is we're going to put these, house these people who are, who are homeless in our city. And anybody who wants to sort of take issue with whether or not there's a homelessness problem in the city, then you know there is. And come with me. Come with me. I went this winter to, to, to many of these shelters. I went and talked to people on the street. I, you see how the, 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 uh, the accountability that I'm held to for this problem. I, as the mayor, who am just a member of council, just like you, and who has to get elected among exactly the same people you represent. So I think it's a very important decision time just now. And it's an important decision time for about 10 more of these we have to find in the next period of time. And I'm going to stand up and be counted on this by saying no to the motion moved by Councillor Palacio. I'm going to say no because, frankly, those options are there for our benefit. If we don't wish to exercise them, then we don't have to. We can just say no, this shelter's done, George Street is about to open any day, and it's over. We have that option. Taking the options away is simply meant to start a renegotiation with the landlord over again. I think if people really wanted to speak up, they'd say with the hopes that those negotiations will fail and the, and the shelter won't go there. And I'm not part of that. I went out there twice to avoid precisely this kind of moment from being in front of us. And my conscience is clear voting for this. I want to privilege, uh, Mr. Mayor. I want to be very clear with you and everybody else, is that uh, we are not against shelters in any way whatsoever. I do have shelters in my, in my area. Is the way it was done and how the community has been, through a number of communications, misled. And that's where I have an issue overall. It's not the shelter itself. I think I will just say, I'll, I'll, I've taken more than my time, I will just say I think the beginning part of this consultation with the public was very poorly handled. And I think if we'd gone at it this way from the beginning, the result would have been different in terms of the feelings of the community. But we are where we are. So anyway, let's, uh, I think if we've... Can I ask you a question? I know you didn't move a motion. So you convinced me that I'm happy to vote for it. But the fact that you said that we need 10 more of these and that we already have this set up and that that we have these extensions in place, it seems to me that we're left with no other choice if we need 10 of them. This is going to become a permanent shelter. I mean, there is some logic. There is some logic. You've you got to accept yep. the logic that if there's something there and you're going, you have, you know, let's say 10 years from now, the problem isn't going to get, get any better, likely. It's probably only going to get worse. That, you know, at the end, we'll extend for the option because we will need a homeless shelter. And this, and, you My know, understanding is that on a track that staff will correct me if I'm wrong. And if that's the case, why don't we? Why don't we? But just I think say that, that, that the ten more we need or whatever are meant to look after our needs in the short term until George Street and other things are done. So that, that a lot of these are temporary, while we refurbish or re, well, there's four. Okay, I exaggerated. I, I, I thought I, mean, I think we originally needed 15, and we've now obviously got five or six that are done. So we need four more. But temporary. Four temporary. Four temporary. Okay. But, but recognizing that, Mr. Mayor, you can appreciate the suspicion that the community has that this is that this is going to be permanent that this potentially could be permanent. well but you've heard our staff this is why i don't like having people say our staff are misleading people you've heard them say this one this one we're only talking about this one tonight 
and it's one of the temporary ones. And they're saying it's temporary. When George Street is done, this will close or, and be, repur or be repurposed if we still have the lease in place. Right, but you can appreciate the community. Uh, yes. And is our job to fuel that suspicion or to try and dampen it down? Right. Can, I, can I just, I know I, I'm out of order, but I'd just like to make a comment to members of council. And I really don't appreciate some members of council thinking that I don't support a shelter. I support the shelter. I didn't support the location at first, but I, I negotiated with my community and we got 50 rather than 100. It's the way we communicated to the community. It's wrong. And if it was your community, you would be just as upset as I am, Councillor Bylaw, Councillor McMahon. If you say something to your community and then you retract it, then you have to justify that. And that's wrong. That's what's wrong about this whole process. Mayor Tory? I'm over here and I haven't had my warm milk yet. Um, would it be beneficial to add with the recommendation to council if it goes forward that prior to any lease extension, local council be contacted well in advance of that going forward? to provide some understanding to their community if it was going to be extended for more than the original 10 years? I'm wondering on your thought. It's a 10-year lease and there's options which staff will only need, they've said, if they're unable to complete George Street in time. So I'm wondering if the recommendation to Council is to enact a 10-year lease but come back to Council prior to any extensions as an option. And that might provide to the local Council some surety that it won't automatically become a 20-year shelter without Council approval. orthodox zone here in terms of out of the procedural in, order so in terms of um, the real estate transaction uh, normally um, we would look and see if it falls under delegated authority for staff to just go ahead and renew though or renew through the options but if committee wants us to come back uh, to council I don't see any harm in doing that at the 10-year mark because all we're doing is informing the committee about the circumstances at the time and having committee help us decide, are we going to exercise the option or not? So I don't see any harm in that. Being totally unorthodox, if I could have a moment to speak. Yeah, did, you hadn't spoken yet, had you? No. no. So in listening to the issues that have transpired, and um, I'm one that's supportive of shelters. As you know, I've served on the board of Youth Shelter and I had them built in numerous places around the city. If the community was told that it was for a five-year period or a temporary use, while George Street was being rebuilt. Uh, the only thing I'm, and I wasn't there to say that, but it appears to me that's what staff have negotiated as a 10 year lease with that intention. Then my motion would seek council's concurrence prior to the extension of the lease and not make it delegated authority. And then if the shelter has or needs to continue to operate, council can then take advantage of the extension, but then still fulfill the commitments that my colleague has stated were given to the community that it would be a five-year or a temporary shelter. And I think that if it has worked well, then there wouldn't be a problem and it was needed with an extension. And that's my experience with the shelters that are up in, like for example, the youth shelter that's up in North York that came in many years ago. 
the residents thought that having a youth shelter was going to increase the number of break-ins and burglaries and the problem in the area and instead the residents were brought onto the advisory committee and became full supporters of the shelter and the work that it did. So it's never been a problem nor have the other locations that we've put them into. So I would place the motion just to seek the council authority prior to extending the lease. Okay, any questions of the mover? Well, I'm just wondering if this is gonna be um, the new norm that we're gonna do this on, on every temporary shelter. So, because I think that we're we're strangleholding so, the the process. I think you've answered the question yourself, Councillor McMahon. If it's a temporary shelter, it's not necessary there for twenty years, without council authorizing it to be there longer than that. However, my own experience is that you, the shelters moving into an area become good community neighbors, and people actually support them and they belong and work with the, the, the people that are running them. I haven't had a lot of complaints that I've heard of with the shelters I'm involved in where they would want to have them taken out. It's just the opposite. They support them and go to their fundraising events and are great community you know, participants. But if it's not, it's not a new norm if it's a temporary shelter to say 10 years is temporary and the extension just get council's concurrence. All right, so we have some motions to deal with here. All right, yes, go ahead, Frank. Is this a question of the mover? So, uh, Councillor Shiner, given that the councillor, when, when something is coming up for renewal, the lease is coming up for renewal, the councillor could intervene at that time and do exactly what you're suggesting council do. So why would you wanna, yeah. why don't you just leave it in the local councillor's hands? Staff have said it would never come back it will be delegated authority currently to currently as it stands council does not get involved in any way nor the councillor asked or the community asked about exercising the extensions and a staff have said if council want an input to that then they would understand that and come back at the time of the extension right but you know that delegated authority can be withdrawn at any time all the local councillor has to do is bring it to the attention of council Oh, no, I don't. Well, council can... No, that would be a major thing to have to bring up in six or seven years' time, an issue about delegated authority and try and explain what happened that long ago. I, I'm simply putting it forward for you as members of committee, whether you wish or you don't wish, to support it. I, I think the services will be in place. Okay, leave it at that for... So are we ready to call the question on these motions then? And what order will we deal with them in, uh, Madam Clerk? Yes, as they're moved. Well, I just it does, I wonder if that makes sense, only because the last one, it, hmm? so I'd have to vote against yours in order to vote for that. I just want to be clear that we're doing it in the right order because the I think I would prefer to, to deal with them in the order, of, uh, 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 which is to have Councillor Shiner's motion Councilor. dealt with first. Pardon me? So then mine would be an amendment to Councillor Palacios or just a, okay. Okay. It's standalone, so it just speaks to the. All right, does that leave just the one then, or is there another one? No, that's it. Just this one, plus the main motion. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we'll have a vote then. I could presume we want a recorded vote on, on uh, this. Uh, 
this option, motion by Councillor Shiner. On the motion by Councillor Shiner, all those in favor? Deputy Mayor Minimwa, on the motion by Councillor Shiner, all those in favor? Councillor Crawford, Councillor DiGiorgio, Deputy Mayor Minimwong, Mayor Tory, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Shiner, all those opposed? Councillor Bylow, Councillor McMahon. Motion by Councillor Shiner carries. All right, now the main motion as amended. All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Said complete our business. All right, thank you very much. We'll adjourn.